is audible. Gildan Media presents Your Coach in a Box, affordable, life changing audio programs. Abraham Lincoln, A Life, by Michael Burlingham. Read by Sean Pratt. Lincoln's frontier background shapes the future president. 1809 to 1837. Chapter 1. I have seen a good deal of the backside of this world. Childhood in Kentucky. 1809 to 1816. One day in the middle of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln stole time from his busy schedule to pen some wise paternal advice to a young Union captain who had been squabbling with his superiors. Quoting from Hamlet, the president wrote that a father's admonition to his son, Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear it that the opposed may beware of thee, was good counsel, and yet not the best. Instead, Lincoln enjoined the captain, Quarrel not at all. The reasons Lincoln gave were practical. No man resolved to make the most of himself can spare time for personal contention. Still less can he afford to take all the consequences, including the vitiating of his temper and the loss of self-control. Yield larger things to which you can show no more than equal right, and yield lesser ones, though clearly your own. Better give your path to a dog than be bitten by him in contesting for the right. Even killing the dog would not cure the bite. Born in emotional and economic poverty, Lincoln early on resolved to make the most of himself, and did so, adhering to those precepts. Ancestry Like many exceptional children of unexceptional parents, Lincoln was quite curious about his ancestors, especially his grandfathers, neither of whom he knew. He was so intrigued that he planned to conduct genealogical research after he left the presidency. In 1858, when asked about his forebears, he revealed more than a passing acquaintance with his family tree. I believe the first of our ancestors we know anything about was Samuel Lincoln, who came from Norwich, England, in 1638, and settled in a small Massachusetts place called Hingham, or it might have been called Hangham. Lincoln loved wordplay. In two brief autobiographical sketches written for the campaign of 1860, he devoted much space to his lineage. The following year, Lincoln told a Yorkshireman that he planned to visit England, the home of his ancestors. His father's father was known as Captain Abraham, a rank he attained in 1776 while serving in the Virginia militia. Born in 1744 in Pennsylvania, the future captain moved with his father, John, and the rest of their family to the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia around 1766. They settled along Linville Creek in Augusta, later Rockingham County, where John Lincoln farmed a tract of 600 acres, one-third of which he sold to his son Abraham in 1773. The following year, Abraham participated in Lord Dunmore's expedition against the Shawnees, and during the Revolution he joined General Lachlan McIntosh's feudal campaign against Fort Detroit. For unknown reasons, in 1780, the captain departed with his wife and children on a 250-mile trek to the remote and dangerous Indian hunting grounds of Kentucky, while the Revolutionary War still raged and attacks on settlers were common. In 1784 alone, Indians killed more than a hundred migrants traveling the wilderness road from Virginia to Kentucky, which was little more than a trail first blazed by Daniel Boone in 1775. Perhaps Grandfather Abraham wished to avoid taxes, or he may have been lured westward by the prospect of easy gains in land speculation. His decision to sell a large farm in western Virginia for paper money showed bad judgment because the soil there was so fertile that German pioneer settlers had made the area highly productive. Captain Abraham's inability to thrive in Virginia suggests that he may have been shiftless. 
Captain Abraham died a violent death on the dark and bloody ground of frontier Kentucky. As a boy, the future president often heard this harrowing tale, which he called the legend more strongly than all others imprinted upon my mind and memory. Working his farm one spring day in 1786, the 42-year-old grandfather Abraham was ambushed by an Indian, who shot him dead before the terrified eyes of his young son, Thomas, father-to-be of the 16th president. As the Indian prepared to kidnap the lad, his older brother, Mordecai, dashed back to the family cabin, grabbed a rifle, aimed at the silver ornament dangling from the Indian's neck, and squeezed the trigger. Luckily for Thomas, his brother's aim was true and the boy escaped unharmed, at least physically. The Indian may have belonged to a tribe the captain had battled during his militia service. Lincoln's opinion of his namesake grandfather is not recorded, but he may well have admired him. Some gifted children with disappointing fathers romanticize their grandfathers, even if they scarcely knew them. In an 1861 speech to New Jersey legislators, Lincoln paid glowing tribute to the soldiers of the Revolution, and Captain Abraham may have been a lifelong source of inspiration to Lincoln as he strove to make the most of himself. In a campaign biography that Lincoln himself read and corrected, William Dean Howells asserted that his subject had the stubborn notion that because the Lincolns had always been people of excellent sense, he, a Lincoln, might become a person of distinction. What Lincoln knew about his other grandfather is hard to say. Lincoln once described him as a Virginia planter or a large farmer who took sexual advantage of a poor, credulous young woman named Lucy Hanks, granddaughter of William Lee, a plantation overseer accused of beating a slave to death. The fruit of that union was Nancy Hanks, mother of the future president. From this aristocratic progenitor, Lincoln believed that he inherited his power of analysis, his logic, his mental activity, his ambition, and all the qualities that distinguished him from the other members and descendants of the Hanks family. This grandfather's identity, unknown to history, may well have been known to Lincoln, who was acquainted with several members of the Hanks family, including two great aunts who had been born in Virginia before or during the Revolution, and also his great uncle Billy Hanks, father of Lincoln's rail splitting partner, John Hanks. The Hankses played a long lasting role in Lincoln's life, caring for his beloved stepmother until her death in 1869. It seems likely that the Hanks family would have shared with Abe what they knew about Nancy Hanks's father. Lincoln's description of his aristocratic grandsire represents a variation of the family romance phenomenon, which causes some children to speculate that they are actually the offspring of more distinguished parents than the ones who raised them. Most people outgrow these fantasies, but some adults, including exceptional people or men with very distant fathers, tend to maintain an unusually strong sense of family romance throughout life. Lincoln fits this category on both counts, for he was truly exceptional and had a distant relationship with his father. Father Thomas Lincoln's father, Thomas, was quite undistinguished. As his son later wrote, By the early death of his father and very narrow circumstances of his mother, even in childhood, Thomas was a wandering, laboring boy. Born around 1776 in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley, he moved with his parents and four siblings to Kentucky in 1780. Finding most land in the fertile bluegrass region already taken, the Lincolns pushed on to the hard scrabble terrain between the Cumberland and Green Rivers, where they established a farm. Later, evidently fearing hostile Indians in that remote locale, they moved to a site on Long Run in Jefferson County. There they lived in a stockade, 18 miles from Louisville. After Captain Abraham's death, his widow, Bathsheba, and their children resettled in Washington County, where they would be safer. Bathsheba later stayed with her daughter, Nancy, wife of William Brumfield, who owned a large farm near Hardensburg in Breckenridge County. After Bathsheba's son, Thomas, bought a farm in 1803 on Mill Creek, she and the Brumfields moved in. Three years later, the Brumfields purchased 225 acres a few miles to the north, where they built a log house. Bathsheba, 
the shrewdest and most intelligent member of the family, prodded both her rather lazy son-in-law and young Thomas, hiring the latter out for good wages. The documentary record reveals little about Thomas's activities in the decade after his father's death. Under the law of primogeniture, his eldest son, Mordecai, inherited everything from the paternal estate, which included a few hundred acres in Kentucky. Mordecai may have treated his younger brother unkindly. Emily Todd Helm, half-sister of Mary Todd Lincoln, said that the reason why Thomas Lincoln grew up unlettered was that his brother Mordecai, having all the land in his possession, turned Thomas out of the house when the latter was twelve years old, so he went out among his relations and the Berries and others, and there grew up. In 1795, Thomas served in the Kentucky militia for a month, and the following year he worked on a mill dam in Hardin County. While laboring there, he lived with his father's cousin, Hananiah Lincoln, a resident of Elizabethtown, 45 miles southwest of Louisville. Thomas and Hananiah remained in that village only until 1789, when they evidently headed south to Cumberland County. While in that region, Thomas spent time in Tennessee with his prosperous uncle, Isaac Lincoln, whose only child had died quite young. Thomas might have become a surrogate son, but Isaac disapproved of young Tom's indolence and improvidence. Returning to Kentucky the following year, Thomas shuttled back and forth between Washington and Cumberland counties. In 1802, he moved to Hardin County, where his name appeared on the tax lists for the next 14 years. In 1803, he purchased a 238-acre farm on Mill Creek, where he lived while working in nearby Elizabethtown, a hamlet whose population in 1810 numbered 181. How Thomas could afford to buy that farm is unclear. Perhaps his brother Mordecai shared some of his patrimony with him after Thomas attained his majority, or Thomas may have purchased the Mill Creek property with the savings his mother had set aside from the wages he earned when she hired him out. Three years after he bought the Mill Creek farm, Thomas journeyed to New Orleans. On June 12, 1806, shortly after returning from Louisiana, he married Nancy Hanks in a ceremony that took place near Poor Town in Washington County. Following a brief honeymoon, the newlyweds moved to Elizabethtown, where their first child, Sarah, was born less than eight months after her parents' wedding. A journalist described their residence as a shed, almost bare of household fittings and quite unfit for a human dwelling place. Why the couple did not live on the Mill Creek property is a mystery. Nancy, perhaps, wished to be closer to her family than to her husband's relatives. She may have been lonely in Elizabethtown, where she had no kin, and perhaps for that reason at the end of 1807, Thomas moved 14 miles to a rock-strewn spread in the Barrens, on the south fork of Nolan Creek, known as the Sinking Spring Farm. It was near the homestead where Thomas and Betsy Sparrow, who raised Nancy, lived with their foster child, Dennis Hanks and where Nancy's aunt, Polly Hanks' friend, had settled. Thomas gambled when he chose that site, for rather than a deed, he purchased a title bond, an assignment of someone's contested right to the land. He would own the property only if others met their financial obligations. Dennis Hanks, a cousin who lived with the Lincolns for three years during Abe's youth, reported that Thomas couldn't make a living by his trade of carpentry, there was scarcely any money in the country. So Tom took up some land, mighty poor land, but the best he could get when he hadn't much to trade for it. Thomas Lincoln may have left Elizabethtown for Nolan Creek because he believed his reputation as a carpenter had been damaged when an influential citizen sued him for shoddy work. The nearest settlement, two and a half miles to the south, was in the vicinity of Hodgins Mill, on February 12, 1809, in a cabin that an observer called a miserable habitation, Nancy delivered a baby boy, who was named Abraham, after Thomas's father. The Lincolns remained in Kentucky until 1816, when they removed to Indiana. There, Nancy Hanks Lincoln died two years later. Thomas remarried in 1819, and 11 years afterwards, he moved to Illinois or he would remain until his death in 1851. He had known more than his fair share of hardship and sorrow. 
Thomas Lincoln shared only a few things in common with his son. Both were able wrestlers, as well as good-natured, humorous, and gifted storytellers. A surviving example of Thomas's humor concerns his second wife, who allegedly remarked one day, We have lived together a long time, and you have never told me whom you like best, your first wife or me. He responded, Oh, now, Sarah, that reminds me of old John Harden down in Kentucky, who had a fine-looking pair of horses, and a neighbor coming in one day and looking at them said, John, which horse do you like best? John replied, I can't tell. One of them kicks, and the other bites, and I don't know which is worst. But the qualities that would make Abraham Lincoln famous, his intellectual power, ambition, idealism, eloquence, spirituality, integrity, political wisdom, judgment, leadership, were lacking in Thomas. Henry C. Whitney, to whom Lincoln described his childhood, said that from Thomas Lincoln, his son inherited only infancy, ignorance, and indigence. Few of Thomas's neighbors could remember anything special about him other than that he was a plain, unpretending, plodding man, a good, average man, who attended to his work, and was among the very commonest of the plain pioneers, honest and harmless, illiterate, yet always truthful, conscientious, and religious, and peaceable good. Thomas evidently could read a little, but was unable to write anything other than his signature. Unlike his tall, rangy son, Thomas was thick, weighing between 180 and 200 pounds. He was a bit stoop-shouldered, somewhat clumsy as he walked, and strong. Dennis Hanks found it remarkable that Thomas, though not a fleshy man, was built so compact that it was difficult to find or feel a rib in his body. Thomas had dark gray eyes, a low forehead, heavy eyebrows, a sharp chin, and an unusually big Roman nose, which was his most prominent feature. He was indifferent to clothes, and his taste in food was simple, two traits he also shared with his son. His whole appearance, said one neighbor, denoted a man of small intellect and less ambition, and such he was. If Thomas lacked intellectual power and driving ambition, he impressed people favorably as honest and sociable slow to take offense, with a lot of common sense. Though he seldom had a cross word for anyone, he did use profanity occasionally. When his young daughter repeated an oath of his, he received a scolding from his wife and never swore again. One day during his presidency, Lincoln used the expression, by jings, while visiting the telegraph office. When asked about that expression, he apologized to the operators for his profanity, explaining that, by jings is swearing, for my good old mother taught me that anything that had a by before it is swearing. When Lincoln's friend William G. Green visited Thomas in 1836, he found his manners backwoodsish, but was charmed by his wit and humor and thought him a mighty hospitable and a very entertaining host. For all his humor, Thomas could be taciturn and moody. He often became depressed and withdrew into himself, sometimes wandering out in the barrens for hours on end. Bouts of depression would hardly be surprising in a man who, as a boy, had witnessed his father's murder, and then endured wandering, rootless poverty, and hard labor. Other losses, recurring financial setbacks, and the deaths of his second son in 1813, of his wife in 1818, and of his daughter in 1828, deepened his dejection. He frequently said, Everything that I ever touched either died, got killed, or was lost. On other occasions he lamented, It's the hand of providence laid upon me. Thomas's susceptibility to depression may have been in part genetic. His brother Mordecai and his sons were known as men who at a time communed with themselves, absorbed in their own thoughts. Prone to melancholia, depression, and gloomy spells called the horrors, Mordecai allegedly would come into his mother's house and sit down for long periods of time without saying a word, unless it were to mutter an oath against something or curse somebody. He would sometimes take up his violin and pace the floor. 
The horrors resembled bouts of delirium tremens, and may in fact have been the result of heavy drinking. For he reportedly exercised the privilege very common in those days of indulging freely whenever he pleased, which happened very often. He also betrayed signs of paranoia, accusing Catholics of stealing his father's land, and over time his hatred of Roman priests intensified. Many other members of the family had moody spells. Mary Rowena Lincoln, mother of Thomas's nephew James Lincoln, was reportedly a victim of the Lincoln Hippo, that is, hypo or depression. Benjamin Mudd, son of Elizabeth Lincoln Mudd, suffered from what was called the Lincoln Horrors. An uncle of Thomas's confessed to a court that he suffered from a deranged mind. Another relative in the same area, Mary Jane Lincoln, was committed to the Illinois Hospital for the Insane after a court hearing in which a jury determined that the disease is with her hereditary. She had gone insane in 1854 at the age of 26, was committed to the state asylum in 1867, and died there 21 years later. Thomas Lincoln prospered neither as a carpenter nor a farmer. He learned woodworking from Nancy Hanks's uncle, Joseph Hanks Jr., and made his living as a cabinet and house carpenter until he wed. Thereafter, he supplemented his income by farming. His carpentry skills were so rudimentary that people called him a rough and cheap carpenter, who could only put doors, windows, and floors in log houses and do a tolerable job of joining. He continued working as a carpenter after he moved to Indiana, making tables, coffins, doors, and window casings. He worked when jobs came to him, but would not seek them out. Some customers were unhappy with his work. In 1807, Denton Gahagan of Elizabethtown refused to pay Thomas for hewing timbers for his sawmill. Some timbers were too short, others too long. Thomas sued for his fee and won. Thomas was even less successful as a farmer, partly because he chose unpromising land to till. The Nolan Creek property, birthplace of the future president, had poor soil except in a few small patches. When, in 1811, Thomas abandoned that farm, after the owner took title and refused to lease the property to him, he moved to equally unpromising terrain on Knob Creek, nine miles away. In 1816, he attempted to make a fresh start in Indiana, and, unwisely, selected 160 heavily timbered acres. He also built his cabin more than a mile from a reliable water source. He showed similarly bad judgment in Illinois in the 1830s and 1840s. Even if he had selected land more shrewdly, Thomas lacked the industry, ambition, and intellect to prosper. As Dennis Hanks put it, Thomas was a man who took the world easy and never thought that gold was God. Hanks' son-in-law was more blunt. Thomas, he declared, was very careless about his business, a poor manager, at times accumulated considerable property which he always managed to make way with about as fast as he made it, and was what is generally called an unlucky man in business. In 1835, Thomas and four partners leased a mill for a year, when they failed to pay the agreed-upon rent, they were successfully sued. Several times Thomas took boatloads of pork and other goods down the Mississippi River to New Orleans, usually making little money. In a particularly unfortunate transaction, he was cheated out of the entire load. His son Abraham described that calamity. Father often told me of the trick that was played upon him by a pair of sharpers. It was in 1815 the year before we moved from Kentucky to Indiana, that Father concluded to take a load of pork down to New Orleans. He had a considerable amount of his own, and he bargained with the relatives and neighbors for the pork. So, that altogether, he had quite a load. He took the pork to the Ohio River on a clumsily constructed flatboat of his own make. Almost as soon as he pushed out into the river, a couple of sleek fellows bargained with him for his cargo, and promised to meet him in New Orleans where they arranged to pay him the price agreed upon. He eagerly accepted the offer, transferred the cargo to the strangers, and drifted down the river, his head filled with visions of wealth and delight. He thought that he was going to accomplish what he had set out to do without labor or inconvenience. 
Father waited about New Orleans for several days, but failed to meet his whilom friends. At last it dawned upon him that he had been sold, and all that he could do was to come back home and face the music. Thomas Lincoln also lost money buying and selling farms, especially in Kentucky, where an archaic surveying system, which permitted claims to be identified by trees, stones, creek bends, and other such imprecise landmarks, produced chaos, leading to innumerable lawsuits. Kentucky law did not require a qualifying examination for surveyors, who reportedly were never correct except by accident. Years later, Lincoln recalled how Kentuckians used to be troubled with mysterious relics of feudalism, and titles got into such an almighty mess with these pettifogging encumbrances turning up at every fresh trading with the land, and no one knowing how to get rid of them. Because the size of the Mill Creek farm was unclear, Thomas was able to sell it for only 100 pounds, though he had paid 118 pounds for it a decade earlier. For $200, he purchased a title bond to the 300-acre Nolan Creek farm and lost it all, including the value of the improvements he had made on the property. He was ejected from the 30-acre Knob Creek farm, which he had leased, not purchased. Memories of his family's trouble with land titles may have predisposed Lincoln to become a surveyor and a lawyer. As an attorney, he advised young men aspiring to the bar, Never stir up litigation. A worse man can scarcely be found than one who does this. Who can be more nearly a fiend than he who habitually overhauls the register of deeds in search of defects and titles, whereon to stir up strife and put money in his pocket? Thomas fared just as badly in Indiana. First, he squatted on a 160-acre tract of government land for 10 months and then bought it, on credit, for $320. Thomas probably delayed making a down payment for the same reason that most pioneers did. Lack of cash. In 1817, he put down $80, but over the following decade, he made no further payments. In 1827, he relinquished half the farm, reducing his debt to $80, which he met by turning over to the government title to 80 acres in a distant county, a property that he had mysteriously acquired four weeks earlier. In 1830, he sold this $160 farm for $125. When, a decade later, Thomas found himself unable to meet obligations he had assumed for four parcels of Illinois land, his generous son Abraham gave him what amounted to a gift of $200 for a 50-acre tract that had cost Thomas only $50. Shortly thereafter, Abraham again rescued his father by paying off a mortgage that Thomas had assumed. Thomas made scant use of the land he occupied, usually clearing only a few acres for a garden and a corn patch. At Knob Creek, he cultivated only six acres along the creek in a strip about 40 feet wide on either side. He worked enough to sustain life, and no more. For the most part, Thomas avoided the market economy, remaining a subsistence farmer. He did, however, grow a little tobacco, which he peddled for ten cents a pound. On at least one occasion, he offered that commodity to satisfy a debt on a horse he had bought on credit. The creditor, impressed that a man would part with his tobacco to pay what he owed, forgave the ten dollars. According to Thomas's stepson-in-law, John J. Hall, Thomas Lincoln did not improve with age nor with increasing responsibilities. He was still the same kind and genial fellow, but grew more and more shiftless and good for nothing as the years rolled on. At the rocky Nolan Creek farm, Hall reported, he did not cultivate the soil nor fix up the old shanty. In Illinois, Tom, along with his stepson, John D. Johnston, and Johnston's five sons, tilled only 40 of their 120 acres. In an area where the average farm was worth $1,600, Tom valued his farm at $100 in the 1850 census, even though he was older than his neighbors, had had time to accumulate more property, and had a large number of family hands to work the land. Thomas ranked behind 79% of his neighbors in terms of wealth, George B. Balk, an Illinois neighbor, noted that while most farmers took their crops to market in a wagon, Tom Lincoln used a basket or a large tray. 
Balk characterized Thomas as uneducated, illiterate, and contented with a from-hand-to-mouth living. In sum, an excellent specimen of poor white trash, rough, lazy, and worthless. He owned a few sheep behind which he talked and walked slow. Balk added that several anecdotes of his ignorance and singularity might be related, but we forbear. Other neighbors agreed with Balk's assessment of Thomas Lincoln. In Indiana, Nathaniel Grigsby called Thomas a piddler, always doing, but doing nothing great. He wanted few things and supplied them easily. William E. Grigsby regarded Thomas as no account. Robert Mitchell Thompson of Kentucky, whose mother was a cousin of Nancy Hanks, reported that Thomas Lincoln was always poor and was all the time going hunting or roaming around, not satisfied to stay long in any one place. Still others testified that Thomas was rather indolent and improvident, had an aversion to work, and was careless and inert and dull. William G. Green spent time at the Lincoln's farm in Goose Nest Prairie in Coles County, Illinois, and observed that Thomas was barely able to eke out a living. Green found Thomas residing in a little cabin that cost perhaps fifteen dollars, and with many evidences of poverty about him. The cabin looked so small and humble that Green felt embarrassed. It had no stable, no outhouse, and no shrubbery or trees. An early historian of Coles County, who interviewed acquaintances of Thomas Lincoln, called him one of those easy, honest, commonplace men who took life as they find it, and, as a consequence, generally find it a life of poverty. He possessed no faculty whatever of preserving his money when he had made any, hence he always remained poor. He was easily contented, had few wants, and those of a primitive nature. He was a foe to intemperance, strictly honest, and supposing others the same, often suffered pecuniary losses. Sophie Hanks, who lived in the Lincoln family's Indiana cabin for several years, had a son who attributed Thomas's lack of ambition to frontier isolation. He was like the other people in that country. None of them worked to get ahead. There wasn't no market for nothing unless you took it across two or three states. The people raised just what they needed. Thomas preferred hunting to farming. Dennis Hanks recalled, We all hunted pretty much all the time, especially so when we got tired of work, which was very often, I will assure you. Such behavior was common on the Midwestern frontier. A Northeasterner who moved to central Illinois described the inhabitants there as destitute of any energy or enterprise, and their labors and attention being chiefly confined to the hunting of game. In sketches of pioneer life in that same locale, Francis Grierson portrayed a representative farmer, Zach Caverly, who explained, My old daddy learnt me to go through this sorrowing veil like the varmints do, easy and natural-like never gallopin' when you can lope, and never lopin' when you can lie down. It's a heap easier. Thomas, in short, was a classic southern backcountry cracker, a term originating in northern Britain. Often of Celtic background, crackers were famously easygoing, improvident, unacquisitive, lazy, and restless. They preferred to spend their days hunting, fishing, and loafing, rather than farming. They had little use for education and were often illiterate. Their folkways and culture derived largely from Northern England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, Cornwall, and the Hebrides. Abraham Lincoln's view of his father's indolence is unrecorded, but he did scold his stepbrother John D. Johnston for that flaw in letters that may reflect his attitude not only toward Johnston, but also toward Thomas Lincoln. In 1848, when Johnston asked him for a loan, Lincoln declined, saying, At the various times when I have helped you a little, you have said to me, We can get along very well now, but in a very short time I find you in the same difficulty again. Now this can only happen by some defect in your conduct. What that defect is, I think I know. You are not lazy, and still you are an idler. I doubt whether since I saw you, you have done a good whole day's work in any one day. 
You do not very much dislike so to work, and still you do not work much, merely because it does not seem to you that you could get much for it. This habit of uselessly wasting time is the whole difficulty, and it is vastly important to you, and still more so your children, that you should break this habit. When Johnston, who was born tired, proposed to leave Illinois for Missouri, Lincoln scolded him in language that could well have applied to his peripatetic father. Such a notion is utterly foolish. What can you do in Missouri better than here in Illinois? Is the land any richer? Can you there, any more than here, raise corn and wheat and oats without work? Will anybody there, any more than here, do your work for you? If you intend to go to work, there is no better place than right where you are. If you do not intend to go to work, you cannot get along anywhere. Squirming and crawling about from place to place can do no good. You have raised no crop this year, and what you really want is to sell the land, get the money, and spend it. Part with the land you have, and my life upon it, you will never after own a spot big enough to bury you in. Half you will get for the land you spend in moving to Missouri, and the other half you will eat and drink, and wear out, and no foot of land will be bought. Now I feel it is my duty to have no hand in such a piece of foolery. Thomas Lincoln's indolence, lack of ambition, and disdain for education put him at odds with his smart, enterprising son. Thomas, Abraham said, grew up literally without education, and never did more in the way of writing than to bunglingly sign his own name. This patronizing language lends credence to the testimony of Dennis Hanks, who called Lincoln a mother's boy, and doubted whether Abe loved his father very well or not, and concluded, I don't think he did. The feeling was mutual. According to Augustus H. Chapman, Dennis Hanks's son-in-law, Thomas Lincoln never showed by his actions that he thought much of his son Abraham when a boy. He treated him rather unkind, and always appeared to think much more of his stepson, John D. Johnston, than he did of his own son Abraham. This preference is not surprising, for Thomas shared much in common with his improvident stepson. Lincoln's aversion to his father persisted into adulthood. He never once invited Thomas or his wife to Springfield during the entire 24-year span Lincoln lived there. He rarely lent money to his cash-strapped sire. When his law practice took him near his father's home in Coles County, Illinois, Lincoln stayed with Dennis Hanks, rather than under the paternal roof. As Thomas lay dying in 1851, his 41-year-old son refused his deathbed appeal for a visit. Lincoln icily enjoined his stepbrother to tell their father that if we could meet now, it is doubtful whether it would not be more painful than pleasant. After Thomas died, Lincoln failed to attend the funeral, nor did he have a tombstone placed on the grave. Lincoln did not name a son after his father until after Thomas's death. He belittled his father when, referring to one of Thomas's brothers, he told a friend, I have often said that Uncle Mord had run off with all the talents of the family. Lincoln's estrangement stemmed not just from Thomas's emotional reserve, painful though it may have been. More deeply wounding was his father's cold and inhuman treatment of him. Caroline Dahl, who spoke with William H. Herndon, Lincoln's law partner and biographer, in 1866, and spent three days examining the biographical materials he had accumulated, said Thomas Lincoln ill-treated Abraham to such an extent that he drove him from home. Augustus H. Chapman deplored Thomas's great barbarity in dealing with his boy. Dennis Hanks recalled that Thomas would whip young Abe for minor indiscretions. Sometimes Abe was a little rude, Hanks testified. When strangers would ride along and up to his father's fence, Abe always, through pride and to tease his father, would be sure to ask the stranger the first question, for which his father would sometimes knock him a rod. Thomas Lincoln would pick up a big clod and knock little Abe off the fence, crying, Let older people have the first say, will you, boy? Whenever he was whipped by his father, he never bawled, but dropped a kind of silent, unwelcome tear, as evidence of his sensations, or other feelings. 
Thomas avoided whipping or scolding his son in front of visitors, but would administer punishment after they had left. One day, a poor neighbor named Jenkins, who usually went barefoot, called on the Lincolns. Abe greeted him heartily. Hello, Mr. Jenkins. You are doing better than you used to. You have a new pair of boots. Thomas took his son aside and gave Abe a little drilling, because his remarks may have wounded Jenkins' feelings. Well, said Abe, he's got the boots. Lincoln's cousin Sophie Hanks always said that the worst trouble with Abe was when people was talking. If they said something that wasn't right, Abe would up and tell them so. Uncle Tom had a hard time to break him of this. She also recalled how Lincoln very often would correct his father in talking when his father was telling how anything happened and if he didn't tell it just right or left out anything, Abe would butt in right there and correct it. Thomas would then slap the lad. Abe was physically punished for other kinds of misbehavior, too. He received a beating, for instance, when he released a bear cub from one of Thomas's traps. Lincoln's father regarded physical strength as sufficient to make a manly man and thought time spent on schooling was wasted. He would slash Abe for neglecting his work by reading. Sometimes he even threw out the boy's books. Five years after Lincoln, at the age of 22, left his father's home, Thomas Lincoln scoffed, I suppose that Abe is still fooling himself with education. I tried to stop it, but he got that fool idea in his head and it can't be got out. Now, I ain't had no education, but I get along far better than if I had. Thomas then showed how he kept his accounts by marking a rafter with a piece of coal and proudly declared, That there's a heap better in your education. He added that, If Abe don't fool away all this time on his books, he may make something yet. Mother Nancy Lincoln's estrangement from his father is well documented, but little is known about his relationship with his mother, who died when Abe was just nine years old. In fact, little is known about her at all. She was born in Virginia around 1783 or 1784. Accounts of her appearance differ widely. Her complexion was variously described as dark, sandy, pale, and exceedingly fair, while her hair was deemed light by some and dark by most. Her eyes were evidently hazel, though one observer described her as a heavy-built, squatty woman. Most people remembered her as taller than average. One estimate placed her at six feet. She had a spare, delicate frame, weighed about 120 pounds, and was not at all good-looking, with a face sharp and angular, high forehead, and rather coarse features that gave her the appearance of a laboring woman. A minister who interviewed people who knew the Lincolns in Indiana said she was about five feet ten inches tall, bony, angular, and lean, with long arms, large ears, nose, and mouth, small gray-blue eyes, and a big head and a long stringy neck. Her cheekbones were high, and her chest was sunken. Nancy Hanks was evidently an intelligent, kind woman. Her son called her intellectual and a woman of genius. Dennis Hanks agreed, praising her quick perception and good memory. Nathaniel Grigsby said she was noted throughout the family for her strong mind and was a brilliant woman, far superior to her husband in every way. She was notably affectionate and displayed tenderness, charity, and love to the world. Her cheerful disposition and active habits were a dower to the pioneers with whom she lived, she also enjoyed a reputation for outdoing all the local women at spinning flax. At camp meetings, the deeply religious Nancy would shout in an attempt to get others to repent. She was not very sociable, however. She did not talk much, nor did she visit with her neighbors. They, in turn, stopped coming to see her because she did not return their calls. Her lack of sociability may have been linked to her apparent sadness, even depression. Neighbors remembered her sad appearance and observed that she was rather gloomy. Her son Abraham, her relative John Hanks, and Indiana neighbors all commented on her melancholy. A Kentuckian attributed her depression and aloofness to gossip. 
People talked about her sometimes, and that depressed her, hurt her. Those hurtful rumors perhaps concerned the unchaste ways of Nancy's mother, Lucy Hanks, who bore Nancy out of wedlock in Virginia and was later charged with fornication in Kentucky. At first, Lucy turned baby Nancy over to her own parents. Later, the youngster was raised by her childless aunt and uncle, Thomas and Elizabeth Sparrow. She also lived for a time with Richard Berry and his wife, Polly Ewing Berry, friends of Thomas Lincoln. Her mother's lack of interest in her may have predisposed Nancy to depression. That she was base-born was well known in Indiana, and probably common knowledge in Kentucky, too. Questions were raised about Nancy Hanks's chastity as well as her mother's. Polly Richardson, a neighbor of the Lincolns in both Kentucky and Indiana, told her daughter that not only was Nancy Hanks an illegitimate child herself, but that Nancy was not what she ought to have been, that she was loose. Among the people who believed this of Nancy, Judge Alfred M. Brown of Elizabethtown reported that Rumor says that Nancy Hanks had one child before she married Thomas Lincoln, a son, the father of whom was Isaac Friend. Others called her of low character, a woman who did not bear a very virtuous name. William H. Herndon believed that Nancy Hanks fell in Kentucky about 1805, fell when unmarried, fell afterward. According to Herndon, the reputation of Mrs. Lincoln is that she was a bold, reckless, daredevil kind of a woman, stepping to the very verge of propriety. Nancy Hanks's wayward behavior may have inspired the story that in a fair wrestle she could throw most of the men who ever put her powers to the test. Jack Thomas, clerk of the Grayson County Court, alleged that he had frequently wrestled with her, and she invariably laid him on his back. Nancy's courtship with Thomas Lincoln raised some eyebrows. At the time they met, she was living in the home of a woman on South Fork Creek where Thomas Lincoln often came to visit. The young couple would take extensive trips to attend camp meetings and would stay out quite late, scandalizing the neighborhood. Finally, the woman with whom Nancy was staying scolded Thomas for such nocturnal adventures. This reprimand may have prompted Nancy to move temporarily to Washington County and later to marry Tom there, instead of in her adopted home. Other sources, perhaps describing the same woman, testified that Nancy lived with various families in Bourbon County, sewing, weaving, and doing domestic work, and that while there she was courted by Thomas Lincoln, whose shiftless character caused her friends to think him not worthy of her. A neighbor unrelated to Nancy, a good, kind old lady, a motherly sort of woman, took a great interest in Nancy and grew upset because the young woman got herself talked about from allowing this shiftless linkhorn to wait on her. The woman persuaded Nancy to go to Washington County with some of her relatives in the Barry family, who were attending a camp meeting nearby. She agreed, but if the plan was to get her away from Tom Lincoln, it failed, for he clambered into the wagon and accompanied her. Some felt that Nancy was not a wanton woman, but a victim of idle gossip. Nancy Lincoln Brumfield, Thomas Lincoln's sister, asserted that Nancy Hanks was more sinned against than sinning. Mrs. Brumfield explained that Nancy visited Elizabethtown when Tom Lincoln was absent, causing tongues to wag. County folk in that era believed that women should remain at home and work. William H. Herndon observed that the noblest of women can lose their character quickly in a little village or in a new and sparsely settled country. Everybody knows everybody, and a man's business is the business of the whole community. Such people love to tattle and lie about one another. Stories about Nancy's unsavory reputation, accurate or not, evidently reached the ears of her son, Abe, and made him ashamed of her and of her family. Herndon described Lincoln's melancholy in part to his sensitivity about the origin and chastity of his near and dear relations, and speculated that Lincoln may have felt suicidal because of the knowledge of his mother's origin. Lincoln was informed of all this, Herndon believed. Probably it was thrown up to him in Indiana. Herndon reported that Lincoln remembered the scorn of her neighbors. J. Edward Murr, an Indianan, 
who interviewed several Hoosier acquaintances of the Lincolns, speculated that Abraham early knew that his mother was an illegitimate, and this troubled him. Lincoln described his grandmother Lucy as a halfway prostitute, and acknowledged that his relations were lascivious, lecherous, not to be trusted. Lucy Hanks's sister Nancy had a bastard, Dennis Hanks, and Lucy's daughter Sarah bore six illegitimate children. It was no wonder that in Indiana the Hankses were known as a peculiar people, not chaste. Herndon contended that although Lincoln was ashamed of his mother and other Hankses, he did praise her one day around 1850 as the two men were riding in a buggy. All that I am or hope ever to be I get from my mother, God bless her. Often misinterpreted as a sentimental pean to Nancy Hanks, that statement was in fact a tribute to the genes she passed on to Abraham from her aristocratic father. Lincoln confided to Herndon that his mother was a bastard, the daughter of a nobleman, so-called of Virginia. My mother's mother was poor and credulous, etc., and she was shamefully taken advantage of by the man. My mother inherited his qualities, and I hers. Lincoln asked Herndon, Did you ever notice that bastards are generally smarter, shrewder, and more intellectual than others? Herndon explained that when Lincoln spoke to me as he did, he had reference to his mother's mind, nothing else. In 1887, Herndon wrote that Lincoln believed the father of Nancy Hanks is no other than a Virginia planter, large farmer of the highest and best blood of Virginia, and it is just here that Nancy got her good, rich blood, tinged with genius. Mr. Lincoln told me that she was a genius, and that he got his mind from her. If she had been given a decent upbringing, Herndon recalled Lincoln telling him, she must have flourished anywhere. But, as it was, she was rude and rough. She could not be held to forms and methods of things, and yet she was a fine woman, naturally. It is quite possible that a knowledge of her origin made her defiant and desperate. She was very sensitive, sad sometimes, gloomy. Then Herndon continued, Lincoln often thought of committing suicide, why? Did the knowledge of his mother's origin, or his own, press the thought of suicide upon him? Who will weigh the force of such an idea, as illegitimacy on a man and woman, especially when that man or woman is very sensitive, such as Lincoln was? Whatever the accuracy of Herndon's account, which some scholars doubt, the great weight of the evidence supports the conclusion that Nancy Hanks was illegitimate, that her son knew it, and that most likely Lincoln was aware of his maternal grandfather's identity. A campaign biographer of Lincoln, John Locke Scripps, reported that his subject communicated some facts to me concerning his ancestry which he did not wish to have published. Scripps was probably alluding to Lincoln's knowledge of his mother's illegitimacy. In the 1890s, eleven Hoosiers who knew Lincoln and several children of other Indiana acquaintances of Lincoln told J. Edward Murr that Nancy Hanks was born out of wedlock. Her niece Sophie also asserted that Nancy was illegitimate. Lincoln may have harbored negative feelings for his mother. At the age of 29, he made one of the few surviving allusions to her. It was not positive. Describing a woman whom he had courted, he said that after a long separation, when I beheld her, I could not for my life avoid thinking of my mother, and this not from withered features, for her skin was too full of fat to permit its contracting into wrinkles, but from her want of teeth and weather-beaten appearance in general. Lincoln failed to mark his mother's grave with a stone. In 1844, while campaigning in Indiana, he told Redmond Grigsby that he would return soon and wanted to have his mother's gravesite fixed up. But, Grigsby reported, Lincoln got absorbed in politics and was never able to get away. In 1860, Lincoln informed Nathaniel Grigsby that he would return to Indiana and place a monument on his mother's grave. Four years later, a resident of Spencer County offered to do so if Lincoln would authorize it. A few weeks before his death, Lincoln allegedly wrote a friend in Gentryville, saying that 
In the coming summer he intended to visit the locality and make provision for procuring a testimonial of his affection for his mother. Nothing came of these good intentions. Little is known about Nancy Hanks Lincoln's treatment of her son. She evidently dealt out corporal punishment, for when young Abe fell into Knob Creek one summer day and nearly drowned, he feared that his mother might find out and thrash him. To escape her wrath, he dried his wet garments in the sun. Nancy Hanks Lincoln, like many of her neighbors, seems to have been an indifferent housekeeper. A woman settler in frontier Illinois attributed the prevalence of squalid cabins to the incapacity of the mistress of the family to appreciate a better condition or help to create one. The typical Midwestern frontier cabin was described by an English traveler as a miserable little log hole. The Lincoln's sinking spring abode fit this description. It had a dirt floor and was sparsely furnished, with rough stools serving for chairs. Four legs inserted into a huge puncheon formed the table. Beds were fashioned from planks placed atop poles, which were secured in holes bored in the wall. The dishes were pewter and tin, and the sole cooking utensils were a Dutch oven and a skillet. Only when Thomas Lincoln's second wife, Sarah Bush Johnston, arrived in 1819, did life become less crude for Abe and his sister. Sarah brought a bureau, bed, knives, forks, cooking utensils, and other amenities, as well as a determination to see that a floor was laid, that windows were cut into the walls and covered with greased paper, that the ceiling was painted, and that other improvements were made. If she could persuade Thomas Lincoln to spruce up their abode, it is noteworthy that Nancy failed to do so. Nancy Hanks Lincoln was content to live in the primitive manner that Thomas favored, never opposing him on any matter. Catering to his simple taste in food, she would walk miles to the nearest mill to have corn ground or to purchase bacon, which, along with cornmeal, mush, or johnny cake, formed the staple of the family diet. Nancy may have been casual in her approach to child-rearing. A Kentuckian who grew up near Lincoln recalled that in pioneer days, boys were men, their mothers turned them out to go when they got their diapers off, and they had to root hog or die and they got so they could take care of themselves pretty soon. A boy that could not plow when he was eight was not much of a boy, and all of them had to do it, and they did not whine about it. When they got orders, they obeyed them very promptly, and they did not do much talking. Lincoln might have felt neglected, even abandoned, if his mother raised him in this laissez-faire manner. He almost certainly felt abandoned when she died in 1818, leaving nine-year-old Abe with his sister, and his unsympathetic father. He may have concluded that his mother did not love him. William Herndon and Jesse Wyke, both citing a source, maintained that after Nancy's death and the remarriage of Thomas to Sarah Bush Johnston, her newly adopted children, for the first time perhaps, realized the benign influence of a mother's love. Frontier Poverty Lincoln was ashamed not only of his family background, but also of the poverty in which he grew up. When John Locke Scripps interviewed him in 1860, Lincoln expressed reluctance to communicate the homely facts and incidents of his early life. He seemed to be painfully impressed with the extreme poverty of his early surroundings, the utter absence of all romantic and heroic elements, and even questioned the proposal to have a biography written. Why, Scripps, said Lincoln, it is a great piece of folly to attempt to make anything out of my early life. It can all be condensed into a single sentence, and that sentence you can find in Gray's Elegy. The Short and Simple Annals of the Poor That's my life, and that's all you or anyone else can make of it. To a close friend, Lincoln described the stinted living in Kentucky and pretty pinching times in Indiana. In 1846, he referred to the very poor neighborhood where he grew up in Indiana. Fourteen years later, he was asked to speak to some homeless and friendless boys in New York. In recounting this event, he recalled his own boyhood. I thought of the time when I had been pinched by terrible poverty, and so I told them that I had been poor, that I remembered when my toes stuck out through my broken shoes in winter, when my arms were out at the elbows when I shivered with the cold. 
Lincoln did not exaggerate the deprivation he had known as a child. In Kentucky, his family's neighbors regarded them as quite poor, in fact, among the very poorest people. One of those neighbors remembered the Lincoln family living in abject poverty, characterized Thomas Lincoln as the poorest man that ever kept house, and maintained that Nancy Hanks Lincoln was a good woman whose only fault was that she was very poor. She would walk miles to do laundry at the homes of more prosperous Kentuckians. At the time of Lincoln's birth in 1809, the family lived in dire poverty, a neighbor recorded. Dennis Hanks, who observed the Lincolns in Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois, described Thomas as a very poor man. Hanks's obituarist said of Hardin County in the early 19th century, It is scarcely possible to exaggerate the rudeness of the society of that time and locality, or the primitive character of the people, and there is an overabundance of testimony that the two families, the Lincolns and the Hankses, were below rather than above the average. All the testimony indicates that the families were of the class known as poor whites. It was the same in Indiana, where one of Lincoln's sympathetic neighbors, Elizabeth Crawford, invited Abraham's sister Sarah to live in her home. The girl paid for her board by performing housework until she married a year later. When Mrs. Crawford called at the Lincoln home, they had little to offer guests other than raw sweet potatoes, which surprised her. It was not in keeping with the hospitable customs of the frontier. Elizabeth's husband, Josiah Crawford, hired Thomas Lincoln and young Abe to do chores, even though they were poor help, because he took pity on them. Others had similar memories of the Lincoln's poverty in Indiana, where they passed for honest people but were very poor. A neighbor there recalled that Lincoln's folks were awfully poor. A was not invited to Elizabeth Ray Grigsby's wedding feast because, unlike other neighbors, he lacked appropriate clothing. At the age of twenty, when he tried to buy ready-made shoes on credit, he was mortified when told to come back when he could pay for them. James Grigsby, Sarah Lincoln's brother-in-law, often told his daughter how poor the Lincoln family was. A Hoosier from Rockport called the Lincolns very poor. A resident of Boonville testified that the hardships of the Lincoln family were extreme. Several other Indianans who had known Lincoln asserted that the poverty of the Lincolns was extreme. J. Edward Muir claimed that he could detail a number of incidents touching upon the poverty, not to say the extreme want of the Lincolns. Muir cited the extreme poverty of his parents as a reason why Lincoln could not be considered a typical Kentuckian. Similarly, Joseph D. Armstrong, who during the 1860s and 1870s gathered information about the Lincolns in Indiana, concluded that Thomas was a very poor man and that Abe's life was one of hard labor and great privation. Lincoln commented wryly on the poverty of his family one evening as his father pronounced the customary blessing over dinner which that day consisted of a small dish of roasted potatoes. Abe called them very poor blessings. Given the economic and emotional poverty he endured in his early years, it is no wonder that Lincoln, according to his good friend Joseph Gillespie, felt very strongly that there was more of discomfort than real happiness in human existence under the most favorable circumstances. To an Illinois neighbor, Lincoln confided, I have seen a good deal of the backside of this world. Old Kentucky Homes Cut off by a 75-mile-long escarpment misleadingly named Muldraw Hill, the isolated area of Kentucky where Lincoln spent his first seven years was exceedingly provincial, with few towns, only primitive churches, and virtually no schools. This Penny Royal area got its name because its soil was so poor that nothing but the Penny Royal weed could thrive there. In these backwoods, social life was crude, marred by excessive drinking and savage fighting. Kentuckians fought for the most trivial reasons, if any at all. Often the combatants were merely testing each other's strength, about which they liked to boast. They used their teeth, knees, head, and feet, as well as fists, as they punched, kicked, scratched, and bit their opponents. They also gouged each other's eyes with thumbs and fingers. 
Lincoln was born at Sinking Creek Farm, an unpromising homestead of infertile ground nestled among unproductive ridges. It was a place for a poet, in the opinion of a leading Kentucky historian, Thomas D. Clark, but not for a practical farmer who had to grub a living for a growing family from the soil. Others described it as a sterile tract of land, almost destitute of timber, and broken barren land. The neighborhood was thinly settled. The 36-square-mile tax district where the Lincoln Farm was located contained 85 taxpayers, 44 slaves, and 392 horses. When Abe was two, his family moved a few miles northeast to a valley that penetrated Muldraws Hill. This Knob Creek spread was not ideal farmland, with its bottomless hollows, deep ravines, and steep conical hills called knobs. Remote, small, and subject to flooding, it was much less desirable than the farm they were leaving. Thomas may have been drawn to Knob Creek by its proximity to a ferry and inn, which made it more appealing than the lonely barrens along Nolan Creek. Perhaps he valued the abundance of timber fringing the creek. In any event, the move was uncomplicated. Thomas had two horses and only a few possessions to haul. Little is known of Lincoln's Kentucky years. One of his earliest memories was of the Knob Creek farm. Reminiscing in 1864, he recalled, Our farm was composed of three fields. It lay in the valley surrounded by high hills and deep gorges. Sometimes when there came a big rain in the hills, the water would come down through the gorges and spread all over the farm. The last thing that I remember doing there was one Saturday afternoon, the other boys planted the corn in what we called the big field. It contained seven acres, and I dropped the pumpkin seeds. I dropped two seeds in every other hill and every other row. The next Sunday morning there came a big rain in the hills. It did not rain a drop in the valley, but the water coming down through the gorges washed ground, corn, pumpkin seeds, and all clear off the field. This episode may have been memorable to Lincoln because it represented, in miniature, the futile farming career of his father. Lincoln's only other recorded reminiscence of his Kentucky youth dates from the War of 1812. I had been fishing one day and caught a little fish, which I was taking home. I met a soldier in the road, and, having been always told at home that we must be good to the soldiers, I gave him my fish. Abe's First Seven Years Abe had a reputation as a quiet, bashful, polite boy who liked solitude and was rather noted for keeping his clothes cleaner longer than any others. He was also described as the shyest, most reticent, most uncouth and awkward-appearing, homeliest and worst-dressed boy in the neighborhood. He often served as a peacemaker, helping settle disagreements. Abe was also regarded as a good wrestler, though he would not fight unless he had to. One day, in the shade of a big tree at the mill, he was attacked without provocation or warning by a bigger boy, who was supported by two friends. Onlookers were astonished when Lincoln whipped each of them in succession and challenged any others who wished to do battle. Lincoln's pastimes were shaped by his rural surroundings. He liked fishing and hunting with his dog. When the dog would run a rabbit into a hollow tree, Abe used his axe to chop it out. The future president nearly drowned crossing Knob Creek over a foot log. He lost his balance, fell in, and had to be rescued by a friend, Austin Gallagher. Abe and Gallagher improvised their play. Whatever they did, Lincoln delighted in excelling. Lincoln remembered Gallagher and many other Kentuckians fondly. During the Civil War, he asked a resident of the Bluegrass State about the Cessnas, Brownfields, Friends, Ashcrafts, and Kirkpatricks. He expressed a special interest in Gallagher, declaring, I would rather see Gallagher than any man living. Lincoln then told a scatological story about a prank the two had played as boys. In Kentucky, Abe briefly attended a school taught by Zachariah Riney, a pious Roman Catholic who was popular with students and respected for his character and education. In later years, Lincoln always spoke of him in terms of grateful respect and remembered that Riney made no effort to proselytize his small scholars. On the first day of class, Abe appeared wearing a long one-piece Lindsay shirt, 
and, improbably, a sunbonnet. He returned home weeping because his schoolmates teased him. To spare him further humiliation, his mother braided a more masculine straw hat. The windowless, dirt-floored schoolhouse, situated about three miles from the Lincoln's cabin, was made of rough logs forming little niches where the youngsters played hide-and-seek. Later, Abe was a pupil of his neighbor, Caleb Hazel, a young man with a rudimentary education who ran a school four or five miles from the Lincoln's cabin. Like most other frontier instructors, Hazel taught by subscription, starting up a school when enough parents were willing to pay sufficient sums to make it worthwhile. A friend said Hazel could perhaps teach spelling, reading, and indifferent writing, and perhaps could cipher to the rule of three, but had no other qualifications of a teacher except large size and bodily strength to thrash any boy or youth that came to his school. This last quality was necessary on the frontier, where schoolboys occasionally assaulted their teachers. Thrashings were sometimes administered with switches resembling ox goads, five feet long and quite thick. Once Hazel sent Abe to cut a switch to be used on a classmate, an errand he disliked because, as Gallagher put it, he never wanted to see anybody punished. Hazel used only a spelling book, and when the more advanced pupils finished it, he would start them over again on one-syllable words. Lincoln went to Hazel more to keep his sister company than to learn much himself, but he did manage to master his letters and a little spelling. Lincoln's brief experience with Caleb Hazel was typical of frontier education at the time, a rough cabin staffed by a scarcely educated teacher, using a scant supply of rudimentary books, and relying on recitations and liberal doses of harsh physical discipline. Good students were sometimes rewarded with a swig of whiskey or a chaw of tobacco. Years later, Lincoln described the educational system he had known. There were some schools, so-called, but no qualification was ever required of a teacher beyond reading, writing, and ciphering to the rule of three. If a straggler supposed to understand Latin happened to sojourn in the neighborhood, he was looked upon as a wizard. The rule of three was the means for solving problems involving proportions, where the student was given three numbers in a proportion and asked to calculate the fourth. Thirty-four is to fifteen, as seven is to X. What is the value of X? Lincoln's schooling, at least in the alphabet, may have begun at home. Nancy Hanks Lincoln could not write but was able to read. She often read to her children from the Bible, much to Abe's delight. Her foster parents, Thomas and Elizabeth Sparrow, seemed to care about literacy. They made their other foster child, Dennis Hanks, into the best educated member of the family. He could write as well as read. It is probably to the Sparrow's credit that Nancy was regarded as better educated than most girls in the area. Her son, as an adult, would demonstrate intimate familiarity with Scripture. It is not clear how literate Abe was when he left Kentucky. Zachariah Riney's daughter said that Abe learned to read well at the first session of her father's school. An Indiana playmate and William Makepeace Thayer, who interviewed many of Lincoln's friends, both alleged that Lincoln could read before he turned eight. John Locke Scripps asserted that Lincoln could also write by that age. More modestly, William Dean Howells, in his 1860 campaign biography, claimed that Lincoln had only acquired the alphabet and the rudiments of education while in the bluegrass state. Dennis Hanks stated flatly, Abe read no books in Kentucky. In Backwoods, Kentucky, the churches and preachers were as primitive as the schools and teachers. There were three major varieties of religion. Very ignorant Baptists, very noisy Methodists, and very dogmatic Presbyterians. The two Baptist ministers whom the Lincoln family knew best, William Downs and David Elkin, hardly served as models of Christian decorum. The bibulous, disorderly, lazy, and slovenly Downs founded the Little Mount Church only after the Rolling Fork congregation had expelled him. Elkin was hard-drinking, ignorant, impoverished, indolent, and dressed sloppily. Elkin's grandson testified that, when my grandfather went to preaching, 
He did not know but one letter in the alphabet, and that was the letter O, and he knew it because it was round. Nancy and Thomas belonged to Baptist churches in Kentucky and Indiana, and their home library contained a catechism as well as a Bible. According to John Locke's scripts, the pioneers were glad of an opportunity to hear a sermon, whether delivered by one of their own religious faith or not. Thus it was, at least with the father and mother of young Lincoln, who never failed to attend with their family upon religious worship. They gladly received the word, caring less for the doctrinal tenets of the preacher than for the earnestness and zeal with which he enforced practical godliness. In 1816, Thomas Lincoln decided to relocate to Indiana. His brother, Josiah, his second cousins, Austin and Davis Lincoln, his friend, James Carter, the widow and children of Hananiah Lincoln, and Nancy Hanks' uncle, Joseph Hanks, all lived there. Thomas joined a chain migration from the Rolling Fork of the Salt River in Kentucky to Little Pigeon Creek in southwestern Indiana. Migrants from all over Kentucky poured into Indiana after the War of 1812, when Indian tribes surrendered claims to the southern half of the territory. Kentucky had taken Indiana without firing a shot, Wags quipped. The head of the government land office in Vincennes reported that in 1817, the year Thomas Lincoln entered his claim for 160 acres there, the applications were so numerous that it was impossible to record them as rapidly as they came in. Troubles besetting Thomas in Kentucky strengthened the lure of Indiana. In February 1816, an ejectment suit filed against him threatened to force him off his rented Knob Creek Acres. Having already lost money on his Mill Creek and Sinking Spring farms because of imperfect titles, Thomas at first retained a lawyer to fight the suit, but abruptly changed his mind. In May, a court instructed him to ascertain that the road from Mildraws Hill through Knob Creek Valley was maintained properly. That order may have helped persuade him to leave. Unusually bad weather later in the year might have also influenced Thomas. Winter came early to Hardin County in 1816, with frost appearing as early as the end of July. By September, ice a quarter inch thick covered the ground. The temperature did not rise above freezing in October and November was bitterly cold. Thomas cobbled together a flatboat, loaded it with his tools and barrels of whiskey, his meager capital, left Nancy and the children at Knob Creek, and shoved off for the Ohio River. Before reaching it, his raft capsized, pitching whiskey, tools, and sailor into the rolling fork. After salvaging some of his cargo with the help of friendly onlookers, Thomas continued his journey, crossing the Ohio River at Thompson's Ferry. Aided by Francis Posey, who hauled his goods for him in an ox-drawn wagon, Thomas hacked his way through an Indiana forest choked with grapevines and underbrush. The vines were so dense, a knife could be driven into the tangle all the way up to the handle. At one point, it took several days to chop through just 18 miles of forest. Thomas, whose whole life was a struggle, said that he never passed through a harder experience than he did going from Thompson's Ferry to Spencer County, Indiana. Thomas was uncertain where to stake his claim. He was looking for familiar terrain, and like other settlers, wanted to avoid commercial arteries like the Ohio River. A friendly pioneer, William Wood, recommended the site that Thomas chose for his cabin, and promised to guard Thomas's possessions while he fetched his family. In an 1860 autobiographical sketch, Abraham Lincoln declared that his family's move was partly on account of slavery, but chiefly on account of the difficulty in land titles in Kentucky. Some have inferred from this statement that Thomas Lincoln ardently opposed slavery, but that seems unlikely. Lincoln told others that his father moved in order to improve his standard of living. Dennis Hanks scoffed at the idea that Tom had left Kentucky because of slavery. It is untrue, said Hanks. He moved to better his condition. Slavery did not operate on him. In 1866, E. R. Burba of Hodgenville reported that, I have never heard that slavery was any cause of his leaving Kentucky, and think quite likely it was not, for there were very few slaves in the whole country round here then. 
In Kentucky, Thomas had served without apparent qualms on a slave patrol, a kind of informal police headed by a captain empowered to whip slaves found away from their owners without a pass. Lincoln's campaign year remark, this removal was partly on account of slavery, may have been made for political consumption. It may also have referred to Thomas's dislike of a social system that afforded little upward mobility to poor whites like himself. In 1860, John Locke Scripps alleged that Thomas Lincoln realized in his daily experience and observation how slavery oppresses the poorer classes, making their poverty and social disrepute a permanent condition through the degradation which it affixes to labor. Many such settlers in Indiana, harboring no moral objections to slavery, actively and successfully campaigned to keep free blacks from moving into their state. Before leaving Kentucky, Lincoln and his mother visited the grave of his brother, Thomas, who had died in infancy around 1812. As he crossed the Ohio with his sister and parents, seven-year-old Abraham did not seem like a prodigy destined for greatness. Dennis Hanks thought that Abe exhibited no special traits in Kentucky, except a good, kind, somewhat wild nature. Another Kentuckian remembered him simply as the gawkiest, dullest-looking boy you ever saw, unremarkable except for an exceptionally powerful memory. In that cold autumn, the Lincoln family packed up and plunged into the wilderness of southwestern Indiana, seeking a new beginning in wild and desolate Hurricane Township. Chapter 2 I Used to Be a Slave Boyhood and Adolescence in Indiana, 1816-1830 In 1817, a British traveler described Indiana as a vast forest larger than England, just penetrated in places by the backwoods settlers, who are half hunters, half farmers. Late in the previous year, Thomas Lincoln, his wife and their two children, entered the Buckhorn Valley of that state which had just been admitted to the Union. The family's journey from Kentucky was an arduous one, relentlessly exposing them to the rigors of camping out on cold winter nights. They brought with them little more than clothes, bedding, a Dutch oven, a skillet, and some tinware. The family had lost all their ironware when Thomas's raft overturned on his earlier expedition. Upon reaching their home site, they began a new life with just these few household possessions. Their lack of domestic animals and separation by miles from their nearest neighbors added to the uncertainty of their new existence. Hardships in Frontier, Indiana The Lincolns quickly erected a crude shelter called a half-faced camp. This temporary expedient, commonly thrown up by pioneers, had three pole walls and a roof of poles and brush. Where the fourth wall would be, on the southern exposure, a fire was kept burning in cold weather. The Lincoln's pole house had animal skins that covered the open side when the wind howled and the fire was out. It was in this structure, which Dennis Hanks unfondly called that darn little half-face camp, that the family lived for an undetermined time, probably several months. Hanks's distaste for that camp, which he and his foster parents occupied temporarily in 1817, is understandable. It would be relatively comfortable in warm, dry weather, but when winter storms raged and the south wind blew rain and smoke into their faces, it proved nearly intolerable. Acquaintances of the Lincolns testified that young Abe lived amid want, poverty, and discomfort that was about on the plain of the slaves he was destined to emancipate. And they described the winter of 1816 to 1817 as a veritable childhood valley forge of suffering. This Little Pigeon Creek neighborhood, Hardin County, Kentucky, seemed a model of subtle civilization. Lincoln portrayed it as a wild region of unbroken forest, where many bears and other wild animals roamed. Though it was as unpoetical as any spot of the earth, it inspired him to write poetry thirty years later. When first my father settled here, t'was then the frontier line. The panther's scream filled night with fear, and bears preyed on the swine. 
When the Crawford family first moved to the Little Pigeon Creek area nine years after the Lincolns, through the unchinked spaces in their cabin walls, they observed the eyes of wolves reflecting light from the fireplace. Less menacing fauna also abounded near the Lincoln's lean-to, from which seven-year-old Abe shot a wild turkey, he later recalled with regret. In an 1860 third-person autobiographical sketch, Lincoln wrote, A few days before the completion of his eighth year, in the absence of his father, a flock of wild turkeys approached the new log cabin, and A, with a rifle gun, standing inside, shot through a crack and killed one of them. He has never since pulled a trigger on any larger game. If game was readily at hand, water was not. Thomas dug holes in his property for badly needed water, only to come up with a miserable article that had to be strained. A Yankee dowser offered to find water on the farm for a five-dollar fee, but the cash-strapped Thomas would not part with that much for a pig in a poke. With a pet cat tagging along, young Abe often trudged back and forth to fetch clean water from a spring one mile away. It is hard to know why Thomas settled so far from a water source. Typically, pioneers made proximity to good water a priority. Perhaps he was one of those who feared that a dread disease called milk sickness was likely to be contracted near spring branches. Little Pigeon Creek's social environment was as primitive as the physical setting. One resident stated in 1866 that the early settlers were quite sociable, kind, and accommodating, more so than now, but that there was more drunkenness and stealing on a small scale, more immorality, less religion, less well-placed confidence. Pioneer customs, Dennis Hanks recalled, were very rough. Ignorance and superstition prevailed among the early Hoosiers, they believed that breaking a mirror or carrying a hoe or an axe into a cabin would bring a death in the family within a year's time. The wailing of a dog portended a death the next day. If a dog crossed a hunter's path, it was bad luck unless he locked his little fingers together. Friday was considered an inauspicious day to begin planting or harvesting. If a bird lit on a window or entered the house, it was regarded as a harbinger of woe. Farmers should plant, sow, and fence only if the signs of the moon were propitious. Subterranean crops, like potatoes, had to be planted in the dark of the moon, unlike tomatoes and beans, which must be planted in the light of the moon. The pioneers hired wizards to restore sick cows to health, and thought that a child who was breathed on by a horse would contract whooping cough. Young girls swallowed chicken hearts in the hopes that they would facilitate their quest for true love. Carrying a bag of eggs in one hand and a bag of salt in the other, young men mounted mules facing backward and rode for a mile. If no accident occurred, they concluded that they would have good luck throughout the coming year. Although Lincoln eventually shed many of the qualities of backwoods Indiana, he remained superstitious throughout life. His law partner, William Herndon, to whom Lincoln once confided, I feel as if I shall meet with some terrible end, said that a Baptist upbringing made him, Lincoln, a fatalist, and that a streak of superstition ran through him like a bluish-red vein runs through the whitest marble. When a dog bit one of his children, Lincoln took the boy to Terre Haute, Indiana, to be cured by a mad stone, which would supposedly drain off any poison when applied to the wound. As a congressman in the late 1840s, he declined to be a member of a party of 13 people, an act that prompted a friendly colleague to declare sharply that he would rather be dead than be as superstitious as Lincoln. In 1842, Lincoln told his best friend, Joshua Speed, I always was superstitious. To Henry C. Whitney, he confided that as a boy, I used to wander out in the woods all by myself. It had a fascination for me which had an element of fear in it, superstitious fear. I knew that I was not alone, just as well as I know that you are here now. Still, I could see nothing and no one, but I heard voices. Once I heard a voice right at my elbow, heard it distinctly and plainly. I turned around, expecting to see someone, of course. No one there, but the voice was there. When Whitney asked what the voice said, Lincoln did not reply. 
deep gloom, a look of pain, settled on his countenance and lasted some minutes. The most pressing challenge facing the Lincolns in their primitive home was clearing the land. Large for his age, Abe set to work with an axe, and later he remembered that, for the next fifteen years, he was almost constantly handling that most useful instrument. He felled trees, chopped them into logs, cleared undergrowth, dug stumps, and grubbed up roots for drying and burning. When not so engaged, he was harrowing, planting, hoeing, plowing, weeding, harvesting, or butchering. Taking grain to a distant mill provided young Abe a break from that soul-crushing routine. He especially enjoyed watching the mill machinery in action. Even waiting in line at the mill afforded him pleasure. There he would meet other boys who would joke, tell stories, fight, and wrestle. Lincoln always remembered a bizarre incident that occurred one day at Noah Gordon's mill. Impatient with the mare powering the grindstone, Lincoln hit her with a whip, yelling, Get up, you lazy old devil! Just as he uttered the words, Get up, the horse kicked him unconscious. Upon coming to, he involuntarily completed his injunction, You lazy old devil! Lincoln regarded this as a most remarkable event, and often discussed it with Herndon. Once the family had cleared enough land and planted a small crop of corn and vegetables, Thomas built a log cabin, which his family occupied for thirteen years, a windowless, one-story structure measuring eighteen by twenty feet. It was high enough to accommodate an overhead bedroom, reached by a ladder of pegs stuck into the log walls. There, Lincoln and Dennis Hanks slept. Thomas fashioned a few pieces of crude furniture, including a pole bedstead, and a slab table and stools. Thirteen people would eventually crowd together in this dismal abode, which afforded little comfort or privacy. In one of the best cabins in southwestern Indiana at this time, William Fox noted, that males dress and undress before the females, and nothing is thought of it. Fox inferred that shame, or rather what is called false shame or delicacy, does not exist here. Death of Nancy Hanks No sooner had the Lincoln family abandoned the half-faced camp in 1817 than Nancy's aunt and uncle, Thomas and Betsy Sparrow, arrived from Kentucky to occupy it. They brought with them their foster child, Dennis Hanks, bastard son of Mrs. Lincoln's aunt Nancy. Dennis became a kind of surrogate older brother to his second cousin Abe, a decade his junior. The Sparrows had, in effect, adopted Nancy when she was quite young. She and everyone else in the Little Pigeon Creek area regarded them as her virtual, if not biological, parents. Indeed, young Abraham thought of the Sparrows as his grandparents. In 1818, within months of the Sparrows' arrival, an epidemic of milk sickness swept through southwest Indiana. Cows contracted the malady by eating weeds that contained the toxic substance Tremetol. The disease killed not only the cows, but also the humans who drank their infected milk. Doctors at that time knew neither the cause of the disease nor a cure for it, which struck down Mrs. Peter Bruner, a neighbor of the Lincolns, and then Thomas and Betsy Sparrow. Nancy Lincoln nursed all three of them as they sickened and died. And then, in late September, she too contracted the disease. If Nancy Hanks died the way most victims of milk sickness did, her husband and children in the small cabin must have been horrified as her body was convulsed with nausea, her eyes rolled, and her tongue grew large and turned red. After a few days, as death approached, she probably lay in pain, her legs spread apart, her breath growing short, her skin becoming cool and clammy, and her pulse beating ever more irregularly. Before her final coma, she urged Abe and Sarah to be good to one another, and to their father, and to reverence and worship God. On October 5, 1818, a week after her symptoms first appeared, she died, unattended by a physician. Young Abe helped his father construct a coffin, a melancholy task that Thomas had performed often that season. 
Nancy's body was conveyed on a homemade sled to a gravesite near the cabin, where Betsy and Thomas Sparrow were already buried. No tombstone marked her final resting place, and no preacher delivered a funeral sermon until months later, when David Elkin arrived from Kentucky and spoke to a group of about twenty mourners gathered at the grave. No witnesses described Lincoln's reaction to his mother's death, nor did he say anything directly about its effect on him. Many years later, however, he indirectly revealed something of his emotions when he consoled a young girl whose father had been killed in the Civil War. It is with deep grief that I learn of the death of your kind and brave father, and especially that it is affecting your young heart beyond what is common in such cases. In this sad world of ours, sorrow comes to all, and to the young it comes with bitterest agony, because it takes them unawares. And then he added, I have had experience enough to know what I say. During the lonely winter following his mother's death, Lincoln cherished hearing the Bible stories she had once told him because they brought back memories of her voice. In January 1861, he spoke of the sad, if not pitiful, condition of his family after Nancy died. In the late 1840s, Lincoln read William Cowper's poem, On Receipt of My Mother's Picture, and marked one stanza that may well have reminded him of Nancy Hanks Lincoln. Oh, that those lips had language! Life has passed with me but roughly since I heard thee last. Those lips are thine, thy own sweet smile I see, the same that oft in childhood solaced me. Lincoln's sister, Sarah, who was only eleven when her mother died, assumed the domestic responsibilities of cooking, cleaning, washing, mending clothes, and spinning wool. She was a good-natured, amiable, gentle, intelligent, dark-skinned, heavy-set girl. Nathaniel Grigsby remembered her as having an extraordinary mind. She was industrious, more so than Abraham. Abe worked almost alone from the head, whilst she labored both. Like her brother, she could meet and greet a person with the very kindest greeting in the world, make you easy at the touch and word. Austin Gallagher, who was quite fond of Sarah, described her as just as pretty as Abe was homely, with big brown eyes and curly chestnut hair. But even with the help of kindly neighbors who pitched in, she could hardly replace her mother in the household. The gloom that settled over the cabin after Nancy Hanks Lincoln's death would not lift for more than a year, not until Thomas remarried. The profound agony caused by the loss of his mother left its mark on Abe. Psychologists have found that bereavement in childhood is one of the most significant factors in the development of depressive illness in later life, and that a depressive illness in later years is often a reaction to a present loss or bereavement which is associated with a more serious loss or bereavement in childhood. When a parent dies, the quality of the child's relationship with the surviving parent becomes critically important. Inadequate care of the child seems to be a central cause of later depression. In the wake of Nancy's death, Lincoln's unsympathetic father failed to provide Abe with adequate care, and partly as a result, Lincoln will be plagued with depression as an adult. At one point, Thomas left his two children with their young cousin, Sophie Hanks, who had come to live with the Lincolns around 1818, to fend for themselves, while he drifted down the Ohio River to sell pork. He again left the children when he wooed Sarah Bush Johnston in Kentucky, where, according to family tradition, he spent more time than he had intended to. One source alleged that the children, having given him up for dead, became almost nude for the want of clothes, and their stomachs became leathery from the want of food. By the time their new stepmother arrived at the end of 1819, she found Sarah and Abe wild, ragged, and dirty, and thought her stepson the ugliest chap that ever obstructed my view. The year and a quarter that separated Nancy Lincoln's death and Sarah Bush Johnston Lincoln's arrival was miserable for both children and left enduring scars. Children often regard the early death of a parent as a deliberate abandonment. 
Throughout his life, Lincoln feared being abandoned and was inclined to attack those who forsook their party or their principles. He also harbored an abiding wariness of women in general. His mother's death evidently taught him that women are unreliable and untrustworthy. Stepmother When Thomas proposed marriage to Sarah Bush Johnston in Kentucky in the fall of 1819, it was the second time he had asked for her hand. They had known each other since childhood. He had had dealings with some of her eight siblings, including her brother Isaac, who had accompanied him to New Orleans in 1806. Sarah had rejected Thomas's first proposal in favor of Daniel Johnston, who passed away a decade after their wedding, leaving her a widow with three young children. Thomas found 30-year-old Sarah Bush Johnston very attractive. She was handsome, tall, with good posture and a light complexion, and was sprightly, talkative, proud, kind, and charitable. Although her family was rough, uncouth, and uneducated, they occupied rungs far higher on the social and economic ladder than did the Hankses. William Herndon said she was far above Thomas Lincoln, somewhat cultivated, and quite a lady. She impressed people in both Kentucky and Indiana as industrious, strong, healthy, intelligent, and gentle. A tidy housekeeper with good manners and a knack for managing children, she, unlike Thomas's first wife, enjoyed a spotless reputation. Thomas courted his prospective bride matter-of-factly, blurting out to her one day as she was doing laundry, Well, Miss Johnston, I have no wife and you have no husband. I came a purpose to marry you. I knowed you from a gal and you knowed me from a boy. I have no time to lose if you are willing. Let it be done straight off. She replied that it was so sudden and asked for time to consider. But he said he was not in a mood to fool away time on such an important business as wife hunting. To this she rejoined, Tommy, I know you well and have no objection to marrying you, but I cannot do it straight off as I owe some debts that must first be paid. I could never think of burdening the man I marry with debt. It would not be right. Thomas promptly settled with her creditors, paying them approximately three dollars, and showed her the receipts. Meanwhile, her friends and brothers urged her to accept the proposal. She assented, and so they were married on December 2nd, 1819. Thomas hired his brother-in-law to haul the bride's many household goods, including a bureau, table, spinning wheel, set of chairs, large chest of drawers, cooking utensils, dishes, cutlery, and two beds. Arriving in Indiana with her three children, Sarah was taken aback by the quasi ursine condition of the Lincoln cabin and its inhabitants and quickly proceeded to improve both. I dressed Abe and his sister up, looked more human, she recalled. She scrubbed them until they looked well and clean, and eliminated the lice that had taken up residence in Abe's unruly hair. Appearances mattered to Sarah. When she was a girl, her mother thought her excessively proud because she cared about looking good and keeping up with fashion. When Thomas insisted that she sell some of her furniture because it was too fine for them to keep, she refused. After replacing the crude punch and tables and stools in the Indiana cabin, she swiftly effected other improvements. A floor was laid down, and doors and windows were installed. She dressed Sarah and Abe in some of the abundant clothing she had brought from Kentucky. In just a few weeks, she revolutionized the Lincolns and their house, so that everything was snug and comfortable. Sarah was a good cook, though her culinary skills were wasted on Abe, whom she described as a moderate eater, who obediently ate what was set before him, making no complaint. He seemed careless about this. Her meals were evidently nutritious, for the boy enjoyed good health. She probably served him the customary pioneer diet in Indiana, which consisted of cornbread, mush and milk, pork, chickens, quails, squirrels, and wild turkeys. Occasionally, she used to get some sorghum and ginger and make some gingerbread. It wasn't often, and it was our biggest treat, Lincoln recalled. Sarah Bush Lincoln tended to Abraham's emotional as well as physical needs. 
Augustus H. Chapman reported that she took an especial liking to young Abe, and soon dressed him up in entire new clothes, and from that time on he appeared to lead a new life. She encouraged him to study, for she recognized that he was a boy of uncommon natural talents, which she did all she could to foster. She even moderated Thomas Lincoln's reluctance to let Abe read. I induced my husband to permit Abe to read and study at home as well as at school, she told an interviewer. At first, Thomas was not easily reconciled to it, but finally he too seemed willing to encourage him to a certain extent. Abe and his stepmother grew remarkably close. I can say what scarcely one woman, a mother, can say in a thousand, and it is this. Abe never gave me a cross word or look, and never refused, in fact, or even in appearance, to do anything I requested him, she remembered. In turn, she never gave him a cross word. She and Abe, she thought, were kindred souls. His mind and mine, what little I had, seemed to run together, move in the same channel. Abe was dutiful to me always. He loved me truly, I think. She compared him favorably to her own son, John. Both were good boys, but I must say that Abe was the best boy I ever saw or ever expect to see. He always wanted to do just as I wanted him. Lincoln reciprocated the love of his stepmother, whom he called Mama. In 1861, he told Augustus H. Chapman that she had been his best friend in this world and that no son could love a mother more than he loved her. From Lincoln's affectionate tone, Chapman concluded that few children loved their parents as he loved this stepmother. Joshua Speed, Lincoln's closest confidant, recalled that Lincoln's fondness for his stepmother and his watchful care over her after the death of his father in 1851 deserves notice. He could not bear to have anything said by anyone against her. Near the end of his life, Lincoln told Speed of his affection for her and her kindness to him. To Herndon and others, Lincoln said she was considerate and attentive, a kind, tender, loving mother, and a noble woman to whom he was indebted more than all the world for his kindness, amiability, etc. Curiously, Lincoln seldom visited his stepmother, even after Thomas died. Perhaps he hesitated to return to the parental cabin, lest it remind him of the grim one in Indiana, where he had grown up. Just as Sarah Bush Lincoln seemed to prefer her stepson to her own boy, Thomas Lincoln favored his stepson John D. Johnston over Abe. Remarkably, however, little step-sibling rivalry developed between the two boys. Sarah remembered them quarreling but once, and she thought theirs was an unusually harmonious relationship for stepbrothers. A year younger than Abe, Johnston was a handsome, kind-hearted, generous, hospitable fellow, whose major defects were indolence and a quarrelsome streak. His glibness and sociability gave the impression that he was smarter than his shy stepbrother, Abe. Sophie Hanks reported that Abe would stick up for John when he was in the right, but let him get licked when he was not. She added that John was not very truthful. Sometimes he would do some devilment. John would not always tell the truth, and Uncle Tom would say, Wait till Abe comes, and we'll find out about it. In adulthood, Johnston became known as the Beau Brummel of Goose Nest Prairie, who wore the best clothes, even if he could not afford them. He may have had a drinking problem. A ledger showed that Johnston once purchased over 14 gallons of whiskey in four months. After Lincoln had become a successful lawyer and politician, Johnston would tell with much relish how he once thought Abe a fool, because, instead of spending his evenings sporting with the young folks, he seemed to care for nothing but some old musty books. To Johnston and his contemporaries, such behavior was clear proof of Abe's insanity. But now, he said, Abe is a great and wise man, and I am a fool still. Sarah Bush Lincoln said that John used to be the smartest when they were little fellows, but Abe passed him. Abe kept getting smarter all the time, and John went 
just so far, and stopped. I never saw another boy get smarter and smarter like Abe did. All in all, it is hard to imagine anyone more different from Lincoln than Johnston. Nevertheless, Lincoln spoke of him in the most affectionate manner, and said that he and his stepbrother were raised together, slept together, and liked each other as well as actual brothers could do. When Abe's sister told him to keep away from the Johnstons or they would ruin him, Abe just laughed and said that John was all right. In 1848, he wrote to John, You have always been kind to me. In time, however, Lincoln became impatient with Johnston's laziness. And though he extended himself to help John's children, he was reluctant to subsidize him. For his part, Johnston may have resented Lincoln's lectures on his lack of diligence and may have believed that Lincoln did not do enough for Thomas and Sarah, who lived with Johnston. Dennis Hanks reported that eventually the stepbrothers became enemies for a while on this ground, and added, mysteriously, I don't want to tell all the things that I know, for it would not look well in history. Still, Hanks concluded, I think Abe done more for John than he deserved. Abe treated John well. Lincoln was also friendly with his two stepsisters, Elizabeth and Matilda, who were, respectively, ten and eight years old when they came to Indiana. The step-siblings of the blended Johnston-Lincoln family got along so well, in fact, that two of them, Elizabeth Johnston and Dennis Hanks, became husband and wife. When their daughter, Harriet, reached school age, Lincoln invited her to live with his family in Springfield and pursue her education there, which she did. Education Lincoln's own education continued fitfully in Indiana, where he attended ABC schools for brief stretches. Later in life, he laconically referred to his education as defective and estimated the aggregate of his time spent in school was less than a year. In 1852, he said the career of his political hero, Henry Clay, demonstrated that in this country one can scarcely be so poor, but that, if he will, he can acquire sufficient education to get through the world respectably. Lincoln may well have been speaking of himself. Even though there was absolutely nothing to excite ambition for education in frontier Indiana, by the age of 21, he said, somehow I could read, write, and cipher to the rule of three, but that was all. In an 1860 autobiographical sketch written in the third person, he expressed regret at his want of education, but added that he does what he can to supply the want. Lincoln's earliest surviving composition is a bit of doggerel scribbled in an arithmetic notebook. It reads, Abraham Lincoln, his hand and pen, he will be good, God knows when. The Indiana school available to young Abe was a low-ceilinged, flea-infested cabin with a floor of split logs, a chimney of poles and clay, and a window of greased paper. Pupils sat on uncomfortable benches without backs, but with splinters aplenty. The young scholars usually studied aloud so that the teacher could tell that they were not daydreaming. In such a blab school, the 19th century Indiana novelist, Edward Eggleston, found it impossible to determine in his own mind whether the letters B-A-K-E-R in his spelling book spelled lady or shady. Eggleston simply could not force attention upon his mind in the midst of such a din. One Hoosier child repeated the word heptorpy from morning to noon and from noon till night in order to make the teacher believe that he was studying his lesson. Such schooling probably accounts for Lincoln's tendency to read aloud, which irritated his law partner, William Herndon. To justify that annoying habit, Lincoln explained, I catch the idea by two senses, for when I read aloud I hear what is read, and I see it, and hence two senses get it, and I remember it better, if I do not understand it better. Frontier teachers, whose ability to administer physical discipline was as important as their scholastic skills, boarded with families in the neighborhood. 
Preoccupied with enforcing order, making quill pens and other chores, they hardly had time, even if they had the inclination, to encourage independent thought and understanding. Because instructional technique involved rote memorization, fast learners stagnated while waiting for slower schoolmates to master a lesson. The punishments these teachers dealt out could be harsh, not only for outright misbehavior, but also for simply misspelling a word or miscalculating a sum. A wooden switch was always at hand and used liberally, sometimes to the point of inflicting injury or causing the child to vomit from the pain. Lincoln recalled a teacher who slapped a classmate for mispronouncing the names of the biblical figures Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Far from protesting, some parents encouraged the whipping of their children. Perhaps it was well that the school year was short, extending from the close of the fall harvest to the planting season. Along Little Pigeon Creek, Lincoln's teachers were Andrew Crawford, James Swaney, and Azell Dorsey. Only Dorsey left reminiscences of Lincoln, recalling that the boy came to school in buckskins and a raccoon cap, clutching an old arithmetic book, and was remarkable for his diligence and eagerness. Lincoln's first Indiana teacher, Crawford, went beyond reading, writing, and arithmetic, and tried to instill manners into his backwoods charges. He would have one pupil leave the room and then return, to be formally introduced by another pupil to all the others. Lincoln, too, tried to civilize his contemporaries by denouncing their mistreatment of animals. On the Midwestern frontier, cruelty to animals was common. At log rollings, men would round up a chipmunk, a rabbit, or a snake, and make him take refuge in a burning log heap and watch him squirm and fry. In one of his early bouts of schooling, Lincoln wrote an essay on that subject. As an adolescent, he upbraided John Johnston for smashing the shell of a land turtle against a tree, leaving the suffering animal quivering and defenseless. When his mother urged him to kill a snake, Abe replied, No, it enjoys living just the same as we do. His stepsister, Matilda, remembered Abe saying that an ant's life was to it as sweet as ours to us. Lincoln's concern for animals persisted into adulthood. One day, while traveling to Illinois, dressed more formally than usual, he saw a pig mired down. Reluctant to soil his clothes, he determined to pass the creature by, but his conscience would not allow him to do so. The imploring look in the porcine eyes seemed to say, There now, my last hope is gone. Moved to pity, Lincoln turned back to rescue the unfortunate beast. He similarly extricated a mud-bound lamb. When he observed a sow attempting to eat one of her piglets, he declared, By jings, the unnatural old brute shall not devour her own progeny, and clubbed her vigorously. On another occasion, he restored two small birds to their nest. When friends derided him for wasting his time, he responded, Gentlemen, you may laugh, but I could not have slept well tonight if I had not saved those birds. Their cries would have rung in my ears. In Potomac, Illinois, where he was abed one stormy night, Lincoln heard a cat mewing outside in the rain. Moved to pity, he was unable to sleep until he opened the door and let the poor feline enter. Lincoln also chastised his playmates for cruelty to other youngsters. When they tormented James Grigsby, who stuttered badly, Lincoln stepped in. Abe took me in charge, Grigsby recalled, when rough boys teased me and made fun of me for stuttering. Abe soon showed them how wrong it was, and most of them quit. Lincoln composed essays on subjects other than cruelty to animals. He showed a piece he wrote on temperance to his neighbor William Wood, who thought it superior to anything he had read in the press. Lincoln's enthusiasm for temperance did not keep him from aiding a poor drunk sleeping along the roadside one bitterly cold evening. To prevent the fellow from freezing to death, Lincoln carried him to the cabin of Dennis Hanks and stayed the night with him. Most young Hoosiers showed less compassion. According to Edward Eggleston, Indiana boys who found a drunk would often place a large crate over him and weight it down with logs. 
that would make escape difficult when the poor wretch should come to himself. It was a sort of rude punishment for inebriety, and it afforded a frog-killing delight to those who executed justice. Lincoln's youthful hostility to drink and his kindness to drunks were reflected in a temperance address he delivered many years later. Another lost Lincoln essay, written in 1827 or 1828, dealt with national politics. Wood admired that one, too, and said that it was published. In his twenties, Lincoln often read his first composition, written when he was about fourteen, to William G. Green. Lincoln thought highly of that witty piece. Though his command of spelling was imperfect, Lincoln was far ahead of his schoolmates, whom he often helped out with their spelling. That subject enjoyed pride of place in the frontier curriculum, an Indiana teacher recalled that the public mind seems impressed with the difficulties of English orthography, and there is a solemn conviction that the chief end of man is to learn to spell. Edward Eggleston noted that often the pupil does not know the meaning of a single word in the lesson, but that mattered little, for the pioneers believed that words were made to be spelled, and men were probably created that they might spell them. Hence the necessity for sending a pupil through the spelling book five times before you allow him to begin to read, or indeed to do anything else. Each school session, morning and afternoon, typically ended with a long spelling class, and Friday afternoons were entirely devoted to spelling matches, viewed as a kind of spectator sport on the frontier. One day Andrew Crawford asked his charges to spell defied, and declared that he would keep them in school until they spelled it properly. None of the pupils could meet the challenge until Anna Roby noticed Lincoln at the window, with his finger pointing to his eye. She took the hint, changed her guess from D-E-F-Y-E-D to D-E-F-I-E-D, and Crawford finally dismissed the class. Lincoln also assisted his chums with their handwriting. Spelling became a lifetime preoccupation for Lincoln, even as president, he would unhesitatingly admit when he did not know how to spell a word and ask for guidance. Once, when he publicly asked a room full of visitors how to spell missile, a government official marveled, is there another man in this whole union who, being president, would have done that? It shows his perfect honesty and simplicity. At a reception in February 1865, Lincoln told Supreme Court Justice David Davis, I never knew until the other day how to spell the word maintenance. I always thought it was M-A-I-N, main, T-A-I-N, tain, A-N-C-E, ents, main, tain, ents. But I find that it is M-A-I-N, main, T-E, te, N-A-N-C-E, nents, maintenance. An observer called the scene a spectacle. The president of a great nation at a formal reception, surrounded by many eminent people, statesmen, ministers, scholars, critics, and ultra-fashionable people, by all sorts, who honestly and unconcernedly, in the most unconventional way, speaks before all, as it were of a personal thing illustrative of his own deficiency. In 1864, Lincoln again confessed his weakness as a speller. When I write an official letter, I want to be sure it is correct, and I find I am sometimes puzzled to know how to spell the most common word. I found about twenty years ago that I had been spelling one word wrong all my life up to that time. It is very. I used always to spell it with two R's, V-E-R-R-Y. And then there is another word which I found I had been spelling wrong until I came here to the White House. It is opportunity. I had always spelled it O-P-P-E-R-T-U-N-I-T-Y. Some fretted that Lincoln's public confessions of lapses in his learning were a spectacle coming from an important man. But Joshua Speed marveled that Lincoln was never ashamed to admit his ignorance upon any subject, or the meaning of any word, no matter how ridiculous it might make him appear. Leonard Sweat, his close friend on the Illinois legal circuit, admiringly observed that Lincoln 
was the only man I have ever known who bridged back from middle age to youth and learned to spell well. Lincoln's schoolmates did not always appreciate his efforts to enlighten them. Anna Roby remembered one evening remarking that the moon was sinking. That's not so, he replied. It don't really go down. It seems so. The earth turns from west to east, and the revolution of the earth carries us under, as it were. We do the sinking, as you call it. The moon, as to us, is comparatively still. The moon's sinking is only an appearance. The skeptical Miss Roby retorted, Abe, what a fool you are. Astronomy would remain a lifelong interest of Lincoln's, as would mathematics. His passion for math, which led him in his forties to master the first six books of Euclid, was initially stimulated by his teachers, by several textbooks, and by a neighbor, James Blair. His math education enabled Lincoln in his early twenties to master surveying speedily. It also helped him develop a keenly analytical mind. In contests and games with his schoolmates, broad jumping, foot racing, putting the shot, hop step and jumping, slapjack, towel ball, stink base, wrestling, I spy, catapult, bullpen, and horseshoes, Lincoln shone when he could use his exceptional strength to advantage. He was able to sink an axe deeper into a tree and strike a heavier blow with a mole than anyone in the neighborhood. He could easily carry what three other men would have a hard time lifting. In his early twenties, with the aid of a harness, Lincoln hoisted over a thousand pounds. How he could chop, Dennis Hanks exclaimed. His axe would flash and bite into a sugar tree or sycamore, and down it would come. If you heard him falling trees in a clearing, you would say there was three men at work by the way trees fell. A form of recreation that Lincoln enjoyed little was his father's favorite, hunting. One of his rare hunting expeditions led Lincoln to kill his father's dog. One night he and John D. Johnston slipped out to join their friends in search of raccoons, only to have the barking of Joe, Thomas's house dog, threatened to disclose their nocturnal escapade. To silence the cur, Lincoln and his comrades took it along on their hunt. After they had caught a coon, they sewed its skin around Joe, who promptly ran toward home. En route, the dog was attacked and killed by larger canines. Lincoln recounted this odd tale later in life. Father was much incensed at his death, but as John and I, scantily protected from the morning wind, stood shivering in the doorway, we felt assured little yellow Joe would never be able again to sound the call for another coon hunt. Such a cruel act by a young man so solicitous of animals suggests that Lincoln's hostility toward his father ran deep. This uncharacteristic deed may have been Lincoln's way of retaliating, perhaps unconsciously, against Thomas for having slaughtered young Abe's beloved pet pig. For all his enjoyment of sports and games, Lincoln possessed a streak of introversion and a fondness for solitude. He disliked crowds and often preferred to be alone. After Nancy Hanks died in 1818, her son matured quickly and had less time for playmates. As one Indiana neighbor recalled, he seemed to change in appearance and action. He began to exhibit deep thoughtfulness and was so often lost in studied reflection we could not help noticing the strange turn in his actions. He disclosed rare timidity and sensitivity especially in the presence of men and women, and, although cheerful enough in the presence of boys, he did not appear to seek our company as earnestly as before. Another neighbor thought, Abe was always a man, though a boy. He would say to his playfellows and other boys, Leave off your boyish ways and be more like men. Lincoln outshone his schoolmates. He arrived at school early, paid close attention to his studies, read and reread his assignments, never wasted time, made swift progress, and always stood at the head of his class. As John Hanks observed, he worked his way by toil. To learn was hard for him, but he worked slowly but surely. To Anna Roby, Nathaniel Grigsby, 
and other fellow pupils, he often summarized what he had read, using stories and maxims to explain things clearly and simply. He retained that didactic impulse as an adult. It was common for him to read aloud, commenting on a book to a companion. He once discussed Euclid's geometry with a stableman. Lincoln devoted most of his leisure, such as it was, to study. He quickly got ahead of his schoolmates and even his instructors. His stepmother recalled, Abe read all the books he could lay his hands on, and when he came across a passage that struck him, he would write it down on boards, if he had no paper, and keep it there till he did get paper. Then he would rewrite it, look at it, repeat it. He had a copy book, a kind of scrapbook in which he put down all things, and this preserved them. He ciphered on boards when he had no paper or no slate, and when the board would get too black, he would shave it off with a drawing knife and go on again. When he had paper, he put his sums down on it. While John D. Johnston attended dances, Abe sat reading by the fire. When working at Josiah Crawford's farm, he read during lunchtime while other hands sat around chatting, smoking, and chewing tobacco. Crawford's wife recollected that while other boys were out hooking watermelons and trifling away their time, he was studying his books. He read all our books. We had a broad wooden shovel on which Abe would work out his sums, wipe off and repeat till it got too black for more, then he would scrape and wash off and repeat again and again. On other jobs, too, he always carried a book to pursue during breaks. Sundays he devoted his free time to reading. Walking to and from school, he read aloud at such a decibel level that his voice could be heard for a great distance. In 1828, Lincoln spent a few weeks at the Rockport home of Daniel Grass, whose books he enjoyed. In the evenings, he would lie before the fireplace so that he could read, sometimes until midnight or later. When he worked with John Hanks, Lincoln would return to the house at day's end, grab a piece of cornbread, and con a book. Lincoln allegedly told a friend that he had got hold of and read through every book he ever heard of in that country for a circuit about 50 miles. But Elizabeth Crawford recalled that he was more selective. If he picked up a book he thought was not worth his time, he would close it up and smile and say, I don't think this would pay to read it. Henry C. Whitney agreed that Lincoln was selective and that he would skim parts of the longer books or skip around through the chapters. Still, Lincoln always liked to have a book at hand for meals, or at least be with someone who could hold an intelligent conversation. He would diligently jot down passages from his reading that particularly struck him. Reading helped liberate Lincoln from his backwoods environment. In middle age, he said that before Johann Gutenberg's great invention, the great mass of men at that time were utterly unconscious that their conditions, or their minds, were capable of improvement. They not only looked upon the educated few as superior beings, but they supposed themselves to be naturally incapable of rising to equality. To emancipate the mind from this false and underestimate of itself is the great task which printing came into the world to perform. Print performed exactly that task for Lincoln, emancipating his mind and firing his ambition. To supplement his meager schooling, young Lincoln educated himself. He practiced writing the letters of the alphabet whenever and however he could, carving letters on slabs of wood, tree trunks, even on the stools and table in his family's cabin. When he did not have charcoal to hand, he wrote in the dust, in sand, or in snow. Dennis Hanks claimed credit for teaching his cousin to write, a boast that may be justified inasmuch as Dennis, ten years older than Abe, could write. As Lincoln's writing skill improved, and it was learned that he was conducting the correspondence for his own family, neighbors came to regard him as a marvel of learning and called upon him to write for them too. John Locke Scripps believed that Lincoln's greatest asset was not so much his skill as a stenographer as it was his ability to express the wishes and feelings of those for whom he wrote in clear and forcible language. Years later, Lincoln told a friend, 
that the way he learned to write so well and so distinctly and precisely was that many people who came with them from Kentucky and different sections after they moved to Indiana employed him as an amanuensis, which sharpened his perceptions and taught him to see other people's thoughts and feelings and ideas by writing their friendly confidential letters. He also drafted legal documents, including a contract between his stepbrother and a man who hired Johnston to run a stillhouse. Lincoln himself worked at that facility in the winter of 1829 to 1830. In addition to writing for his neighbors, Lincoln also read to them. He regularly visited William Wood's house to read newspapers aloud for the edification of the unlettered. He had a knack for making his listeners understand what they heard. When in a puckish mood, he would often invent stories while pretending to read from the paper he was holding. Sometimes Lincoln memorized items in the press. John Romine recalled that Abe borrowed a newspaper from me which contained a long editorial about Thomas Jefferson and read the entire paper by firelight. The next morning he returned the paper, and it seemed to me that he could repeat every word in that editorial. And not only that, he could recount all the news items, as well as tell all about the advertisements. John Rowan Herndon said Lincoln had the best memory of any man I ever knew, for he never forgot anything he read. Young Lincoln admired Lindley Murray's English Reader, an anthology of poetry and prose that he called the greatest and most useful book that could be put in the hands of a child at school. It contained some anti-slavery sentiments, such as these lines by the 18th century poet William Cowper. I would not have a slave to till my ground, to carry me, to fan me while I sleep, and tremble when I wake for all the wealth that sinews bought and sold have ever earned, I had much rather be myself the slave, and wear the bonds that fastened them on him. Lincoln would later famously write, As I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this, to the extent of the difference, is no democracy. Lincoln's other school books included Thomas Dilworth's New Guide to the English Tongue, Noah Webster's American Spelling Book, and Asa Rhodes's American Spelling Book. In addition to his family Bible, Lincoln read volumes borrowed from neighbors, including Josiah Crawford, William Johns, Thomas Turnman, and John Pitcher. Among these works were The Arabian Nights, Aesop's Fables, the Kentucky Preceptor, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, James Barclay's English Dictionary, Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, James Riley's Authentic Narrative of the Loss of the American Brig Commerce, William Grimshaw's History of the United States, A Biography of Henry Clay, Mason Weems' Life of George Washington, and William Scott's Lessons in Elocution. Curiously, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin does not seem to have been among the books read by Lincoln. It was to become as famous a representative of the self-made man ethic as Franklin himself. It is not possible to say precisely what Lincoln derived from these volumes. His views on slavery may have been affected by the Scott Anthology, which contained Lawrence Stern's Indictment of Human Bondage. Disguise thyself as thou wilt, Still, slavery, still thou art a bitter draught, and though thousands in all ages have been made to drink of thee, thou art no less bitter on that account. Scott also included Cowper's poem, Cruelty to Brutes Censured, which may have had a special appeal to the young Lincoln. Robinson Crusoe perhaps reinforced his sense of irony and fatalism. In the late 1820s, Lincoln began reading newspapers, especially the New York Telescope, the Washington National Intelligencer, and the Louisville Journal, papers that helped develop his interest in politics. He originally supported Andrew Jackson's Democratic Party, but soon switched his allegiance to the National Republicans, whose leader, Henry Clay, would found the Whig Party in the 1830s. 
Influencing this decision was a prosperous merchant, William Jones, who admired Clay so much that when his hero lost the 1844 presidential election, Jones was unable to attend to business for days. Jones employed young Lincoln in his store and served as a friendly mentor to him. Lincoln hung around the store where he could read the Louisville Journal and discuss politics. In all likelihood, Lincoln's preference for the National Republicans grew from his aversion to the Jeffersonian-Jacksonian celebration of agrarianism and negative government. Eager to escape rural backwardness, he probably associated the Democrats with shiftless frontiersmen like his Democratic father, while the National Republicans represented enterprising lawyers and merchants like Jones. When Lincoln was about 14 years old, hearing that David Ramsey's biography of the first president offered an account of Washington superior to Mason Weems's, he promptly borrowed a copy of the Ramsey book from Josiah Crawford and read it avidly. Before he could return it, however, the volume inadvertently got soaked by rain that poured into the Lincoln cabin one night. When he told Crawford what had happened and offered to pay for the book, Crawford instead suggested that the lad cut the tops from a field of corn, which he did over the course of three days. Lincoln believed that Crawford, a tight-fisted man known for his pettiness in dealing with neighbors, had made an excessive demand and retaliated by composing satirical verses, ridiculing Crawford unmercifully. Lincoln did not rely solely on the printed word or the classroom for his education. He also queried travelers who stopped at Jones's store. In addition, with Dennis Hanks, Nathaniel Grigsby, and other friends, Lincoln attended political meetings and discussed issues of the day endlessly. Lincoln insisted on thoroughly digesting whatever he read or heard. His stepmother recollected that Abe, when old folks were at our house, was a silent and attentive observer, never speaking or asking questions till they were gone, and then he must understand everything, even to the smallest thing, minutely and exactly. He would then repeat it over to himself again and again, sometimes in one form and then in another, and when it was fixed in his mind to suit him, he became easy, and he never lost that fact or his understanding of it. Occasionally he seemed pestered to give expression to his ideas and got mad almost at one who couldn't explain plainly what he wanted to convey. Lincoln never lost his desire to gain a clear understanding of what he read or heard. In 1860, he described one of his earliest recollections to a Connecticut clergyman. I remember how, when a mere child, I used to get irritated when anybody talked to me in a way I could not understand. I don't think I ever got angry at anything else in my life. But that always disturbed my temper, and has ever since. I can remember going to my little bedroom after hearing the neighbors talk of an evening with my father and spending no small part of the night walking up and down and trying to make out what was the exact meaning of some of their, to me, dark sayings. I could not sleep, though I often tried to, when I got on such a hunt after an idea until I had caught it. And when I thought I had caught it, I was not satisfied until I had repeated it over and over, until I had put it in language plain enough, as I thought, for any boy I knew to comprehend. This was a kind of passion with me, and it has stuck by me, for I am never easy now when I am handling a thought till I have bounded it north and bounded it south and bounded it east and bounded it west." He rewrote the words of family guests to make his own prose more concise. When visitors came to the cabin, he would patiently listen to them talk. Employing a kind of shorthand, he jotted down their remarks and later went over them repeatedly, striking out extraneous words while retaining the substance and flavor of the conversations. Religion It is clear that Lincoln read the Bible, though how diligently he perused it is not recorded. In the 1850s, he told an Illinois lawyer that his boyhood library consisted of 66 books of which he was very fond, that is, the Bible, and that he studied it with great care. Lincoln would probably have agreed with a historian who called the Bible a whole literature, a library, a collection of poems and short stories 
teaching history, biography, biology, geography, philosophy, political science, psychology, hygiene, and sociology, as well as cosmology, ethics, and theology, and presenting a worldly panorama with particulars so varied that it is hard to think of a domestic or social situation without a biblical example to match and turn to moral ends. In his mature years, Lincoln often referred to the Bible, which he described as the richest source of pertinent quotations and the best gift God has given to man. All the good the Savior gave to the world was communicated through this book. But for it, we could not know right from wrong. All things most desirable for men's welfare, here and hereafter, are to be found portrayed in it. Near the end of the Civil War, he told Joshua Speed, Take all of this book, the Bible, upon reason that you can, and the balance on faith, and you will live and die a happier and better man. The Bible, journalist Noah Brooks reported, was a very familiar study with the President, whole chapters of Isaiah, the New Testament, and the Psalms being fixed in his memory. Lincoln, Brooks added, would sometimes correct a misquotation of Scripture, giving generally the chapter and verse where it could be found. He liked the Old Testament best, and dwelt on the simple beauty of the historical books. Of the Psalms, he said, They are the best, for I find in them something for every day in the week. Lincoln often cited the Old Testament. In discussing the relationship between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, he alluded to the book of Proverbs, chapter 25, verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. Still pondering his future, he told a friend he would follow the advice of Moses. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. Responding to Stephen A. Douglas in 1852, he quoted Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Opening his campaign for the Senate in 1858, Lincoln took a text from Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 4. A living dog is better than a dead lion. He made another biblical canine allusion when complaining about press criticism during the Civil War. Is thy servant a dog that he should do this thing? 2 Kings, chapter 8, verse 13. He also alluded to a passage in Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 10, dealing with servants. Accuse not a servant to his master, lest he curse thee, and thou be found guilty. In 1861, speaking in Philadelphia, he gave a condensed version of the following passage from the 135th Psalm. If I forgot thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. When denouncing slavery, Lincoln would repeatedly cite God's injunction to Adam. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Genesis chapter 3 verse 19. Lincoln also liked the New Testament, frequently quoting the words of Jesus. Judge not that ye be not judged. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe unto that man by whom the offense cometh. Matthew chapter 18 verse 7. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Matthew chapter 12 verse 25. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Matthew chapter 24 verse 28. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew chapter 16 verse 18. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Luke chapter 16 verse 31. Whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. Luke 
chapter 6, verses 43 and 44. They seek a sign, and no sign shall be given them. Luke, chapter 11, verse 29. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Matthew, chapter 12, verse 34. And finally, as your Father in heaven is perfect, be ye also perfect. Matthew, chapter 5, verse 48. Lincoln's lecture on discoveries and inventions, delivered in the 1850s, contains more than 30 biblical references. In his youth, Lincoln didn't read the Bible half as much as is said, according to Dennis Hanks, who reported that the Bible puzzled him, especially the miracles. He often asked me in the timber or sitting around the fireplace nights to explain Scripture. Lincoln's stepmother also testified that Abe read the Bible some, though not as much as is said. He sought more congenial books, suitable for his age. In 1860, Lincoln confessed to a Springfield minister, I have read my Bible some, though not half as much as I ought. Sarah Bush Lincoln often entertained guests by having Abe read aloud from the Bible. On one such occasion, Abe evidently resented the assignment and began reading at a furious pace. When Mrs. Lincoln urged him to slow down, he defiantly sped up. In exasperation, she grabbed a broom and chased him out of the cabin, much to his relief. Another time he read aloud from the book of Isaiah, playfully interpolating passages from Shakespeare. Lincoln's youthful attitude toward the Bible, as described by his stepmother and Dennis Hanks, may reflect disenchantment with the ignorant preachers and hypocritical churchgoers he observed both in Kentucky and at the Little Pigeon Baptist Church, with which his parents affiliated in 1823, but which Abe did not join. That congregation seethed with personal feuds, quarrels over the proper credentials for those who administered baptism, opposition to benevolent missionary work, and disputes over creeds. The primitive worship, heavy emphasis on arcane doctrinal matters, and ignorant and even drunken preachers, probably rebelled young Lincoln. In The Hoosier Schoolmaster, the former circuit-riding minister, Edward Eggleston, portrayed hard-shell Baptist congregations in antebellum Indiana. Their confession of faith is a caricature of Calvinism and is expressed by their preachers about as follows. If you're elected, you'll be saved. If you ain't, you'll be damned. God'll take care of his elect. It's a sin to run Sunday schools or temperance societies or to send missionaries. You let God's business alone. What is to be will be, and you can't hinder it. These prodigiously illiterate and often vicious fundamentalist parishioners sometimes had ministers who were notorious drunkards and who dragged their sermons out sometimes for three hours at a stretch. William E. Barton, a clergyman who wrote extensively about Lincoln, described the kind of services young Abe probably attended. The Baptist preachers bellowed and spat and whined, and cultivated an artificial holy tone, and denounced the Methodists, and blasphemed the Presbyterians, and painted a hell whose horror even in the backwoods was an atrocity. Barton speculated plausibly that before Lincoln reached the age of 28, he may not have encountered a Baptist preacher who acknowledged that the earth was round. After hearing sermons or speeches, Lincoln repeated them nearly verbatim to his friends, mimicking the gestures and accent of the speaker. He often would return from church, mount a box in the middle of the cabin, and replicate the service. He would do the same outdoors, climbing on a stump and inviting his friends to hear him deliver sermons or political speeches. Because this activity interfered with farm work, Abe's father frequently scolded him and made him quit. His stepsister, Matilda, remembered that sometimes she and Lincoln would conduct mock religious services, at which she would lead the singing while Abe would lead in prayer. Among his numerous supplications, he prayed God to put stockings on the chicken's feet in winter. A strain of irreverence remained with Lincoln all his life. He especially relished humorous stories about ignorant preachers, including one which involved a Baptist minister in Indiana. 
The meeting house was in the woods and quite a distance from any other house. It was only used once a month. The preacher, an old line Baptist, was dressed in coarse linen pantaloons and shirt of the same material. The pants, manufactured after the old fashion, with baggy legs and a flap in front, were made to attach to his frame without the aid of suspenders. A single button held his shirt in position, and that was at the collar. He rose up in the pulpit and with a loud voice announced his text thus, I am the Christ, whom I shall represent today. About this time a little blue lizard ran up underneath his baggy pantaloons. The old preacher, not wishing to interrupt the steady flow of his sermon, slapped away on his legs, expecting to arrest the intruder. But his efforts were unavailing, and the little fellow kept on ascending higher and higher. Continuing the sermon, the preacher slyly loosened the central button, which graced the waistband of his pantaloons, and with a kick, off came the easy-fitting garment. Meanwhile, Mr. Lizard had passed the equatorial line of waistband and was calmly exploring that part of the preacher's anatomy which lay underneath the back of his shirt. Things were now growing interesting, but the sermon was still grinding on. The next movement on the preacher's part was for the collar button, and with one sweep of his arm, off came the toe linen shirt. The congregation sat for an instant, as if dazed. At length, one old lady in the rear of the room rose up and glancing at the excited object in the pulpit, shouted at the top of her voice, If you represent Christ, then I'm done with the Bible. Lincoln also enjoyed telling the story of a camp meeting, where, as the tents were being struck, a little wizened-faced man ascended the log steps of the pulpit, and clasping his small hands, and rolling his weak eyes upward, squealed out, Brethren and cistern! Because he presented such a striking contrast to the last speaker, the assembled people paused to look with wonder upon him. Encouraged by their attention, he resumed, I rise to narrate unto you on the subject of the baptismal, yes, the baptismal, ahem. There was Noah, he had three sons, ahem, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Belteser. They all went in tow the Daniel's den, and likewise with them was a lion, a him. Observing that his auditors were inattentive, the fellow adopted a new tack. Dear perishing friends, if you will not hear unto me on this great subject, I will only say this, that Squire Nobbs has recently lost a little bay mare with a flaxy mane and tail, amen. Even though Lincoln delighted in mimicking backwoods clergymen, something of what they preached became embedded in his psyche, for he remained a Calvinistic fatalist throughout life. He frequently quoted Hamlet's lines, There's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. He also found religious significance in the poetry of Alexander Pope, whose Essay on Man, he said, contained all the religious instruction that was necessary for a man to know. He repeatedly said, What is to be will be, and no cares or prayers of ours can arrest the decree. Lincoln also retained a fondness for the frontier minister's theatrical style. In 1861, he told the sculpture Leonard Volk, I don't like to hear cut-and-dried sermons. No, when I hear a man preach, I like to see him act as if he were fighting bees. Relations with the Opposite Sex Lincoln's great height and sartorial indifference did not endear him to the opposite sex, nor was his physical and social awkwardness very appealing. He was strikingly tall. He reached six foot by age 16, and he kept growing until by 21 he attained his full height of six feet four inches. He was thin, swarthy, and raw-boned. Though he was very careful of his person, and tolerably neat and clean. His clothes were typically rough and suited to the frontier. Toe linen pants in warm weather, buckskin pants in cool weather, flax shirts, linsey woolsey jackets, short socks, low shoes, and caps fashioned from animal skins. But they fit him poorly. His pants often exposed six to twelve inches of skin. 
This did not bother him, for he cared little about fashion. Lincoln got along well enough with neighborhood girls, kidding and chatting with them, but they found him too green and awkward to care for him romantically. One Indiana maiden recalled that he was so tall and awkward and that all the young girls my age made fun of Abe. They'd laugh at him right before his face, but Abe never appeared to care. He was so good, and he'd just laugh with them. Abe tried to go with some of them, but no siree. They'd give him the mitten every time, just because he was so tall and gawky. And it was mighty awkward, I can tell you, trying to keep company with a fellow as tall as Abe was. Elizabeth Wood found him too awkward. Pretty, vain Elizabeth Tully reported that he was big and awkward and couldn't dance much. Whenever she was seen with Lincoln, her friends teased her unmercifully about his coat sleeves and pant legs always being too short. Another young woman, who thought him too big and awkward and ugly, further objected that he just cared too much for books. Lincoln attended parties but refused to dance. Instead, he would gather several boys together and tell stories, which upset the girls, for they would, as a result, have trouble rounding up partners for dancing. For his part, Lincoln returned the girls' indifference. His friend, Anna Roby, was one of many who noted that Abe didn't like girls much and found them too frivolous. Lincoln's cousin, Sophie Hanks, reported that Abe didn't like the girls' company. His stepmother remembered that he was not very fond of girls. John Hanks said that, I never could get him in company with women. He was not a timid man in this particular, but he did not seek such company. Some Hoosiers alleged that after Lincoln turned 17, he began to take a romantic interest in the opposite sex. But the evidence tends to support Dennis Hanks, who called Lincoln the bashfulest boy that ever lived, and John D. Johnston, who said Lincoln didn't take much truck with the girls because he was too busy studying. Quasi-slavery as a rented laborer. Lincoln was indeed busy, but not always with a book in hand. He worked hard on his father's farm and also for neighbors to whom Thomas rented his boy. Around 1825, Thomas Lincoln found himself in greater financial trouble than usual when a friend defaulted on a loan that he had endorsed. To pay off that note, Thomas removed Abe from school and hired him out to neighbors such as Thomas Turnman, Wesley Hall, William Wood, Silas Richardson, Joseph Gentry, John Dutton, John Jones, and Josiah Crawford. For the next few years, Lincoln was virtually a slave, toiling as a butcher, ferry operator, riverman, store clerk, farmhand, wood chopper, distiller, and sawyer, earning anywhere from 10 cents to 31 cents a day. He handed these meager wages over to Thomas, in compliance with the law stipulating that children were the property of their father, and that any money they earned belonged to him. Locked into this bondage, Abraham felt as if he were a chattel on a southern plantation. I used to be a slave, he declared in 1856. This painful experience led him to identify with the slaves and to denounce human bondage even when it was politically risky to do so. Among the people for whom young Lincoln slaved was a neighbor named Carter, who paid him ten cents a day to cut corn. Josiah Crawford gave him 25 cents daily to split rails, build fences, dig wells, cut pork, clear land, daub his cabin, and perform other farm chores. When Lincoln and Joseph Richardson pulled fodder, they each received 25 cents for a full day's work. In 1827, he spent three months clearing land for John Jones, who compensated the young laborer with corn instead of money. Lincoln received 20 cents a day from James Taylor, who hired him to operate a ferry on Anderson Creek. When not shuttling passengers across the 100-foot-wide expanse of water, Lincoln helped with chores on Taylor's farm, where he lived for several months. Lincoln's most lucrative work, earning him 31 cents a day, was butchering hogs for Taylor. It was also his nastiest job, involving barrels of hot water, blankets, clubs. A hog had to be clubbed, doused in scalding water, and its bristles removed. Then one man held the warm, moist, 
greasy carcass, as heavy as 200 pounds, nearly perpendicular with its head down. Another man ran a gambrel bar through a slit in the animal's hock, over a string pole, and then through the other hock. Holding the hog was a challenge. Lincoln termed this regimen at Taylor's the roughest work a young man could be made to do. Abe still managed to get in some reading at Taylor's. He would read until midnight, then rise early, make a fire for Mrs. Taylor, put on the water, and straighten up the place. While working for Taylor, Lincoln built a small boat. One day, two gentlemen in a hurry saw the craft and asked Lincoln to row them and their trunks out to a steamer on the Ohio River. He gladly agreed. While boarding the steamboat, the men dumbfounded Lincoln by pitching two silver half-dollars into his vessel. Recounting this episode, he said, It was a most important incident in my life. I could scarcely credit that I, the poor boy, had earned a dollar in less than a day. That by honest work I had earned a dollar. The world seemed wider and fairer before me. I was a more hopeful and thoughtful boy from that time. Rowing passengers out onto the Ohio was lucrative, but it soon provoked a ferry owner on the Kentucky shore to sue Lincoln for operating without a license. The presiding justice of the peace, Samuel Pate, ruled for the defense, pointing out that the statute in question covered ferries plying between the southern and northern banks of the Ohio, and not ferrymen who merely rowed passengers part way across the river. This episode may have stirred young Lincoln's interest in the law. It might have also predisposed him to read Constable Thomas Turnham's copy of The Statutes of Indiana, with unusual avidity. As a ferryman, Lincoln had grown so fond of working on the water that he readily accepted the offer made by a local merchant, James Gentry, to accompany his son Alan on a cargo boat trip to Louisiana. The two young men spent weeks constructing a flat boat for their corn, pork, potatoes, hay, and kraut, all destined for deep south sugar plantations. In late December 1828, they shoved off from Rockport on a 1,200-mile, seven-week excursion down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, with Lincoln manning the boat oars and Gentry the tiller. The constantly changing scenery and the boats passing by kept the voyage from becoming monotonous. From the riverbanks, villagers would call out, Where are you from? Where are you bound? What are you loaded with? Gentry and Lincoln slept on the hard deck, which was difficult when storms raged, forcing them to struggle hard to keep their boat from capsizing. On occasion, they were pelted by rain for days on end. As they floated down the Mississippi, Gentry and Lincoln stopped frequently to peddle their cargo. They traded foodstuffs for cotton, tobacco, and sugar. One night, while tied up at a plantation a few miles below Baton Rouge, they were attacked by seven slaves. The blacks, noting that only two young men were aboard the boat, attempted to rob it. Gentry and Lincoln fended them off in a fierce struggle during which both got badly hurt. After selling all their wares along the banks of the Mississippi, they proceeded to New Orleans. As they strolled about, Lincoln saw something that would leave an indelible impression on him. A slave auction at which scantily clad young women were exhibited on the block and pinched and ogled by prospective buyers. Revolted, Lincoln said, Alan, that's a disgrace. It was the first time, but not the last, he would be repelled while observing slavery firsthand. Lincoln and Gentry probably returned to Illinois via steamboat, perhaps one like the ship Frances Trollope described in her reminiscences of the river boatman whom she observed on a voyage up the Mississippi. We had about 200 of these men on board, but the part of the vessel occupied by them is so distinct from the cabins that we never saw them, except when we stopped to take in wood, and then they ran, or rather sprung and vaulted over each other's heads to the shore, whence they all assisted in carrying wood to supply the steam engine, the performance of this duty being a stipulated part of the payment of their passage. When Lincoln reached home, tales of his adventures won him a reputation as a capable boatman and a courageous fighter. If the trip to New Orleans convinced Lincoln that chattel slavery was disgraceful, 
It also intensified his desire to escape his own quasi-slavery in Indiana. Soon after his return, Lincoln called on a neighbor, William Wood. When the shy young man found it difficult to get to the point, Wood prompted him, Abe, what is your case? Uncle, I want you to go to the river, the Ohio, and give me some recommendation to some boat. Citing the law that made children their father's property until they attained their majority, Wood said, Abe, your age is against you. You are not twenty-one yet. I know that, protested Lincoln, but I want to start. Wood refused, counseling Lincoln to stay with his father until 1830. Reluctantly, Lincoln took that advice. Lincoln may have been eager to escape his home for some time. An interviewer who spoke with people who knew Lincoln concluded, Mr. L. does not appear to have cared for home after the death of his mother. At 13, he worked away from home for the first time, cutting wood with Dennis Hanks and Squire Hall on the banks of the Ohio. Thereafter, he frequently absented himself from the paternal cabin. In 1825, at the age of 16, he stayed several months with the Taylors on Anderson Creek. After his sister Sarah wed Aaron Grigsby in the summer of 1826, Lincoln spent much time at their home. In the spring of 1827, he lived with John Jones's family at Dale, returning home only on Saturday nights. That same year, Lincoln and John D. Johnston journeyed to Louisville, where they found employment on the Louisville and Portland Canal. In the fall of 1828, while helping Allen Gentry construct their flatboat, Lincoln stayed weeks with the family of Daniel Grass in Rockport. He lived with William Jones when he worked on his farm and at his Gentryville store. Lincoln heartily disliked farm chores. His employers, neighbors, and family all testified that he was not industrious as a worker on the farm or at any other kind of manual labor. Lincoln admitted that his father taught him to work, but never learned him to love it. On the frontier, laziness connoted physical, not mental, indolence. A neighbor of the Lincolns in Illinois recalled that Abe always did take to book reading, and on that account, Williams used to think he wouldn't amount to much. You see, it weren't book reading then. It were work that counted. Another Illinois acquaintance, John Perkopile, declared that Lincoln was a mighty lazy man. Well, I've seen him under a tree with a book in his hand, and too mortal lazy to move when the sun came round. As his stepsister Matilda observed, Lincoln was indeed intellectually industrious, if reluctant to perform farm chores. Abe was not energetic, except in one thing. He was active and persistent in learning, read everything he could, ciphered on boards, on the walls. Sarah Bush Lincoln told an interviewer that her stepson was diligent for knowledge, wished to know, and if pains and labor would get it, he was sure to get it. Longing to escape the toilsome world of subsistence farming and make something of himself, Lincoln prophetically told Elizabeth Crawford, I don't always intend to delve, grub, shuck corn, split rails, and the like. She remembered that Abe was ambitious, sought to outstrip and override others. His friend, Joseph Gentry, had a similar recollection. Abe wasn't fond of work and often told me he never intended to make his living that way. He often said he would get some profession. In fact, his whole mind seemed bent on learning and education. Sophie Hanks recalled that her cousin Abe always had a natural idea that he was going to be something. In 1829, Lincoln wrote this couplet in a friend's copybook. Good boys who to their books apply will make great men by and by. When he could, Lincoln lured others into shunning chores with him. He would employ pranks, tricks, stories, and jokes to distract them. One day, when he and Dennis Hanks had a job pulling fodder, they procrastinated all morning by playing marbles. At noon, Hanks reminded Lincoln that they had not pulled any fodder. Lincoln replied that he had rather play marbles any time than pull fodder. Upon his return from New Orleans, after weeks of freedom as a flatboatman, Lincoln grudgingly resumed the 
uncompensated toil imposed on him by his father. The contrast to his life on the water seemed to curdle Lincoln's good nature. In 1829, the dark side of his personality emerged as he became testy, belligerent, spiteful, and vindictive. This transformation was especially obvious when he attacked the neighboring Grigsby clan. Although Nathaniel Grigsby was one of his best friends, Abe detested Nathaniel's older brother Aaron, who had married his sister Sarah in 1826. Lincoln believed that the prosperous Grigsby family mistreated her and looked down on her because she had been hired help. Joseph C. Richardson remarked on Lincoln's anger at Grigsby. You may think you have forgiven the fellow who married your sister and abused her, but you never did. You go gunning for him in your sleep. A year and a half after her wedding, Sarah died in childbirth. Upon hearing the news, Lincoln sat down on a log and hid his face in his hands while the tears rolled down through his long, bony fingers. Those present turned away in pity and left him to his grief. Repeatedly he asked himself, What have I to live for? Henry C. Whitney, who thought that Abraham's inner life was a desert of sorrow, speculated plausibly that Sarah's passing reawakened painful memories of his mother's death. Lincoln and his father blamed Sarah's death on the neglectful conduct of the Grigsby clan. The Grigsbys contended that they had taken good care of her, but that the only nearby doctor had been too drunk to tend to her. Lincoln had another falling out with the Grigsbys when everyone in the neighborhood except his family was invited to celebrate the double wedding of Reuben and Charles Grigsby to Elizabeth Ray and Matilda Hawkins, respectively. Miffed and insulted, Abraham vowed revenge for the slight. With his highly developed knack for mimicry and sarcasm, Lincoln penned a satire in biblical language titled The Chronicles of Reuben, which described grooms inadvertently bedding down the wrong brides. This burlesque, Nathaniel Grigsby recalled, was so sharp and cutting that it hurt us. It became famous in the Buckhorn Valley, where the Chronicles of Reuben were remembered better than the Bible, better than Watts' hymns. Joseph C. Richardson called the Chronicles the first production that I know of that made us feel that Abe was truly and really someone. This called the attention of the people to Abe intellectually. Lincoln evidently wrote other satirical pieces in Indiana, though none seemed to have survived. Not content with the wounds inflicted on Reuben and Charles, Lincoln wrote a body poem questioning the sexual preference of their brother William. I will tell you a joke about Josiah and Mary. Tis neither a joke nor a story, for Reuben and Charles have married two girls, but Billy has married a boy. He tried the girls on every side. He had well tried. None could he get to agree. All was in vain. He went home again, and since that he's married a natty. So Billy and Natty agreed very well, and Mama's well pleased at the match. The egg it has laid, but Natty's afraid. The shell is so soft that it never will hatch. But Betsy, she said, you cursed ball head, my suitor you can never be. Besides your low crotch proclaims you a botch, and that never can answer for me. Thirsty for revenge, William Grigsby challenged Lincoln to a fight, but the larger and stronger Lincoln protested that it would hardly be a fair match. So they hit on a compromise. Grigsby would battle Lincoln's stepbrother, John D. Johnston. As John Gentry recalled it, the fight became a much-anticipated spectacle. The ring was pitched in Warwick County, a short distance from the old Lincoln homestead. That was for the purpose of evading any investigation by the grand jury. The fight was well advertised. Every township in the county was represented, I reckon. There was a big crowd present. Abe Lincoln was there, and he was mad because he couldn't get anybody to fight him. Johnston and Grigsby pummeled each other until Johnston was seriously hurt. At that point, Abe burst through, caught Grigsby, threw him off some feet, stood up and swore he was the big buck at the lick. A general melee then broke out. 
this uncharacteristically boastful intervention in a fight that he himself caused suggests that Lincoln, at age 20, was not entirely a paragon of virtue, despite his reputation as a sociable, cheerful, good-natured, and gentle fellow. The Ballins of Perry County thought that the young Lincoln of Pigeon Creek, like all his Indiana cronies, was pretty much of a rowdy, and certainly was not of a saintly nature. What Henry Whitney aptly called a reprehensible trait of character that Lincoln showed in cruelly satirizing the Grigsby's would mar him for years to come. Not until midlife did he cease wounding people with his exceptional knack for ridicule. In other ways, Lincoln showed his frontier crudeness. At times, a highly polished cuss word would escape his lips, his stepmother admitted, and he began to develop a taste for alcohol. In 1858, he told a friend that he had never taken a drink of any alcoholic beverage in the past 20 years, clearly implying that he had stopped drinking in 1838, at the age of 29. Nathaniel Grigsby testified that Lincoln was a temperate drinker, who drank his dram as well as all the others did, preachers and Christians included. Elizabeth Tully alleged that at least once Abe had gotten too much cider of Applejack and fell in a branch on his face and almost drowned. Her strict father never forgave Lincoln for that one lapse. In Indiana, Lincoln acquired a lifelong fondness for off-color humor. Dennis Hanks said Lincoln liked to sing little smutty songs, but Hanks refused to recite their lyrics, for they would not look well in print. J. Rowan Herndon also declined to tell all he knew of Lincoln's anecdotes. There is many that I could mention, but they are on the vulgar order. Lincoln wrote a satire about Charles Harper, who one day encountered Mrs. Noah Gordon as he was riding to the mill with a long bag of wheat. She remarked, Brother, your bag is too long. No, he replied, it is only too long in the summer. When Mrs. Gordon told her husband about this ribald remark, he demanded a church trial. Lincoln heard about the proceedings and penned a witty commentary, poking fun at the parties involved. Young Lincoln could be a kind of forward boy, a little rude and stubborn, according to Dennis Hanks, who also remarked that Lincoln was a good listener to his superiors, but bad to his inferiors, because he couldn't endure jabber. One day, while working on Anderson Creek as a ferryman, he taunted Green B. Taylor about a girl in a nearby town whom Taylor disliked. Exasperated, Taylor hurled a large ear of corn at him. Lincoln then spanked him good and plenty. Lincoln liked to deflate boastful men. One election day, for example, while en route to the polls, he encountered a braggart named James Larkin, who boasted about his mare's great speed. Why, said Larkin, yesterday I run her five miles in four minutes, and she never drew a long breath. Lincoln replied quietly, I guess she drew a great many short ones. The consequent laughter enraged Larkin, who declared he would fight Abe if he wasn't so big. He cussed and jumped around until Abe quietly said, Now, Larkin, if you don't shut up, I'll throw you in that water. The Move to Illinois In 1830, Thomas Lincoln moved his family to a site near the hamlet of Decatur in Macon County, Illinois, where John Hanks and some of his relatives had settled two years earlier. Hanks's letters extolling the virtues of the prairie state helped induce Thomas to migrate west. His decision was abrupt. In 1829, he and Abraham had been whipsawing logs for a new cabin in Indiana and had already erected the walls. Dennis Hanks took the lead in migrating west. He removed his wife, Elizabeth, the elder daughter of Sarah Bush Lincoln, and their four children from Indiana because of an outbreak of the milk sickness. Not wanting to be separated from her daughter and grandchildren, Mrs. Lincoln prevailed upon Thomas to join Dennis and Elizabeth in Illinois. Thomas sold his farm, corn, and pigs to Indiana neighbors, disposed of his wife's lot in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, and from his church obtained a letter of dismission, a kind of recommendation to other Baptist congregations. 
Little Pigeon Creek Church records show that a month after that letter was issued, Nancy Grigsby informed the church that she was not satisfied with Brother and Sister Lincoln. The church agreed and called back their letter until satisfaction could be attained. The parties convened at William Hoskins and agreed and settled the difficulty. The substance of Mrs. Grigsby's complaint is unknown. On March 1, 1830, with his wife, son, stepson, stepdaughters, and their families, eight adults and five children all told, Thomas Lincoln set out for Illinois in a primitive wagon which Abe and his father had constructed almost entirely of wood, with few iron parts. Many neighbors, including James Grigsby, turned out to see them off. Their departure was slightly delayed by Abraham's tardiness. When he finally appeared, Grigsby noticed Thomas, ox whip in hand, looking impatiently at his son. Watch old Tom flail him, Grigsby said to a friend. But instead of a beating, Thomas gave Abraham the whip and told him to lead the way. The 225-mile journey took the family past Lick Skillet, Loafer Station, Polkberry Creek, the Embarrass River, Polk Patch, Dead Man's Grove, Purgatory Bottom, and Paradise, areas that, judging by their names, no doubt had a story of their own to tell. Problems with the crude wagon wheels, discs of solid wood, forced occasional stops, including one in Vincennes, where Lincoln visited a newspaper office and first beheld a printing press. As they crossed a river coated with a thin layer of ice, they inadvertently left behind Lincoln's dog, who could be heard in the distance howling in despair. Lincoln removed his shoes, rolled up his pants, and waded through the frigid water to rescue the canine. In recounting this story, he said, I guess I felt about as glad as the dog. Although the weather was generally mild, the roads were so wet that for long stretches, Abe found himself slogging through mud several inches deep. The Kakaskia River overflowed its banks, almost washing out the corduroy road. Following some debate, the party decided to press on, and for a few miles Abraham led the team through water so high that it threatened to sweep away wagon, oxen, and all. After two weeks, they finally reached John Hanks' spread on the Sangamon River, four miles northwest of Decatur, where they received a hearty welcome. According to Henry Whitney, Hanks was homespun, matter-of-fact, and dull to a superlative degree, but he was the very soul of generosity, truth, and probity. As of February 12, 1830, Lincoln was at last legally free to go his own way, but he did not do so. His sense of duty overruled the desire of his heart, and he postponed his self-emancipation in order to help his family as they settled into a new home. Abraham helped Hanks and Thomas Lincoln build a cabin, fence it in, and clear several acres. Conditions there were primitive. Deer and wolves roamed about freely, sometimes coming close enough to homes to be visible from doorways and windows. When building cabins for his father and others, Lincoln always served as one of the men to true up corners, a task that required a keen eye and expertise with an axe. Because he often stayed with the families who hired him as a laborer, Lincoln spent little time in this new cabin. For Macon County Sheriff William Warnick, Reuben Brown, William Butler, Charles Hanks, and William Miller, among others, he broke prairie, raised crops, and split rails. One cold day, when Miller's wife, John Hanks's sister Nancy, noticed that Lincoln's pants were worn out, she offered to make him new ones. To his protest that he had no money, she replied that he could chop wood for her instead of paying cash. In both Macon and Sangamon counties, Lincoln and John Hanks cut innumerable cords of wood and divided the profits equally. Lincoln's later reputation as a rail splitter was no fanciful invention of political publicists. Joining them in some of these labors was George Close, who described Lincoln as the toughest-looking man I ever saw, a poor boy dressed in pants made of flax and tow, cut tight at the ankle, his knees were both out. Close recalled that they had a hard time to get work. All a man could do was to keep himself in clothes. Lincoln trudged five, six, and seven miles to his day's work. As a farmhand, he was especially adept with a reap hook, 
which was hard, hot, thirsty work. At lunch break, he bolted down his food and spent most of the hour reading. Henry C. Whitney, to whom Lincoln described his year in Macon County, called that period one of the three eras of unusual hardship and misery in Lincoln's melancholy journey of life. The other two unusually painful periods, Whitney asserted, were those following the deaths of Nancy Hanks Lincoln in 1818 and his sweetheart, Ann Rutledge, in 1835. Lincoln's introduction to Illinois politics occurred in the summer of 1830 when he was working for William Butler as a plowman at Island Grove near Springfield. There he heard a speech by Peter Cartwright, a popular Methodist circuit writer campaigning for office. Butler recalled that Lincoln, though awkward and very shabbily dressed, challenged the speaker for being too dogmatic. My first special attention was attracted to Lincoln, Butler said, by the way in which he met the great preacher in his arguments, and the extensive acquaintance he showed with the politics of the state. In fact, he quite beat him in the argument. Later that season, Lincoln put to work the speaking skills he had been cultivating for years as a mimic. He attended a debate in Decatur between two candidates for the state legislature. William L. D. Ewing and John F. Posey. Posey had violated Illinois custom by failing to offer liquid refreshment to the crowd. People on the hard-ranking frontier expected candidates to treat them to alcoholic beverages. When George Close urged Lincoln to abuse Posey, Lincoln responded that he would do so as long as his friends promised not to laugh at him. Frightened when he began speaking, Lincoln quickly warmed up and delivered a respectable speech. Instead of attacking Posey, he spoke well of both candidates and offered a vision of the future of Illinois. After he finished, Ewing complimented Lincoln, calling him a bright one. Then Posey took Abe aside and asked him where he had learned so much. When Abe described his program of reading, Posey encouraged him to persevere. Thomas Lincoln did not wish to persevere in Illinois. In the summer of 1830, everyone in and around Decatur was attacked by disease-bearing mosquitoes, gallon nippers in frontier parlance, whose bite transmitted malaria, a debilitating and discouraging disease, then variously known as Illinois shakes, the ague, or simply chills and fever. Thomas and his family were seriously afflicted. He and his wife shivered uncontrollably, and their married daughter, who came to nurse them, was scarcely better off. Miserable, Thomas vowed that as soon as he got able to travel, he would get out of there. Eventually, frost killed off the mosquitoes, but relief was short-lived, for a December blizzard dumped three feet of snow on central Illinois. Soon thereafter, a freezing rain encrusted the snow with a layer of ice, followed by more snow. Then temperatures plunged below zero and remained there for a fortnight. This season would become immortalized in the annals of Illinois history as the winter of the deep snow. For two miserable months, the Lincolns and their neighbors, ill-prepared for such harsh weather, huddled captive in their cabins while livestock froze and starved outside. Abraham, putting aside his aversion to hunting, braved the cold in search of game. The deer were easy prey because they were caught fast when their sharp hooves broke through the ice crust. To a farmer he encountered, Lincoln reported, We have used up all of our corn, and now we have to go to our neighbors for assistance. One day Lincoln's feet got wet while crossing the Sangamon River as he headed for Sheriff Warnick's, and became frostbitten as he trudged two more miles to his destination. Mrs. Warnick nursed him back to health. Discouraged by mosquitoes and snowstorms, Thomas Lincoln retreated toward Indiana in the spring of 1831. En route, he stopped at the Coles County home of his sister-in-law, where she and other relatives, including John Sawyer, a good friend of Thomas from Kentucky, persuaded him to settle in their neighborhood. Thomas and his family built a cabin in nearby Buck Grove, where they stayed until 1834, when they moved to Muddy Point, also in Coles County. Three years later, they migrated to yet another location in that county, Goose Nest Prairie, near Farmington. There, Thomas would remain for the rest of his life. 
His wife, Sarah, unhappy with this nomadic existence, told the neighbors that they moved so often that it reminded her of the children of Israel trying to find the promised land. When Thomas suggested yet another move, she flatly refused. Lincoln did not accompany his family as they headed back to Indiana. In March 1831, his stepmother bundled up his meager possessions, which he slung over his shoulder, and he struck out on his own. No longer could Thomas rent him out to neighbors and attach the wages he earned in the abundant sweat of his brow. Though unsure about what he wanted to do, young Lincoln knew for certain that he did not wish to lead the crude life of a subsistence farmer, mired in poverty, superstition, and ignorance. He had had his fill of primitive backwoods agriculture and culture. Later, as a politician, he would not pander to farmers. Despite his enthusiasm for measures promoting economic growth and opportunity, he paid little attention to homestead legislation offering people free farms on government land, which many Republicans considered the best means to end poverty. In abandoning farm life, Lincoln was hardly unique. Horace Greeley echoed many commentators when he wrote, Our farmers' sons escape from their father's calling whenever they can, because it is made a mindless, monotonous drudgery. Fleeing that drudgery in what he called parental tyranny, Lincoln strove to distance himself from the world of his father, who for Abe embodied the indolence, ignorance, and backwardness that he so disliked. Lincoln's adult life clearly represented a flight from the frontier. Once he left the paternal home, Lincoln would never invite Thomas to visit him. Nor would he give Thomas the satisfaction of knowing that his name would be carried on by a grandson. Never would Thomas see his grandchildren or his daughter-in-law. Never would Lincoln perform Thomas's work as a farmer and carpenter. Never would he pursue Thomas's favorite forms of recreation, hunting and fishing. As he stepped from the Macon County cabin, Lincoln was free at last. Free at last. Chapter 3 Separated from his father, he studied English grammar. New Salem, 1831-1831. To 1834. In 1848, the 39-year-old Lincoln offered some sage advice to his law partner, William H. Herndon, who had complained that he and other young Whigs were being discriminated against by older Whigs. In denying the allegation, Lincoln urged him to avoid thinking of himself as a victim. The way for a young man to rise is to improve himself every way he can, never suspecting that anybody wishes to hinder him. Allow me to assure you that suspicion and jealousy never did help any man in any situation. There may sometimes be ungenerous attempts to keep a young man down, and they will succeed, too, if he allows his mind to be diverted from its true channel to brood over the attempted injury. Cast about and see if this feeling has not injured every person you have ever known to fall into it. By his own account, Lincoln began his emancipated life a strange, friendless, uneducated, penniless boy. After escaping from his paternal home, he spent three years preparing himself for a way of life far different from the hard scrabble existence into which he had been born. As he groped his way toward a new identity, he improved himself every way he could. Frontier Boatman, Humorist, and Jack of All Trades to earn some pennies, Lincoln accepted an offer from a Kentucky entrepreneur named Denton Offutt to take a flatboat to New Orleans. Offutt was a stocky, talkative, bibulous merchant and speculator, constantly on the lookout for quick money. He was also something of a confidence man, peddling a magical expression that would allegedly tame horses when whispered in their ears. Lincoln's friends thought Offutt gassy and rattle-brained. A sheriff, from whose jail Offutt escaped in 1834, said he tried to pass for the gentleman he was not. When Offutt approached Lincoln, he was trying to recoup losses from a failed pork-packing enterprise by buying corn, beef, and pork cheap and peddling them in the South. In February 1831, Offutt proposed to John Hanks, a skilled riverman, that he run a flatboat of goods to New Orleans. 
Hanks took off it to meet his cousin, Abraham. I am seeking employment, Lincoln reportedly said. I have had some experience in boating and boat building, and if you are in want of hands, I think I can give you satisfaction. Hanks, Lincoln, and John D. Johnston struck a deal to make the trip south as soon as the snow melted. In March, the adventuresome trio paddled a canoe from Decatur to Springfield, where they discovered Offutt in the Buckhorn Tavern, dead drunk at midday. After sobering up, Offutt confessed that he had not yet obtained a flatboat, so the first task confronting the three young men would be to build one. They hiked five miles north to the mouth of Springfield Creek, felled trees, flooded the logs to a sawmill near Sangamatown, and with the help of Charles P. Cabanus, a knowledgeable carpenter, managed to construct a serviceable vessel, 80 feet long by 18 feet wide. During the weeks it took to build the boat, Lincoln impressed the villagers of Sangamatown with both his gawky appearance and his agreeable wit. John E. Roll, who helped with the boat project, described Lincoln as an awful clumsy-looking man, with his homespun suit, cowhide boots, with his trousers strapped down under them, wearing an old slouch wool hat and a short coat that exposed several inches of suspenders whenever he bent over. Sometimes Lincoln would strip to the waist for more strenuous work, such as chopping notches and removing the resulting heavy blocks, with his pants rolled to the knees, shirt drenched with sweat, his frizzy hair combed only by his fingers. Caleb Carmen, with whom Lincoln boarded, at first regarded him as a greenhorn and a fool because of his bad appearance. A brief conversation persuaded Carmen that his larger was, in fact, a very intelligent young man, who conversed often about books and politics. When comrades swore at him for refusing to play cards, Lincoln didn't swear back or even get mad, but rather spent his leisure time reading. Among the books he perused were biographies of George Washington and Francis Marion, The Swamp Fox. Lincoln's personality and ability to tell a funny story made him a celebrity in Sangamatown. He was always very merry and full of fun, Caleb Carmen remembered. Lincoln struck Clark E. Carr as the most comical and jocose of human beings, laughing with the same zest at his own jokes as at those of others. Never, said Carr, have I seen another who provoked so much mirth, who entered into rollicking fun with such glee. He could make a cat laugh. Sangama townsmen would sit on a log as Lincoln regaled them with stories, and when he ended one in an unexpected fashion, they would laugh so hard they fell off. He was also perfectly willing to be the butt of his own jokes. One night at Carmen's house, a magician cooked eggs in the hats of several men. When asked for his headgear, Lincoln replied, Mister, the reason why I didn't give you my hat before was out of respect to your eggs, not care for my hat. His hat became known as Lincoln's frying pan. Lincoln's humor was distinctly crude, and his lifelong fondness of off-color stories became legendary. In 1859, when asked, Why do you not write out your stories and put them in a book? Lincoln drew himself up, fixed his face as if a thousand dead carcasses were shooting all their stench into his nostrils and said, Such a book would stink like a thousand privies. In Lincoln's view, clean stories lacked fun. Very nasty indeed, is how C. Henry Whitney remembered Lincoln's sense of humor. Albert Taylor Bledsoe deemed Lincoln one of the most obscene men that ever lived. But even those who disapproved sometimes could not help laughing. A New England-born lawyer who practiced with Lincoln in Illinois deplored his racy stories, yet he was frequently reduced to uncontrollable laughter because they were so funny. Lincoln and his friends were reticent about recording examples of his rough humor. Abner Y. Ellis, for example, told an interviewer, Modesty and my veneration for his memory forbids me to relate any racy Lincoln stories. Nonetheless, enough of Lincoln's humor has survived to illustrate why his Sangamatown colleagues found him hilarious. Even the reticent Abner Ellis shared this Lincoln joke with William Herndon. It appears that shortly after we had peace with England, Mr. Ethan Allen had occasion to visit England, 
and while there the English took great pleasure in teasing him, trying to make fun of the Americans, and General Washington in particular, and one day they got a picture of General Washington and hung it up the back house where Mr. Allen could see it, and they finally asked Mr. A if he saw that picture of his friend in the back house. Mr. Allen said no, but said he thought that it was a very appropriate place for an Englishman to keep it. Why, they asked. For, said Mr. Allen, there is nothing that will make an Englishman shit so quick as the sight of General Washington. Defecation was not the only bodily function that animated Lincoln's jokes. Flatulence would serve just as well, especially if the setup was richly detailed and the punchline held the sort of surprise that typified his humor. He told of a man of audacity, quick-witted, self-possessed, and equal to all occasions, who was asked to carve a turkey for a large party. The men and women surrounded the table, and the audacious man, being chosen carver, whetted his great carving knife with the steel and got down to business and commenced carving the turkey. But he expended too much force and let a fart, a loud fart, so that all the people heard it distinctly. As a matter of course, it shocked all terribly. A deep silence reigned. However, the audacious man was cool and entirely self-possessed. He was curiously and keenly watched by those who knew him well, they suspecting that he would recover in the end and acquit himself with glory. The man, with a kind of sublime audacity, pulled off his coat, rolled up his sleeves, put his coat deliberately on a chair, spat on his hands, took his position at the head of the table, picked up the carving knife, and whetted it again, never cracking a smile nor moving a muscle of his face. It now became a wonder in the minds of all the men and women how the fellow was going to get out of his dilemma. He squared himself and said loudly and distinctly, Now, by God, I'll see if I can't cut up this turkey without farting. Lincoln also poked fun at drunks. When I was a little boy, he once said, I lived in the state of Kentucky, where drunkenness was very common on election days. At an election in village near where I lived, on a day when the weather was inclement and the roads exceedingly muddy, a topper named Bill got brutally drunk and staggered down a narrow alley where he lay himself down in the mud and remained there until the dusk of the evening, at which time he recovered from his stupor. Finding himself very muddy, he immediately started for a pump, a public watering place on the street, to wash himself. On his way to the pump, another drunken man was leaning over a horse post. This, Bill mistook for the pump, and at once took hold of the arm of the man for the handle, the use of which set the occupant of the post to throwing up. Bill, believing all was right, put both hands under and gave himself a thorough washing. He then made his way to the grocery for something to drink. On entering the door, one of his comrades exclaimed in a tone of surprise, Why, Bill, what in the world is the matter? Bill said in reply, By God, you ought to have seen me before I washed. Lincoln enjoyed telling about a fellow who had a great veneration for revolutionary relics. He heard that an old lady had a dress which she had worn in the Revolutionary War. He made a special visit to this lady and asked her if she could produce the dress as a satisfaction to his love of aged things. She obliged him by opening a drawer and bringing out the article in question. The enthusiastic person took up this dress and delivered an apostrophe to it. Were you the dress, he said, that this lady once young and blooming wore in the time of Washington? No doubt when you came home from the dressmaker, she kissed you as I do now. At this the relic hunter took the old dress and kissed it heartily. The practical old lady rather resented such foolishness over an old piece of wearing apparel, and said, Stranger, if you want to kiss something old, you had better kiss my ass. It is sixteen years older than that dress. Lincoln's repertoire included body songs, too. He regaled the boys of Sangamatown with such tunes as Old, Old, Sucky Blue Skin and The Woodpecker Stopping on the Hollow Beech Tree. Lincoln was not the only member of his family with a penchant for ribaldry. His uncle Mordecai was renowned for his ability to tell smutty stories. Abner Ellis traced Lincoln's great passion for dirty stories to his early training by the Hanks boys, his cousins. Lincoln favored stories that illustrated a point, 
and disliked vulgarity for its own sake. William Herndon explained that even though Lincoln's jokes were vulgar, indecently so, yet he was not a dirty, foul-mouthed man by any means. He was raised among a peculiar people, an ignorant but good people, honest ones. Hence Mr. Lincoln preferred jokes to fables or maxims, as they, for his people, had the pith, point, and force about them to make the point luminous, clear, plain. Leonard Sweat reported that if he told a good story that was outrageously low and dirty, he never seemed to see that part of it. Almost any man that will tell a vulgar story has got, in a degree, a vulgar mind, but it was not so with him. Herndon recalled, A person who so far mistook Mr. Lincoln wants us to tell a coarse story without purpose. During its recital, Mr. Lincoln's face worked impatiently. When the man had gone, he said, I had nearly put that fellow out of the office. He disgusts me. In 1864, Lincoln told White House visitors of a lawyer who knew more stories and could tell them better than anyone I ever knew. He was the life of the bar and did more than any of us to make the dismal nights in a small county court town pass off pleasantly. But the man got religion and cleaned up his conversation and ceased his dirty stories despite the efforts of his friends to draw him out. Finally, under duress, he reluctantly retold one of the bawdy tales for which he had been famous. And it was a failure. No one laughed. The fellow had admitted expletives and hard swearing. Lincoln remembered the man, explaining, As I have only told you the plain story, it has failed to amuse you. The question is, gentlemen, whether the fault is in the story or in you. During his stay in Sangamatown, Lincoln made an impression with more than his stories and songs. After the flatboat was finished, the builders fashioned a canoe that two young men commandeered. In the middle of the raging river, the frail vessel capsized, putting the men in grave danger. Lincoln shouted to them to swim to a nearby tree and hang on. He then mounted a log, tied a rope around himself, and handed the end to some anxious spectators. Braving the current, he risked his own safety and brought the men ashore. In late April 1831, Lincoln, Hanks, Johnston, and Offutt set out for New Orleans with a boatload of bacon, pork, and corn. Years later, Lincoln recalled, I acted both as engineer and engine on that trip. After only a few miles, the boat ran aground on a mill dam at the village of New Salem. Townspeople watched curiously as Lincoln, who made a rather singular, grotesque appearance, jumped off the boat into the river and took charge. He and his crew transferred the cargo to another vessel to lighten the load. Then Lincoln borrowed an auger to drill a hole in the bow of the flatboat which hung precariously over the dam. After the water drained out, he plugged the hole, freed the boat, and the journey continued. Struck by Lincoln's ingenuity, Offa declared that he would have a steamboat built to navigate the Sangamon, and by thunder she would have to go because Lincoln would be the captain. A few miles below New Salem, the boat stopped to load some hogs, which balked when the crew tried to herd them aboard. When corn strewn on the gangplank failed to lure them, off it, in Lincoln's words, conceived the whim that he would sew up their eyes and drive them where he pleased. I can't sew the eyes up, Lincoln objected, so he held the hog's heads while off it stitched their eyes shut. The drastic scheme failed as the blind porker stayed in the lot and simply went around in circles. Finally the crew tied them up and hauled them aboard on carts. Soon after that serio-comic episode, Lincoln nearly abandoned the trip when Johnston and Hanks went on a spree farther downriver at Beardstown. Offutt had to track Lincoln down and persuade him to continue. Thereafter, the journey was uneventful. Occasionally, onlookers laughed at the strange craft with its unorthodox sail of plank and cloth. When they reached New Orleans in May, Lincoln was appalled as he had been two years earlier at the site of slavery. John Hanks alleged that he and Lincoln saw Negroes chained, maltreated, whipped, and scourged. Lincoln's heart bled, though he said nothing much and was silent from feeling, was sad, looked bad, felt bad, 
was thoughtful and abstracted. Hanks maintained that it was on this trip that he formed his opinions of slavery. It ran its iron in him, then and there. May 1831. I have heard him say, often and often. To a Lincoln biographer, Herndon reported John Hanks's recollections of the New Orleans episode. Lincoln saw a slave, a beautiful mulatto girl, sold at auction. She was felt over, pinched, trotted around to show to bidders that said article was sound, etc. Lincoln walked away from the sad, inhuman scene with a deep feeling of unsmotherable hate. John Hanks, who was two or three times examined by me, told me the above facts about the Negro girl. There is no doubt about this. Historians doubt Hanks' assertion, since Lincoln stated that Hanks did not proceed all the way to New Orleans, but had turned back from St. Louis. It is possible that Hanks reported accurately what Lincoln told him at a later time, rather than what he saw with his own eyes. It is also possible that Lincoln's memory was faulty. Herndon alleged that Lincoln often related this story, and it squares with the reminiscences of Alan Gentry's wife about Lincoln's remarks made during his first trip to New Orleans. Moreover, Caleb Carman recalled that Lincoln was opposed to slavery and said he thought it was a curse to the land. Throughout this venture, Denton Offutt grew ever more impressed with Lincoln. Lincoln can do anything, he marveled. I really believe he could take the flatboat back again up the river. Upon Lincoln's return from New Orleans, Offutt hired him to run a store and mill at New Salem. Lincoln readily accepted, delighted to have work that required little physical exertion and paid well. He had dabbled at merchandising when his family had moved to Illinois. En route, he sold needles, pins, pocket knives, eating utensils, and the like, which he had purchased as speculation just before leaving Indiana. Offutt had dreamed up the plan for a New Salem store while returning from Louisiana. Passing through St. Louis, he ordered goods shipped to New Salem and obtained the necessary license. New Salem In late July, Lincoln headed for the river village where he was remembered for his ungainly appearance and his exploits on the mill dam. Many New Salemites hailed from the Rolling Fork area of Kentucky, near Lincoln's boyhood home on Knob Creek, among them was an older brother of Lincoln's boyhood chum, Austin Gallagher. New Salem, with its two dozen families, a grain and sawmill, three stores, a saloon, grocery in frontier parlance, and a blacksmith shop, was considered an important small town. It served as a trading center for residents of Wolf, Sugar Grove, Concord, Sand Ridge, Little Grove, Athens, Irish Grove, Indian Point, Rock Creek, Clary's Grove, and other settlements. New Salem was also a rough and primitive place where violence was commonplace, and even religion reflected the crudeness of the frontier. The transplanted Kentuckians, mostly from Barron and Greene counties, were hard-shell Baptists who opposed Sunday schools and Bible societies. They devoted Saturdays to shooting matches, card games, horse racing, cock and dog fights, drinking sprees, and fisticuffs. Combatants gouged, bit, kicked, and did anything they could to prevail. On Sunday, men were seen with bruised faces, or worse still, missing fingers, eyes, or ears. Women folk placed bets on the outcome of fights. Strangers, incautious enough to play cards, lost their money and then got beaten up. Among the early settlers of Sangamon County, according to Lincoln's friend Milton Hay, the inherent meanness and vice of the human character frequently manifested itself. Some were given to brawls and violence. Some were malicious and would vent their malice in slandering a neighbor or injuring his property. Gander pulling was so popular that a field was set aside for it. A contestant would grease the neck of a gander, lash its feet together, and suspend it from a high tree limb. He would then ride his horse at a fast clip beneath the limb, reach up, grab the gander's head, and try to pull it off. If successful, he won the decapitated bird. In a frontier hamlet without a jail or whipping post, 
rowdies had little to fear if they misbehaved. When Baptists would immerse true believers in the Sangamon River, roughnecks would throw logs and animal carcasses from the high bluff, yelling and screaming all the while. From that same bluff, the entire community witnessed a fistfight in which a combatant was killed. The Clary's Grove boys were the most notorious bullies in town. We had hard knocks and hot blood, said one of their gang members, Thomas S. Edwards. We could give good knocks and take them without either whining or bearing malice. If bad blood was bred at a raisin or a shooting match, it was middling sure to be split afore sundown. We always felt like knocking off somebody's hat or tramping on somebody's moccasins. In 1833, Edwards was indicted for riot and rape. One Sally Marshall alleged that he entered her house one night, threw his coat on the floor and said that he would do as he pleased with her. He would throw her down there and fuck her, and her husband would stand and see it. New Salem's living conditions were as rough as its people. To his family in New Hampshire, Charles James Fox Clark described the village's cabins, including those of the more prosperous farmers, as not half so good as your old hog's pen, and not any larger. Those dwellings were little better than the half-faced camps of the original pioneers. A staple of the local diet was a form of bread called corn dodgers that were so hard that you could knock a Texas steer down with a chunk of it or split an end board 40 yards offhand. Writing from central Illinois in 1834, Stephen A. Douglas warned a friend in New York that persons who have been accustomed to the older and more densely settled states must expect to experience many inconveniences and perhaps, I may add, hardships if they come here. The drudgery of housework and child-rearing made life especially burdensome for women. An English observer called central Illinois heaven for men and horses, but a very different place for women and oxen. In 1830, a pioneer in nearby Taswell County confided to a relative, I pity our women very much. Then he added, I do not tell them so. Religious practices in New Salem resembled those Lincoln had witnessed in Indiana. In 1835, Charles James Fox Clark reported that there were no settled ministers except in the large towns, such as county seats, etc. All the preaching we hear is from traveling ministers, such as the Free Will Baptist, Iron Jacket Baptist, Cumberland Presbyterians, Methodists, Campbellites, etc., to disguise their ignorance, those preachers would often resort to histrionic gestures and high decibel levels. Drunkenness was common, even among children. Looking back on his early years, Lincoln recalled that intoxicating liquor was recognized by everybody, used by everybody, and reputed by nobody. It commonly entered into the first draft of the infant and the last draft of the dying man. From the sideboard of the parson, down to the ragged pocket of the homeless loafer it was constantly found. Physicians prescribed it in this, that, and the other disease. Government provided it for its soldiers and sailors. And to have a rolling or raising, a husking or hoedown, anywhere without it, was positively insufferable. Some New Englanders in the village, led by the pious Dr. John Allen, tried to civilize it by establishing a temperance society. According to New Salem tradition, Lincoln once said, while pointing to Allen, There stands the man who, years ago, was instrumental in convincing me of the evils of trafficking in and using ardent spirits. I am glad that I ever saw him. I am glad that I ever heard his testimony on this terrible subject. When the local schoolmaster joined Allen's group, he was expelled from the Baptist church because the fundamentalist congregants regarded membership in such a society as an unwarranted distraction from God's work. When the same congregation subsequently dismissed a member for drunkenness, a perplexed fellow, brandishing a whiskey flask, asked for clarification. Brethren, it seems to me that you are not consistent because you have turned out one man for taking the temperance pledge and another for getting drunk. Now, brethren, how much of this critter have I got to drink to have good standing among you? Temperance advocates in New Salem faced ridicule and stiff opposition. 
For all its drawbacks, New Salem offered residents a chance to rise based on their talent, ability, and industry. No artificial social barriers stood in anyone's way. As Stephen A. Douglas recalled of the region, no man acknowledged another his superior unless his talents, his principles, and his good conduct entitled him to that distinction. Soon after his arrival, Lincoln met the challenge presented by what Dr. Allen called a notoriously wicked and intemperate place, taking advantage of frontier equality by making friends and allies, even of the Clary's Grove boys. Storekeeper As he entered New Salem in the summer of 1831, Lincoln thought of himself as a sort of floating driftwood, swept along by the floods that inundated the region after the winter of deep snow. Because neither Offutt nor his goods had arrived yet, Lincoln had to postpone his debut as a merchant. He therefore continued as a riverman, piloting a small boat to Beardstown for Dr. David P. Nelson, who was taking his wife and family to Texas. The trip was challenging, for the river had overflowed its banks, and Lincoln sometimes ran far out into the prairie. At Beardstown, he awaited the arrival of Offutt's merchandise, which was to be transported to New Salem by a fellow named Potter. When Potter asked how he would recognize Lincoln, Offutt replied, You can't mistake him. He's as long as a beanpole, and as awkward as he is long. With nothing much to do after the Beardstown trip, Lincoln, as he put it, rapidly made acquaintances and friends. The genial personality that won him popularity in Sangamatown did the same in New Salem. One new friend, schoolteacher Mentor Graham, was clerking at the polls on August 1st, an election day, when Lincoln entered to vote for the pro-Henry Clay candidate for Congress, an unpopular choice in that heavily Democratic precinct. In need of an assistant, Graham asked the rangy newcomer if he could write. I can make a few rabbit tracks, Lincoln replied. Graham pressed him into service and later testified that Lincoln performed the duties with great felicity, much fairness, and honesty and impartiality. During lulls, Lincoln delighted his colleagues and voters with jokes and stories. Another townsman, Royal A. Clary, recalled that he was humorous, witty, and good-natured, and that geniality drew him into our notice so quick. Thanks to those qualities, the penniless newcomer had nothing, only plenty of friends, as his companion George Close put it. In September 1831, Lincoln finally began his career as Offutt's store clerk in a rented log storehouse, dispensing coffee, tea, gunpowder, liquor, tobacco, and other commodities. Offutt hired two assistants for Lincoln, Charles Maltby and William Green, a 19-year-old Tennessean who, like Lincoln, was a highly entertaining storyteller. Green's main duty at the store was to assess applicants for credit. The three young men slept at the store and took meals at Bowling Green's home, three-quarters of a mile from the village. Green found his tall colleague attentive, kind, generous, and accommodating, and recalled that he and Lincoln slept on the same cot, and when one turned over, the other had to do likewise. Lincoln became a popular store clerk. Jesse Baker said that he drew much attention from the very first. His striking, awkward, and generally peculiar appearance advertised the store roundabout and drew many customers, who never quit trading there as long as young Abe Lincoln clerked in the establishment. He gave good weight, he was chock full of accommodation, and he wasn't a smart aleck. Lincoln's integrity made him especially appealing to women customers, who trusted him to give an accurate assessment of the wares. Mrs. Hannah Armstrong said, she liked him first-rate because he was so pleasant and kind. One woman bought a dress for which she paid $2.37. Later that day, Lincoln realized he had overcharged her six and a quarter cents, which he refunded to her that very evening. Another woman asked for a pound of tea, which he measured out on a scale inadvertently using the half-pound weight rather than the pound. When he discovered his error, he promptly went to her home and gave her another half-pound of tea. Episodes such as these earned him the sobriquet, Honest Abe. 
Although he usually treated his customers kindly, Lincoln could on occasion lose patience with them. He took offense at one Harvey Lee Ross, who asked to see some gloves. Lincoln showed him a pair that he identified as being made of dogskin. When Ross asked how he knew they were dogskin, Lincoln, rasped at the challenging tone of the question, replied, I will tell you how I know they are dogskin gloves. Jack Clary's dog killed Tom Watkins' sheep, and Tom Watkins' boy killed the dog, and old John Mounts tanned the dogskin, and Sally Spears made the gloves, and that is how I know they are dogskin gloves. Lincoln took umbrage at another customer, Charlie Revis, who used profanity around women in the store. When Revis ignored warnings to stop, Lincoln accosted him. I have spoken to you a number of times about swearing in this store in the presence of ladies, he said angrily, and you have not heeded. Now I am going to rub the lesson in so you will not forget again. Lincoln grabbed Revis by the arm, hustled him out of the store, threw him to the ground, and rubbed smart weed in his face. Lincoln, Maltby, and Green assumed new responsibilities when Offutt rented the flour and sawmills, whose dam had obstructed the flatboat earlier that year. These mills, the only ones within twenty miles of New Salem, brought in a great deal of business. There, Lincoln helped unload wheat, measure it out, tie up bags, and collect payments. Offutt also kept Lincoln busy splitting rails and constructing a pen for one thousand hogs. Even with all these added duties, Lincoln still had a fair amount of free time. Saturdays were busy when farmers came to town in large numbers, but the rest of the week was quieter. Lincoln, therefore, could devote much of his time to the mill while Green and Maltby minded the store. Most business was transacted between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. After the store closed, Lincoln would usually devote an hour to wrestling or other physical exercise. With his extremely long legs, he was especially successful in jumping contests. Lincoln did not spend time gambling, a form of amusement he condemned. When he urged Green to give it up, his friend protested that he was ninety cents in debt to a demanding creditor, and so could not quit until he had won it back. Lincoln offered him a deal. Billy, if you will promise that you will never gamble again, I'll put up a job that will beat him. Green promised to stop. If you will only help me get ahead of him, I swear it. Well, said Lincoln, when he comes into the store again, you bet him one of those seven-dollar hats that I can drink out of a full whiskey barrel. When the opportunity arose, Green made the wager, and the men turned to Lincoln. Deceptively strong and uncommonly clever, the towering Lincoln squatted down and lifted the one end of the barrel on one knee then lifted the other end on the other knee, and stooping over, actually succeeded in taking a drink out of the bunghole, which, however, he immediately spat out. Now free of debt, Green kept his word and gave up gambling. Like Green, Denton Offit also liked to wager, and a bet he made led to one of the formative episodes in Lincoln's young life. Offit bet rival storekeeper, Bill Clary, five dollars, that his lanky clerk could out-wrestle any challenger, including Jack Armstrong, leader of the Clary's Grove Boys. Offit reportedly had won fifty dollars in New Orleans, betting that Lincoln could lift one thousand pounds. As one of the Clary's Grove Boys remembered, he and his cohorts haw-hawed at this a little, but thought it was some of Dent's wind, for Dent could lie like a peddler. But Jack Armstrong, the pride of our settlement, him that we used to call Salem's glory, tough as whit leather and wiry as a cat, the man that never could be throwed and we believed never could be throwed, commenced talking back at Dent, saying that his bones was aching with nothing but strength, that he had been laying lazy long enough, and when like a good freshener of a wrestle first rate. Lincoln, who did not share Armstrong's enthusiasm, was quite irritated by Offutt's challenge. He had become popular in New Salem and did not wish to lose the goodwill of anybody. Moreover, he was by nature a peacemaker, not a fighter. Whenever he and his friend Russell Godeby of New Salem saw a fight taking place, Lincoln would laughingly say, Let's go and break up the row. Back in Indiana, he had allegedly settled a bitter quarrel between two neighbors over the ownership of a goose. 
But Lincoln also knew he could not back down from Offutt's challenge to the Clary's Grove boys without being branded a coward. The day of the match, a large crowd gathered near Offutt's store. Though Armstrong was exceptionally strong and a clever wrestler, he found it difficult to cope with Lincoln's great reach and height. As the contest went on, the newcomer was getting the better of it. Just as it seemed that Lincoln would prevail, Bill Clary shouted to his man, "'Throw him anyway, Jack!' Breaking the rules of wrestling with a hold permissible only in scuffling, Armstrong instantly threw Lincoln, who angrily said that if it ever came right, he would give Bill Clary a good licking. At that point, a general fight nearly broke out, but Lincoln fearlessly quelled the threat. John Todd Stewart, Lincoln's friend, mentor, and first law partner, called this contest the turning point in Lincoln's life. His courage, strength, and good-natured acceptance of Armstrong's violation of the rules impressed New Salemites, especially the Clary's Grove boys. They honored him with invitations to referee their horse races, where he further cemented his reputation for fairness. Armstrong became his fast friend and admirer. The popularity he thus gained helped lay the foundation for his political career. As long as Lincoln lived in New Salem, the Clary's Grove boys supported him at election time. Only later, when he ran for Congress from Springfield, did they vote against him. In those days, support from the Butcher Knife boys was essential to get a man elected. That Lincoln won such support without sharing their enthusiasm for drinking, gander-pulling, and general mayhem was a tribute to his remarkable capacity for making and keeping friends. Lincoln's essential fairness won him a host of other admirers. A friend who judged a race along with Lincoln declared that he was the fairest man I ever had to deal with. If Lincoln is in the county when I die, I want him to be my administrator, for he is the only man I ever met with that was wholly and purely and unselfishly honest. A cockfight that Lincoln officiated would be immortalized during the Civil War. Bab McNabb's rooster was pitted against Tom Watkins' bird. But when Lincoln threw the two feathered combatants into the ring, McNabb's shunned the challenge. Its furious owner leapt into the pit, seized the bird, and flung him onto a pile of wood, where he raised his head, spread his wing, and crowed lustily. In disgust, McNabb addressed him, "'Yes, you little... You are great on dress parade, but you ain't worth a damn in a fight.' Lincoln remembered the incident years later, and, in exasperation, he likened General George B. McClellan to McNabb's rooster. Self-Education Once established as a promising young man in New Salem, Lincoln began steadily bettering himself, preparing for a career in politics. Most nights after he and Charles Maltby closed the store, Lincoln would settle into reading and study from 8 o'clock to 11, and then review what he had done. At first, Lincoln concentrated on English grammar, for he did not want to seem like an uneducated bumpkin. In an 1860 autobiographical sketch, written in the third person, he stated, After he was 23 and had separated from his father, he studied English grammar, imperfectly, of course, but so as to speak and write as well as he now does. Lincoln began to study grammar soon after he took up his duties as a clerk. The village school teacher, Mentor Graham, alleged that Lincoln told him one day that he had a notion of studying grammar. Graham replied, If you ever expect to go before the public in any capacity, I think it is the best thing you can do. Eager to begin, Lincoln mused, If I had a grammar, I would commence now. Curiously, Graham himself did not own such a book, but he thought John Vance did. Lincoln promptly walked several miles to Vance's, borrowed a copy of Samuel Kirkham's English Grammar and Familiar Lectures, and then turned his immediate and almost undivided attention to English Grammar. Lincoln found that volume a puzzler at the start, with its four, five, and six-headed rules about as complicated to beginners as the Longer Catechism and the Thirty-Nine Articles to Young Ministers. A new Salemite called Kirkham's dry book the hardest grammar I think anybody ever studied. 
Night after night, Lincoln labored over the rules and regulations of proper English usage. His assistant, William G. Green, listened to him recite its rules, correcting him when he made mistakes. Green recalled that when he got through with that grammar, he knew more grammar than the man who made the book. Lincoln mastered grammar easily and quickly, obtaining a working knowledge of the subject in a few weeks. Though Green provided only a little help, his brother Lynn, who had attended Illinois College, spent several days instructing him. Years later, Lincoln told Jonathan Baldwin Turner, who served on the faculty at Illinois College from 1833 to 1848, that his only instruction in the English language had been from me, through the Green Brothers of Tallulah, Illinois, while they were studying at Illinois College, and he was a hired hand working for their mother in the harvest fields. Another helpmate for Lincoln, Dr. Jason Duncan, modestly stated that Abraham requested me to assist him in the study of English grammar, which I consented to do to the extent of my limited ability. Lincoln's rapid progress amazed Duncan. His application through the winter of 1831 to 1832 was assiduous and untiring. His intuitive faculties were surprising. He seemed to master the construction of the English language and apply the rules for the same in a most astonishing manner. In fact, Lincoln never completely overcame his primitive linguistic background. Even in his presidential years, his speech betrayed his frontier roots. He began his celebrated 1860 Cooper Union speech by saying, Mr. Chairman. As president, he said, only for only, own for one, wall for well, thar for there, was for were, get for forget, ye for you, rare for rear, and one on em for one of them. George Templeton Strong, who recorded some of these Hoosierisms, called the president's grammar weak and deemed him a barbarian, Scythian, Yahoo, or gorilla in respect of outside polish. Strong heard Lincoln say, Me and the attorney general's very chicken-hearted, in his antebellum career as a lawyer, he used ain't freely, greeting friends in court with a jocular, Ain't you glad to see me? Or, Ain't you glad I come? During his famous 1858 debates with Stephen A. Douglas, he one day asked, Ain't hit here? When a magician at the White House asked for the president's handkerchief, Lincoln replied, You got me now. I ain't got any. He said of a supposed relative, She ain't my cousin, but she thinks she is. Settled in New Salem, Lincoln became a bookworm. He occasionally indulged in sports and games, but never to the neglect of his work or studies. If he had a few minutes of spare time at the store, or later at the post office, he would crack open a book. He read walking to dinner at the boarding house and strolling about New Salem. When he boarded with the family of the village cooper, Henry Onstott, Lincoln would read after work lying down before the fireplace. When Mrs. Onstott, busy preparing dinner, complained that he was in her way, he replied, Just step over me, Susan. After the meal, he would resume reading. Now and then, Lincoln would walk around reading Kirkham's grammar and would mischievously grab young Robert Rutledge, son of New Salem's innkeeper, hold him under one arm, and nonchalantly continue his ramble, pretending not to notice the lad's yells and kicks. Eventually, he would express mock surprise at discovering the youngster's presence. In New Salem, Lincoln continued devouring newspapers, just as he had done in Indiana. Like many another merchant, he found this habit advantageous in business. He looked forward to the weekly arrival of the St. Louis Republican and the Louisville Journal, two leading newspapers of the West. He particularly relished the journal's politics and wit, subscribing to it even when he lacked the money to buy decent clothes. Lincoln also regularly perused the Sangamo Journal, a Whig paper from nearby Springfield, which served as his political Bible. Lincoln especially enjoyed Shakespeare's plays and the poetry of Burns, Cowper, Gray, Pope, and Byron 
though he subordinated such pleasure-reading to his serious self-improvement studies. In Byron's poems, Lincoln evidently responded to the juxtaposition of brooding gloom and rollicking humor. He highly prized Pope's essay on man, especially the following lines. All nature is but art unknown to thee, all chance direction which thou canst not see, all discord, harmony not understood, all partial evil, universal good, and spite of pride, in erring reason's spite. One truth is clear, whatever is, is right. Burns was Lincoln's favorite. After studying hard for two or three hours in the evening, he would relax with the volume of his poems. He especially liked humorous verses like Tom O'Shanter, Address to the Dial, Highland Mary, Bonnie Jean and Dr. Hornbrook, Holy Willie's Prayer, and Epistle to a Young Friend, which he memorized and recited with a Scottish accent. Burns never touched a sentiment without carrying it to its ultimate expression and leaving nothing further to be said, Lincoln declared. He may well have identified with Burns, a poor farm boy who grew up loathing the drudgery and ignorance of rural life, wrote satirical verses, cherished company before whom he would tell stories and recite poetry, suffered from depression, and carried a book with him to read whenever he could find time. Later, as an attorney traveling the legal circuit, Lincoln always packed a volume of the Scottish poet in his saddlebags. At times, melancholy would overtake Lincoln as he recalled his hard scrabble youth. In such a mood, he read The Cotter's Saturday Night by Burns or Thomas Gray's Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard or a poem by William Cowper. Lincoln may have detected parallels between New Salem and the settings of Burns's poetry. A New Salemite thought The Cotter's Saturday Night would describe many a prairie cabin here. Lincoln also esteemed Edgar Allan Poe's poetry, particularly The Raven, which he repeated often. He also liked Poe's short stories, notably The Gold Bug and The Facts in the Case of M. Vladimir. Shakespeare brought Lincoln special pleasure. In New Salem, he would sit on the banks of the Sangamon and quote the bard of Avon with Jack Kelso, a sometime handyman and impractical devotee of poetry. He and Jack were constant companions, frequently seen conversing and arguing. Lincoln may have boarded with Kelso and his wife. After he left New Salem, Lincoln would regularly carry a copy of Shakespeare's works with him when traveling. He liked, above all, Shakespeare's political characters, Richard III, Hamlet, Macbeth, Julius Caesar, and Coriolanus. His favorite plays were Hamlet and Macbeth. As president, he told an actor that he had read and reread Shakespeare, perhaps as frequently as any unprofessional reader. Lincoln had little use for novels. He once told Henry Whitney that he had never read a novel clear through. But that was not quite the case, for he is known to have read Nathaniel Beverly Tucker's George Balcom, a novel, published in 1836, and to have recommended it to Abner Y. Ellis. Ellis, in turn, lent him plays by Edward Bulwer-Lytton, James Kenney, and John M. Morton. Lincoln's course of self-improvement drew him into the meetings of the Literary and Debating Society in New Salem, presided over by the warm, generous, and sociable James Rutledge. When Lincoln first spoke before the group in the winter of 1831 to 1832, standing with his hands in his pockets, everyone expected him to tell a funny story. To their amazement, he focused seriously on the question before the society. As he proceeded, he awkwardly gestured to emphasize his points, which were so convincing that they astonished his largely uneducated audience. After the meeting, Rutledge told his wife that there was more in Abe's head than wit and fun, that he was already a fine speaker, that all he lacked was culture to enable him to reach a high destiny which he knew was in store for him. As Lincoln gained more experience speaking at these unpretentious meetings, sometimes held in a vacant storeroom, he displayed the logic, intelligence, and spontaneity that would make him the most formidable debater in the New Salem area. 
David Berner recalled that arguments seemed to come right out of him without study or long preparation. Lincoln's skills as a debater may have been honed by Mentor Graham, whose forte as a teacher was elocution. The schoolmaster would have his charges, repeat a sentence twenty or more times, until they had delivered it properly. Quite possibly he had Lincoln perform these exercises. No records of Rutledge's debating club survive, but those of some nearby clubs have been preserved. Such clubs usually met once a month, had rules about such things as orderly behavior and strictures against invoking God in argument, and often required that members participate in debate, declamation, composition, criticism, and lecturing. Anonymous papers were solicited and read aloud at meetings, though the bylaws of the Rock Creek Lyceum stipulated that an anonymous reader shall examine the contents of his box, and on finding any obscene documents by this act, be empowered to burn them without further ceremony. Order did not always prevail. At least one of these clubs, the Rock Creek Lyceum, had its meeting broken up by roughnecks. Fittingly, at the time they were debating the question, which is the greatest evil which the human family is infested with? Because of the disruption, however, they adjourned before reaching a verdict. Debate topics from this period in Illinois included what should be done with free blacks if slavery were abolished, and whether or not slavery had been beneficial. There were also debates on public works, temperance, banking, public land policy, marriage, and woman's voting in education. During his political career, Lincoln would address many of these issues. Lincoln's studies progressed well at New Salem, but his career as a clerk did not, primarily because the flighty offit neglected the store. In early 1832, the store failed, leaving Lincoln and Maltby unemployed. Such misfortune was common on the frontier. As a resident of central Illinois observed in 1835, merchandising is a tolerably good business for those who understand it well and have a sufficient capital to meet all of their engagements. We have but a few such merchants here, however, and consequently merchandising among the suckers, that is, Illinoisans, is considered rather a dangerous business. At this time, Vincent A. Bogue, owner of a store and mill near Springfield, announced that he would cut freight rates in half by bringing a steamboat, the Talisman, to Springfield. Farmers could use it to ship their crops cheaply to St. Louis and New Orleans. Merchants, mechanics, and professional men also stood to gain. Lincoln and Maltby, out of work after the failure of Offutt's store, saw an opportunity to make New Salem a shipping point for the new steamer. They bought a large log building, which they planned to use for storing and forwarding merchandise and crops. Bogue hired Lincoln and others to clear the channel of the Sangamon. In March, the little vessel reached New Salem, where part of its cargo was stored at Lincoln and Maltby's warehouse, and proceeded upriver as far as Portland Landing, a few miles from Springfield. Just as success seemed within reach, the water level began to drop, forcing the talisman, on which Lincoln served as an assistant pilot, to turn back. The boat retreated slowly in the face of stiff prairie winds, making only three or four miles a day. A sense of deja vu may have overcome Lincoln when the vessel stuck on the same New Salem mill dam that had snagged his flatboat a year earlier. By this time, the boat was in sad shape, with the cabin and upper portions severely damaged by trees overhanging the sluggish river. The crew tore away part of the dam and retreated ignominiously to Beardstown, their mission a failure. After pocketing his $40 fee, Lincoln trudged back to New Salem, where his warehousing business met the same melancholy fate as Offutt's store. Black Hawk War Service when Lincoln returned from Beardstown, he found New Salem astir with excitement over brewing trouble. Chief Blackhawk had led 800 members of the so-called British Band of Sauk and Muskoki, or Fox tribes, across the Mississippi to repossess lands in northern Illinois that they had earlier ceded to the U.S. government. 
Governor John Reynolds called up the militia. Before the Black Hawk War would end in August, 10,000 state militiamen, aided by one-third of the U.S. regular army, would spend $2 million to chase several hundred Indian warriors from Illinois. Seventy-two whites and 600 to 1,000 Indians were killed. On April 21, 1832, Lincoln and 67 others from the New Salem area responded to the call-up. Militiamen chose their own officers, and a prosperous sawmill owner, William Kirkpatrick, was confident that he would be elected the company captain. To his intense disappointment, however, the volunteers preferred Lincoln instead. Although Lincoln was reluctant to stand for the office, his friends grabbed him, pushed him forward, and lined up behind him to indicate their choice. Few stood behind Kirkpatrick, who was crushed by the result. Lincoln gleefully exclaimed to William G. Green, I'll be damned, Bill, but I've beat him. This first electoral victory of his life, Lincoln wrote in 1859, was a success which gave me more pleasure than any I have had since. Lincoln's unit, the 4th Illinois Regiment of Mounted Volunteers, part of General Samuel Whiteside's brigade, included some Clairsgrove boys. One of its members described the 4th as the hardest set of men he ever saw. The poet William Cullen Bryant portrayed them as a hard-looking set of men, unkempt and unshaven, wearing shirts of dark calico, and sometimes calico capotes. Lincoln's toughness, fairness, and native ingenuity made him an effective officer, although not everything went smoothly for him. When he issued his first order as captain, he was told, Go to the devil, sir! He may have had some rudimentary militia training in Indiana, but he knew little of military practice or terminology. One day, as he was drilling his troops, he wanted them to pass through a gate, but he could not recall the command for having them turn endwise for that purpose. So he improvised, shouting, This company is dismissed for two minutes, when it will fall in again on the other side of the gate. Lincoln served three brief tours of duty, from late April to mid-July. But to his disappointment, he saw no combat in the Black Hawk War. He had occasion, however, to witness its horrors. During his first tour as captain of the 4th Illinois, he marched west to the Illinois River, then north to the Mississippi, and finally to Rock Island, where he and his men were officially mustered into U.S. service. They proceeded up the Rock River to Dixon's Ferry, then south to Ottawa, where they were disbanded, but not before they had observed casualties. On May 15th, Lincoln and his men found the corpses of eleven soldiers, all scalped, some with the heads cut off, many with their throats cut and otherwise barbarously mutilated. These were casualties of the battle at Stillman's Run, where a small band of Indians had routed a much larger militia force. A week later, near Ottawa, Lincoln and his men discovered the mutilated bodies of women and children hanging upside down. A member of Lincoln's company reported, We saw the scalps they had taken, scalps of old women and children. The Indians scalped an old grandmother, scalped her, hung her scalp on a ramrod, that it might be seen and aggravate the whites. They cut one woman open, hung a child that they had murdered in the woman's belly that they had gutted, Strong men wept at this. Hard-hearted men cried. In this charged atmosphere, Lincoln showed courage when his company grew visibly alarmed at a threat posed by a large force of Indians. He was riding a borrowed horse at the time, and though it was more dangerous to march along with his men rather than remain in the saddle, Lincoln sought out the horse's owner, returned it, and took his chances on the ground. At the end of May, after a month's service, the 1,400-man volunteer army disbanded. Only 300 of them, Lincoln included, re-enlisted. For the other 1,100, army life had turned out to be less agreeable than they had anticipated. They insisted on returning home for, they claimed, their enlistment was nearly up. They had to tend their crops and business back home, and they had not enlisted simply to chase Indians across Wisconsin. Moreover, they found their commanding officers inadequate, especially General Sam Whiteside, a legendary hand-to-hand -hand fighter, but a failure as a brigade commander. 
He knew little of tactics and would not take charge of his men. Lincoln re-enlisted because, as he put it, I was out of work, and there being no danger of more fighting, I could do nothing better. He joined Elijah Isles's company of 61 other officers from the original force. Lincoln was mustered into U.S. service by Lieutenant Robert Anderson, who, in 1861, would command Fort Sumter when it fell to the Confederacy. The company formed part of a cavalry force charged with protecting the frontier until a new army could be raised. They scouted in northern Illinois, reassuring settlers and menacing Blackhawk as best they could. While undertaking a risky mission to Galena, they paused to bury the victims of yet another massacre. On June 20th, Lincoln volunteered for his final tour as a private in Dr. Jacob Early's Independent Spy Company, a 36-man outfit that primarily conveyed messages and conducted reconnaissance. On one occasion, the men came upon the corpses of several troops killed at Kellogg's Grove and buried them, using their hatchets and hands to dig graves. Lincoln described the scene vividly. The red light of the morning sun was streaming upon them as they lay, heads toward us on the ground, and every man had a round red spot on the top of his head, about as big as a dollar, where the redskins had taken his scalp. It was frightful, but it was grotesque, and the red sunlight seemed to paint everything all over. In 1860, Lincoln's political opponents would belittle Early's unit as useless, claiming that it was held in general disrepute with men and officers of every other part of the army. Military life had its sociable moments for Lincoln and his mates. When not marching, they held foot races, swam, wrestled, played checkers, chess, and cards, and listened to Lincoln as he regaled them with his vast repertoire of stories. They baked bread on ramrods, ate fried meat off of elm bark, and ground coffee in tin cups with their hatchet handles. Of a ration of chickens, Lincoln said, They are much like eating saddlebags. Then added, But I think the stomach can accomplish much today. Lincoln was elected water bearer, a post he readily accepted, in part because it exempted him from less agreeable chores, such as cooking or gathering wood. During his three-week stint with the spy battalion, he and John Todd Stewart joined others in search of feminine companionship at Galena. Stewart, who came to know Lincoln well in the Black Hawk War, recollected that they went to the whorehouses. General James D. Henry went. His magnetism drew all the women to himself. All went purely for fun, devilment, nothing else. All in all, Stewart remembered, he and Lincoln had a first-rate time on this campaign. We were well provided. The whole thing was a sort of frolic. Lincoln's cheerful, agreeable nature stood him in good stead. According to Stewart, Lincoln had no military qualities whatever, except that he was a good, clever fellow, and kept the esteem and respect of his men. He made a very good captain. As an officer, Lincoln looked out for his men. When a regular army officer insisted that his own troops must enjoy preferment in rations and pay, and then ordered Lincoln to perform an unauthorized act, he reluctantly obeyed. But he protested, Sir, you forget that we are not under the rules and regulations of the War Department at Washington, are only volunteers under the orders and regulations of Illinois. Keep in your own sphere, and there will be no difficulty. But resistance will hereafter be made to your unjust orders. And, further, my men must be equal in all particulars in rations, arms, camps, etc., to the regular army. Acknowledging that Lincoln's complaint was just, and realizing that he was determined to have his men treated fairly, the officer thereafter saw to it that the volunteers received the same treatment as the regulars. Lincoln's action endeared him to most of his men. Lincoln was not popular with everyone, however. His superiors disciplined him for firing his pistol near the camp and for allowing his troops to become drunk. In the first instance, he was arrested for a day, and in the second, he was made to carry a wooden sword for two days. Years later, some privates in the company that he commanded disparaged Lincoln's leadership to a Democratic historian 
and Confederate veteran John F. Snyder, who reported that they never spoke in malice of Lincoln, but always in the spirit of ridicule. They regarded him as a joke, an absurdity, and had serious doubts of his courage. Any old woman, they said, would have made a more creditable commander of a company than he did. Profoundly ignorant of military matters, and, from fear of losing his popularity, he made no pretense or effort to enforce discipline or control his men in any way. In fact, Lincoln occasionally defied his men. One day, an old Indian entered the camp, bearing a note signed by Lewis Cass, attesting to his good character. Several troops menaced him, swearing that they had volunteered to fight Indians, and that they intended to do so now. Lincoln interposed himself between them and the Indians, saying, Men, this must not be done. He must not be shot and killed by us. Even when some accused the man of being a spy, Lincoln would not budge. This is cowardly on your part, Lincoln, a comrade charged. If any man thinks I am a coward, let him test it, Lincoln replied, drawing himself up to his full height. One member of the regiment protested, Lincoln, you are larger and heavier than we are. This you can guard against. Choose your weapons, Lincoln retorted. That challenge abruptly ended all charges of cowardice. This episode was one of the first times William Green ever witnessed Lincoln's righteous anger. He would do justice to all, though the heavens fell, Green noted. On another occasion, Lincoln's sense of fairness cost his troops money. When both his company and that of Lorenzo Dow Thompson of St. Clair wanted the same campsite, Lincoln agreed to wrestle Thompson in order to settle who would get the prize. As he later recalled, he boastfully told my boys I could throw him, and they could bet what they pleased. Lincoln added, You see, I had never been thrown. You may think a wrestle, or wrassle, as we called such contests of skill and strength, was a small matter. But I tell you, the whole army was out to see it. Thompson had first choice of holds, and when Lincoln felt the strength of the man's grip, he realized he was in for a struggle. After several attempts, Thompson threw him. My boys yelled out, A dog fall, which meant then a drawn battle. But I told my boys it was fair, and then said to Thompson, Now it's your turn to go down, as it was my hold then. Indian hug. We took our holds again, and after the fiercest struggle of the kind that I ever had, he threw me again, almost as easily at my hold as at his own. Lincoln's men protested, unwilling to lose their bet, but he insisted that the man actually threw me, and did so fairly. Many years later, Lincoln, as president, wanted to appoint Thompson to some office, as he explained, just to show him I didn't bear any malice. Thompson, for his part, esteemed Lincoln highly for his sense of humor and because he was much of a man. As a wrestler, Lincoln did better against the champion of the Southern companies, who, he recalled, was at least two inches taller and somewhat heavier. But, Lincoln said, I reckoned that I was the most wiry, and soon after I had tackled him, I gave him a hug, lifted him off the ground, and threw him flat on his back. That settled his hash. Lincoln took pride in his wrestling skills. When, during his presidency, he was told that George Washington had won fame as a wrestler, he said, If George was loafing around here now, I should be glad to have a tussle with him, and I rather believe that one of the plain people of Illinois would be able to manage the aristocrat of old Virginia. In 1848, as Lincoln ridiculed Democratic presidential nominee Lewis Cass, he poked fun at his own service record. In the days of the Black Hawk War, I fought, bled, and came away, he told his fellow representatives on the floor of the U.S. House. I was not at Stillman's defeat, but I was about as near it as Cass was to Hull's surrender, and, like him, I saw the place very soon afterwards. It is certain I did not break my sword, for I had none to break, but I bent a musket pretty badly on one occasion. If General Cass went in advance of me in picking huckleberries, I guess I surpassed him in charges upon the wild onions. If he saw any live fighting Indians, it was more than I did. But I had a good many bloody struggles with the mosquitoes. 
and although I never fainted from loss of blood, I can truly say I was often very hungry. Despite this self-mockery, Lincoln felt proud of his role in the Black Hawk War, which proved valuable financially and politically. He earned $175 and 40 acres of public land, gained popularity among both soldiers and civilians by his service in the war, and made friendships that would prove important for his future careers as a politician and lawyer, most notably with John Todd Stewart, John J. Hardin, Edward D. Baker, and Joseph Gillespie. Though he saw no combat, he did get a taste of war, and his selection as captain whetted his appetite for future electoral contests. Lincoln's military service ended in mid-July when he was mustered out in Wisconsin. With George M. Harrison, he walked rather than rode most of the way home, for their horses had been stolen the night before their departure. At Peoria, they bought a canoe, paddled to Havana, sold the boat, and completed their 250-mile journey on foot. First Bid for Elective Office Upon returning to New Salem, Lincoln threw himself into the political campaign, which he had decided to enter back in March. After his Literary Society debut the previous winter, James Rutledge had urged him to run for the legislature. At first, Lincoln balked, fearing he had no chance, but Rutledge suggested that a canvas of the country would bring him prominently before the people and in time would do him good. Other friends seconded the idea, but for a different reason. James Matheny remembered that the idea of Lincoln running for the legislature was regarded as a joke. The boys wanted some fun. He was so uncouth and awkward, and so illy dressed that his candidacy afforded a pleasant diversion for them. But it was not expected that it would go any further. In March, Lincoln finally agreed to run and issued a lengthy announcement of his candidacy. John McNamara helped him compose the document and corrected the grammar. Like many other frontier merchants, Lincoln ran as a Whig, but as soon as he announced his intention, the Black Hawk War broke out. By the time it ended, he had only a few weeks to conduct the campaign for the legislature. With the election looming on August 6th, Lincoln's chances seemed poor, for he was a little-known Whig in a Democratic district. His formal campaign announcement made his principles clear. He rejected the Jacksonian Creed, which the Democratic Review summarized in 1838. As little government as possible, that little emanating from and controlled by the people, and uniform in its application to all. Democrats in general believed that the only assertive action that the federal government should undertake was aggressive foreign expansionism. Whigs, on the other hand, favored positive government. A leading Whig spokesman, Horace Greeley of the New York Tribune, explained in 1845, The Commonwealth is the term best expressing the Whig idea of a state or nation, and our philosophy regards a government with hope and confidence as an agency of the community through which vast and beneficent ends may be accomplished. Unlike the Democrats, who regard government with distrust and aversion, as an agency mainly of corruption, oppression, and robbery. The great fundamental principle of Whiggery, Greeley declared, was that government is not merely a machine for making war and punishing felons, but is bound to do all that is fairly within its power to promote the welfare of the people, that its legitimate scope is not merely negative, repressive, defensive, but also affirmative, creative, constructive, beneficent. Lincoln shared the Whig vision. He argued that the legitimate object of government is to do for the people whatever need to be done, but which they cannot, by individual effort, do at all or do so well for themselves. There are many such things. Some of them exist independently of the injustice in the world. Making and maintaining roads, bridges, and the like. Providing for the helpless young and afflicted. Common schools and disposing of deceased men's property are instances. In his 1832 campaign announcement, Lincoln above all championed government support for internal improvements that would enable subsistence farmers to escape rural poverty 
through participation in the market economy. That the poorest and most thinly populated countries would be greatly benefited by the opening of good roads and in the clearing of navigable streams within their limits is what no person will deny. Lincoln, who knew firsthand about poor and thinly populated places, wanted to spare others the ox-like drudgery that rural isolation had imposed on him and his family. To that end, he recommended affordable projects, primarily to facilitate navigation of the Sangamon River, a subject widely discussed that spring as excitement over the steamboat Talisman peaked. Lincoln justly claimed to have some expertise in navigating the Sangamon. From my peculiar circumstances, it is probable that for the last twelve months I have given as particular attention to the stage of the water in this river as any other person in the country. For modest sums, he predicted, the river could be straightened and its channel cleared. Desirable as other improvements might be, like canals and railroads, their high cost produced a heart-appalling shock. Lincoln suggested another technique for liberating people from rural poverty, usury laws. The baneful and corroding system of lending money at extortionate interest rates for the benefit of a few individuals injured the general interests of the community by effectively imposing a heavy tax on borrowers. His implicit message was clear. People could not escape poverty without access to loans at reasonable interest rates. It was a popular issue. In 1833, Illinois legislators outlawed interest rates above 12% for loans of a year or longer. Yet another means for emancipating frontiersmen won Lincoln's approval. Public education, which he deemed the most important subject which we as a people can be engaged in. The kind of superstitious, primitive ignorance that surrounded him in Kentucky and Indiana could be banished by education, which would in turn promote morality, sobriety, enterprise, and industry. Lincoln might have added that, just as he had observed the Sangamon River closely, so too was he intimately familiar with backwoods immorality, drunkenness, indolence, and sloth. He longed to see the day when that kind of world, the world of his father, would disappear. In the final paragraph of his campaign statement, Lincoln went beyond policy matters to reveal his personal feelings. Every man is said to have his peculiar ambition. Whether it be true or not, I can say, for one, that I have no other so great as that of being truly esteemed of my fellow men, by rendering myself worthy of their esteem. As far as I shall succeed in gratifying this ambition is yet to be developed. I am young and unknown to many of you. I was born and have ever remained in the most humble walks of life. I have no wealthy or popular relations to recommend me. My case is thrown exclusively upon the independent voters of this country, and if elected, they will have conferred a favor upon me, for which I shall be unremitting in my labors to compensate. But if the good people in their wisdom shall see fit to keep me in the background, I have been too familiar with disappointments to be very much chagrined. Lincoln's ambition, like that of many other politicians, was clearly rooted in an intense craving for deference and approval. But unlike many power seekers, Lincoln was expansive and generous in his ambition. He desired more than ego gratifying power and prestige. He wanted everyone to have a chance to escape the soul-crushing poverty and backwardness that he had experienced as a quasi-slave on the frontier. In 1852, he attributed his own views to the recently deceased Henry Clay. Mr. Clay's predominant sentiment, from first to last, was a deep devotion to the cause of human liberty, a strong sympathy with the oppressed everywhere, and an ardent wish for their elevation. With him, this was a primary and all-controlling passion. That description fits Lincoln as well as it did Clay. From first to last, Lincoln's political goal was to free the oppressed, starting with the kind of frontier people whose conditions he knew firsthand. In time, the scope of his sympathies would broaden. 
To forward these principles, Lincoln had to campaign hard in late July and early August. He stumped the huge county, delivering speeches and socializing with the voters. His first campaign address was given at Papsville, a hamlet 11 miles southwest of New Salem. An auditor remembered that it went something like this. Fellow citizens, I suppose you all know who I am. I am humble Abraham Lincoln. I have been solicited by many friends to become a candidate for the legislature. My politics are short and sweet, like an old woman's dance. I am in favor of a national bank. I am in favor of the internal improvement system and a high protective tariff. These are my sentiments and political principles. If elected, I shall be thankful. If not, they will be all the same. This speech did not mention public education or usury laws, but it did allude indirectly to the presidential campaign of that year, as Andrew Jackson sought re-election after vetoing the recharter of the Bank of the United States. Just before this maiden campaign effort, Lincoln quelled a fight. J. Rowan Herndon was whipping Jesse Dodson when Dodson's friends intervened. Lincoln pitched in for Herndon, throwing Dodson's allies about as if they were mere boys. He caught one of them by the neck and seat of his pants and flung him several feet. This decisive action won him many admirers in Papsville. Illinois political rallies were usually followed by drinking sprees that inevitably led to fisticuffs. So the fight between Herndon and Dodson was not uncommon. During the 1832 canvass in Sangamon County, for example, voters engaged in several fights at groggeries. Gangs from nearby hamlets would gather in Springfield and do battle. Lincoln poked fun at his own odd appearance. On one occasion, he self-deprecatingly observed, Fellow citizens, I have been told that some of my opponents have said that it was a disgrace to the county of Sangamon to have such a looking man as I am stuck up for the legislature. Now, I thought this was a free country. That is the reason that I address you today. Had I known to the contrary, I should not have consented to run. On another occasion, he said, Gentlemen, I have just returned from the campaign. My personal appearance is rather shabby and dark. I am almost as red as those men I have been chasing through the prairies and forests on the rivers of Illinois. Lincoln used logical, thoughtful, and engaging speeches to offset the effect of his unprepossessing appearance. Stephen T. Logan, who saw Lincoln address a crowd in Springfield, recalled that he was very tall and gawky and rough-looking, wearing pants that ended six inches above his shoe tops. But Logan soon forgot about Lincoln's looks. After he began speaking, I became very much interested in him. He made a very sensible speech. It was the time when Thomas Hart Benton was running his theory of a gold circulation. Lincoln was attacking Benton's theory, and I thought, did it very well. The manner of Mr. Lincoln's speech, then, was very much the same as his speeches in afterlife. That is, the same peculiar characteristics were apparent then. Though, of course, in after years, he evinced both more knowledge and experience. But he had then the same novelty and the same peculiarity in presenting his ideas. He had the same individuality that he kept up through all his life. But his eloquence did not lead everyone to overlook Lincoln's eccentric outward form. According to Henry C. Whitney, responsible citizens could not seriously believe that so ill-dressed and fresh a spectacle as Lincoln could decently represent this important and populous county. Lincoln had to overcome more than his looks. Campaigning in the 1830s could be grim and tiresome. Local candidates often spoke to audiences of no more than 20 to 30 at social events such as shooting matches or house raisings. Even smaller audiences would attend evening meetings at log schools illuminated by a few candles. Hard-pressed to overcome the deadening effects of such dismal surroundings, candidates resorted to the use of wit, humor, and vigorous colloquial rhetoric and terse arguments. Lincoln, a political newcomer and long shot, 
declared that if he were defeated, he would try and try again. When I have been a candidate before you some five or six times, and have been beaten every time, I will consider it a disgrace, and will be sure never to try it again. And indeed, in his first try for office, he did lose, finishing eighth in a field of thirteen, where only the top four vote-getters won legislative seats. It was, he remarked in 1859, the only time I have been beaten by the people. Because Sangamon County was huge, Lincoln could not begin to cover it in the short time he had campaigned. On Election Day, few voters outside New Salem knew who he was. Still, his respectable showing boded well for the future. In New Salem, he did astonishingly well, winning 277 of 300 votes cast, even though his candidate for president, Henry Clay, lost that precinct by 115 votes. Lincoln was so popular that several pro-Jackson partisans voted for him because he seemed so honest and worthy. Moreover, he pleased New Salemites who were keen to separate from sprawling Sangamon County and form their own county. Since Lincoln was their local candidate, they counted on him to help achieve that end. Also swelling Lincoln's vote in New Salem was a long-standing enmity between one of his rivals, the Methodist minister Peter Cartwright, and Samuel Hill, the village's leading merchant. Hill, a staunch Democrat, detested Cartwright so much that he not only voted for Lincoln, the Whig, but also worked for him. Lincoln was quite gratified despite the outcome, for his showing amazed many, including his strongest backers. His skeptical comrades, including James Matheny, discovered that he knew what he was about and that he had running qualities. And John Todd Stewart believed that Lincoln so impressed everyone with his candor, honesty, and effective speeches that he made friends for future campaigns. He ran on the square, said Stewart, and thereby acquired the respect and confidence of everybody. Frontier Merchant, Postmaster, Surveyor Two years had to pass before Lincoln could run for office again. In the meantime, though jobless and broke, he resolved to stay in New Salem, where people had been exceptionally kind and where he had many friends. He thought about studying law, but feared that his educational background was inadequate for that challenge. He also considered becoming a blacksmith. But before long, Lincoln found himself working at a store once again, this time as a co-owner. Early in 1832, William Franklin Berry, the son of John M. Berry, a Cumberland Presbyterian minister, bought half interest in a store from James Herndon. Berry's partner, J. Rowan Herndon, soon sold his half to Lincoln on credit. Shortly after the August election, Berry, Lincoln's junior by two years, and Lincoln opened their emporium with the stock on hand, supplemented by goods, including whiskey, purchased from Henry Inco and James A. Rutledge after their establishment had failed. Some friends wondered why a man of Lincoln's integrity would associate with such a dissolute character as Barry. Frontier village merchants like Lincoln and Barry were general factotums for everyone and thus came to know what was happening in their neighborhoods. Stores were gathering places, often containing the post office, and usually had a whiskey barrel in the back room with a tin cup dangling from its side. In January 1833, the new storekeepers bought up the stock of a competitor, Reuben Radford, whose place had been demolished by the Clares Grove boys, incensed that the clerk had refused to serve them more than two drinks. William G. Green, who owned the building, bought the surviving merchandise from the agitated Radford for $400. Green began to fret that he had overpaid, but his friend Lincoln said, Cheer up, Billy. It's a good thing. We will take an inventory. Not understanding exactly what an inventory was, and fearing that the Claresgrove boys had committed one, Green replied, No more inventories for me. Green gladly accepted $650 from Lincoln and Barry for the goods in the store, which was a more substantial structure than the one they had. The little store's stock kept growing. That same month, Barry and Lincoln applied for a license to sell liquor by the glass. 
Daniel Green Burner, who clerked in the store, dispensed drinks for six cents apiece. Burner and several other New Salemites cast doubt on Lincoln's 1858 claim in the debates with Douglas that Lincoln never kept a grocery saloon anywhere in the world. Lincoln might have been quibbling. His statement could be interpreted to mean that he never presided over a store where liquor was the main product sold. Then in April, the partners bought even more goods from a Beardstown firm. All this expansion left the entrepreneurs, as Lincoln put it, deeper and deeper in debt. And eventually, the business winked out. The store failed not just because the partners were overextended, but also because Barry was an undisciplined, hard-drinking fellow. He neglected the store and died in 1835, apparently of tuberculosis caused by his dissolute ways. At his funeral, his sin-hating, hard-hearted, prohibitionist father preached a temperance sermon rather than a proper eulogy for his son. Making matters worse, Lincoln was too soft-hearted to deny any application for credit, no matter how impecunious the applicant might be. Nor could he sue his customers or otherwise pressure them to pay their bills. Moreover, he lacked enthusiasm for the job and was far too likely to interrupt a transaction with a long story. He also erred in letting the bibulous Barry wait on women and in candidly warning their good customers that the whiskey he sold would ruin them and that the tobacco was of poor quality. If he did not know much about some of the goods in the store, he would freely acknowledge his ignorance. He and Barry extended too much credit, bought and sold goods unwisely, failed to keep items properly stocked, and invested so much money in slow-selling merchandise that their stock became an unappealing hodgepodge. In short, they had little aptitude for the business. When Barry died in 1835, Lincoln's debts amounted to approximately $1,100. That debt was the greatest obstacle I have ever met in life, he told a friend. I had no way of speculating and could not earn money except by labor, and to earn by labor $1,100, besides my living, seemed the work of a lifetime. So Lincoln told his creditors that if they would let me alone, I would give them all I could earn, over my living, as fast as I could earn it. As late as 1860, Lincoln was still being dunned for payment of these New Salem debts. According to Herndon, the debt galled him and hastened his wrinkles. While struggling to pay his creditors, Lincoln had few expenses, for his rent was minimal. At first, he slept for free in Offutt's store and took his meals with John M. Cameron, who charged him one dollar per week. Later, Isaac Burner charged him the same fee for room and board. He lodged in the second Lincoln Berry store even after it folded. When he roomed with James Short, Lincoln paid two dollars a week. Meals and laundry were cheap. During his five and a half years in New Salem, Lincoln stayed with Caleb Carmen, James Rutledge, the Cameron family, and the Cooper, Henry Onstott. He also lived with J. Rowan Herndon until that gentleman, perhaps accidentally, shot his wife to death in 1833. Lincoln then moved to the outskirts of the village to mentor Graham's home for six months. Graham's hospitality might have been inspired by a singular act of kindness on Lincoln's part. The previous autumn, the schoolmaster's family had been very sick, especially his seven-year-old daughter, Ellen, of whom Lincoln was quite fond. Unable to tolerate milk, she needed bread, which Graham could not afford. As Graham later described it, I was too proud to tell the actual condition we were in. As I walked back to the street from the mill, my sack on my arm and my head down, thinking over my sad lot, and the disappointment there would be at home, my little girl's wan face uprose before me, and tears gathered in my eyes, falling thick and fast. Just then I had something touch my hand, and looking down, there lay a ten-dollar bill, Turning quickly, I saw Lincoln slipping into his office door, glancing furtively toward me. Lincoln also roomed at the tavern of Nelson Alley, another beneficiary of his generosity. After moving to Springfield in 1837, Lincoln heard that his former landlord, who had once lent him money, 
was incarcerated in a poorhouse. Lincoln made a personal visit to the facility and arranged for Allie to be released and located in a new home. Throughout his life, Lincoln unfailingly showed his gratitude to those who had helped him in times of need. He rapidly acquired a reputation as an unusually generous, charitable, benevolent young man. One cold winter day, he offered to help a barefoot boy who was chopping wood to earn money for shoes. Lincoln set the lad inside while he did the chopping for him. After completing the job, Lincoln told the boy to purchase the footwear. He also chopped wood and did other chores for widows and orphans. When he saw travelers bogged down, he stopped to help them, despite the taunts of his friends who said, Now, Lincoln, don't make a damn fool of yourself. In May 1833, as he struggled to eke out a living, Lincoln was delighted to be named the postmaster of New Salem, a job he would hold until that post office closed three years later. The position had belonged to storekeeper Samuel Hill, who neglected his postal patrons in favor of customers for his merchandise, including liquor. Several New Salem women, indignant that they had to wait while tipplers were served their whiskey, got up a petition to replace Hill with Lincoln. Ossian M. Ross, postmaster at Havana, reviewed the petition, noted that it was signed by leading citizens, and forwarded it with his endorsement to Washington. Also behind the drive to Oust Hill was Jason Duncan. Over Lincoln's protests that he had no desire to see Hill fired, Duncan nonetheless preferred charges that led to Hill's resignation and Lincoln's appointment by the Jackson administration. Lincoln's whiggery did not hurt his chances because, as he explained, the office was too insignificant to make his politics an objection. Besides, Lincoln was one of the few people in New Salem who could manage the paperwork. Nelson Alley and Alexander Trent guaranteed the mandatory $500 bond. Lincoln was greatly pleased, not only because he would be able to earn some money, but also because he gained access to newspapers he did not subscribe to. Lincoln's duties were light, for the mail came just twice a week. When picking up their letters and periodicals, Customers paid the postmaster. There were no stamps in those days, and sometimes Lincoln advanced the amount due. Of a trusting nature himself, Lincoln was stung when George Spears sent a man for the mail and demanded a receipt for the payment. Lincoln obliged, but enclosed a sharply worded note. At your request, I send you a receipt for the postage on your paper. I am somewhat surprised at your request. I will, however, comply with it. The law requires newspaper postage to be paid in advance, and now that I have waited a full year, you choose to wound my feelings by insinuating that unless you get a receipt, I will probably make you pay it again. On receiving the receipt and note, Spears immediately rode to New Salem to apologize and explained that it was his messenger he distrusted, not the postmaster. Another postal customer, who irritated Lincoln repeatedly, became the butt of a retaliatory prank. Johnson Elmore, ignorant but ostentatiously proud, pestered Lincoln several times a day with the question, Anything for me? When obviously there would not be. Exasperated but amused, Lincoln drafted a letter to Elmore from a fictitious black woman in Kentucky. The missive discussed possums, dances, corn shuckings, and ended with, Johns, come and see me, and old master won't kick you out of the kitchen anymore. When Elmore received the fake letter, he could not, in fact, read it. Lincoln knew he was illiterate. But Elmore pretended to do so. Elmore then took the letter to literate friends who told him what it said, prompting him to think that they were fooling him. Finally, he brought the document back to Postmaster Lincoln. Though it was difficult for him to keep a straight face, Lincoln read the entire letter aloud. Never again was he bothered by the insistent request, Anything for me? When business took him out of the village, Lincoln delivered letters at homes, using his hat as a mailbag. Storing letters and papers in a hat was not unusual on the frontier, and Lincoln did it for many years. 
Lincoln kept his accounts carefully. After the New Salem Post Office closed in 1836, he had a surplus of about $16, which he took with him when he moved to Springfield the following year. A few months later, a government agent approached Lincoln's friend, Anson G. Henry, about the outstanding balance. Henry, fearing that the cash-strapped young man might not have it on hand, offered to help Lincoln. But it was unnecessary, for the erstwhile postmaster had in his room all the money, in fact, the very coins, that he had received in New Salem. He turned over the funds to the agent with a simple explanation. I never make use of money that does not belong to me. By the middle of 1833, Lincoln's personal finances reached low ebb. The postmaster job paid little, and his debts weighed him down so much that he often had to struggle to pay his modest board bill. He took every odd job he could, serving as an election clerk, splitting rails, tending both the grain mill and the sawmill, clerking in stores, among them Samuel Hills, and harvesting crops for James Short, who praised him as the best hand at husking corn on the stalk I ever saw. I used to consider myself very good, but he would gather two loads to my one. All these jobs yielded just enough to make ends meet. Lincoln's economic situation improved considerably when John Calhoun, the Democratic surveyor of Sangamon County, offered to hire him as an assistant. Business was heavy in the northern part of the county, where New Salem was located, because the voyage of the talisman had prompted most landowners to have their property surveyed for town lots. Frontier wags jested that soon the whole district would be laid out in towns, with no land left for agriculture. The town site craze lasted from 1832 to 1838. Speculators filed on lands at $1.25 an acre and resold them for higher sums. Town lots became one of the principal exports of Illinois, peddled in the east by slick salesmen. There arose a strong demand for surveyors, whose stakes covered the vacant prairies. Calhoun and his principal assistant, Thomas M. Neal, knew Lincoln from the Black Hawk War, when they all served in the same regiment. Neal may have recommended Lincoln for the job, and when he replaced Calhoun in 1835, Neal retained Lincoln as an assistant. Friendship trumped politics when Lincoln was offered the job. Both Neal and Calhoun were Democrats, as was Pollard Simmons of New Salem, who also endorsed Lincoln. Simmons was devoted to Lincoln, who described Pollard as being about the best friend I ever had. Lincoln reciprocated by voting for both Calhoun and Neal. But when Simmons jubilantly delivered the actual job offer, Lincoln asked, Do I have to give up any of my principles for this job? If I have to surrender any thought or principle to get it, I wouldn't touch it with a ten-foot pole. Assured that he would not have to abandon his Whig convictions, Lincoln gratefully accepted. After he called on Calhoun to accept the offer formally, the chief surveyor's sister-in-law disparaged the new assistant's appearance. Calhoun replied, He is no common man. Lincoln was ever grateful to Calhoun, whom he held in high esteem and regarded affectionately. A mannerly and agreeable gentleman, Calhoun was unfortunately ruined by alcohol. In later years he would clash with Lincoln in political debates, but the two remained friends despite Calhoun's struggles with whiskey. Lincoln attacked his surveying duties with characteristic industriousness. He procured a compass and surveyor's chain and began to study both Robert Gibson's Treatise on Practical Surveying and Abel Flint's System of Geometry and Trigonometry together with a treatise on surveying. Both books emphasized higher math, including logarithms, plane geometry, and trigonometry. It is not certain how much time Lincoln spent learning the art of surveying, but it was surely more than six weeks, as some have improbably asserted. He had studied the surveyor's art ever since mastering grammar. Once the latter task was accomplished, he told William Green, If that is what they call a science, I'll subdue another. He evidently mastered the subject without assistance. Mentor Graham claimed that he taught Lincoln surveying, but 
That is highly unlikely, for Graham knew little math. Indeed, Graham's entire claim to be the man who taught Lincoln is unfounded. He barely achieved limited certification to teach, and was widely regarded as a long-winded classroom tyrant, suited only to lower levels of instruction. His former pupils mostly spoke ill of him. Having learned the basics, Lincoln set out with his compass, 66-foot chain, marking pins, range poles, plumb bobs, stakes, and axe, to pursue his new calling. When a friend told him he needed a horse, Lincoln demurred, saying he was somewhat of a hoss himself. For a time, he borrowed a mount from Jack Armstrong. Eventually, he bought one, along with a bridle and saddle on credit. When he finally recorded his first survey on January 6, 1834, Lincoln's friends and neighbors helped him celebrate his good fortune with a picnic. A good surveyor and a welcome presence, Lincoln made many friends throughout the sprawling county. The exposure would serve him well in his political future. Charles Chandler, a Connecticut-born physician who settled on Panther Creek in 1832, had a particular reason to think well of Lincoln. Chandler wanted to buy 80 acres adjacent to his property, and frontier custom dictated that as a settler he had first refusal rights on parcels adjoining his original claim. But another Connecticut newcomer, Henry Lawrence Ingalls, coveted the same tract. Once Chandler learned that Ingalls might beat him out for the land, he quickly borrowed some cash, saddled up, and began a desperate dash to the Springfield land office, where Ingalls was also headed. As he rode along, Chandler told his story to some horsemen he had overtaken. One of them was Lincoln, who immediately offered to swap his fresh mount for Chandler's tired one. Chandler declined, estimating that he would beat Ingalls to Springfield anyway, but he was grateful for the offer. I became a Lincoln man then, he recalled, and when he needed to have that new tract surveyed, he hired the young man from New Salem. Lincoln quickly gained an enviable reputation as a skillful surveyor. It was important for settlers to register their timber lots, especially to protect them from trespassers and unauthorized pillaging of valuable trees. Lincoln became the preferred expert for determining survey lines in the dense forest. Whenever settlers like Henry McHenry had a disagreement over property boundaries, Lincoln refereed the dispute to the satisfaction of all. McHenry and his neighbors argued over the location of a corner and chose Lincoln to arbitrate the matter. After spending three or four days surveying the area, Lincoln stuck a staff into the ground and announced, Gentlemen, here is the corner. When the contested parties dug at that spot, they found the remains of the original survey stake with a lump of charcoal under it, just as the first surveyor had left it. Between 1834 and 1836, Lincoln surveyed home sites, roads, school sections, and towns, including New Boston, Petersburg, Huron, and Bath. While platting Petersburg, Lincoln changed a line as an act of kindness to Jemima Elmore, widow of a member of the company he had commanded in the Black Hawk War. He calculated that if he ran a street in the usual fashion, it would slice a few feet off the end of Mrs. Elmore's house, which was all she owned or was ever likely to own. Lincoln said, I reckon it wouldn't hurt anything out here if I skew the line a little. Lincoln's work in laying out New Boston earned high praise from Peter Van Bergen, who had invested money to develop the site. Mr. Lincoln was a good surveyor, Van Bergen said. He did it all himself, without help from anybody except chain men, etc., and also made a plat of it. The founders of Huron liked his work so much that they allegedly offered him $5,000 to establish a store there. Surveying on the frontier was rugged work, hard on men, equipment, and clothes alike. Surveyors lived outdoors in all conditions while trying to impose order on a wild, untracked land. Lincoln often went to work in an old broken straw hat, with no coat or vest, and pants that barely met his boot tops. Elizabeth Abel, in whose home Lincoln lodged while he was surveying the hills between New Salem and Petersburg, Recall that he would often return at night 
ragged and scratched up with the briars. He would laugh over it and say that was a poor man's lot. His trousers often had to be foxed, that is, have a buckskin cover sewn on the outside of the leg to save them from total destruction in the brush. Mrs. Abel foxed Lincoln's trousers for him, as did Hannah Armstrong, whose husband Jack was a friend and sometime chain man for Lincoln. She also made Lincoln deerskin breeches and shirts. Despite his success as a surveyor, Lincoln continued to have financial troubles. The man who sold him a horse on credit, a colorful eccentric named Thomas Watkins, sued Lincoln for payment in April 1834. That same month, other creditors, including Peter Van Bergen, also won judgments against him. To satisfy the debts, Lincoln's surveying tools and horse were sold at a sheriff's auction. A friend from Sandridge, James Short, saw that Lincoln was very much discouraged and heard him say he would let the whole thing go by the board. Generously, Short bought Lincoln's possessions for $120 and returned them. Trying to express his gratitude, Lincoln said simply, Uncle Jimmy, I will do as much for you sometimes. During the Civil War, Lincoln appointed Short to supervise an Indian agency. Election to the State Legislature While surveying land in Sangamon County, Lincoln also surveyed his political prospects, which seemed encouraging. As a veteran of the Black Hawk War, merchant, humorist, surveyor, handyman, teller of colorful stories, and an honest, helpful friend, he had made himself not only known, but liked and well-regarded. He was a Whig with a host of Democratic friends and admirers. The Democrats approached him first in 1834. Because they had supported him for postmaster and surveyor, they had reason to hope Lincoln would join them. During the early and mid-1830s, it was common for ambitious Illinois politicos to affiliate with the Democrats. New Salem Democrats told their party comrades throughout Sangamon County to assist Lincoln or else they would not support their candidates. It was a Democrat, Justice of the Peace Bowling Green, who persuaded Lincoln to make a second run for the legislature. In March 1834, Green and Lincoln presided over a meeting called to endorse a gubernatorial candidate. Afterward, Green and other Democrats approached Lincoln and offered to remove two of their own nominees in favor of his candidacy. Lincoln immediately recognized that this might hurt the chances of his friend, John Todd Stewart, and informed Stewart of the scheme. Stewart appreciated that Lincoln had acted fairly and honorably. Confident of his own strength, though, Stewart instructed Lincoln to go and tell them he would take their votes, that I would risk it. An important issue in 1834 was a proposal to lop off the New Salem area from Sangamon County, which at that time was over twice the size of Rhode Island, and form a new county. Travel to the county seat, Springfield, imposed hardships on jurors, witnesses, litigants, land filers, and anyone else who had to do public business there. Between New Salem and Springfield lay 20 miles of rough country. In 1832, a resident described how in the spring, our rivers are overflowed, the channels of all streams are full, and traveling in any direction is impeded, and sometimes wholly stopped. A rider would find himself wading through ponds and quagmires, enjoying the delights of log bridges and causeways, and vainly invoking the name of McAdam as he plunges deeper and deeper into mire and misfortune. In addition to avoiding the perils of travel to Springfield, voters in New Salem hoped their town would become the seat of the new county. New Salemites and their neighbors began petitioning for their own separate county in 1830. In the winter of 1832 to 1833, Hugh Armstrong and Ned Potter obtained 195 signatures on a petition to the legislature calling for a new county. Several of Lincoln's friends signed it. Lincoln pledged that he would attempt to get New Salem detached and incorporated into a new county. That pledge won Lincoln nearly unanimous support in the New Salem area, while he secured at least the Whig vote elsewhere in the county. 
Lincoln also gained popularity by favoring construction of a canal from Beardstown to the Sangamon River. New Salem had closer ties to Beardstown than Springfield. The canal, Lincoln told the electorate, would prevent spring flooding and allow farmers to transport their produce more cheaply to the Illinois River, 40 miles away. The Illinois was their preferred highway to the world. The Sangamon was mostly unnavigable except in spring. Lincoln issued no principled manifestos in 1834 and instead focused heavily on the county separation issue and what he called more of a handshaking campaign than anything else. He stumped extensively, staying with friends like Abner Y. Ellis in Springfield. At Island Grove, when Lincoln approached some 30 men harvesting crops, they declared they would support no man unless he could lend them a hand. Lincoln replied, Well, boys, if that is all, I am sure of your votes. He grabbed a cradle and easily pitched in. Later, every one of the men voted for him. An onlooker, Dr. Richard F. Barrett, looking at Lincoln harvesting away, scornfully asked J. Rowan Herndon if the Whig Party could not find a better nominee than that. In response, Herndon urged the doctor to attend a political rally the next day, where all the candidates would speak. Barrett did so, later acknowledging to Herndon that Lincoln knows more than all of them put together. Lincoln's personal qualities appealed to the voters, especially his geniality and humor, both of which were highly prized by frontiersmen, and he was gifted in the art of calling on people in their homes. Charles Maltby remembered that Lincoln made himself pleasant and agreeable with all persons, with the rich or poor, in the stately mansion or log cabin. Dealing with the prosperous, he was respectful, deferential, and sociable, and with the lowly, affable, agreeable, and simple. He talked to the families about their hopes and prospects, about schools, farms, crops, and livestock. People felt they had met a friend, one near as a brother. He paid attention to the children, gave them candy and nuts, and it was clear that all this came from the natural impulses of his heart. While other home-visiting candidates tended to talk immediately about politics, Lincoln would propose a tour of the farm while supper was cooking. After the meal, he would eventually involve the women and children and regale the family with tales of his own childhood. He was folksy and congenial, and he made people feel he was one of them. Clearly a smarter version of them, but one of them nonetheless. Lincoln's family-friendly campaign style worked because it was without affectation. Especially appealing to the families was his genuine fondness for children. When he boarded with John Cameron, he delighted in playing merry tricks and pranks on his host's many daughters. He would pluck their ears and give them nicknames. In the Cameron family, Vienna became Quinine. Tom, he renamed Tamishanter. Betsy was Queen Isabella, and Eliza, unaccountably, was dubbed John. They and the other children of New Salem enjoyed his joking and playfulness as much as he did, and loved him for it. Lincoln also won admirers and votes in the neighboring town of Athens, primarily by saving one of their neighbors from the roughnecks of New Salem. A fierce rivalry had grown up between Athens and New Salem, fueled by raids that residents of one community made on the other. In turn, retaliatory counter-raids were executed. When one of the combatants from Athens incautiously visited New Salem alone, several villagers stuffed him into a sugar hogshead, nailed it shut, and prepared to roll him down the steep 200-foot bluff into the river. Lincoln intervened and talked them out of this potentially fatal plan. Thereafter, the Athens boys voted for him enthusiastically in all his campaigns for the legislature. A potential threat to Lincoln's electoral chances was his reputation as a religious skeptic. Isaac Snodgrass urged fellow townsmen to vote against him because of his alleged deism. The father of James H. Matheny, Lincoln's close friend, loved Lincoln wholeheartedly but was a strong Methodist and therefore hesitated to vote for him. Lincoln's religious views were, in fact, unconventional. After discussing with his New Salem friends such iconoclastic works 
as Constantine de Volney's The Ruins, or a Survey of the Revolutions of Empires, and Thomas Paine's Age of Reason and Common Sense. Lincoln wrote an essay in a similar vein. When he told his political backer, Samuel Hill, that he intended to publish it, Hill snatched the manuscript from his hands and flung it into the fire. According to Jesse Fell, Lincoln held opinions utterly at variance with what are usually taught in the churches, and his views would place him entirely outside the Christian pale. Lincoln lived in a community that took religion seriously. He often discussed religious topics with his friends, many of whom were skeptics. In New Salem, and later in Springfield, his views bordering on atheism shocked many. He pointed out contradictions or logical lapses in the Bible. According to Herndon, Lincoln told him a thousand times that he did not believe that the Bible, etc., were revelations of God, as the Christian world contends. In many conversations with Edward D. Baker, Lincoln challenged the authenticity of scriptures, unconvinced that they were divinely inspired. At times, Lincoln appeared saddened by his lack of faith. Albert Taylor Bledsoe, who debated religious issues with Lincoln in Springfield, thought that he always seemed to deplore his want of faith as a very great infelicity, from which he would be glad to be delivered. The way Lincoln talked about religion, with an air of such apparent modesty, as well as gloom and despair, made Bledsoe feel deep compassion for his friend. When Samuel Hill's devout wife asked Lincoln, Do you really believe there isn't any future state? He replied, Mrs. Hill, I'm afraid that there isn't. It isn't a pleasant thing to think when we die, that is the last of us. Lincoln found religion as practiced on the frontier unappealing. Detailed doctrinal hair-splitting repelled him, as did the cranky sectarianism that bred enmity and divided communities. In Indiana, Sophie Hanks heard young Lincoln declare that if he could take the best parts from all the churches, he could make a new church better than any of them. He told a New Salem friend, I'd like to go to church if I could hear a good sermon. About all one hears is one preacher get up and denounce another or run down the denomination he preaches for. An exception to this rule was Campbellite minister Josephus Hewitt, whose preaching Lincoln admired. Even as late as the Civil War, Lincoln continued to be put off by doctrinal bickering. As he told a congressman, when any church will inscribe over its altar as its sole qualification for membership, the Savior's condensed statement of the substance of both law and gospel, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. That church will I join with all my heart and all my soul. On good and evil, Lincoln identified with a man who asserted that when he did good, he felt good and when he did bad, he felt bad. That, Lincoln said, is my religion. Innately tolerant and forbearing, Lincoln was doubtless offended by harsh frontier Calvinism. Because he often spent weekends at George Spears's home, he on occasion probably attended Clary's Grove Baptist Church, which had been founded in Spears's house and was known for punitive discipline of its congregants. John M. Berry, the father of Lincoln's store partner, William F. Berry, was a strapping man with a strong voice and a reputation for rigidity. He denounced his son as a drunk and disowned his daughter from marrying at the age of 14. Not only did he never again speak to her, but when her firstborn died, he did not attend the funeral. He limited his formal grieving to a momentary pause in his gardening as his grandchild's funeral procession passed by his farm. Lincoln was probably alienated by such unforgiving, hard-hearted inhumanity by a man purportedly espousing the gospel of a Savior who counseled, Judge not, that ye be not judged. One of the poems Lincoln memorized, Robert Burns's Holy Willie's Prayer, satirized the doctrine of predestination. O thou that in the heavens does dwell, O as it pleases best thy cell, Send one to heaven and ten to hell, a for thy glory, and know for only good or ill they've done before thee. 
That poem, according to James H. Matheny, was Lincoln's religion. Lincoln poked fun at the doctrine of damnation by telling a story about a Methodist parson who criticized a Universalist minister. Why, that impertinent fellow declared that all shall be saved. But, my dear brethren, let us hope for better things. Despite his unorthodox religious views, in 1834 Lincoln won election to the Illinois legislature. Democratic crossover votes helped him finish among the top four in a 12-man contest, even though he was unyielding in his devotion to Whig principles. In the two years since his first try at office, he had become much better known and appreciated. A growing network of loyal friendships, many of them dating from the Black Hawk War, strengthened him. In Lake Fork, for example, when the official Democratic tickets instructing the party faithful whom to vote for disappeared, Lincoln's resourceful friend, Hawkins Taylor, made up tickets of his own that included Lincoln's name. Although few voters there had heard of Lincoln, Taylor talked him up. I let each man name whom he pleased for governor and the other state officers, Taylor remembered, but not one of them could name four members for the legislature, and then I would get in Mr. Lincoln's name. According to Taylor, 108 of the 111 men who voted at Lake Fork marked their ballots for Lincoln. Lincoln was overjoyed. Not only was election an honor, but members of the legislature were paid four dollars, and he told a friend that that was more than I had ever earned in my life. During his four terms as a legislator, Lincoln received a total salary of one thousand seven hundred and sixty-two dollars. In his first term, he was paid three dollars per day. In his remaining terms, four dollars per day. By the end of 1834, the peace of human driftwood, who had, three and a half years earlier, washed up on the banks of the Sangamon River at New Salem, had been transformed. Though still known as a mighty rough man, he had acquired a sense of direction. Having chosen his career as a politician, he would pursue it single-mindedly, distancing himself ever further from the backwood provincial isolated, ignorant world of Thomas Lincoln. Chapter 4. A Napoleon of Astuteness and Political Finesse. Frontier Legislator, 1834-1837. After leaving his paternal home and settling in New Salem, Lincoln found a surrogate father in Bowling Green, a rotund, easygoing, humorous, jovial reading man from North Carolina, known as a gifted spinner of yarns. Twenty-two years Lincoln Sr., Green served at various times as Justice of the Peace, Canal Commissioner, Doorkeeper of the Illinois House of Representatives, Judge of Elections, County Commissioner, Sheriff, and Candidate for the State Senate. In Lincoln's early days in New Salem, he boarded at Green's house, which attracted many visitors, for Green was famously hospitable. Finding a Surrogate Father Abner Y. Ellis reported that Lincoln loved Mr. Green as his almost second father. Green, in turn, looked on him with pride and pleasure and used to say that Lincoln was a man after his own heart. Green told Ellis that there was good material in Abe, and he only wanted education. Undertaking to provide that education, Green nurtured his protege lending him books, encouraging him to study, and fostering his political career. Though a prominent Democrat, Green urged Lincoln, who opposed the Democrats, to run for the state legislature. Lincoln confided to Ellis that he owed more to Mr. Green for his advancement than any other man. Green stimulated Lincoln's interest in the law by inviting him to attend sessions of his court, where Green's directness and informality could lead to humorous moments. When John Ferguson sued Green's poetry-loving friend Jack Kelso for stealing a hog, Green ruled in Kelso's favor, even though he had no proof and witnesses testified that the hog was Ferguson's. Green announced that, The two witnesses we have have sworn to a lie. I know this shoat, and I know it belongs to Jack Kelso. I therefore decide this case in his favor. When Lincoln queried him about the verdict, Green explained that 
The first duty of a court is to decide cases justly and in accordance with the truth. Green displayed a similarly casual approach to the niceties of the law when he asked attorney Edward D. Baker if a justice of the peace could preside over slander suits. After Baker replied that only courts of general jurisdiction could hear a slander case, Green expostulated, Well, think again. You have not read law very well, or very long. Try it again. Now, have I not jurisdiction? Can I not do it? Once again, Baker responded in the negative. After another round of such questioning, Green finally said, I know I can, for by heaven I have done it. Lincoln had learned some law from the books Green lent him, which he read in 1832 and 1833. Because few lawyers lived in the New Salem area, the young would-be attorney was often requested to try suits in Green's court. He accepted the challenge but turned down any remuneration. Initially, the judge, who enjoyed Lincoln's humor, allowed him to practice for amusement's sake. Green's fat sides would shake as he laughed at the young man's laconic presentation of cases. Soon realizing that Lincoln was more than just a comedian, Green came to respect his intellect. Green and Lincoln performed a kind of comic duet in one trial. When quizzed by an attorney about the veracity of a bibulous shoemaker named Peter Lukens, Lincoln testified, He is called Lying Peter Lukens. The lawyer then asked Lincoln if he would believe Lukens under oath. Lincoln turned about and said, Ask Esquire Green. He has taken his testimony under oath many times. Green replied, I never believe anything he says, unless somebody else swears the same thing. Lincoln grew close to Green and his wife, the former Nancy Potter, an unusually maternal, hospitable woman. In 1835, while suffering from depression, Lincoln repaired to the Greens' cabin, where, for three weeks, they nursed him back to psychological health. When a stroke killed Green in 1842, his widow asked Lincoln to speak at the memorial service. He agreed to do so, but when he arose, he only uttered a few words and commenced choking and sobbing, and acknowledged that he was unmanned and could not go on. He therefore got down and went to Mrs. Green's old family carriage. Law student. Even before he began attending Green's court, Lincoln had shown interest in the law. In Indiana, he was sued for violating the rights of a Kentucky ferry operator and sat in on trials held before a neighboring judge. He may have actually done some pettifogging before this court, acting as a very junior attorney in minor matters. To Judge John Pitcher of Rockport, Indiana, young Lincoln expressed a desire to study law. During his brief sojourn in Macon County in 1830, Lincoln read law books at the home of Sheriff William Warnick. Like many other Hoosiers, Lincoln had often attended court sessions in Boonville, where conditions were doubtless primitive. Legal proceedings in a similar community, Fall Creek, were conducted in a double log cabin. While shoeless jurors sat in the woods on a log, their foreman signed indictments on his knee. One Indiana judge quelled a disturbance with his fists, saying, I don't know what power the law gives me to keep order in this court, but I know very well the power God Almighty gave me. In New Salem, Lincoln drafted legal documents for his neighbors without charge. He was notably willing to help the poor, including Isaac Burner, for whom he wrote a deed. Lincoln once pettifogged before Justice of the Peace Samuel Berry, uncle of Lincoln's ill-starred business partner, William F. Barry. The case involved a young woman impregnated by a swain who refused to marry her. Lincoln compared her plight with that of her seducer, likening the young man's honor to a white garment that, if soiled, could be washed clean. But the young woman's honor resembled a glass bottle that, once broken, was gone. Lincoln reportedly won a $100 judgment for his client. As early as 1832, Lincoln had considered studying law in earnest, but hesitated because of his meager education. His trepidation was understandable, for the most widely used legal text, William Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of England, recommended that the prospective law student should have 
formed both his sentiments and style, by perusal and imitation of the purest classical writers, among whom the historians and orators will best deserve his credit, should be able to reason with precision and separate argument from fallacy by the clear and simple rules of pure unsophisticated logic, and to steadily pursue truth through any of the most intricate deduction, by the use of mathematical demonstrations, should have enlarged his conceptions of nature and art by a view of the several branches of genuine experimental philosophy, should have impressed on his mind the sound maxims of the law of nature, the best and most authentic foundation of human laws, and finally, should have contemplated those maxims reduced to a practical system in the laws of imperial Rome. In 1834, however, Lincoln was far less intimidated by the mysteries of Blackstone's commentaries, a copy of which he bought at an auction. This change in attitude could have resulted from his experience in Springfield in April 1833, when he served as a witness in two cases and as a juror in three others. Over half of the members of the bar whom he might have observed in these proceedings had attended neither college nor law school. Even the presiding magistrate was probably unimposing. In 1835, a New York attorney observed Judge Stephen T. Logan of the Sangamon Circuit Court, with his chair tilted back and his heels as high as his head, and in his mouth a veritable corncob pipe, his hair standing nine ways for Sunday, while his clothing was more like that worn by a woodchopper than anybody else. If Lincoln beheld such a jurist, he may have overcome his self-consciousness about his own appearance. Around that time, he told Lynn M. Green that he had talked with men who had the reputation of being great men, but could not see that they differed from other men. Perhaps some of these great men were Springfield lawyers. Lincoln may also have been encouraged by his experience as a pettifogger before Bowling Green and Samuel Barry. With his powerfully analytical mind, Lincoln might well have been drawn to lawyers as a class, for they were reputedly the most intelligent members of frontier society. Lawyers also had an advantage over non-lawyers in the political arena, and after his 1834 electoral victory, Lincoln's appetite for politics grew stronger. A student who worked with Lincoln observed that he took up the law as a means of livelihood, but his heart was in politics, and that he delighted and reveled in it that is, politics, as a fish does in water, as a bird disports itself in the sustaining air. Lincoln's third law partner, William H. Herndon, varied the metaphor, declaring that politics was his life and newspapers his food, while the law merely served as a stepping stone to a political life. Further stimulating Lincoln's ambition to become a lawyer was encouragement from a sophisticated, dignified, college-educated attorney, John Todd Stewart. The tall, slender Stewart was exceptionally handsome and enjoyed a reputation as one of the best jury lawyers in the state. His easygoing, cheerful, good-natured personality and polished, gentlemanly manners won him many friends and favorably impressed numerous jurors. In his law practice, he played the role of peacemaker. A Springfield woman who spent much of her youth in Stewart's home deemed him a type of a gentleman of the olden times, so gentle and courteous, with as fine and gallant a bow for his laundress as for a duchess. A Kentuckian like Lincoln, Stewart graduated from Center College in 1826 and studied law with Judge Daniel Breck. Soon thereafter, he settled in Springfield, where in 1833 he formed a partnership with Henry E. Doomer. The previous year he had run successfully for the legislature, quickly rising to become a Whig leader in the House of Representatives. There he was known as Jerry Sly for his mastery of legislative intrigue. William Herndon thought him tricky and a dodger. Political opponents denounced him as indolent and inefficient, condemned his low cunning and bestowed upon him the sobriquets Sleepy Johnny and the Rip Van Winkle of the Junto. During the Black Hawk War, Stewart came to admire Lincoln so much that he decided to take him under his wing. In a third-person autobiographical sketch, 
Lincoln wrote that during the election campaign of 1834, in a private conversation, he, John Todd Stewart, encouraged Abraham to study law. After the election, he borrowed books of Stewart, took them home with him, and went at it in good earnest. Whenever Lincoln expressed anxiety about the difficulties standing in his way, or doubts about entering the legal profession, Stewart reassured him. Without Stewart's mentoring, Lincoln probably would not have become a lawyer. Years later, Stewart predicted that he would be remembered only as the man who advised Mr. Lincoln to study law and lent him his law books. Although Stewart became Lincoln's mentor, he did not, like Green, play the role of surrogate father. He was, after all, only a year older than Lincoln. Jesse W. Fell, who observed the two men during the legislative session of 1834 to 1835, called them congenial spirits, not only boarding at the same house but rooming and sleeping together. Socially and politically, they seemed inseparable. David Davis believed that Lincoln and Stewart loved one another. Indeed, Fell said they were boon companions, though totally different in temperament and appearance. Stewart, who had all the adornments of a polished gentleman, provided a startling contrast to Lincoln. Raw-boned, angular, features deeply furrowed, ungraceful, almost uncouth, having little, if any, of the polish so important in society life. Under Stewart's guidance, Lincoln began his legal studies by wading through Blackstone's commentaries, the work most widely read by aspiring attorneys, though some authorities found it unsuitable for Americans. Lincoln went to his task industriously, claiming to have mastered forty pages of the commentaries on his first day. He recalled, I began to read those famous works, and I had plenty of time, for during the long summer days, when the farmers were busy with their crops, my customers were few and far between. The more I read, the more intensely interested I became. Never in my whole life was my mind so thoroughly absorbed. I read until I devoured them. When Lincoln began to go at the law in good earnest following the 1834 election, he once again studied with nobody save Stewart. In those days, it was not difficult to become a member of the Illinois Bar. Men in the West are admitted to practice much less qualified than they are in the East, a resident of Champaign County reported. An ordinary intelligent man with a moderate education can be admitted in about one year. Still, as an autodidact, Lincoln was unusual, for in the 1830s and 1840s, most lawyers learned their craft in an attorney's office. By pursuing his studies virtually alone, Lincoln may not have missed much, however. As Joseph Story maintained, the dry and uninviting drudgery of an office was utterly inadequate to lay a just foundation for accurate knowledge in the learning of the law. Josiah Quincy painted an unflattering picture of a typical law office. Of regular instruction there was none. Examination as to progress and acquaintance with the law, none. Occasional lectures, none. Oversight as to general attention and conduct, none. Lincoln followed a regimen that he would prescribe 24 years later to a young man who asked him how to gain a thorough knowledge of the law. Lincoln replied, the mode is very simple, though laborious and tedious. It is only to get the books, and read, and study them carefully. Begin with Blackstone's commentaries, and after reading it carefully through, say, twice, take up Chitty's pleading, Greenleaf's evidence, and Story's equity, etc., in succession. Work, work, work is the main thing. Two years earlier, he had indirectly recommended the same course of study to another would-be attorney. When a man has reached the age that Mr. Widner has, and has already been doing for himself, my judgment is that he reads the books for himself without an instructor. That is precisely the way I came to the law. In 1855, he told yet another potential law student, If you are resolutely determined to make a lawyer of yourself, the thing is more than half done already. It is but a small matter whether you read with anybody or not. I did not read with anyone. Get the books and read and study them till you understand them in their principal features, and that is the main thing. 
It is of no consequence to be in a large town while you are reading. I read at New Salem, which never had three hundred people living in it. The books, and your capacity for understanding them, are just the same in all places. Always bear in mind that your own resolution to succeed is more important than any other one thing. Lincoln, whose resolution to succeed was strong indeed, preached what he practiced. In 1860, he urged a young friend who had been rejected by Harvard not to despair. It is a certain truth that you can enter and graduate in Harvard University, and having made the attempt, you must succeed in it. Must is the word. I know not how to aid you, save in the assurance of one of mature age and much severe experience, that you cannot fail if you resolutely determine that you will not. In your temporary failure there is no evidence that you may not yet be a better scholar and a more successful man in the great struggle of life than many others who have entered college more easily. Some of his neighbors in New Salem were nonplussed by Lincoln's resolute study of law. Before he began preparing himself for a career at the bar, he seemed a rather happy-go-lucky fellow. Parthena Hill told a journalist, I don't think Mr. Lincoln was over-industrious. He didn't do much. His living and his clothes cost little. He liked company and would talk to everybody and entertain them and himself. Others remembered Lincoln in the period before his law studies as a shiftless young man who worked at odd jobs and a sort of loafer. But once Lincoln devoted himself to legal studies, he became a different man, much to the consternation of his friends and neighbors. When Russell Godby initially noticed him with a law book in hand, he asked, Abe, what are you studying? Studying law, Lincoln replied. Godby exclaimed, Great God Almighty! So it was for the first time since his arrival in New Salem. Lincoln became antisocial. In the summer, he often sought solitude in the woods in order to read and study undisturbed. Some New Salemites even thought him deranged. Henry McHenry remembered that when Lincoln began to study law, he would go day after day for weeks and sit under an oak tree on a hill near Salem and read, moved round the tree to keep in the shade, was so absorbed that people said he was crazy. Sometimes he did not notice people when he met them. He quit reading poetry to focus on his law tomes. Henry McHenry and others joshed Lincoln because they found it strange that he walked all the way to Springfield for books. When they also teased him about his first name, he began signing letters and documents, A. Lincoln. Lincoln enjoyed his informal legal training. Many years later, when his son Robert expressed a desire to attend Harvard Law School, Lincoln said, if you do, you should learn more than I ever did, but you will never have so good a time. After moving to Springfield in 1837, Lincoln continued to work, work, work at mastering the law. Herndon testified that he was not fond of physical exercise, but his mental application was untiring. Sometimes he would study 24 hours without food or sleep, often walking unconscious, his head on one side, thinking and talking to himself. In 1836, Lincoln took some necessary formal steps to become a lawyer. In March, he obtained a certificate of good moral character from Stephen T. Logan, and six months later, he received his license from the Illinois Supreme Court. After another six months, a clerk of that court officially enrolled him as an attorney. No record survives of the required examination that Lincoln took, but it probably resembled the one administered to John Dean Caton in 1835, by Justice Samuel D. Lockwood of the Illinois Supreme Court. The judge asked Caton what books he had read, and how long, and with whom he had studied. Then he inquired of the different forms of action and the objects of each, some questions about criminal law and the law of the administration of the states, and especially of the provisions of our statutes on these subjects. The exam lasted no more than half an hour, after which Lockwood told Caton that he would approve his application, though the young man had much to learn if he wanted to become a good lawyer. 
Lincoln's exact contemporary, Gustav Korner, remembered undergoing a similarly casual examination, after which he and another candidate for the bar treated their examiners to a round of brandy toddies. Korner found this quite a contrast to the bar exam he had taken in his native Germany, where leading jurists grilled him for four hours in Latin. Freshman Legislator In December 1834, legislative duties interrupted Lincoln's self-education in the law. Until taking his seat in the General Assembly, he had been indifferent about clothing. He often wore trousers with one leg rolled up and the other down. Overcoming his sartorial insouciance, the freshman legislator decided to purchase new garments. He asked his friend Coleman Smoot, Smoot, did you vote for me? When Smoot said yes, Lincoln replied, Well, you must loan me money to buy suitable clothing, for I want to make a decent appearance in the legislature. Smoot obliged with a generous loan, which Lincoln used to purchase a very respectable-looking suit of jeans, garb that made an ideological as well as a fashion statement. The Whig champion Henry Clay once wore similar apparel to demonstrate support for protective tariffs and encourage the consumption of American-made goods. The outfit was probably inexpensive. Much later, Lincoln said, I have rarely in my life worn a suit of clothes costing $28. In the capital city of Vandalia, a primitive village of about 800 souls, located 75 miles south of Springfield, Lincoln and three dozen other newcomers joined 19 returning veterans to the House of Representatives. Three-quarters of the legislators were, like Lincoln, Southern-born. The second youngest member of that chamber, he belonged to the minority anti-Jackson contingent, which numbered only about 18 in the lower house. The Democrats were more than twice as numerous. The factions had not yet become formal parties. It is difficult to catch the hang of parties here, an Illinoisan remarked, for although there is considerable party feeling, there is very little party organization. Legislative business was conducted primarily through personal influence. The anti-Jackson forces in Illinois did not officially coalesce to form the Whig Party until 1838. The Illinois House of Representatives that Lincoln entered was a rudimentary body. Most of his colleagues were farmers, many of them unsophisticated. Representative Alfred W. Caverly pronounced the word unique, uniqu. When someone asked for a definition, one wag quipped that it was the female of the unicorn. A Springfield lobbyist remarked on Caverly's very inordinate enlargement of the organ of self-esteem. This is shown in the pomposity of his delivery and the elevation of his ideas, which are sometimes so deep and profound, as Patty O'Flanagan said of the preacher, that the devil a word you can understand. Representative Jesse K. Du Bois said, Imbroligo, instead of imbroglio, and as a synonym for it, created the neologism imbriglement. In 1840, David Davis observed, perhaps generously, that the politicians of the state of both parties are of a medium order of intellect. After serving in the General Assembly, Davis commented at the close of one session, I do not think that the legislature has done much harm. We never inquire whether it has ever done any good. In 1847, he flatly denounced the General Assembly as the great source of evil in this state. If there had been none in session for ten years, Illinois would have been a very prosperous state. An observer of the 1840-1841 House of Representatives said that it appeared to be composed all of young men, some of them mere boys. They forcibly reminded me of a debating school of boys' students. Thomas Ford, governor of Illinois in the 1840s, took a more charitable view of the state's legislators, most of whom were, in his opinion, simply gladhanders. The great prevailing principle upon which each party acted in selecting candidates for office was to get popular men, he recalled, men who had made themselves agreeable to the people by a continual show of friendship, who were loved for their gaiety, cheerfulness, 
apparent goodness of heart, and agreeable manners. Though unlearned, the members of the General Assembly were, Ford said, generally shrewd, sensible men, who, from their knowledge of human nature and tact in managing the masses, were amongst the master spirits of their several counties. Not all legislators were amiable conciliators, however. Some hotheads challenged opponents to duels. The state capital where Lincoln first served was unprepossessing. A leader of the Senate, William Lee Davidson Ewing, called the decade-old building, with its falling plaster, sagging floors, cracked and bulging walls and crumbling bricks, manifestly inconvenient for the transaction of public business. The plainness of both the architecture and the furnishings made it resemble a Quaker meeting house. Members sat on hard benches instead of cushioned chairs. The Speaker of the House of Representatives presided from an armchair resting on a small platform. Before him was a primitive desk made by placing a board on some sticks. Built hurriedly on low, wet ground, this state house was replaced in 1836 with a more substantial, if no more attractive, edifice. Some members of the General Assembly thought the capital the dullest, dreariest place, and the governor complained that there is no young ladies in Vidalia. The sleepy hamlet, which one of its founders called a most dull and miserable village, when the General Assembly was not in session, came to life when the legislators arrived. On the opening day of the 1834 session, a Vandalian reported that, Last night, all night, nearly this town has been a scene of busy, buzzing, bargaining, etc. It is said 150 persons, some from the most distant parts of the state, are vying for the appointments of sergeant-at-arms of the Senate and doorkeeper of the House of Representatives. Primitive as it was, Vandalia, with its bookshop, jewelry store, furniture emporium, and other businesses, must have seemed glamorous to the rough young legislator from New Salem. It certainly seemed so to Representative John J. Hardin's wife, who, in 1839, wrote from her home in Jacksonville, I miss the intellectual feasts I enjoyed in Vandalia. A friend of hers wondered, how can she bear with the dull, monotonous town of Jacksonville after leaving the gay scenes of the splendid city of Vandalia? In 1830, a visitor to the capital marveled that three meetings of an antiquarian and historical society have already taken place, and the whole of their published proceedings are as regular and as well conducted and as well printed as if the seat of society had been at Oxford or Cambridge. In the winter of 1838 to 1839, lectures were given at the State House by an officer in Napoleon's army and a visitor from McKendry College, among others. The topics included temperance, phrenology, and Prussian education. James Hall, a journalist and literateur, promoted intellectual life in Vandalia, helping to found schools and lyceums. Parties, dances, and receptions enlivened society during sessions of the legislature. Lincoln struck up a close friendship with Senator Orville H. Browning of Quincy and his wife, Eliza, a charming and witty woman. Years later, Senator Browning told an interviewer, Lincoln had seen but very little of what might be called society and was very awkward and very much embarrassed in the presence of ladies. Mrs. Browning very soon discovered his great merits and treated him with a certain frank cordiality, which put Lincoln entirely at his ease. On this account, he became very much attached to her. He used to come to our room and spend his evenings with Mrs. Browning. Most of his spare time was occupied in this way. In 1839, Lincoln and three other legislators light-heartedly invited Mrs. Browning to come from her home in Quincy to the Capitol. Bringing in your train all ladies in general, who may be at your command, and all Mrs. Browning's sisters in particular. In the 1830s, the legislature wielded more power than it would later. As Governor Thomas Ford described it, his office was feeble and clothed with but little authority, while the legislators came fresh from the people and were clothed with almost the entire power of government. 
Voters chose only the governor, lieutenant governor, senators, and representatives. All other state officers were selected by the General Assembly. People paid little attention to government, as long as it left them alone. Politicians took advantage of this lethargic state of indifference of the people to advance their own projects, to get offices and special favors from the legislature, which were all they busied their heads about. Governor Ford decried the fraud and deceit that legislators employed in passing special laws and creating offices and jobs, while ignoring the general welfare. He lamented that the frequent legislative elections, the running to and fro of the various cliques and factions, before each election, the anxiety of members for their popularity at home, the settlement of plans to control future elections, to sustain the party in power on the one side, and to overthrow it on the part of the minority, absorb nearly the whole attention of the legislature, and leave but little disposition or time to devote to legitimate legislation. Others shared Ford's view of the legislature. In 1835, Lincoln's colleague in the General Assembly, fellow Whig, William H. Fithian, complained from Vandalia of too much blowing off steam for expedition of business. Four years later, he lamented, We have been here now two weeks, and as yet so far as I can judge, not one measure has been adopted for the benefit of the people of Illinois. The Chicago Democrat condemned Illinois legislators for passing most of their time at drinking, gambling, and bawdy houses. Legislatures throughout the West were held in low esteem. One Hoosier declared, When I hear of the assembling of a legislature in one of these western states, it reminds me of a cry of fire in a populous city. No one knows when he is safe. No man can tell where the ruin will end. Judge David Davis, appalled by a particularly dangerous criminal standing before his bench, absently sentenced the miscreant to seven years in the Illinois legislature, where Davis had endured one term. During the ten-week legislative session in 1834 to 1835, Lincoln, under the tutelage of John Todd Stewart, remained inconspicuous, quietly observing his colleagues grant petitions for divorce, pass private bills to relieve individual citizens, appeal to Congress for money, declare creeks navigable, lay bills on the table, and listen to committee reports. On roll calls, Lincoln sided with Stewart 101 times, but voted against him on 26 occasions. On votes for public officials, Lincoln agreed with Stewart every time, save one. Stewart claimed that in 1834 and 1836, he frequently traded Lincoln off. As he laid plans for a congressional race in 1836, Stewart groomed Lincoln to take over his leadership role in the General Assembly. Lincoln's first bill sought to limit the jurisdiction of justices of the peace. Much amended, it won approval in the House, but not the Senate. Two weeks into the session, he introduced a measure that did pass, authorizing the construction of a toll bridge over Salt Creek. Appreciating his literary skill, colleagues pressed him to draft legislation for them. He also wrote reports for the Committee on Public Accounts and Expenditures. In addition, Lincoln composed anonymous dispatches about legislative doings for the Sangamo Journal, an influential Whig newspaper in Springfield, that over the years would publish many of his unsigned articles. Lincoln had easy access to the columns of that paper. As William Herndon recalled, I frequently wrote the editorials in the Springfield Journal, the editor, Simeon Francis, giving to Lincoln and to me the utmost liberty in that direction. Both partners submitted material to the journal up to 1861. James Matheny, who was to be a groomsman at Lincoln's wedding, recalled that when he served as deputy postmaster in Springfield in the mid-1830s, he came to recognize Lincoln's handwriting and estimated that he delivered hundreds of editorials from him to Simeon Francis. Lincoln's political opponents took note that he was contributing to the journal, the Democratic Illinois State Register of Springfield, charged that the writers of the journal have had a late acquisition 
Lincoln, a chap rather famous not only for throwing filth, but for swallowing it afterwards. In 1840, the Register alleged that the author of a journal article attacking Democrats is no doubt one of the junto, whose members deliberate in secret, write in secret, and work in darkness, men who dare not let the light of day in upon their acts. This was doubtless an allusion to Lincoln, a leader of the Whig junto, and its most trusted writer. The partisan press was filled with anonymous attacks and misattributed remarks. In 1841, the Register charged that a member of the Junto had contributed pseudonymous articles signed Conservative to the journal, and had then tried to ascribe the authorship to Judge Jesse B. Thomas. The Register claimed that the gang who controlled the Sangamo Journal wrote the articles which appear in that paper over the signature of a Conservative, and privately impressed it upon the minds of the friends of the Martin Van Buren administration that the judge, Jesse B. Thomas, was the author. The Junto resorted to this foul stratagem to render the judge obnoxious to the friends of Van Buren, hoping that thereby he would be driven to become a Federalist, that is, a Whig. Although Lincoln's journalism is not easy to identify with certainty, dozens of pieces from the 1830s seem clearly to be his handiwork including dispatches from an unnamed Whig member of the legislature. At first, those dispatches simply offered terse accounts of legislative activity. In time, they grew longer and more partisan. One, dated January 23, 1835, sarcastically referred to Whig legislators as aristocrats and reported dissension within the Democratic ranks. Written in Lincoln's characteristic bantering, satirical style, it concluded thus, The thing was funny, and we aristocrats enjoyed it hugely. In the first session of his initial term as a legislator, Lincoln made no formal speeches and only two brief sets of remarks. In one of the latter, he humorously commented on the nomination of a surveyor to fill a post that, it turned out, had not been vacated. If there was no danger of the new surveyor's ousting the old one, so long as he persisted not to die. Lincoln said he would suggest the propriety of letting matters remain as they were, so that if the old surveyor should hereafter conclude to die, there would be a new one ready-made without troubling the legislature. Economic issues dominated the session. The most important bill dealt with the much-discussed proposal— to dig a canal from Chicago to La Salle, connecting the Great Lakes and the Illinois River, which fed into the Mississippi. When completed in 1848, it helped make Chicago a metropolis. Lincoln, who wished to be known as the DeWitt Clinton of Illinois, voted with a majority to finance that internal improvement with $500,000 in state bonds. Clinton was the governor of New York when the Erie Canal was built. The most controversial national issue debated by the legislature involved the Bank of the United States, on which President Andrew Jackson had declared his well-publicized war. Another was the distribution of funds generated by the sale of federal public lands. Lincoln introduced an unsuccessful resolution calling for the U.S. government to remit to the state at least one-fifth of such proceeds collected in Illinois. In fulfillment of his pledge to Hugh Armstrong and Ned Potter, he also submitted a petition of sundry citizens of the counties of Sangamon, Morgan, and Taswell, praying the organization of a new county out of said counties. The Committee on Petitions reported against it. That winter of 1834 to 1835, the General Assembly passed 191 laws, dealing chiefly with roads, corporations, schools, and acts to relieve individuals. A state bank was chartered. The Illinois and Michigan Canal received vital funding. Public roads were encouraged. The state was divided into judicial districts, and four colleges were incorporated. Lincoln voted on 131 out of 139 roll calls, and was present for at least 59 of the 65 days 
when the legislature met. During that session, some observers felt that Lincoln had achieved little. Stewart recalled that Lincoln was the author of no special or general act, and that he had no organizing power. John Moses reported that Lincoln arose in his place and spoke briefly on two or three occasions, without giving any special promise, however, of ability as a debater or speaker. He seemed rather to be feeling his way and taking the measure of the rising men around him. Lincoln did virtually nothing to implement the three main proposals of his 1832 platform, expanding public education, improving navigation of the Sangamon, and curbing high interest rates. Usher F. Linder said that if he won any fame at that season, I have never heard of it. In 1835, upon meeting Lincoln for the first time, Linder found him very modest and retiring, good-natured, easy, unambitious, of plain good sense, and unobtrusive in his manners, resembling a quiet, unassuming farmer. Other contemporaries, however, recalled Lincoln's legislative debut more positively. Jesse K. Du Bois asserted that before the session ended, Lincoln was already a prominent man. John Locke Scripps wrote in an 1860 campaign biography, which Lincoln read and corrected, that Lincoln acquired the confidence of his fellow members as a man of sound judgment and patriotic purposes, and in this manner he wielded a greater influence in shaping and controlling legislation than many of the noisy declaimers and most frequent speakers of the body. If Lincoln achieved little renown, he learned a great deal. He had met legislators, lobbyists, judges, and attorneys from around the state, and taken their measure. Had observed a more civilized culture than he had known along Little Pigeon Creek or in New Salem. Had paid heed to the shrewd advice of John Todd Stewart, and had seen firsthand how legislation was framed and passed. In addition, he had made friends, in part through his legendary skill at storytelling. Those ten weeks in Vandalia sharpened Lincoln's already keen desire to escape the backwoods world of his father. He wanted to belong to this new realm, peopled with ambitious and talented men, and so he returned to New Salem, resolved not only to continue studying law, but also to smooth some of his rough edges. Abner Y. Ellis thought that Lincoln improved rapidly in mind and manners after his return from Vandalia, his first session in the legislature. Romance In Illinois, as in Indiana, the bashful Lincoln paid little attention to young women. In middle age, he admitted that women are the only things that cannot hurt me that I am afraid of. When he boarded with John M. Cameron, he took no romantic interest in his host's attractive daughters, one of whom described him as thin as a beanpole and as ugly as a scarecrow. Between 1831 and 1834, when Daniel Burner and Lincoln both lived in New Salem, Burner never observed him with a girl. Because he could not sing any more than a crow, Lincoln avoided the singing school, where on weekends young men and women received elementary musical instruction and also courted. When he did attend social occasions where the sexes mingled, he never danced or cut up. Jason Duncan, who left New Salem in 1833, recalled that Lincoln was very reserved toward the opposite sex. Duncan could not recollect of his ever paying his addresses to any young lady. James Short said that Lincoln didn't go to see the girls much, for he cared but little for them, and when he craved companionship, he would just as leave the company were all men as to have it a mixture of the sexes. Abner Y. Ellis, who employed Lincoln as a sometime clerk at his store, reported that he was a very shy man of ladies. One day, Ellis recalled, while we boarded at this tavern, there came a family containing an old lady, her son, and three stylish daughters from the state of Virginia, and stopped there for two or three weeks, and during their stay... I do not remember of Mr. Lincoln ever eating at the same table when they did. 
A New Salem maiden said that in his mid-twenties, the homely, very awkward Lincoln was a very queer fellow and very bashful. One historian speculated that it was greatly to Lincoln's advantage that he was not a favorite with society women. If he had been, most of his time and energies would have been wasted in agreeable frivolity. Women who claimed that Lincoln was drawn to them testified that he was socially backward and not a particularly eligible bachelor. Martinet Hardin said he was so awkward that I was always sorry for him. He did not seem to know what to say in the company of women. Polly Warnick, whom Lincoln allegedly tried to woo in Macon County, Illinois, had little interest in a tall, gangly youth with an Indiana accent. A woman whose parents had lived in New Salem reported that Lincoln was not much of a beau and seemed to prefer the company of elderly ladies to the young ones. Those more mature women, in effect surrogate mothers, included Mrs. Bennett Abel, who encouraged Lincoln's ambition. William Butler deemed her a cultivated woman, very superior to the common run of women about here. While boarding at Bowling Greens, Lincoln came to know the Abels and lived close by. Mrs. Abel found Lincoln congenial. In time, Lincoln boarded with the Abels, where he lived in a sort of home intimacy. Butler thought it was from Mrs. Abel he first got his ideas of a higher plane of life, that it was she who gave him the notion that he might improve himself by reading, etc. Lincoln's other surrogate mothers included Mary Spears, a woman of uncommon intelligence. He thought that if she had received an education, she would have been the equal of any woman. She, in turn, remarked that there was a great promise, a great possibility, in Lincoln. Lincoln called his first landlady in New Salem, Mrs. John M. Cameron, Aunt Polly, and always remembered her affectionately. According to Charles Maltby, her motherly kindness and counsels to Lincoln reminded him of the advice and instructions of a dear departed mother. Hannah Armstrong, yet another surrogate mother, remembered that he amused himself by playing with the children or telling some funny story to the old folks. Lincoln also liked to converse with Sarah Graham, the wife of Mentor Graham, often soliciting her advice about personal matters, including love. Romantic love finally entered Lincoln's life in the person of Anne Rutledge, the daughter of one of his early New Salem landlords, James Rutledge. Four years younger than Lincoln, she was, by all accounts, attractive, intelligent, and lovable. She weighed approximately 120 pounds, stood five feet and three inches tall, and had large blue eyes with a great deal in them. She was smart, moderately educated, pleasant, a good conversationalist, hard-working, and domestically accomplished. Her mother said she had been noted for three things, her skill with the needle, being a good spinner, and a fine cook. She also possessed a kind nature that one observer described as angelic, and a modesty that left her without any of the airs of your city bells. Her cousin, James McGrady Rutledge, called her a girl whose company people liked, seeming to enjoy life and helping others enjoy it. In the opinion of William G. Green, her character was more than good. It was positively noted throughout the county. She was a woman worthy of Lincoln's love, and she was most worthy of his. Lincoln described Anne as a handsome girl, natural and quite intellectual, though not highly educated, who would have made a good loving wife. He may have been smitten with her when boarding at her father's tavern in 1831, but she was then engaged to the successful merchant John McNamara, who used the alias McNeil, a partner of Samuel Hill. The women of New Salem considered McNamara the catch of the village, for he had accumulated between $10,000 and $12,000 by the time he began courting Anne. But Anne's father disapproved of him, perhaps because he was twelve years Anne's senior, unattractive, and cold. In 1836, McNamara evicted Anne's widowed mother from her home when she fell behind in the rent. After McNamara's death, his widow recollected, 
that in all the years of their married life, though he was courteous and attentive and a good provider, there was no more poetry or sentiment in him than in the multiplication table, and that she really never became acquainted with him. Around the time that Lincoln returned from the Black Hawk War, McNamara left New Salem to fetch his family from New York. He did not return for three years. During that period, he wrote to Anne so seldom that she believed he had canceled their engagement. Meanwhile, she had moved with her family to Sandridge, a few miles from New Salem. It was at this time that Lincoln began to court her, visiting Sandridge several times a week. Few details of that courtship survive. Parthena Nance Hill recalled that when McNamara stopped writing to his fiancée, some of the girls lorded it over Anne, who sat at home alone while we other young people walked and visited. Lincoln, who thought highly of Anne and felt sorry for her, began escorting her on evening walks. Mrs. Hill told a friend that Lincoln was deeply in love with Anne. When visiting her family, Lincoln would cheerfully, if awkwardly, help Anne with household chores. They also studied together, poring over a copy of Kirkham's grammar, which he had given her. In addition, they sang songs from an anthology called The Missouri Harmony. Eventually, according to Anne's sister Nancy, he declared his love and was accepted, for she loved him with a more mature and enduring affection than she had ever felt for McNamara. No one could have seen them together and not be convinced that they loved each other truly. In early 1835, Abe and Anne evidently became engaged, but decided to postpone their wedding for a year because she wished to further her education, and Lincoln wanted to prepare for the bar. She also desired to wait until she could honorably break her engagement with McNamara. Anne's brother David urged her to marry Lincoln even before the return of her whilom fiancé, but she declined so that she could personally explain to McNamara her change of heart. While awaiting his return, Anne became sick, probably with typhoid fever. She lingered for several weeks. Lincoln was distraught. One stormy night, he braved the foul weather to walk to Sandridge. En route, he stopped at the cabin of Parson John M. Barry, who invited him in. After protesting that he must go to Anne, Lincoln finally accepted Barry's offer to spend the night. Rather than sleep, he paced the floor for hours and decamped early the next morning. According to her sister Sarah, Anne had brain fever and was out of her head all the time till about two days before she died, when she came to herself and called for Abe. Bowling Green fetched Lincoln. When he arrived, everybody left the room and they talked together. Emerging from that room, Lincoln stopped at the door and looked back. Both of them were crying. Dr. John Allen, who had been attending Anne, took the devastated Lincoln to his house for the night. Anne's death on August 25, 1835, crushed Lincoln, leaving him so profoundly grief-stricken that many friends worried that he might lose his mind. Henry McHenry recollected that after that event he seemed quite changed. He seemed retired, and loved solitude. He seemed wrapped in profound thought, indifferent to transpiring events, had but little to say, but would take his gun and wander off in the woods by himself, away from the association of even those he most esteemed. His depression seemed to deepen for some time, so as to give anxiety to his friends in regard to his mind. William G. Green testified that after this sudden death of one whom his soul and heart dearly loved, Lincoln's friends were compelled to keep watch and ward over Mr. Lincoln, for he was, from the sudden shock, somewhat temporarily deranged. We watched during storms, fogs, damp, gloomy weather Mr. Lincoln for fear of an accident. He said, I can never be reconciled to have the snow, rains, and storms to beat on her grave. He did not recover quickly. Long after Anne died, Green reported, Abe and I would be alone perhaps in the grocery on a rainy night, and Abe would sit there, his elbows on his knees, his face in his hands, the tears 
dropping through his fingers. Elizabeth Abel, who witnessed the depth of Lincoln's grief, recalled that he was staying with us at the time of her death, which was a great shock to him, and I never seen a man mourn for a companion more than he did for her. The community said he was crazy, but he was not crazy, though he was very desponding a long time. Another surrogate mother, Hannah Armstrong, saw Lincoln weep like a baby over the death of Anne Rutledge. Nancy Green recollected that Lincoln took Anne's death very hard, so much so that some thought his mind would become impaired. She reported that her husband, Bowling Green, was so afraid that Lincoln would lose his reason that he went to Salem after Lincoln and brought him to his house and kept him a week or two and succeeded in cheering him, Lincoln, up, though he was quite melancholy for months. At Green's, Dr. Allen often visited him. In great despair, Lincoln thought of killing himself. According to John Hill, Lincoln was so fearfully wrought up upon her death that Samuel Hill had to lock him up and keep guard over him for some two weeks, for fear he might commit suicide. The whole village engaged in trying to quiet him and reconcile him to the loss. Hill remembered that for a short time his mind wandered. The family of Jack Armstrong was afraid that Lincoln would go crazy. Henry Sears and his wife recollected that Lincoln strolled around the neighborhood for the next three or four weeks, humming sad songs and writing them with chalk on fences and barns. It was generally feared that the death of Anne Rutledge would drive him insane. This was not the only time Lincoln considered suicide. He told Mentor Graham that he felt like committing suicide often. To Robert L. Wilson he confided that although he appeared to enjoy life rapturously, still he was the victim of terrible melancholy. He sought company and indulged in fun and hilarity without restraint. Yet, when by himself, he told me that he was so overcome with mental depression that he never dared carry a knife in his pocket. On the third anniversary of Anne's death, an unsigned poem about suicide, perhaps by Lincoln, appeared in the newspaper for which he regularly wrote anonymous pieces. Decades later, when Isaac Cogdell asked him if he ran a little wild after Anne's death, Lincoln replied, I did really. I run off the track. It was my first. I loved the woman dearly and sacredly. I did honestly and truly love the girl, and I think often, often of her now. The depth of Lincoln's sorrow and the severe depression he suffered after her demise may have been partly a result of his unresolved grief at the death of his mother and siblings. Anne's death unconsciously reminded him of those old wounds, which began to suppurate once again, causing him to re-experience the bitter agony he had endured as a youth. Such intense depression can lead to suicide, even among young and physically healthy people like Lincoln. While recuperating from the devastating effect of Anne's death, Lincoln neglected his duties at the post office. He often started out for a destination but returned without having reached it. Instead, he would wander about, absorbed in his thoughts, recognizing no friends or neighbors. Three weeks after Anne died, a New Salem resident complained that the postmaster, Mr. Lincoln, is very careless about leaving his office open and unlocked during the day. Half the time I go in and get my papers, etc., without anyone being there, as was the case yesterday. Years later, when his friend Joshua F. Speed suffered from depression, Lincoln suggested an antidote. Avoid being idle. I would immediately engage in some business or go to making preparations for it. In the fall of 1835, Lincoln took this cure, throwing himself into the study of law. The previous summer he had begun to go at it in good earnest, and a year later he returned to it with even greater enthusiasm. Some friends regarded this ferocious absorption in study as a symptom of a disordered mind. Mentor Graham recalled that Lincoln was studious, so much so that he somewhat injured his health and constitution. 
The continued thought and study of the man caused, with the death of one whom he dearly and sincerely loved, a partial and momentary derangement. Lincoln studied so hard, and exercised so little, that he grew emaciated. Isaac Cogdell told Herndon about the crazy spell following Anne's death, but concluded that if Mr. Lincoln was crazy, it was only technically so, and not radically and substantially so. We used to say, you were crazy about Anne Rutledge. He was then reading Blackstone, read hard, day and night, terribly hard, was terribly melancholy, moody. By December 1835, Lincoln managed to pull himself together enough to attend a special session of the legislature, which the governor had called to modify the Illinois and Michigan Canal Act and to reapportion the General Assembly. During his six weeks in Vandalia, he won approval for the incorporation of the Beardstown and Sangamon Canal Company, one of his pet projects. Lincoln bought stock in that corporation and at a public meeting urged others to do so. He even purchased land on the Sangamon a mile from the eastern terminus of the proposed canal, which was never dug. A Sangamo Journal article by Sangamo, perhaps Lincoln, declared that the project must be of immense advantage to the country through which it will pass, and to the Great West generally. A leading promoter of that enterprise, Francis Arnez, edited the Beardstown Chronicle, whose columns in November 1834 contained a slashing attack on Peter Cartwright, a prominent Methodist minister and Jacksonian politico. Though signed Sam Hill, the piece was actually written by Lincoln, who sent it to Arnez after the Sangamo Journal had rejected it. Arnez agreed to run it only as a paid advertisement. The irascible, vindictive Hill, known as the rich man of the village and the potentate, with a peculiar temper so explosive that he could not drive a carriage team, had been quarreling with the belligerent Cartwright, who lived six miles from New Salem in Pleasant Plains. During an earlier squabble with Jack Armstrong, Hill had hired someone to thrash that leader of the Clares Grove Boys, now he employed Lincoln to attack Cartwright with pen rather than fists. Lincoln had no special fondness for Cartwright, one of the four candidates who had beaten him out for a legislative seat in 1832. Lincoln's inflammatory 1,500-word philippic, dated September 7, 1834, accused Cartwright of being a most abandoned hypocrite and concluded that it was hard to tell whether he is a greater fool or knave, and that he has but few rivals in either capacity. The attack was clever but unfair, based on a misreading of Cartwright's writings. Thus began a pattern of anonymous and pseudonymous journalistic assaults that did Lincoln little credit. He would quit that ugly practice in 1842, when an offended target of his ridicule challenged him to a duel an episode discussed in Chapter 6. Lincoln participated actively in the special session. On December 12th, he introduced a debt relief bill that passed the House but not the Senate. He also consistently voted in favor of the Illinois and Michigan Canal, whose supporters finally prevailed on Christmas Eve when the House, by a 29-26 to 26 margin, authorized the establishment of a board of commissioners, empowered it to build the canal, and permitted the governor to borrow up to half a million dollars to fund the effort. The struggle over the canal pitted northern Illinois against the southern part of the state. Whereas northern Illinois had been settled by ambitious, industrious Yankees who erected mills, churches, schools, villages, and towns, southern Illinois had attracted from the south a more easygoing class of settlers who regarded the Yankees as tight-fisted, dishonest, money-grubbing misers, lacking the spirit of generous hospitality. Lincoln enjoyed quoting a hard-shell Baptist preacher in southern Illinois who declared that, The mercy of God reaches from the Eskimo of the frozen north to the hottentot of the sizzling south, from the wandering Arab of Asia to the engines of the western plains. There are some who say it even extends to the Yankees, but I wouldn't go scarcely that far. 
Residents of northern Illinois, in turn, looked on their neighbors to the south as indolent, ignorant primitives, scarcely more advanced than savages. Legislators from southern Illinois opposed the canal because they feared it might pave the way for Yankees to flood the state. Moreover, their constituents, predominantly southern subsistence farmers who produced little that anyone might wish to buy, could not understand why the state should undertake such a costly project. Overcoming their resistance was a formidable challenge. A leading champion of the canal, Gurdon Hubbard, doubted that the legislation could have been approved so quickly without Lincoln's invaluable assistance. During the debates over reapportionment of the General Assembly, Lincoln supported a plan that would have kept the legislature relatively small. When the proposal failed, that body was expanded from 55 to 91 members. Under the new arrangement, Sangamon County had seven seats rather than four and became the largest delegation in the House of Representatives. Fortunately for his political career, Lincoln had the prescience to oppose a seemingly minor bill to improve the breed of cattle, which stipulated that no bull over one year old shall be permitted to run at large out of an enclosure. Violators will be fined and the proceeds distributed to the farmers with the three best cows, bulls, and heifers within the county. In the Jacksonian era of the common man, the public regarded this statute as hopelessly elitist and voted its supporters out of office. Less than a year later, the General Assembly overwhelmingly repealed the Little Bull Law. During the 1835 to 1836 special session of the General Assembly, Lincoln answered all but 11 of the 130 roll calls. He spent three days writing the report of the Committee on Public Accounts and Expenditures. By supporting the State Bank and the Canal, he remained true to his Whig principles. His most important contribution was the steadfast encouragement he gave to the Illinois and Michigan Canal, which was begun in 1836 and completed 12 years later. Sophomore Legislator in June 1836, two months after the Ninth General Assembly adjourned, Lincoln announced his candidacy for re-election in a campaign statement far more breezy and succinct than the one he had issued four years earlier. He began by paying obeisance to the regnant egalitarianism of the day. I go for all sharing the privileges of the government who assist in bearing its burdens. But to that platitudinous opening he added a startling pendant. Consequently, I go for admitting all whites to the right of suffrage, who pay taxes or bear arms, by no means excluding females. At that time, the exclusion of blacks from the franchise was hardly controversial in Illinois, a state full of Southerners devoted to white supremacy. Indeed, hostility to black voting prevailed throughout the Old Northwest, the Illinois Constitution of 1818 limited voting rights to white male inhabitants, at least 21 years of age. Membership in the militia was open to free male, able-bodied persons, Negroes, mulattoes, and Indians accepted. Between 1819 and 1846, the General Assembly outlawed interracial marriage and cohabitation, forbade blacks to testify in court against whites, and denied them the right to attend public schools. In 1848, by a margin of 79 to 21 percent, the Illinois electorate adopted a new constitution banning black suffrage. It voted separately on an article prohibiting black immigration, which passed 70 to 30 percent. With that, Illinois became the only free state forbidding blacks to settle within its borders. Oregon and Indiana soon followed its lead. Sangamon County was even more Negro-phobic than the Illinois average. Ninety percent voted for the new Constitution, and seventy-eight percent against black immigration. Of the Springfielders voting on black immigration, eighty-four percent supported the ban, including one-third of those who voted for the Free Soil Ticket in 1848. 
A Southern Illinoisan observed that his neighbors born in slaveholding states brought with them many of the prejudices they imbibed in infancy, and still hold Negroes in the utmost contempt, not allowing them to be of the same species of themselves, but look on niggers, as they call them, and Indians, as an inferior race of beings, and treat them as such. American anthropologists like Samuel George Morton, John Bachman, and Louis Agassi argued that blacks constituted the lowest grade of humanity and were an inferior variety of our species. Lincoln's suggestion that women be enfranchised, however, was hardly a campaign cliché. His proto-feminist endorsement of women's suffrage may have been inspired by his participation in debating in literary societies that addressed that question. At a meeting of such an organization in Springfield, he contributed some verses about the sexual double standard. Whatever spiteful fools may say, each jealous, ranting yelper, no woman ever went astray without a man to help her. Lincoln believed that a woman had the same right to play with their tail that a man had, and no more nor less, and that neither husbands nor wives had a moral or other right to violate the sacred marriage vow. Lincoln's support for women's suffrage and his opposition to the sexual double standard reflected his sense of fair play, which constituted the bedrock of his political philosophy. In later years, he would never publicly raise the issue of votes for women, but he would speak and act in ways that prefigured the feminist sensibility of generations then unborn. In the late 1850s, he told a youthful female suffragist, I believe you will vote, my young friend, before you are much older than I. To Herndon, he often predicted that the adoption of women's suffrage was only a matter of time. During his presidency, Lincoln readily spared the lives of soldiers condemned to death by courts martial, but his mercy did not extend to rapists. Wife beaters also angered Lincoln, who in 1839 warned a hard drinking Springfield cobbler to stop abusing his spouse. When this admonition went unheeded, Lincoln and some friends became vigilantes, as one of them later remembered. The drunken shoemaker had forgotten Lincoln's warning. It was late at night, and we dragged the wretch to an open space back of a store building, stripped him of his shirt, and tied him to a post. Then we sent for his wife, and arming her with a good stout switch, bade her to light in. She was a little reluctant at first, but soon warmed up to her work, and emboldened by our encouraging and sometimes peremptory directions, performed her delicate task lustily and well. When the culprit had been sufficiently punished, Lincoln gave the signal, enough, and he was released. We helped him on with his shirt, and he shambled ruefully toward his home. For his sake, we tried to keep all knowledge of the affair from the public. But the lesson had its effect. For if he ever again molested his wife, we never found it out. Lincoln was generally chivalrous, even foregoing any participation in rough gossip about women, as so many men were wont to do. At least once in his New Salem years, however, he did humiliate a young woman with his legendary wit. While he was serving food at a party... A girl there, who thought herself pretty smart, protested that he filled her plate to overflowing. She remarked quite pert and sharp, Well, Mr. Lincoln, I didn't want a cartload. When she returned for more food, he announced in a loud voice, All right, Miss Liddy, back up your cart and I'll fill it again. The guests all laughed at the embarrassed young woman, who spent the rest of the evening crying. In the public letter announcing his candidacy for re-election in 1836, Lincoln also promised that as a legislator he would be guided by the wishes of his constituents insofar as he knew what those wishes were, and otherwise by what my own judgment teaches me will best advance their interests. The only policy issue he addressed was internal improvements, which he said should be funded with proceeds from the sale of federal lands rather than by state taxes and borrowing. In the 1836 campaign, Lincoln joined the Whig leadership and became a virtuoso belittler of Democrats. 
A legislative colleague from Sangamon County, Robert L. Wilson, said that Lincoln was by common consent looked up to and relied on as the leading Whig exponent, that he was the best versed and most captivating and trenchant speaker on their side, that he preserved his temper nearly always, and when extremely provoked, he did not respond with the illogical proposal to fight about it, but use the weapons of sarcasm and ridicule, and always prevailed. During the campaigns of 1832 and 1834, Lincoln had been reserved and had stumped only in rural areas. But in 1836 he grew bolder and spoke in towns as well as villages, winning the respect of friends and the fear of opponents. His new style made him the leading Whig of the district. On the stump he almost always kept his temper. A week after he declared his candidacy, however, he found it difficult to do so. When Colonel Robert Allen, a prominent Democrat known as a dishonest blowhard, told New Salemites that he could destroy the young politician by revealing information that he had, but that he would forbear releasing it, Lincoln charged that Allen would be a traitor to his country's interest if he refused to make public his supposedly damaging facts. Later in the campaign, Lincoln called an anonymous critic a liar and a scoundrel, and threatened to give his proboscis a good ringing. When angry, Lincoln often resorted to ridicule. In July 1836, during a debate at Springfield, he was attacked by George Forker, a Democratic leader derided by Lincoln in the Sangamo Journal as King George, the Royal George, and the most unpopular of all the party. Forker, who had recently converted to the Democratic Party, and had subsequently won appointment as register of the Springfield Land Office, owned a home widely considered the finest in Springfield. Adorning it was a lightning rod, an invention that fascinated Lincoln. In a slasher gaff speech, Forker said, This young man will have to be taken down, and I am truly sorry that the task devolves upon me. Lincoln responded witheringly, the gentleman commenced his speech by saying that this young man would have to be taken down, alluding to me. I am not so young in years as I am in the tricks and trades of the politician, but live long or die young, I would rather die now than, like the gentleman, change my politics, and simultaneously, with the change, receive an office worth $3,000 per year, and then have to erect a lightning rod over my house, to protect a guilty conscience from an offended God." In that same canvas, Lincoln attacked other Democratic leaders, most notably Dr. Jacob M. Early, a physician and Methodist minister called the Fighting Parson, whose skinning by Lincoln became a legend in Sangamon County. At a Springfield meeting, Lincoln, Early, John Calhoun, Peter Quinton, and Ninian W. Edwards addressed a large audience in the courthouse. After Edwards opened the event, the impulsive, hot-tempered Early widely regarded as an excellent debater, followed. He sharply criticized Ninian Edwards, alleging that Edwards had chided the Democrats for their stand on black suffrage and declared that he would sooner see his daughter married to a Negro than a poor white man. Edwards loudly denied Early's charge. In fact, Edwards was naturally and constitutionally an aristocrat who hated democracy as the devil is said to hate holy water. Provoked by Early's speech, Lincoln challenged him. Lincoln seemed embarrassed and began slowly, but as he went on he relaxed. His squeaky voice settled down, and his words began to pour forth smoothly. He roundly condemned the Democrats and was interrupted several times by outbursts of applause. According to John Locke Scripps' 1860 campaign biography, when Lincoln took his seat, his reputation was made. He had not only achieved a signal victory over the acknowledged champion of democracy, but he had placed himself, by a single effort, in the very front rank of able and eloquent debaters. The surprise of his audience was only equaled by their enthusiasm, and of all the surprised people on that memorable occasion, perhaps no one was more profoundly astonished than Lincoln himself. Forker and Early were not the only opponents to feel Lincoln's sting in that campaign. 
In July, at a Springfield event, Lincoln skinned Richard Quinton. And at a meeting in Mechanicsburg, he peeled another Democrat. Such tactics could be dangerous, for violence was not unknown in Illinois politics. After Usher Linder ridiculed the mayor of Quincy, that official ambushed him with a stout cudgel, landing several blows on the back of his head. Theophilus W. Smith, a state Supreme Court justice, once pulled a gun on Governor Ninian Edwards, who seized the weapon and broke Judge Smith's jaw with it. At Springfield in 1839, Isaac P. Walker, after being verbally abused by attorney E. G. Ryan, flogged his traducer. Fifteen years later, Peter Selby, editor of the Morgan Journal, was caned on the streets of Jacksonville for criticism appearing in that paper. What Lincoln said as he peeled and skinned his victims is unrecorded, but he was almost certainly the author of many abusive, insulting, heavy-handed, anonymous, and pseudonymous attacks on Democrats that appeared in the Sangamo Journal. In 1835 and 1836, that Whig paper ran satirical letters ostensibly written by prominent Democrats, making their authors look ridiculous. In all likelihood, Lincoln wrote them, and they shed harsh light on the politics of that time and place. In February 1836, the journal published two such epistles over the signature Johnny Blubberhead, a mocking sobriquet for George R. Weber, co-editor of Springfield's Jacksonian newspaper The Republican. Composed in a primitive dialect like that of Lincoln's 1842 pseudonymous Rebecca missive, whose authorship Lincoln acknowledged. The first blubberhead letter satirized the convention system and various Democratic leaders. John Calhoun, a leading Democrat, was burlesqued shamelessly. Blubberhead, that is, Weber, reports to Democratic Congressman William L. May, Since Calhoun lost part of his ear against the mantelpiece, he's been lopsided, and I thinks it hurt his eiders. He's given greatly to talking to himself, and I heard him talk t'other day, so I was afeard that something was a-brewin'. He said if he took two hundred dollars, t'was nobody's business. He needed it. He'd worked for the party, and he'd be, and then he'd used an awful word, if he didn't blow up the whole party if they didn't do something for him. Blubberhead, that is Weber, recommended firing all the postmasters and outlawing the distribution through the mail of the Sangamo Journal, as the way that would make Democrats of the Van Buren system. He complained that May had allowed another printer, William Walters of Vandalia, to receive government patronage in Illinois. This ain't fair. You promised to give me all the printing, and I hold you to your bargain. I wouldn't have left the anti-Masons if you hadn't have promised me. Alluding to charges against May involving theft and lechery, Blubberhead warned him against trying... Your old Edwardsville tricks. May was an easy target for ridicule. A good stump speaker, he served in the Illinois House of Representatives in the late 1820s and subsequently in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1834 to 1839. Sandy-haired and powerfully built, May was a politician by profession and a reasonably able attorney. In 1834, though, a Springfield clergyman said that a greater compound of meanness and stupidity was never mingled than in May, who had been charged with a burglary a few years earlier. When the accusation appeared in the press, May rallied friends to testify that he had entered the house not to commit a crime, but for illicit sexual intercourse. This, explained the nonplussed minister, Mr. May published as his defense— and called upon the people to overlook the follies of his youth. The second Johnny Blubberhead letter was equally crude. Its author bemoaned the failure of the country to go to war with England in order to enhance Martin Van Buren's electoral prospects. We is very sorry that England has offered to mediate. Why didn't you tell Mr. Van Buren not to accept it? If we can get a war going... As you say, we can use up all the revenue so that Henry Clay's bill to distribute revenues from land sales to the states can't pass, and so as we can have thousands of officers to electioneer for Mr. Van Buren. Blubber had declared that, 
I is sorry Mr. Adams has become a Democrat because as how a good many of our friends thinks it strange. And if they should come to find out that Mr. Van Buren depends altogether on the Federals for his election, they will go off from us like shot from a shovel. Other scandalous letters of this sort, ostensibly by Democrats, but doubtless penned by Lincoln, appeared that season in the Sangamo Journal. In March, Congressman May lamented to Weber that since a war with France was not likely, one should be waged on the surplus funds of the federal treasury. If we help ourselves to those funds, we can elect any man president we please, the author declared. Do all you can against Clay's land bill by talking, but don't publish anything on the subject. Should that bill pass and the surplus funds be divided among the states to make railroads and canals and pay schoolmasters, the thing would be out with us. In another epistolary assault, William Walters reportedly urged Congressman May to admit publicly that in 1832 he had written a letter recounting the story of a corrupt bargain involving two Whigs, George Forker and John Calhoun, who allegedly agreed to switch parties in return for appointment to government offices. In his supposed reply, May expressed anxiety that the people of the West are too independent and high-minded to submit to our dictation. But Martin Van Buren, the Democrats' presidential candidate in 1836, assured him that in time they would come around. He says the people of New York proved somewhat refractory when the harness was first put upon them and frequently kicked out of the traces and occasionally broke the heads of their drivers. But by a free use of the whip and spur, holding a tight rein and making examples of a few of the first offenders, they became so docile and gentle that he could guide them without reins by the crook of his finger or wink of the eye. In Washington, the system worked well. Everything that is determined by our chief is promptly executed, right or wrong. This thing of political honesty, which our opponents stickle so much about, has long since been expunged from the vocabulary of our party. Blubberhead regretted that May's opponent would be John Todd Stewart. This I have been dreading for a long time. You know he has ever been a thorn in our side, and that all our efforts to break him down have failed. Other satirical letters purportedly by Democrats, full of sarcastic humor, focused on voting rights for blacks. Fifteen years earlier, Martin Van Buren had endorsed limited suffrage for free blacks in New York. In 1840, Lincoln would openly attack Van Buren for this stand. In 1836, he may have done so publicly, but the meager record of his speeches for that year does not show it. Anonymous and pseudonymous journalism, probably by Lincoln, however, bristles with such assaults, which were not uncommon throughout the country. There is a grim irony in Lincoln's denunciation of Van Buren's support of limited voting rights for blacks, for in 1865 John Wilkes Booth murdered Lincoln for publicly endorsing that very policy. To embarrass Van Buren and his supporters, Whigs in the 1835-1836 special session of the Illinois legislature introduced a resolution condemning several Democratic policies and slyly included as one of them, Colored persons ought not to be admitted to the right of suffrage. When, as expected, the Democrats voted against that omnibus resolution, Whigs, including Lincoln, taunted them for implicitly endorsing black voting rights. The Sangamo Journal protested that Illinois is threatened to be overrun with free Negroes and suggested that such undesirables be sent to Van Buren's home state of New York. In fact, the census of 1835 showed that of the 17,523 people in Sangamon County, only 104 were black. The editor denounced Van Buren's running mate, Richard M. Johnson of Kentucky, as the husband of a Negro wench and the father of a band of mulattoes. Johnson did have a black mistress who bore him two children. As Election Day drew near in 1836, the journal asked, If Mr. Van Buren be made the president, is it not reasonable to suppose that before his term of service expires, freeing Negro suffrage will prevail throughout the nation? If Colonel Johnson be elected, will not every future aspirant to the vice presidency set about qualifying himself for public favor 
by marrying a negress. If these men be elected, how long before poor white girls will become the waiting maids of sooty wenches? How long before we shall have a negro president? How long before white men and black men will have passed away and the whole population of the country become one huge mass of degenerate and stupid mulattoes? In January 1836, Lincoln, in an anonymous dispatch to the Sangamo Journal, chastised Democratic legislators for opposing the proposition that the elective franchise should be kept free from contamination by the admission of colored voters. Four months later, as the political campaign heated up, a letter in the Sangamo Journal, also probably by Lincoln, put the following words into the mouth of a Democratic congressman. If we could only carry our plan into effect to allow free Negroes to vote, I think our Democratic principles would flourish for a long time. In the same issue of the Sangamo Journal appeared a letter ostensibly written by a black gentleman named Seize Her, but in all likelihood it was composed by Lincoln. It read, Massa Prenta. When I was up there in Springfield, the people kept axing me, How's the election going down in your parts? Now, I couldn't then exactly precisely tell how the folks was gwine, but I've been asked all around since, and I guess was to tell precisely how it is. The gentlemen of color are going for that man what writes the epitaphs of truth and vouch you with a syringe. Some to Mr. Calhoun and Square the Builder, William Carpenter. This brings me to a right understanding for to know what to make the niggers all vote for these men. Now, I suppose you knows as how you sees these men goes for Van Buren and that dare dutter man what loved the nigger so. Van Buren says the nigger all should vote, and that other man in Kentucky State, Mr. Johnston, is going to make all the nigger women's children white. Oh, hush, ha he ho You'd split your sides a-laughing to hear Captain Calhoun tell how much Van Buren is going to do for the nigger. The ways there's going for him, man. Oh, hush. And that man who used to abuse old Jackson so, case as how he's against the niggers voting. Ah, oh, Lord, the way he roots for Van Buren now is sort of singular. He looked precisely like a pig off in the cornfield, with one ear marked, so his massa knowin'. The way the niggers is going for him now, oh, hush. And Squire the Builder, the ways day's going to run him ahead of all ain't nobody's business. Cause as how he's going to send all these poor white folks off to Libraria and let the free niggers vote. And when we send all these tarnal white folks off, we's going to send him to Congress. And then the niggers will be in town. No oh, hush. In great haste, yours. The journal also ran a purported Democrat lament that some party loyalists had grown disenchanted with their legislative ticket of three preachers and an advocate for the rights of suffrage to be extended to Negroes. In June, another such letter had a Democrat complain, the people are up in arms about the matter. That is, the Democrats vote in the legislature on black suffrage. They say that they don't like that a free Negro should crowd them away from the polls. They were upset because two of the Van Buren electoral ticket voted that free Negroes ought to vote at elections. Into the mouth of a Democratic editor whose paper, The Republican, had collapsed, an anonymous satirist put these words. We were the more anxious to keep the Republican a-going, because we wished to defend the conduct of our friends in the legislature last winter in regard to their votes in favor of Negro suffrage. I do believe if free Negroes were allowed to vote here, they, the Democrats, would get every vote. All of these pieces were very probably written by Lincoln. Lincoln was also likely the author of a July letter by a Democrat explaining why one of their candidates, William Carpenter, had dropped out. At the last session of the Illinois legislature, the squire voted to allow free Negroes the right of suffrage. This Democrat then asked, now, if this is an objection against the squire, will it not apply with double force to Mr. Van Buren, our candidate for the presidency? 
did not Mr. Van Buren first bring forth this odious measure in the New York Convention? I say most positively that he did. And for proof of the statement, I refer you to the Journals of the Convention of 1821, September 19th, page 106. Democratic legislative candidates vigorously denied that they favored black suffrage. This line of attack was unfair, for Van Buren disliked slavery, but believed it should be dealt with on the state and local level, not by the federal government. He also supported the abolition of property qualifications for white New Yorkers in 1821, and the retention of such qualifications for blacks. Furthermore, he opposed the abolition of slavery in Washington, D.C. During the 1836 campaign, he publicly declared, I must go into the presidential chair, the inflexible and uncompromising opponent of any attempt on the part of Congress to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, against the wishes of the slaveholding states, and also with the determination equally decided to resist the slightest interference with the subject in the states where it exists. In private, Van Buren urged important New York friends to attack abolitionists. Nonetheless, the assault on Van Buren's support for limited black suffrage would be repeated vigorously in 1840, and was still being cited in the presidential campaign two decades later. When not engaged in race-baiting, Lincoln excoriated the Democrats' newly established convention system, which Ebenezer Peck and Stephen A. Douglas had introduced in December 1835. Previously, any Democrat who wished to run for office simply announced his intention and entered the race. Now, candidates were required to win endorsement at a nominating convention. Lincoln called adherents of this innovation slaves of the magician, Martin Van Buren, Eastern trading politicians, and Hartford Convention Federalists from New England whereas Democrats opposing Peck's innovation were men born and raised west of the mountains and south of the Potomac. The author of some satirical letters to the journal, all probably Lincoln, had a Democrat bemoan his party's failure to hold a county caucus to nominate officers. The people are not yet sufficiently drilled for this purpose. Writing under the name Spoon River, a correspondent denounced the convention system for assuming that six men can regulate the affairs of Fulton County better than six hundred, that our old backwoodsmen, squatters and pioneers, have no right to think and act for themselves when, with the aid of this machine, six men can do it for them, with perfect ease. In a letter ostensibly by the Democratic state printer, William Walters, the author ridiculed Stephen A. Douglas for imposing the convention system on his district. When U.S. Senator Elias Kent Kane died in 1835, Lincoln poked fun at Democrats like George Forker, who scrambled to replace him. This news had the magic effect to produce much of both feigned sorrow and heartfelt rejoicing. Kane's greatest political friends are glad of it, not that they loved him less but that they loved his office more. Forker denounced the author of this piece as a monster, devoid of the ordinary susceptibilities of humanity. When not ridiculing his political foes, Lincoln praised his friends, including John Todd Stewart. Referring to the passage of the Canal Bill, he declared that northern Illinois is under the strongest obligations to the untiring zeal of Mr. Stewart, who has spared no pains in the high-minded, and honorable way to secure the accomplishment of this great work. Lincoln heralded Archibald Williams as much the closest reasoner in the Senate, and asserted that it would be a gratification to any man to hear him tear in tatters the new democracy. Lincoln assailed members of the Monster Party for delaying construction of the Illinois and Michigan Canal until they could vest the legislature with the power to appoint canal commissioners. He caustically observed that there are men hanging on here who are bankrupt in principle, business habits, and everything else, who have the promises of these offices as soon as they shall be made elective. He referred to Democratic supporters of Martin Van Buren as 
ruffle-shirted vannies, whereas supporters of his own favorite candidate for the Whig presidential nomination, Tennessee Senator Hugh Lawson White, he called the people. Although White was a Jacksonian, many people in the South and West viewed his candidacy as a protest against the dictation of Northern Democrats, who had selected Van Buren. Lincoln and other Whigs called Democrats loco focos, a derogatory term originally applied to the most radical faction of the party, which was accused of abandoning Jeffersonian and Jacksonian principles. When opponents denounced that smear tactic, Lincoln responded with a story about a farmer who captured a skunk in his henhouse. Reacting to the varmint's protest that he was no polecat, the farmer remarked, You look like a polecat, act like one, smell like one, and you are one, by God, and I'll kill you, innocent and friendly to me as you say you are. The loco focos, Lincoln continued, claim to be true Democrats, but they are only loco focos. They look like loco focos, act like loco focos, and turning up his nose and backing away a little, as if the smell was about to smother him, are loco focos, by God. Members of the audience nearly burst their sides laughing. In the 1836 campaign, Lincoln emerged as a prominent and effective Whig spokesman. One of his fellow Whig candidates for the legislature, Robert L. Wilson of Athens, recalled that Lincoln took a leading part and praised him for manifesting skill and tact in offensive and defensive debates, presenting his arguments with great force and ability, and boldly attacking the questions and positions taken by opposing candidates. Wilson ascribed Lincoln's success to his original style, avoiding the beaten track of other speakers and thinkers. According to Wilson, Lincoln appeared to comprehend the whole situation of the subject and take hold of its first principles. His remarkable faculty for concentration enabled him to present his subject in such a manner as nothing but conclusions were presented. His mode of reasoning was purely analytical. His reasons and conclusions were always drawn from analogy. Wilson also praised Lincoln's keen understanding of people and their motives, as well as his prodigious memory for facts and anecdotes, which he applied tellingly to the exact situation at hand. Wilson concluded, No one ever forgets, after hearing Mr. Lincoln tell the story, either the argument of the story, the story itself, or the author. One of Lincoln's stiffest political opponents, John Hill, son of the New Salem merchant Samuel Hill, also praised Lincoln for his remarkable eloquence. The convincing power of Mr. Lincoln's plain conversational method of address, recalled Hill, was marvelous and almost irresistible, plain, candid, and honest, without the slightest effort at display or oratory. Lincoln carried his auditors along to unconscious conviction. The benign expression of his face and his earnest interest in the subject, asserted with such simplicity, secured sympathetic absorption. All listened in close attention to the end and when he had finished, there pervaded a momentary solemn silence before his audience realized that it was the end. Hill described Lincoln as the plainest man I ever heard. He was not a speaker, but a talker. Such was his honesty, candor, and fairness that it was scarcely possible for an auditor not to believe every word he uttered. The same was true of conversation. He left behind him on all occasions a feeling one cannot express of respect, and that accompanied by affection for a good man. Lincoln's fellow attorney and Whig politician Albert Taylor Bledsoe detected in Lincoln's speeches a homely strength and a rustic beauty of expression, which are more effective than the oratorical periods of an Edward Everett or a George Bancroft. His simple, terse, plain, direct English goes right home to the point. On August 1st, 1836, Lincoln handily won re-election, finishing first in a field of 17. In New Salem, he ran well ahead of the victorious Whig ticket. Three months later, Van Buren captured the presidency with the help of Illinois' electoral votes. Just as he had been in the vanguard during the campaign, 
so too that winter Lincoln would be the leader of the Whigs in the General Assembly, filling the place vacated by John Todd Stewart, who had run for Congress and lost. Lincoln was among the few veterans in the enlarged and reapportioned legislature. Of the 91 members, 36 more than its immediate predecessor, less than one-fourth were incumbents. During the 1836-1837 session, Lincoln became prominent as the leader of the Whigs in the House. He regularly squelched Democrats with clever stories. In 1839, a Democratic legislator identified ten colleagues, among them Lincoln, who take up more time than all the other members. An Assembly colleague, Robert L. Wilson, thought him a natural debater, who was always ready and always got right down to the merits of his case, without any nonsense or circumlocution. As comfortable in the House of Representatives as he was in the houses of New Salem, he had a quaint and peculiar way, all of his own, of treating a subject, and he frequently startled us by his modes. But he was always right. To Wilson he seemed to be a born politician. The Whigs followed his lead, but he followed nobody's lead. He hewed the way for us to follow, and we gladly did so. He combined mastery of the facts with clear thinking and formidable oratorical skill. Yet he excited no envy or jealousy because of his unpretentious manner and winning wit. His colleagues readily acknowledged that he was so much greater than the rest of us that we were glad to abridge our intellectual labors by letting him do the general thinking for the crowd. Whig representatives, Wilson said, would ride while he would walk. But we recognized him as a master in logic. He was poverty itself when I knew him, but still perfectly independent. He would borrow nothing and never ask favors. Lincoln seldom asked favors because he believed that those who receive favors owe a debt of gratitude to the giver and to that extent are obedient and abject slaves. To Wilson, Lincoln seemed to glide along in life without any friction or effort. In fact, Lincoln was not exactly gliding along. Shortly after the General Assembly convened, he wrote from Vandalia to a friend, My spirits are so low that I feel I would rather be any place in the world than here. I really cannot endure the thought of staying here ten weeks. Aside from his customary melancholy, he may have been downcast because he had nothing to do. The day before Lincoln penned his dispirited letter, a Vandalia newspaper reported that Little business has been done in either the Senate or the House of Representatives thus far, because of the unfinished situation of the State House. The plastering is new and damp, and it became necessary, to the comfort and health of the members, to have additional stoves put up. Downcast or not, Lincoln gathered himself in time to help shape important legislation. He championed the State Bank with special vehemence. On January 11, 1837, he defended that institution against an attack by Democrat Usher F. Linder, sarcastically acknowledging that Linder was his superior in the faculty of entangling a subject so that neither himself nor any other man can find head or tail to it. Lincoln dismissed his opponent's arguments as silly and harshly declared that if Linder were unaware of Illinois' usury statute, he is too ignorant to be placed at the head of the committee which his resolution proposes. If, on the other hand, he were aware of that usury law, which he did not mention in his flings against the bank, Linder was too uncandid to merit the respect or confidence of anyone. Lincoln went on to denounce capitalists who generally act harmoniously and in concert to fleece the people, and politicians, a set of men who are, taken as a mass, at least one long step removed from honest men. Lincoln immediately added that, I say this with the greater freedom because, being a politician myself, none can regard it as personal. He further denounced that lawless and mobocratic spirit, whether in relation to the bank or anything else, which is already abroad in the land, and is spreading, with rapid and fearful impetuosity, to the ultimate overthrow of every institution or even moral principle 
in which persons and property have hitherto found security. In this partisan speech, Lincoln did not forthrightly address all the criticisms of the bank. When the legislature incorporated the Bank of Illinois, it anticipated that its stock would be bought primarily by in-state investors. Instead, most shares were purchased by financiers in the East, who deviously used the names of Illinois farmers as owners of the stock. Linder justly accused the bank commissioners of violating the law. This Lincoln dismissed as a quarrel among selfish capitalists, which was of no concern to the people. In fact, the law had been undermined. Lincoln was also disingenuous in alleging that the bank had met its legal requirement to redeem its notes in specie. This provision of the law was virtually nullified through clever arrangements by which the nine branches of the Bank of Illinois printed notes redeemable only at the issuing branch. To ensure that few such requests for redemption were made, the branches brought their notes into circulation at remote sites. Though somewhat demagogic, Lincoln's speech rested on the sound notion that economic growth required banks and an elastic money supply. His political opponents, with their agrarian fondness for a metallic currency, failed to understand this fundamental point. Banks, he knew, had a vital role to play in financing the canals and railroads, essential for ending rural isolation and backwardness, a goal he cared about passionately. In fact, the state bank had been revived in the 1830s to finance internal improvements without raising taxes. In addition, Lincoln wanted to protect the assets earned by ordinary people in the sweat of their brows. He predicted that the destruction of the bank would annihilate the currency of the state, and thus render valueless in the hands of our people that reward of their former labors. Banks also allowed the honest, industrious, and virtuous poor to get ahead through loans. Without internal improvements and banks, argued the Sangamo Journal, the poor would forever remain hewers of wood and drawers of water for the rich. By making credit difficult to obtain, the Democrats forced the industrious poor to accumulate capital on their own before starting a business, a process that might take decades. The Whigs, by making the surplus capital of the rich available through banks, aimed to expand economic opportunity for the poor. Lincoln's chief goal in the winter of 1836 to 1837 was to have Springfield chosen as the new state capital. By law, Vandalia's claim to that honor expired in 1839. Thereafter, some other town might replace it. A change made sense. In 1819, when Vandalia had been selected, most Illinoisans lived in the southern part of the state where Vandalia was located. During the 1820s and 1830s, however, more and more settlers flowed into the middle and northern counties, availing themselves of the cheap transportation provided by the Erie Canal, completed in 1825, and by Great Lakes Steamboat Connections to Chicago, opened in 1832. At the same time, the state's rejection in 1824 of attempts to introduce slavery discouraged some potential immigrants from the South. In 1833, Vandalia seemed inadequate, as one critic put it, because of its remoteness from the center, from the most populous districts of the state, and from practicable navigation. It's known and striking destitution of any commanding commercial facilities, the unsightly monotonous appearance, comparative bareness, and flatness of the country immediately surrounding it, rendering it as unhealthy as incommodious unpleasant, and insusceptible of dense settlement and successful cultivation. Vandalia did indeed have major shortcomings as the state capital. For two weeks in December 1836, communication with Springfield was entirely cut off because of the condition of the roads. That situation had not improved over the preceding decade. Then, a traveler had complained that the road for three miles east of Vandalia is impassable with wagons, and nearly so on horseback. It is a perfect marsh or swamp of soft clay, extremely tenacious, into which a horse will sink at every step to his knees, 
and for the whole distance covered with water to the depth of six or eight inches. That same observer, noting that the countryside surrounding Vandalia was hard and sterile, covered with stunted oaks and apparently unproductive, prophetically remarked, I think that it can never be a place of much importance. Yet another drawback for Vandalia was its unhealthy summer climate. A visitor warned that bilious fever prevailed here, and there were several patients in the hotel where we stayed. In the mid-1820s, that same disease had killed many Vandalians. Five legislators died in the town between 1830 and 1836. A local booster protested that the trouble was Busthead Whiskey, which was made too freely available to the lawmakers at Ebenezer Capp's store, a favorite gathering place for members of the General Assembly. Moreover, critics protested, Vandalia offered inferior lodgings and food. In 1836, Justice Samuel D. Lockwood of the State Supreme Court complained that all the accommodations are indifferent. Many years later, John Todd Stewart told an interviewer, I remember that one of the objections that were urged against keeping the seat of government at Vandalia was that they did not feed us on anything but prairie chickens and venison. A piece of fat pork was a luxury in those days. We had such a longing for something civilized. One day, legislators organizing a deer hunt asked Lincoln to join them. He declined, remarking, you go get the deer, the hotel proprietor Maddox can cook it, and I'll eat all you can get. Vandalia was also notorious for its lawlessness. In 1837, residents deplored the frequent recurrence of brawls and drunken frays in our streets, and lamented that our town has come to the pass, that it is almost dangerous for one to walk the streets, unless he is armed with dirks, pistols, etc., Many towns aspired to become the new state capital, including Springfield, Alton, Decatur, Peoria, and Jacksonville. In a 1934 statewide referendum on relocating the seat of government, Alton had received 7,511 votes, Vandalia, 7,148, and Springfield, 7,044. Three years later, Lincoln led the Springfield forces in the legislature even though he was the youngest of the nine members from Sangamon County. That delegation, consisting of men whose average height was slightly over six feet, was contemptuously labeled in the Springfield Republican the Long Nine, after a type of cheap cigar. To win support for Springfield, Lincoln and his colleagues did what legislators usually do. They cut deals. As the representative from Morgan County, John J. Hardin, observed in 1836, members support measures that they would not otherwise vote for, to obtain another member's vote for a friend. To his wife, Hardin described the legislature as a den of legislative trading and renounced politics, saying that a man has no business here, in Vandalia, unless he will debase himself to bargain and trade for his rights. In 1839, David Davis described to his father-in-law the legislature's barter, trade, and intrigue. You vote for my measure, and I will vote for yours. In the first session of the General Assembly, held in the new capital, a journalist reported, Log rolling is now in most successful operation, and that party which understands the art of buying and selling votes the best will succeed. In every sense of the word, the longest poll will knock off the persimmon. In 1836 and 1837, the most coveted persimmons were roads, canals, railroads, and river improvements, which were universally desired and which the legislature was eager to provide. Illinoisans were, as Governor John Reynolds put it, perfectly insane and crazed considerably with the mania for canals and railroads. That mania was the key to Lincoln's strategy to make Springfield the new capital. Under Lincoln's direction, the Long Nine promised to support various internal improvements throughout the state in return for endorsement of Springfield's aspirations. Helping Lincoln was his mentor, John Todd Stewart, 
who lobbied behind the scenes. Since Sangamon County's delegation was the largest in the General Assembly, it had significant leverage when its members voted as a bloc. Governor Thomas Ford noted that the Sangamon delegation was not only large, but also included some dexterous jugglers and managers in politics. And thus, Sangamon County had a decided preponderance in the log-rolling system of those days. As legislative business was grinding along in December and January, the Long Nine relentlessly accumulated friends by promising support for internal improvement projects tailored to the needs of each county. It was difficult work, and progress came hard. As Lincoln remarked later, the subject of internal improvements was fraught with difficulty because it was impossible to please everyone. One man is offended because a road passes over his land, and another is offended because it does not pass over his. One is dissatisfied because the bridge, for which he is taxed, crosses the river on a different road from that which leads from his house to town. Another cannot bear that the county should be got in debt for these same roads and bridges, while not a few struggle hard to have roads located over their lands and then stoutly refuse to let them be opened until they are first paid the damages. Even between the different wards and streets of towns and cities, we find this same wrangling and difficulty. Strong resistance to the internal improvement scheme also came from fiscal conservatives who believed that private funds, not tax dollars, should underwrite river and harbor improvements, railroads, canals, and turnpikes. In addition, some old fogies were opposed to railroads for the reason that they would be too destructive of timber, believing that the roads were made of split wooden rails laid closely together, corduroy fashion. On December 13, 1836, a serious threat confronted the Long Nine when John Taylor of Springfield submitted a petition to divide Sangamon County. Taylor and his lieutenant, John Calhoun, had speculated in land that they hoped would become county seats and thus appreciate in value. In addition, Taylor and the others had bought up acreage at the geographical center of the state, a locale that they named Iliopolis, and hoped to make the capital. Lincoln, not wanting to see the delegation reduced in size while it was seeking votes for Springfield, adopted delaying tactics, urging that the question be postponed until Springfield had achieved its goal. When signatures on the petition favoring division of the county proved fraudulent, the measure failed. In late January 1837, another attempt to divide the county was made, which was condemned at a mass meeting in Springfield. Soon thereafter, Springfield's champion submitted a remonstrance bearing more signatures than the original petition, thus killing the proposal. At one point in the long, tedious process, Lincoln succumbed to despair. Jesse K. Du Bois, a fellow legislator who became Lincoln's good friend, recalled that Lincoln came to my room one evening and told me that he was whipped, that his career was ended, that he had traded off everything he could dispose of, and still had not got strength enough to locate the seat of government at Springfield. Yet, he said, I can't go home without passing that bill. My folks expect that of me, and that I can't do it, and I am finished forever. Robert L. Wilson of the Long Nine also remembered discouraging moments. The contest on this bill was long and severe. Its enemies laid it on the table twice, once on the table till the fourth day of July, and once indefinitely postponed it. Removing bills from the table is always attended with difficulty, but when laid on the table to a day beyond the session, or when indefinitely postponed, it requires a vote of reconsideration, which always is an intense struggle. But the once discouraged Lincoln rallied his troops. In these dark hours, when our bill, to all appearance, was beyond resuscitation, and all our opponents were jubilant over our defeat, and when friends could see no hope, Mr. Lincoln never for one moment despaired, but collected his colleagues to his room for consultation. His practical common sense, his thorough knowledge of human nature, then, made him an overmatch for his compeers, and for any man that I have ever known. 
On February 17th, a motion to table the Internal Improvements Bill passed 39 to 38. Four days later, it was taken off the table. A key swing vote was cast by Edward Smith of Wabash County, an engineer who championed the Internal Improvements Scheme, which passed the legislature on February 23rd. Two days later, the Council of Revision, consisting of the governor and the state Supreme Court, refused to approve that bill. Smith's decision to change his vote may have been influenced by his fear that the House of Representatives would not override the Council's action. He probably struck a deal with the Long Nine to support the removal of the Capitol to Springfield in return for the Long Nine's votes to secure a final passage of the internal improvements measure. Opponents of the internal improvement system claimed that its supporters found out the price of certain members and bought up enough votes to pass it. The council's veto was overridden, and the bill to move the capital to Springfield passed on February 28th. Lincoln provided much of the backbone for the victorious nine. Robert L. Wilson and another legislator, Henry L. Webb of Alexander County, reported that on several occasions their opponents deemed that they had circumvented the movement, and incautious ones crowed lustily over the supposed defeat and discomfiture of Lincoln and his colleagues. Some pessimists supposed that the measure was lost, but Lincoln was tenacious and resolute. His unexpected flanking movements would revive their chances. Thus, under his adroit leadership, the bill was carried, although the only political strength in its favor at the start was seven votes in one house and two in the other, with no natural allies and several delegations of active enemies. The passage of the bill was felt to be one of the greatest of political triumphs, and its credit was freely ascribed to Lincoln. Wilson said flatly, had Lincoln not been there, it would have failed. Lincoln's most important maneuver may have been an amendment he offered on February 24th, stipulating that the legislature reserves the right to repeal this act at any time hereafter. This tautological measure won over the support of four legislators who had previously been in opposition. As amended, the bill was adopted that same day, facilitating Springfield's victory. Helping expedite that choice was another amendment suggested by Lincoln and formally introduced by Alexander P. Dunbar, requiring the town selected as the capital to donate two acres of land and pay $50,000 to help cover the cost of a new state house. This measure, which virtually eliminated the smaller towns from competition, passed 53 to 26. By the time balloting for the removal of the Capitol took place, Lincoln and his colleagues had cobbled together an alliance of 23 legislators who lived in or near Sangamon County, nine who represented counties that would benefit substantially from the internal improvements bill that had just passed, and three who fit neither category. Two of those three unclassifiable representatives were Jesse K. Du Bois and Henry L. Webb, friends of Lincoln who wanted to accommodate him. Du Bois and Webb were from the southern part of the state, where proposals to shift the capital northward enjoyed little popularity. Du Bois explained that he and Webb defended our vote before our constituents by saying that necessity would ultimately force the seat of government to a central position. But in reality, we gave the votes to Lincoln because we liked him, and because we wanted to oblige our friend, and because we recognized his authority as our leader. Webb called the legislative triumph of the Long Nine the masterstroke of diplomacy of the Western Hemisphere, and deemed Lincoln a Napoleon of astuteness and political finesse. According to Henry C. Whitney, Webb voted for the measure because of his admiration of Lincoln and the inability to resist his importunities. His original policy was to leave the capital in Vandalia, but he yielded to Lincoln. These 35 votes made Springfield the clear front-runner. On the first ballot, Vandalia and Peoria each received only 16 votes. Alton, 15, Jacksonville, 14, and Decatur, 4. On the second ballot, Springfield picked up nine more votes. On the third, its total again swelled by nine. 
On the fourth and final ballot, 20 more legislators sided with Springfield, putting it over the top. The Internal Improvements Bill and the move of the Capitol to Springfield had lasting implications, not all of them salutary. The strenuous maneuvering to trade votes so that each bill passed earned both praise and blame for years to come. The Improvements Bill funded many more projects than the committee drafting it had recommended. It directly benefited 44 of the state's 60 counties. The other 16 received cash grants. Representative Richard S. Walker from Morgan County complained of the bargain and sale that was brought about to make Springfield a successful candidate. In 1838, the leading Whig paper in that county declared that the internal improvement legislation was carried through the legislature by bargain and trade. It was a perfect log-rolling affair, and was avowed to be such by many of its supporters. In 1844, an editor of that paper, John J. Hardin, told the U.S. House of Representatives during a debate on an internal improvements bill, I do not wish to enter into a system of log-rolling to carry through this measure. I have seen the evils of that system carried to the extreme in the legislation of my own state, and we are now suffering too severely from its unfortunate results for me to be willing to see it adopted here. Vandalia's champion, William L. D. Ewing, decried, the foul corruption by which the seat of government, contrary to justice and the Constitution, was removed to Springfield. He contended that the Long Nine had sold out to the internal improvement men, and had promised their support to every measure that would gain them a vote to the law removing the seat of government. In July 1838, State Representative Christian B. Blockberger reported witnessing the Long Nine acting in firm and united phalanx throughout the whole session on this subject. I saw the dangerous influence their numbers enabled them to exert. I saw how votes were swapped off and exchanged, and how quickly the local measures of other members were voted for when Springfield could receive a vote in return. That same month, a dozen others joined Ewing and Blockberger in deploring the machinations of the Long Nine. Having staked their all upon this one measure, and having so strong a delegation to act upon the system of log-rolling, it was not difficult for them to secure the votes of members who felt but little interested in the subject. Every art, device, and argument that could possibly be used to gain votes were resorted to. In 1843, a shrewd observer of Sangamon County politics declared that the Internal Improvements Law and all its sad consequences, are more justly attributed to the log-rolling of the Long Nine than any other men or set of men. Lincoln's friend and political ally, George T. M. Davis, editor of the Alton Telegraph, alleged that Springfield was chosen as the capital by the use of the basest stratagem and intrigue. The internal improvement scheme generated patronage opportunities galore. One observer noted that the statute would never have passed had it not been for the multitude of new offices which it created and the confident expectation that the friends of the measure in the legislature would fill those offices. Soon after the bill's passage, the chairman of the committee which reported it to the legislature received an office under the law worth $3,000 a year. Most of the men appointed to the Board of Public Works were party leaders who had never been conspicuous for anything but their blind devotion to the dominant party. None had the least experience in the important duties assigned them, but because they had done something for the party, they had to be provided for, and if they knew nothing else, they knew that they got good salaries, and that was, of course, satisfactory. A case in point was Democrat John J. McClernand, who broke with his party to support the measure and as a reward was named treasurer of the Illinois and Michigan Canal. Lincoln openly acknowledged that he had engaged in log rolling, and his sense of honor demanded that the commitments he and others had made be kept. In 1839, the Vandalia Free Press, a Whig newspaper, said, 
Lincoln admitted that Sangamon County had received great and important benefits. At the last session of the legislature, in return for giving support, through her delegation, to the system of internal improvement, and that, though not legally bound, she is morally bound to adhere to that system through all time to come. Another Vandalia journal, perhaps describing the same remarks, alleged that one night during the 1838-1839 legislative session, Lincoln and Edward D. Baker clashed over the internal improvement system. After Baker pronounced himself against the system, Lincoln replied tartly to his colleague, that he, for himself and every other representative of Sangamon County, present and future, should forever support the system of internal improvements, because the Sangamon delegation had obtained the seat of government at Springfield by an understanding with the friends of the system. Mr. L. said he considered the pledges then made as forever binding, not only on him, but on Sangamon County itself. In the joyful celebration following this victory, Lincoln was toasted as one of nature's noblemen. Robert L. Wilson thought that if any man was entitled that compliment, it was he. Orville H. Browning praised the Long Nine. It was to their judicious management, their ability, their gentlemanly deportment, their unassuming manners, their constant and untiring labor, that Springfield owed its success. Echoing Browning, William Pickering commended Lincoln for his continuously moral and self-reliant conduct, saying his avoidance of strong language and strong drink, along with his good nature, formed a striking contrast with the general manners of nearly all by whom he was surrounded. Nor did Lincoln distribute money to win votes. He was given $200 to dispense while promoting the Internal Improvements Project, but only used 75 cents explaining afterwards, I didn't know how to spend it. Helping Lincoln and the other members of the Long Nine in their efforts to round up votes was William Butler, who later told an interviewer, I was sent down to Vandalia to work in the interest of Springfield. Peter Van Bergen was also sent down there with me, though he did no good, but to hear him tell it, he did it all. Lincoln and Usher F. Linder were the two principal men we relied on in the legislature to make speeches for us. John T. Stewart was the man we depended upon in caucus. Lincoln was not worth a cent in caucus. Not all of Lincoln's friends praised him for his work in the legislative session. Several of them foresaw that the internal improvement scheme was far too ambitious for the meager resources of the new state, and was therefore doomed to fail. Stephen T. Logan recalled that, I was in Vandalia that winter and had a talk with Lincoln there. I remember that I took him to task for voting for the internal improvement scheme. He seemed to acquiesce in the correctness of my views as I presented them to him. But he said he couldn't help himself. He had to vote for it in order to secure the removal here, Springfield, of the seat of government. Usher F. Linder, who later regretted his support for the system, apologetically explained many years later that at the time he, Lincoln, and other enthusiasts were all young and inexperienced men. No such misgivings were voiced when the Internal Improvement Bill passed. A dispatch from the Capitol, probably by Lincoln, described the jubilation. The huzzas and acclamations of the people were unprecedented. All Vandalia was illuminated. Bonfires were built and fireballs were thrown in every direction. Paying for the system would be simple, according to Representative John Hogan, who predicted that bonds would go like hotcakes and be sought for by the Rothschilds and Baring brothers, and that the premium which we would obtain upon them would range from 50 to 100 percent, which by itself would be sufficient to construct most of the important works, leaving the principal sum to go into our treasury and leave the people free from taxation for years to come. Hogan's rosy scenario proved wildly inaccurate. The bargain crafted by Lincoln wound up benefiting Springfield at the expense of Illinois. Governor Thomas Ford called the internal improvement scheme the most senseless and disastrous policy which ever crippled the energies of a growing country. 
In 1832, Lincoln had sensibly warned voters about the heart-appalling costs of railroads and canals. Four years later, he cavalierly ignored his own good counsel and that of friends like Stephen T. Logan, Orville H. Browning, John J. Hardin, Alexander P. Field, and Edwin B. Webb, and helped saddle Illinois with a $14 million system of internal improvements that its population of 500,000 could ill afford. Among the approved projects were the laying of 1,300 miles of railroads, deepening the channels of five rivers, constructing a mail route from Vincennes to St. Louis, and the awarding of $200,000 to compensate the counties through which neither a canal nor a railroad would pass. The interest on the necessary loans exceeded the entire revenue raised by the state in 1836. When the economy collapsed in 1837, any slight chance that the state could pay for the many projects went glimmering. Illinois suspended interest payments on its debt, and for years thereafter its credit rating was poor, and its treasury strapped. The state, as Governor Ford noted, became a stench in the nostrils of the civilized world. In 1843, John Todd Stewart complained, Our reputation is very much that of a set of swindlers. Illinois did not finally pay off the loans incurred from the internal improvement system until 1880. When, at the same session, the General Assembly voted to increase its members' pay from $3 per day to $4, Protests deluged the State House. One indignant constituent, a blunt, hard working yeoman, berated Lincoln for he could and would not understand why men should be paid four dollars per day for doing nothing but talking and sitting on benches, while he averaged only about one dollar for the hardest kind of work. He asked angrily, What in the world made you do it? Lincoln replied, I reckon the only reason was that we wanted the money. In addition to passing the Internal Improvements Bill, the statute removing the capital to Springfield and the pay hike, the legislature continued its routine work of incorporating businesses, schools, and towns, of authorizing roads, and declaring streams navigable, and of defining the boundaries of counties. Lincoln participated in these matters, answering all but 17 of the 220 roll calls taken during the first session of the 10th General Assembly. Between the time that Lincoln declared his candidacy in 1832 and his triumph as the champion of Springfield's bid to become the state capital, he had become an adept partisan, renowned for log-rolling and scourging Democrats, but little more. The day before the General Assembly adjourned, however, he took a step that foreshadowed the statesmanship of his later career. On March 3, 1837, he and another member of the Long Nine, Dan Stone, filed a protest against anti-abolitionist resolutions that the legislature had adopted six weeks earlier by the lopsided vote of 77 to 6 in the House and 18 to 0 in the Senate. Lincoln and Stone were part of the tiny minority who opposed the resolutions, less than 7% of the entire General Assembly. The overwhelmingly popular resolutions were introduced at the behest of Southern state legislatures outraged by the American Anti-Slavery Society's pamphlets depicting slave owners as cruel brutes. Equally objectionable was the Society's massive petition drive calling for the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia. The resolutions passed in Vandalia declared that Illinois legislators highly disapprove of the formation of abolition societies and of the doctrines promulgated by them, that the right of property in slaves is sacred to the slaveholding states by the federal government, and that they cannot be deprived of that right without their consent, and that the general government cannot abolish slavery in the District of Columbia against the will of the citizens of said district. Lincoln wrote a protest against these resolutions and circulated it among his colleagues. None would sign except for Stone, a native of Vermont and a graduate of Middlebury College who was not seeking re-election. He would soon become a judge. 
Lincoln declared in the document, which he and Stone entered into the Journal of the House of Representatives, that the institution of slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy. This statement was a precursor of his landmark 1854 Peoria speech, attacking the monstrous injustice of slavery. In 1860, a newspaper widely regarded as his organ explained that Lincoln could not and did not vote in favor of the resolutions, because the old Calhoun doctrine embraced in the second of the series that the right of property in slaves is sacred to the slave-holding states by the federal government was abhorrent to his ideas of the true meaning of the Constitution. To proclaim that slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy was a remarkably bold gesture for 1837, when anti-slavery views enjoyed little popularity in central Illinois, or elsewhere in the nation for that matter. Several months after Lincoln and Stone issued their protest, the quasi-democratic governor of Illinois, Joseph Duncan, speaking for the clear majority of his constituents, denounced all efforts to agitate the question of abolishing slavery in this country, for it can never be broached without producing violence and discord, even in the free states. Duncan added that, If I read my Bible right, which enjoins peace and goodwill as the first Christian duties, it must be wicked and sinful to agitate this subject in the manner it has been done by some abolitionists, especially after our southern neighbors have repeatedly and earnestly appealed to us not to meddle with it, and assured us their having done so has not only jeopardized their own safety and domestic peace, but in many cases has caused bloodshed and rebellion, which has compelled them as a measure of prudence and protection to use more rigidity and severity with their slaves. Furthermore, Duncan argued, abolition without the consent of the southern states would violate the Constitution. He believed that it will neither be consistent with sound policy or humanity by a single effort to free all the slaves in the Union, ignorant, vicious, and degraded as they are known to be, and then turn them loose upon the world without their possessing the least qualifications for civil government, or knowledge of the value of property, or the use of liberty. Political leaders outside of Illinois held similar views. Henry Clay, Lincoln's beau ideal of a statesman, condemned abolitionists as extremely mischievous firebrands who would see the administration of the government precipitate the nation into absolute ruin and nullify the Constitution. He predicted that if they are not checked in their progress, the day would come when the free states will have to decide on the alternative of repudiating them or repudiating the Union. In 1836, Massachusetts Governor Edward Everett urged the state legislature to outlaw abolitionists, arguing that everything that tends to disturb the relations created by this compact, that is, the Constitution, is at war with its spirit, and whatever by direct and necessary operation is calculated to excite an insurrection among the slaves has been held by highly respectable legal authority an offense against the peace of this commonwealth. New York Governor William L. Marcy called abolitionists sinister, reckless agitators, then advised his legislature that it might behoove the free states to provide for the trial and punishment by their own judicatories of residents within their limits, guilty of acts therein, which are calculated and intended to excite insurrection and rebellion in a sister state. Seven months after the Lincoln-Stone protest, Springfield residents publicly condemned abolitionism. While the Presbyterian Synod was meeting there, citizens banded together to disrupt the proposed delivery of an anti-slavery sermon. Mob violence was averted, but some townspeople met on October 23rd and adopted the following resolutions. As citizens of a free state and a peaceable community, we deprecate any attempt to sow discord among us, or to create an excitement as to abolition which can be productive of no good result. The doctrine of immediate emancipation in this country, although promulgated by those who profess to be Christians, is at variance with Christianity, and its tendency is to breed contention, broils and mobs, 
and the leaders of those calling themselves abolitionists are designing ambitious men and dangerous members of society, and should be shunned by all good citizens. Simeon Francis's newspaper rejoiced that public opinion in the frontier states is likely to check at once the perfidy of these fanatical men, that is, the abolitionists. Westerners could not be induced to visit upon the South such an accumulation of horrors as is embraced in the meaning of those two words, universal emancipation. Francis was right. The anti-slavery movement had difficulty taking root in Illinois. Between 1817 and 1824, some Illinoisans had waged a successful battle against the introduction of slavery into their state constitution. But thereafter, enthusiasm for the anti-slavery cause dramatically waned. Before 1837, only one county in the state, Putnam, had an auxiliary of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Attempts to circulate anti-slavery petitions in 1837 fizzled. In 1841, when the Illinois Anti-Slavery Society dispatched an agent to spread the abolition gospel, Springfield authorities denied him permission to speak. Three years later, Ichabod Cotting's attempt to deliver an abolitionist lecture in the Capitol was thwarted by a mob of more than 100 men, brandishing sticks and boards and blowing horns. They made such a racket that Cotting could not be heard. Some of the mob hurled eggs at the speaker while Springfield's police passively observed the commotion and laughed. Simeon Francis noted that abolitionist is an odious epithet among us, and we do not believe that there are a dozen men to be found in Sangamon County to whom it can be properly applied. As a Morgan County abolitionist noted in 1845, there were many warm friends to the slave in his town. Yet quite a large portion of Western people who are anti-slavery in principle and who will subscribe to all the views of the abolitionists when presented to them in private conversation still abhor the name abolitionist, which they associate with not only all that does belong to it, but everything that possibly can be attached to it that is false, such as amalgamation, circulating inflammatory papers among the Negroes in order to instigate them to insurrection, and a desire to do away with slavery by physical force. They also attach to the name all the views of William Lloyd Garrison. An Urbana newspaper observed that abolition is considered synonymous with treason, disunion, civil war, anarchy, and every horror of which an American can conceive. In such a region, at such a time, Lincoln could scarcely expect criticism of slavery, even that which stopped short of abolitionism, to win him popularity. Yet Lincoln clearly had come to loathe slavery by 1837. Two decades later, he said that, I have always hated slavery, I think, as much as any abolitionist. He had not emphasized the slavery issue before 1854, he explained, because until then the peculiar institution seemed to be on the wane. His friend Samuel C. Parks asserted that Lincoln told the truth when he said he had always hated slavery as much as any abolitionist, but I do not know that he deserved a great deal of credit for that for his hatred of oppression and wrong in all its forms was constitutional. He could not help it. Lincoln expressed compassion for white men forced to labor like slaves. One day at Beardstown he observed a steamboat crew lugging freight on board, working like galley slaves and being cursed every moment by the brutal mate. To a friend he freely expressed his disgust at the tyranny of the mate, and his tender sympathy for the white slaves. In 1864, Lincoln publicly declared that, I am naturally anti-slavery. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel. In 1858, he said, The slavery question often bothered me as far back as 1836 to 1840. I was troubled and grieved over it. A friend remembered that in 1837 Lincoln was talking and men were standing up around him listening to the conversation. One of them asked him if he was an abolitionist. 
Mr. Lincoln, in reply, reached over and laid his hand on the shoulder of Mr. Thomas Alsop, who was a strong abolitionist, and said, I am mighty near one. In 1860, Lincoln stated that the protest he and Stone had issued in 1837 briefly defined his position on the slavery question, and, so far as it goes, it was then the same that it is now. Lincoln and Stone, while condemning slavery, also criticized abolitionists. The promulgation of abolition doctrines tends rather to increase than to abate slavery's evils. In this position, they faintly echoed the committee report to which they were objecting. That document asserted that abolitionists had forged new irons for the black man, added an hundredfold to the rigors of slavery, scattered the firebrands of discord and disunion, and aroused the turbulent passions of the monster mob. The committee could not conceive how any true friend of the black man can hope to benefit him through the instrumentality of abolition societies. This view that uncompromising abolitionism was detrimental to the true welfare of slaves was common, even among foes of slavery. Elijah P. Lovejoy, the anti-slavery editor who would die a martyr's death at Alton, Illinois in 1837, had three years earlier denounced abolitionists as the worst enemies the poor slaves have, and charged that their efforts were riveting the chains they seek to break. Henry Clay declared that abolitionists have done incalculable mischief to the very cause which they have espoused. In 1838, another Whig leader, the future president, William Henry Harrison, similarly remarked that the efforts of the abolitionists, whom he called deluded men, would end with more firmly riveting the chains of those whose cause they advocate. In 1854, the Springfield Register claimed that if it had not been for abolitionism, slavery would have been abolished in Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and probably in other states. The South, by the war made on her rights by the abolitionists, is compelled by every principle of self-respect and local pride to maintain her position and she will do it so long as this war is kept up. The abolitionists, instead of aiding the emancipation of the blacks, only perpetuate their bondage. Abolitionists' tactics and rhetoric could be inflammatory as they pursued what they termed the duty to rebuke which every inhabitant of the free states owes to every slaveholder. The leading exemplar of unconditional abolitionism William Lloyd Garrison, thundered that every American citizen who retains a human being in involuntary bondage as his property is a man-stealer. He characterized the desperados from the South in Congress as the meanest of thieves and the worst of robbers who were not within the pale of Christianity, of republicanism, of humanity. Garrison called the U.S. Constitution a covenant with death, and an agreement with hell. To critics of his approach, Garrison said in the famous lead editorial of his newspaper, The Liberator, I am aware that many object to the severity of my language, but is there not cause for severity? I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation." Such an approach to reform was diametrically opposed to Lincoln's. In a temperance address delivered in 1842, he criticized hectoring crusaders. It is an old and a true maxim that a drop of honey catches more flies than a gallon of gall. So with men, if you would win a man to your cause, first convince him that you are his sincere friend. Previous temperance efforts had failed, Lincoln said, because they were led by preachers, lawyers, and hired agents, whose lack of approachability proved fatal to their success. They are supposed to have no sympathy of feeling or interest with those very persons whom it is their object to convince and persuade. They indulged in too much denunciation against dram-sellers and dram-drinkers, a strategy that was impolitic because 
it is not much in the nature of man to be driven to any thing, still less to be driven about that which is exclusively his own business, and least of all where such driving is to be submitted to at the expense of pecuniary interest or burning appetite. To expect enunciation to bring about reform was to expect a reversal of human nature, which is God's decree and never can be reversed. When the conduct of men is designed to be influenced, persuasion, kind, unassuming persuasion, should ever be adopted. During the Civil War, Lincoln bemoaned what he called the self-righteousness of the abolitionists and the petulant and vicious fretfulness of many radicals. He doubtless felt the same way about some abolitionists of the 1830s, whose vituperative, intolerant style alienated potential recruits to their worthy cause. In fact, Lincoln may have been trying to persuade abolitionists to exercise more tact. Clearly, the abolition of slavery was on his mind, for in the peroration of this temperance address appeared a seeming non sequitur. When the victory shall be complete, when there shall be neither a slave nor a drunkard on the earth, how proud the title of that land, which may truly claim to be the birthplace and cradle of both those revolutions, that shall have ended in that victory. Lincoln may also have been repelled by the anti-Catholic bigotry of some abolitionists, including Elijah P. Lovejoy, a contentious, sternly puritanical newspaper editor and Presbyterian minister who argued with little evidence that slavery was a papist enterprise. In 1836, he was hounded out of St. Louis, whose numerous Catholics disliked his reference to their church as the mother of abominations, and his warning that Catholicism was approaching the fountain of Protestant liberty with a stealthy cat-like step and a hyena grin seeking to cast into it the poison of her incantations, more accursed than was ever seethed in the cauldron of Hecate. One Catholic warned Lovejoy that, should you continue to advance in your dishonest and dishonorable cause of vilifying my religion, I venture to predict your speedy extinction as an editor in St. Louis. Fifteen years after the Lincoln Stone protest, Lincoln criticized abolitionists who, like Garrison, marched beneath the banner inscribed, No Union with Slaveholders. In a eulogy on Henry Clay, Lincoln criticized Garrisonians, those who would shiver into fragments the union of these states, tear to tatters its now venerated constitution, and even burn the last copy of the Bible, rather than slavery should continue a single hour, have received and are receiving their just execration. He praised more moderate opponents of slavery, like Clay, who condemned those pro-slavery apologists who are beginning to assail and to ridicule the Declaration of Independence. The Lincoln Stone protest further declared that the Congress of the United States has the power under the Constitution to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, but that power ought not to be exercised unless at the request of the people of said district. Lincoln had unsuccessfully tried to amend the original resolution to permit abolition in the district if the people of said district petitioned for same. Twelve years later, as a member of Congress, he would frame legislation to rid the district of slavery with such consent. Unlike the committee report to which Lincoln and Stone responded, their protests clearly asserted that the Constitution empowered Congress to abolish slavery in the district, a question that was hotly debated at the time and became a litmus test, distinguishing the friends of slavery from its foes. The boldness of the Lincoln-Stone protest is notable but uncharacteristic of Lincoln in his twenties and thirties. When, in March 1837, he moved to Springfield from the dying hamlet of New Salem he was essentially a clever partisan whose promise of future statesmanship would long remain unfulfilled. Chapter 5. We Must Fight the Devil with Fire Slasher Gaff Politico in Springfield, 1837-1841 Lincoln began his new life as a lawyer 
and legislator in the straggling and irregular village of Springfield, population 1300, which visitors described as a commonplace, sprawling sort of town, covering about ten times as much ground as it ought. And a very unattractive, sickly, unenterprising town. Its dirty, dusty, unpaved streets and sidewalks were flanked by log cabins and shabbily constructed frame houses. In 1832, William Cullen Bryant deemed nearby Jacksonville a horribly ugly village, composed of little shops and dwellings, stuck close together around a dirty square in the middle of which stands the ugliest of possible brick courthouses. But he thought it outshone Springfield, where the houses are not so good, a considerable portion of them being log cabins, and the whole town having an appearance of dirt and discomfort. A friend of Lincoln recalled that for many years it was far from being an inviting city. The town's mud was notorious. When wet, the black loam of central Illinois became knee-deep prairie gumbo. A woman from the east declared that nobody can know the definition of mud until they come to Springfield. I think scrapers and mats must be fast-selling articles here. The family of Elizabeth Capps, who called Springfield a low, muddy place where it was a common thing for carriages and horses to mire in the mud around the public square, left the city for high and dry Mount Pulaski. Mud rendered the sidewalks, such as they were, impassable. The streets were even worse. In foul weather they approached the condition of a quagmire, with dangerous sinkholes, where the boatman's phrase, no bottom, furnished the only description. Not until 1870 was the town square paved, finally making its thoroughfares passable for wagon teams in winter. Garbage and refuse made the muddy streets even more repellent. The streets became the dumping ground for the community rubbish, so that the gutters were filled with manure, discarded clothing and all kinds of trash, threatening the public health with their noxious effluvium. Roaming livestock compounded matters. Throughout the antebellum period, hogs and cattle roamed freely throughout the town. The hogs rubbed against fences and house corners, leaving them filthy. When the summer sun beat down on privies, sinkholes, stables, abattoirs, and the like, the stench became overwhelming. The numerous ponds around town, which furnished frog and mosquito music for the inhabitants, were always loathsome to the eye. In hot weather they became sickening to the smell. Equally noisome was the market house, which swarmed with greenback flies. Springfield's business structures were arranged haphazardly and slapped together in the cheapest possible manner. Both its hotels and livery stables were few in number, small, badly managed, and expensive. Its stores were meagerly stocked, and the concert hall was so dirty and shabby that the celebrated soprano Adelina Patti refused to sing there once she had taken the stage and beheld its appearance. The capital was considered an eyesore with an interior that impressed one visitor as the most shabby, forlorn, dirty, dilapidated specimen of a public edifice which we have ever seen. Other visitors called the city dull, inactive, wanting in public spirit and enterprise, and found little in and about Springfield to interest or amuse a stranger. Sessions of the legislature provided some diversion, but when the lawmakers departed, the town reverted to its customary dullness. An Ohioan wrote that while he had been to many a distressing place, Springfield was the most distressing of all. Springfield citizens, as well as its streets and buildings, failed to please visitors. Ezekiel Morse Weed, a delegate to the 1847 Constitutional Convention meeting in the city, lamented that during the convention's three-month duration, no kindness or hospitality or friendship has been extended to these delegates by any of the citizens, save Ninian W. Edwards. Even the ordinary kindness and civilities of life were lacking, he confided to his diary. John Hay called Springfield a city combining the meanness of the North with the barbarism of the South. Shakespeare's Dogberry, Hay quipped, ought to have been an Illinoisan. 
a Briton deplored the local manners. The nasty habit of chewing tobacco and spitting not only gives them a dirty look, but makes them disagreeable companions. They eat so fast, and are so silent, and run off so soon when they have finished their meals, that really eating in this country is more like the feeding of a parcel of brutes than men. Brawling and drunkenness were common, especially at election time. In 1839 at least fifteen fights broke out while the polls were open. Lincoln enjoyed telling a story about Springfield that he had heard from his friend Jesse K. Du Bois, the Illinois State Auditor. In that capacity, Du Bois was once asked by an itinerant quack preacher for permission to use the Hall of Representatives for a religious lecture. When Du Bois inquired, What's it about? the minister replied, The Second Coming of Christ. Nonsense, retorted the state auditor. If Christ had been to Springfield once and got away, he'd be damn clear of coming again. Settling Down in Springfield A few weeks after moving from New Salem to the new capital designate, a gloomy Lincoln confided to a lady friend that living in Springfield is rather a dull business. After all, at least it is so to me, I am quite as lonesome here as I ever was anywhere in my life. Beyond the drawbacks of the town itself, he felt embarrassed about his poverty. Calling Springfield a busy wilderness, he noted that there was a great deal of flourishing about in carriages here, a form of transportation that he could not afford because of his debts. Lincoln may have been lonesome for female companionship, but kind male friends helped Lincoln settle in. One of them, William Butler, recalled that as he, Lincoln, and two others rode to Springfield from Vandalia after the close of the legislative session in March 1837, they stopped overnight down here at Henderson's Point, and all slept on the floor. We were tired, and the rest slept pretty well. Butler observed, however, that Lincoln was uneasy, turning over and thinking and studying, so much so that he kept me awake. Finally, Butler asked, Lincoln, what is the matter with you? Well, came the reply, I will tell you. All the rest of you have something to look forward to, and all are glad to get home, and will have something to do when you get there. But it isn't so with me. I am going home, Butler, without a thing in the world. I have drawn all my pay I got at Vandalia, and have spent it all. I am in debt, and I have nothing to pay the debt with, and no way to make any money. I don't know what to do. As Butler told an interviewer, he came to Lincoln's assistance. When we got to Springfield, I went and sold his horse without saying anything to him. Butler paid off his debts and took Lincoln's saddlebags to his home, where Butler's wife washed the clothes they contained. When Lincoln learned that Butler had disposed of his horse, he was greatly astonished. What in the world did you do that for? he asked. Lincoln, Butler added, then went back to get his saddlebags, and they told him they had been taken down to my house, so he came down and asked where they were. I said to him, I have had them brought down here, and have had your clothes taken out and washed. Now I want you to come down here and board here and make my house your home. According to Butler, Lincoln was always careless about his clothes, and all the time he stayed at my house he never bought a hat or a pair of socks or a coat. Whenever he needed them, my wife went out and bought them for him and put them in the drawer where he would find them. When I told him that he couldn't have his clothes, that they were in the wash, he seemed very much mortified. He said he had to go down home to New Salem. I told him that he might take my horse and ride him down there. I also told him that there were his saddlebags and that there was a clean shirt in them. He took the saddlebags and went and got the horse and rode down to New Salem and stayed there about a week. Then he came back and put up the horse. For the next five years, Lincoln took his meals, without charge, at Butler's home, one of the largest in Springfield. Ninian W. Edwards may have prompted Butler to extend this hospitality, for Edwards considered the impoverished newcomer a promising young man who, with a little help, would flourish. In addition, Butler was probably grateful to Lincoln for his recent successful effort to have Springfield named the state's capital. 
The Kentucky-born merchant, Joshua F. Speed, who became Lincoln's closest friend, proffered equally generous assistance. Speed remembered that Lincoln rode into town on a borrowed horse, with no earthly goods but a pair of saddlebags, two or three law books, and some clothing which he had in his saddlebags. He took an office and engaged from the only cabinet maker then in the village a single bedstead. Lincoln then asked Speed, a silent partner in the general merchandise store, James Bell & Company, how much it would cost to furnish the bed. When the young businessman, nearly five years Lincoln's junior, calculated that mattress, blankets, pillow, sheets, and coverlid would cost $17, Lincoln replied, It is probably cheap enough, but I want to say that, cheap as it is, I have not the money to pay. But if you will credit me until Christmas, and my experiment here as a lawyer is successful, I will pay you then. If I fail in that, I will probably never be able to pay you back at all. Novice lawyers did not always prosper on the Illinois frontier. One Jacksonville attorney reported in 1835, Out of the long list of lawyers that come to this country and settle, there is not one out of an hundred who does one half business enough to pay his expenses the first year, nor enough to pay his expenses for three of the first years. Speed recalled that the tone of his voice was so melancholy that I felt for him. I looked up at him, and I thought that I never saw so gloomy and melancholy a face. The contraction of so small a debt seems to affect you so deeply, Speed remarked. I think I can suggest a plan by which you will be able to attain your end without incurring any debt. I have a very large room and a very large double bed in it, which you are perfectly welcome to share with me if you choose. He explained that my partner and I have been sleeping in the same bed for some time. He is gone now, and if you wish, you can take his place. After inspecting the room above the store, Lincoln, with a face beaming with pleasure, said, Well, Speed, I'm moved. Between 1837 and 1841, Lincoln bunked with Speed in the room above the store, where Speed's clerks, William H. Herndon and Charles R. Hurst, also slept. There was no partition, and hence no privacy. Such sleeping arrangements were common in frontier Illinois. Neophyte Lawyer John Todd Stewart, Lincoln's law partner, matched the generosity that Speed and Butler extended to Lincoln. On September 9, 1836, the justices of the Illinois Supreme Court licensed Lincoln to practice law throughout the state. Seven months later, he moved to Springfield, where, in April, the firm of Stewart and Lincoln was formerly established in a small, second-floor office on Hoffman's Row, a block of buildings facing the town square. Its meager furniture consisted of a small bed, a buffalo robe, a chair, and a bench. Stewart's partner during the previous four years, Henry E. Dummer, had moved to another town. Most of Stewart and Lincoln's business involved debts in one form or another, though the two men also dealt with various matters in the criminal, common law, and chancery branches of the law. Many of the cases were of small importance. For example, challenging Lincoln to determine who owned a litter of pigs, or who was responsible for the death of sheep due to foot rot. Lincoln and Stewart could not make ends meet if they confined their practice to Springfield, so, like most of their colleagues, they rode the first judicial circuit, encompassing ten counties. In 1839, when Sangamon County was included in the newly created Eighth Judicial Circuit, Lincoln traveled its nine counties but did the bulk of the firm's work in Sangamon, Tazewell, Logan, and McLean counties. Tyro, though he was, Lincoln handled much of the business of the firm, for politics monopolized Stewart's attention. Defeated in 1836 for Congress, Stewart renewed his quest for that seat the very day after he lost. Lincoln got off to a bad start when Stewart sent him to represent John W. Badley, a blunt English-born merchant of McLean County. When the haughty, aristocratic Badley beheld the unprepossessing young attorney, he promptly dismissed him and hired James A. McDougall in his stead. 
Lincoln's first law case, Hawthorne v. Woolridge, which began in 1836, involved a farmer charged with trespass and breach of contract. David Woolridge, Lincoln's client, allegedly assaulted, struck, beat, bruised, and knocked down James Hawthorne, plucked, pulled, and tore diverse quantities of hair from his head with a stick and with his fists gave a great many violent blows and strokes on and about his head, face, back, shoulders, legs, and diverse other parts of his body, and with great force and violence struck, shook, pulled, and knocked him down upon the ground, and violently kicked Hawthorne, struck him a great many other blows and strokes, violently thrust his thumbs into his eyes, and gouged him to his great pain, distress, and injury. The case, involving three separate actions, was argued before a jury, which awarded Hawthorne damages of $36 and costs. The other two actions were settled out of court, with Hawthorne paying the costs of one and Woolridge the other. No record indicates how the settlement was reached, but Lincoln may well have urged the parties to compromise. Years later, he advised lawyers to discourage litigation and to persuade your neighbors to compromise whenever you can. Point out to them how the nominal winner is often a real loser in fees, expenses, and waste of time. As a peacemaker, the lawyer has a superior opportunity of being a good man. Most Whig lawyers, including Stewart, shared this view. In his first case, Lincoln might have served as such a peacemaker, a role he had often played in his youth. Dennis Hanks recalled, I've seen him walk into a crowd of John Rowdies and tell them some droll yarn and bust them all up. It was the same when he was a lawyer. All eyes, whenever he riz, were upon him. There was a something peculiar some about him. Lincoln and Stewart usually charged five to ten dollars for their services, dividing those modest fees equally. The only large sum they received was five hundred dollars for a sensational murder trial in 1838. The case arose when Henry Truitt, quondam register of the Galena Land Office, cold-bloodedly shot and killed a political opponent, Jacob Early, a doctor and Methodist minister who had criticized Truitt's appointment to the Land Post Office. Truett hired Lincoln, Stewart, Stephen T. Logan, Edward D. Baker, and Cyrus Edwards to defend him. The prosecution team included Stephen A. Douglas. Faced with overwhelming evidence of their client's guilt, Lincoln and his colleagues lamely argued that when Truett pulled a gun on Early, the latter had picked up a chair and was therefore armed when he was shot by Truett, who in fact was merely acting in self-defense. Witnesses testified that the victim was obviously using the chair as a shield, not a weapon. Though only in practice for a year, Lincoln was chosen to deliver the closing speech to the jury. No record exists of his words. Logan praised his short but strong and sensible speech, and Milton Hay recalled that despite his rawness, awkwardness, and uncultivated manner, Lincoln was expected to make a strong speech in the case— and that expectation was not disappointed. It must have been quite persuasive, for the jury, amazingly, delivered a verdict of not guilty, which doubtless bolstered Lincoln's self-confidence. If Lincoln had acted as a peacemaker in the Woolridge case, he played the opposite role in the summer and fall of 1837, waging a vituperative political and legal battle against a pompous attorney, James Adams, who affected fancy dress and enjoyed an unsavory reputation as a lawyer. The controversy involved both law and politics. Lincoln's close friend, Dr. Anson G. Henry, wanted to unseat Adams as probate justice of the peace, an office Adams had held since the legislature appointed him in 1825. Adams, Lincoln believed, planted a story in the Illinois Republican, Springfield's Democratic newspaper, charging that Dr. Henry, as a reward for writing press attacks on Democrats, had one appointment as commissioner to oversee construction of the new state capitol. According to the Republican, Henry, a desperate, reckless adventurer, was unqualified and had vastly overpaid a mechanic for demolishing the courthouse to make way for the statehouse, 
and predicted that he would surely overpay contractors for the new building, too. A blistering rebuttal signed Springfield, probably by Henry, denounced the filthy and reckless attacks in the Republican, whose editors, including Stephen A. Douglas, who had recently moved from Jacksonville to serve as register of the Springfield Land Office and to write for the Republican, were aliens in feeling from the community in which they live. The newspaper insults led to violence. Henry suspected that Douglas had written the abusive articles and resolved to demand that the editor, George Weber, identify their author. On June 26, 1837, Henry and several friends, armed with canes and pistols, confronted Weber, expecting him to be meek. Douglas, who had come to the office to sound a warning, was sitting there when the committee arrived and threatened violence. Weber punched the spokesman, prompting the delegation to depart. When Douglas wrote a vivid account of the fracas, Henry's allies resolved to demolish the Illinois Republican office. The next evening, while the editor and his staff were out for dinner, a mob, led by the inebriated sheriff of Springfield, Garrett Elkin, broke down the door and set about wrecking the establishment. Weber and his three brothers, assisted by Jacob M. Early, promptly drove the vandals away. The following day, a mob attacked Weber and his brother John on the street. Sheriff Elkin cudgeled the editor with a weighted whipstock, while Dr. Elias H. Merriman assaulted John with his fists. John counterattacked, butted Merriman in the stomach, bowled him over, and began to beat him severely. At that moment, Jacob Weber came along and plunged a small knife into the back of Elkin, who fainted from loss of blood. Douglas successfully defended Jacob when he was tried for the stabbing. Lincoln joined the contest with his pen, spurred on not only by his friendship with Henry, but also by a lawsuit against Adams. Lincoln and Stewart had been retained as counsel by Mary Anderson and her son Richard, heirs of the recently deceased Joseph Anderson, who had once employed Adams as an attorney. Joseph Anderson's estate included two parcels of land, one of which was occupied by Adams, who claimed that Anderson had given it to him. Anderson's widow sued, believing that Adams had obtained title fraudulently. Lincoln's investigation of land records convinced him that Adams had forged documents. In six letters to the Sangamo Journal, published in June and July, and signed, Samson's Ghost, Lincoln accused Adams of fraud, forgery, and Toryism. Sampson was Andrew Sampson, who had leased land to James Adams with the understanding that Adams would pay the taxes and that Sampson might reclaim the land by compensating Adams for any improvements he made to the property. Adams eventually claimed that he owned the lot in question, though clearly it belonged to Sampson. In the public letters, Lincoln conflated Sampson and Anderson. Although the Toryism charge was inaccurate, Adams had served in the American Army during the War of 1812, Lincoln maintained a generally moderate tone in the Sampson's ghost letters. But Lincoln skinned Adams savagely in an unsigned burlesque entitled, A Ghost, A Ghost, which began with a slightly garbled quotation from one of his favorite plays, Hamlet. Art thou some spirit or goblin damned? Brinkst with thee airs from heaven or blasts from hell. The author of this article is clearly meant to be James Adams, who relates how he had been drinking one night, had fallen off his horse, and was sleeping contentedly on the ground until, accosted by a ghost, obviously representing Anderson, who declared in an Irish brogue which Lincoln employed in jokes and even in formal speeches, the rest of the dead is disturbed by the wickedness of the living. I loved my wife and children, and left them my little all. But it is taken away from them, and how can I rest in my grave in peace? The ghost offered an autobiographical sketch. I was born in old Ireland, Swite Ireland. I came over to America, to this blessed land. My wife and little ones came with me here. I bought a few acres, left it in the care of a friend, went farther and died. 
when Adams, called Stranger in the article, responds, And what of that? Most men die some time or other. The ghost accusingly says, I left my land in the hands of a friend, and that friend, oh, by Jiminy's, what shall I say? My very grave cannot contain me. My spirit wanders about, seeking rest and finding none. My acres are in the hands of my friend, signed, sealed, and delivered. Adams. But perhaps this transfer was legal. Ghost. By the hill, hoth, till the lie. Adams. Unless all the proceedings are regular, no transfer can stand, as you well know. Ghost. Jim is gracious. "'Tis signed with a cross, and I can write my name as well as any can. "'Oh, Jiminy's, Jiminy's!' "'Adams. Rather curious, I confess. But did you not make the assignment?' "'The ghost, his face radiating, anger, indignation, vengeance, erupted. "'Stranger, you lie. How could I assign a judgment before it was obtained? "'Bid Jiminy Christ, it is not so.' Two weeks later, just before the election— the Sangamo Journal ran another story, probably by Lincoln, ridiculing Adams. The recent noise and excitement made about the wounds and bruises received by General Adams reminds me of an adventure which happened to me while traveling to this great county many years ago. Not far from this place I met a sucker late in the evening returning to his home. "'Good evening, friend,' I said. "'How far is it to Springfield?' "'Well, I guess it's about five miles.' "'Are you just from there?' "'Well, I am,' and I said, "'What's the news there?' "'Well, there's nothing of any account but a sad accident that happened the other day. "'You don't know General Adams. "'Well, the general went to stoop down to pick some blackberries, "'and John Taylor's calf gave him a butt right. "'You don't say. "'And did the general die? "'No, by God, but the calf did.' The same day that this story appeared, Lincoln issued an anonymous handbill reviewing the complicated details of the lawsuit and once again accusing Adams of forgery. When queried, the editor of the Sangamo Journal, Simeon Francis, revealed Lincoln's authorship of the handbill. Lincoln's charge seems justified based on the evidence he marshaled cogently, if intemperately, and also on Adams's long record of ethical lapses. In 1818, at the age of 25, Adams had been indicted for forging and backdating a deed in New York. Rather than standing trial, he jumped bail and fled the state, leaving behind his wife and young daughter. In 1832, he had unsuccessfully defended an impoverished man accused of murder and then fleeced the man's family of their few worldly goods. In 1838, attempting to discredit a petition drive, calling for the division of Sangamon County, Adams obtained a blank copy of the petition and forged the names of free blacks. At Springfield, he engaged in dubious land transactions, which Elijah Isles, one of the city's founding fathers and most influential leaders, publicly denounced. Adams accused attorney Stephen T. Logan of slander, eventually dropping the charge and paying all court costs. In 1841, he so alienated his fellow Masons in Springfield that their lodge almost dissolved. Two years later, Adams committed bigamy. At that same time, he ran for office in Hancock County, though he was still a resident of Sangamon. Lincoln's assaults backfired. Adams won the August election handily, receiving 1,025 votes to Henry's 792. Although Lincoln had built a strong case, the public evidently considered his tactics unfair and regarded Adams as a victim of persecution. The Democrats protested that Adams, an infirm old man, had been wantonly slandered, bitterly persecuted, and deeply calumniated. The Sangamon Journal acknowledged that if a community can be made to believe that an individual is persecuted, it is natural for them to sustain him. Lincoln continued to attack Adams even after the election. On September 6th, he published a detailed rejoinder to Adams's defense, which had appeared in the Illinois Republican that day. In that document, Lincoln sneered at Adams's alleged misunderstanding of a situation that the greatest dunce could not but understand. 
To one of Adams's arguments, Lincoln scornfully replied, Is common sense to be abused with such sophistry? To Adams's assertion that Lincoln's testimony conflicted with that of the record of deeds, Benjamin Talbot, Lincoln retorted, Any man who is not willfully blind can see at a blush that there is no discrepancy between Talbot and myself. He called an affidavit by Adams's son-in-law to be most foolish, and deemed Adams himself a fool. Lincoln concluded that one of the witnesses cited by Adams must be some black or mulatto boy, because he had observed an important event while in the kitchen of Adams's house. He termed Adams's assertions of fact false as hell. On October 7th, the Sangamo Journal ran a letter by an old settler, probably Lincoln, accusing Adams of fraud in yet another land transaction. He sententiously declared that Adams may wince and screw as other men of the same character usually do under the lash of justice and the power of truth. Still, he shall not escape. Eleven days later, Lincoln deplored the general's rascality and called his defense foolish, ludicrous, and contradictory. Once again, Lincoln had the better argument, but his snide, contemptuous tone undermined his effectiveness. In 1838, an anonymous piece in the Sangamo Journal, probably by Lincoln, once again attacked Adams. Who is so blind that cannot see the finer marks of forgery in the last issue of the Republican? Do we not see evident marks of meanness? But it is surprising that one who has been guilty of defrauding the widow and the orphan, one who has been guilty of repeated acts of baseness, should stop at anything? He stands the living evidence that man is corrupt by nature. When Adams responded to the charges of forgery that had been brought against him in New York, the Sangamo Journal published a rejoinder, also probably by Lincoln, alleging that Adams distorted the facts and that he had left New York owing debts still unpaid. Eventually the Anderson lawsuit languished, neither dismissed nor pursued, until the death of Adams in 1843, whereupon the court abated the suit. For all the vituperation Lincoln unleashed on their behalf, Anderson's heirs never did receive the land. Adams was not Lincoln's only target in the 1837 political campaign. On July 1st, a special legislative election was held to choose a replacement for Daniel Stone, who had resigned his seat in the General Assembly to accept a judgeship. The Whig candidate, Lincoln's close friend, Edward D. Baker, ran against Lincoln's former boss, surveyor John Calhoun. On election eve, an anonymous screed, probably by Lincoln, appeared in the Sangamo Journal denouncing Calhoun and the other members of Springfield's Democratic Junto, among them John Taylor and the owners of the Illinois Republican. The author accused them of treason against Sangamon County and Springfield, because the previous winter they had lobbied to have the county divided up and to have the paper town of Iliopolis chosen as the new state capital. Their motives were selfish. They and their associates owned land in Iliopolis and in villages, including Petersburg, which they hoped would become the seats of new counties created from Sangamon. To enrich themselves, they were making common cause with the spokesman for Vandalia who wished to repeal the law designating Springfield as the new state capital. In the pages of the Sangamo Journal, a satirist, probably Lincoln, ridiculed William Walters, co-editor of the Illinois State Register, as a broken-down hack. Another scornful letter from the same pen alluded to the split within the Democratic ranks between the old Jacksonians and new converts who were seizing control of the party. In the letter, the author has John Calhoun, ostensibly bitter at his electoral defeat in 1834, say, I thought that I would go to work like an honest man and no longer attempt to obtain a living by locating towns as county surveyor. Special Legislative Session In July 1837, as the combative Lincoln waged a newspaper war against James Adams and others, 
Governor Joseph Duncan summoned the legislature to Vandalia for a special session to address the consequences of the financial panic that had struck that spring, drying up the market for Illinois bonds. The state bank was in danger of losing its charter, a development that, in turn, might delay construction of the Illinois and Michigan Canal. In response to this crisis, Duncan recommended that the legislature scrap the internal improvement scheme it had passed earlier that year. Ignoring this advice, the General Assembly, which met for less than two weeks, first turned its attention to a bill repealing the other major legislation of the last session, the Capital Removal Statute. The champion of repeal, William L. D. Ewing, an able, ambitious, conceited politico, had a reputation for using violence. The short, muscular, impulsive Ewing had several times been indicted and once convicted for assault and battery. In 1831, while drunk, he stabbed and badly injured a man who disagreed with him on a minor matter. As receiver of the Vandalia Land Office, he was found guilty of neglecting his duties. He was also indicted for other misdeeds, among them adultery. In an 1840 quarrel, Ewing threw a chair at a legislator from Chicago, Justin Butterfield. When the two men arranged to fight a duel, only Butterfield's decision to withdraw prevented bloodshed. In his attack on the capital removal law, Ewing sarcastically denounced the arrogance of Springfield, maintaining that its presumption in claiming the seat of government was not to be endured, and accusing the Long Nine of log-rolling. To respond, the Whigs chose Lincoln, who retorted upon Ewing with great severity, denouncing his insinuations and imputing corruption to him and his colleagues, and paying back with usury all that Ewing had said. Onlookers feared that Lincoln was digging his own grave, for it was known that Ewing would not quietly pocket any insinuations that would degrade him personally. Ewing then asked the Sangamon County delegation, Gentlemen, have you no other champion than this coarse and vulgar fellow to bring into the lists against me? Do you suppose that I will condescend to break a lance with your low and obscure colleague? Usher F. Linder and other observers expected that a challenge must pass between them. But cooler heads prevailed and no duel took place. Linder said many years later that this was the first time that I began to conceive a very high opinion of the talents and personal courage of Abraham Lincoln. Ewing's bill was referred to a special committee, chaired by Lincoln, who amended it to have Springfield pay the $50,000 it had pledged before work could begin on the State House. The measure, as amended, passed the House, but died in Senate. In the brief 1837 session, the General Assembly bristled with hostility toward banks because of the financial panic. As David Davis observed in July, there are a great many radicals, as well as desperate men, a great share of whom, by some fortuitous circumstances, are members of the legislature, and the cry at present, from one end of the state to the other, is, Down with the bank! Davis detected political opportunism at work in this assault. Representative Samuel D. Marshall wryly and correctly predicted that the bank will not go down. The leaders of the Van Buren party are too much in debt to it to suffer such a result. The Democrats had made threatening noises because they only wanted the Whigs to take the responsibility so that they might afterwards abuse the bank again and charge the legalizing of the suspension on the Whigs. In fact, Democrats did rally to support the bank. One of them, John Pearson, reflected the views of many colleagues when he said of that institution, A thing may have been unwise in its creation, and yet afterwards prove detrimental to us in its destruction, as some have reasoned in regard to this bank. If the sudden repeal, or even an opposition to this bank, will injure the works the people have begun, why then, it is our duty not to oppose it. With the help of such Democrats, Lincoln and his fellow Whigs thwarted attempts to repeal the 1835 Charter of the Bank of Illinois. Under that law, if the bank suspended specie payments, redemption of its notes in gold and silver on demand, 
for more than sixty days, it must disband. The bank did suspend such payments on May 27, 1837, in response to the financial panic. The Whigs managed to persuade the General Assembly to allow the bank to continue its existence temporarily. Politics, 1838-1840 In the following year's election campaign, the county division issue dominated Sangamon County politics, with the Democrats favoring the proposed change and the Whigs opposing it. Lincoln went to work in the press. Writing from Lost Townships, an author signing himself Rusticus, probably Lincoln, attacked the proposal in the Sangamo Journal. On April 15, 1838, Rusticus denounced the editor of Springfield's Illinois Republican for catering to land speculators by supporting their attempt to cut up Sangamon into a litter of counties. Rusticus reported, I was called on last week and urged to go for new counties. And what upon earth am I to gain, said I? Why, your farm may be made the county seat. It is high and rolling, has a fine view, and is in the neighborhood of a large body of timber, and is about in the middle of the proposed new county. Two weeks later, Rusticus called the plan to divide Sangamon County into Pea Patch counties a plot to benefit certain speculators who own town lots in Allentown, Pulaski, and Petersburg, and to gratify a few men who want offices. In June, Rusticus again invade against dangerous demagogues and speculators, declaring that every man cannot have a county seat at his door, nor ought he to desire it. In 1838, Lincoln campaigned not only for his own re-election, but also for his law partner, John Todd Stewart, who tried, once again, to win the congressional seat he had sought two years earlier. The hard times, widely blamed on the Democratic administration in Washington, improved Whig chances and aroused the public to pay more attention than usual to politics. David Davis of Bloomington recalled that no canvas in my time awakened such interest at the start and retained it to the last. It seemed, in my neighborhood at least, as if every man, woman, and twelve-year-old child were enlisted for the fight. Nothing but politics were subjects of conversation, and everybody attended political meetings. Lincoln attacked Stewart's opponent, Stephen A. Douglas, in letters by A. Conservative, which the Sangamo Journal ran in January and February 1838. Democrats opposed to President Van Buren's economic policies referred to themselves as conservatives. In the first missive, Lincoln called Douglas a radical, arguing that ever since the little giant had assumed responsibility for the editorials in the Illinois Republican, that newspaper had championed the utopian scheme of an exclusive specie currency involving the destruction of all banks and the dangerous doctrine that all incorporated institutions and all contracts between the state and its citizens can be changed or annulled at the pleasure of the legislature. He also accused Douglas of striking a corrupt bargain to win his nomination. Douglas furiously denied the charges and condemned the vindictive, fiendish spirit of conservative. With some justice, he protested that my private and moral, as well as my public and political character, has been assailed in a manner calculated to destroy my standing as a man and a citizen. Two weeks later, Conservative branded Douglas a man of expedience, and once again questioned the legitimacy of his nomination. The Democratic convention in Peoria that chose him to run for Congress was, Conservative alleged, gotten up and conducted in such a manner as to render it both injurious and disgraceful to the party if they attempt to sustain it. Douglas had been register of the Springfield Land Office, a post coveted by a certain gentleman, John Calhoun, who resides in Sangamon County, and who has followed a variety of occupations both here and elsewhere for a living and failed in all. Calhoun, eager to replace Douglas, flattered him with the suggestion that he run for Congress. 
telling him that he regretted to see him confined to the dry and laborious occupation of writing answers to the endless and silly inquiries of every applicant about N.W. of S.E. of 23, T.24.R.3.W., etc., etc., that for one whom nature designed for nothing else but to be fixed to one certain spot, to draw nutrition, propagate, and rot. Such a plodding occupation was well enough, but that for one of his towering genius it was absolutely intolerable. You, he continued, may be President of the United States just as well as not. A seat in Congress is not worthy to be your abiding place, though you might with propriety serve one term in the capacity of representative, not that it would at all become you, but merely in imitation of some king who, being called to the throne from obscurity, lodges for one night in a hovel as he journeys to the palace. History gives no account of a man of your age, Douglas was twenty-four, occupying such high ground as you do now. At twenty-four, Bonaparte was unheard of, and in fact, so it has been with all great men in former times. There is no doubt of a seat in Congress being within your reach. The only question is whether you will condescend to occupy it. Thus flattered out of his senses, conservative alleged, Douglas arranged matters so that he could win the nomination at Peoria. Operating craftily behind the scenes, he stacked the convention with his supporters and won. The two lines of poetry quoted previously in this missive were from Alexander Pope's Essay on Man, a favorite of Lincoln's. The day that this article appeared, Lincoln gave a significant speech to the Young Men's Lyceum in Springfield, entitled The Perpetuation of Our Political Institutions. It focused primarily on a recent nationwide outbreak of mob violence. In 1835, the country had experienced such a startling increase in mob violence. Seventy-one people died in 147 recorded riots that year that a South Carolina newspaper declared... Mobs, strikes, riots, abolition movements, insurrections, lynch clubs seemed to be the engrossing topics of the day. In 1837, Lincoln himself attacked that lawless and mobocratic spirit abroad in the land. In his Lyceum address, Lincoln added his voice to the Illinois Whig chorus, denouncing the upsurge in riots and lynching. In the midst of his ostensibly nonpartisan address, Lincoln struck a blow against Stephen A. Douglas. He alluded to the danger of a coming Caesar, a man of ambition and talents who would, ruthlessly, pursue fame and power, overthrowing democratic institutions to achieve his ends. Many great and good men sufficiently qualified for any task they should undertake may ever be found whose ambition would aspire to nothing beyond a seat in Congress a gubernatorial, or a presidential chair, but such belong not to the family of the lion or the tribe of the eagle. Lincoln asked, rhetorically, if such a person would be content to follow traditional paths to distinction, and then he answered, What, think you these places would satisfy an Alexander, a Caesar, or a Napoleon? Never. Towering genius disdains a beaten path. Clearly the towering genius was Douglas, the man whom the flatterer in Conservative No. 2 called a towering genius. This was probably a slighting reference to Douglas's diminutive stature, five feet four inches, which Lincoln in December 1837 had alluded to. We have adopted it as part of our policy here never to speak of Douglas at all, isn't that the best mode of treating so small a matter? Here Lincoln echoed the charges of conservative from the Sangamo Journal. Conservative likened Douglas to Buonaparte. Lincoln at the Lyceum warned against men like Napoleon. Conservative suggested that Douglas would not be content with a mere seat in Congress. Lincoln denounced any man whose ambition would not be satisfied with such a post. Since the rules of the Lyceum forbade political speeches, Lincoln could not directly attack Douglas, 
but because his audience was politically aware, he could assume that they had read Conservative No. 2 earlier in the day and thus understood that Douglas was the target of his remarks about the coming Caesar. It was a clever maneuver to circumvent the ban on partisanship at the Lyceum. Two decades later, Lincoln would again satirize Douglas in an ostensibly non-political address on discoveries and inventions. The Lyceum speech could be construed as an attack not only on Douglas, but also on the Democratic Party, which Whigs denounced for championing mobocracy. A headline in an Illinois Whig paper read, Mobocracy and Locofocism, One and the Same Thing. With some justice, friends criticized this florid address as highly sophomoric in character and a prime example of spread eagle and vapid oratory. It illustrated Albert T. Bledsoe's contention that Lincoln, as a young man, was most woefully given to sesquipedalian words, or in Western phrase, highfalutin bombast. Lincoln may have been imitating the flamboyant oratorical style of Daniel Webster, whom he had heard speak a few months earlier in Springfield. He greatly admired Webster's speeches, which he predicted will be read forever. In the Massachusetts Statesman's 1825 Bunker Hill Address, he reflected on the inability of his generation to achieve the fame of their revolutionary forefathers. We can win no laurels in a war for independence. Earlier and worthier hands have gathered them all. Similarly, Lincoln observed that during the Revolutionary Era, all that sought celebrity and fame and distinction expected to find them in the success of that experiment. This field of glory is harvested, and the crop is already appropriated. The moral that Lincoln drew from his survey of recent mob violence in Mississippi, Missouri, and Illinois was that every American, every lover of liberty, Every well-wisher to his posterity should swear by the blood of the revolution never to violate in the least particular the laws of the country, and never to tolerate their violation by others. He portrayed reverence for the law as the political religion of the nation. Lincoln echoed an earlier speaker before the Lyceum, his friend Anson G. Henry, who, in 1835, had appealed to the young men of Springfield to put down every symptom of mobocracy and lawless violence by enforcing the laws. The blood of our fathers, let it not have been shed in vain. Despite its evident banality, Lincoln's address offered beneath the surface a bold commentary on slavery and race, couched so as to give little offense, but nevertheless designed to prick the conscience of his audience. In part, the speech was inspired by the recent murder of abolitionist Elijah P. Lovejoy, whom Missouri slaveholders had driven from their state. When Lovejoy transferred operations across the Mississippi River to Alton, Illinois, he encountered an even more unfriendly reception. At a public meeting in 1837, several Alton residents condemned him. Soon thereafter, mobs twice destroyed his printing presses, dumping them into the river. On November 7, 1837, as he brandished firearms in an attempt to protect yet another press from mob violence, he was killed. His death aroused indignation throughout the North, where he was regarded as a martyr to freedom of expression. In the Lyceum speech, Lincoln, who several months earlier had denounced slavery as an institution based on injustice and bad policy, clearly alluded to the murder of Lovejoy in a passage condemning mobs that throw printing presses into rivers and shoot editors. Lincoln's central theme was the danger that mob violence poses to democracy. Although the speech did not mention Lovejoy by name, its application to his murder was obvious. Lincoln's audience might also have been reminded of the Springfield mob that forced the cancellation of an abolitionist sermon the previous October. If it took courage in the Springfield of 1838 to express sympathy for an abolitionist like Lovejoy, it required even more nerve to speak compassionately of a black man who, in April 1836, had stabbed two white men. 
Lincoln nonetheless did so, referring to a highly tragic and horror-striking scene at St. Louis, where a mulatto man by the name of Mackintosh was seized in the street, dragged to the suburbs of the city, chained to a tree, and actually burned to death, and all within a single hour from the time he had been a free man, attending to his own business and at peace with the world. Because the case of Mackintosh had been widely publicized by Lovejoy's newspaper, it seems probable that Lincoln was indirectly expressing further sympathy with Lovejoy by calling attention to that atrocity. Moreover, Lincoln condemned Mississippi mobs for lynching Negroes suspected of conspiring to raise an insurrection, and white men supposed to be leagued with the Negroes, and strangers from neighboring states going thither on business. Thus, within the bombast of the Lyceum Address, Lincoln subtly embedded criticism not only of Stephen A. Douglas, but also of anti-abolitionists and racial bigotry. Lincoln continued to attack Douglas. A third installment of The Conservative Letters, submitted to the Sangamo Journal, ostensibly written by unhappy Democrats, but probably composed by Lincoln, repeated the charge that the Peoria Convention that had nominated Douglas was a mere farce, and denounced the jugglery and secret management that procured him the nomination. Lincoln also confronted Douglas in person, both on the stump and in the courtroom. Lincoln and Stewart debated their opponents throughout the campaign. In one encounter, Stewart grew incensed at Douglas's allegations, grabbed his smaller opponent by the neck, and walked about with him. In response, Douglas bit Stewart's thumb, scarring it for life. Earlier in the campaign, Douglas, offended by a piece in the Sangamo Journal, tried to cane its editor, Simeon Francis, who, as Lincoln described it, caught his would-be assailant by the hair and jammed him back against a market cart, where the matter ended by Francis being pulled away from him. In May, when Stewart became ill, Lincoln substituted for him at a debate in Bloomington. Realizing that the race between his partner and Douglas would be close, Lincoln worked hard and urged other Whigs to follow his example. If we do our duty, we shall succeed in the congressional election, he told a friend. But if we relax an iota, we shall be beaten. His concern proved justified on election day in August, when Stewart narrowly prevailed, receiving 18,254 votes, to Douglas's 18,218. Lincoln easily won a third legislative term, running ahead of all the 15 other candidates, even though some of his old friends in New Salem, Sandridge, and Petersburg voted against him because his party opposed the division of Sangamon County. When the 11th General Assembly convened in December 1838, Lincoln again found himself pitted against William L.D. Ewing, who had run for the legislature that year promising to be a thorn in the side of the long nine, should we again see them, and to fearlessly expose to the new legislature the foul corruption by which the seat of government, contrary to justice and the Constitution, was removed to Springfield. As the most prominent Whig, Lincoln was his party's obvious choice for Speaker of the House. Ewing managed to win after several ballots by the vote of 43 to 38, making Lincoln in effect minority leader of the lower chamber. Lincoln might have won if all Whigs had been present and voted for him. As it was, three were absent, and two defected to Ewing. Disappointed by his loss, Lincoln declared that Ewing is not worth a damn. Thus began what one representative called a stormy session and a very unpleasant one. Once organized, the House somewhat desultorily addressed banking questions yet again. Two weeks into the session, the Committee on Finance submitted a report written in all likelihood by Lincoln. Reflecting the standard Whig position, it condemned President Van Buren's proposal for an independent sub-treasury, arguing that a divorce between government and banking was unnecessary, and citing the history of the extraordinary and unprecedented degree of prosperity which accompanied us in our onward march toward the period of this union of banks and government. 
The generally dispassionate document criticized the inconsistency of congressional Democrats, who, between 1831 and 1835, had voted against proposals to separate banking from the government, but who now supported Van Buren's plan to do so. The committee expressed concern that the separation of bank and state could lead to the marriage of public funds and executive patronage, an alliance that might corrupt elections. Since the system already in place had worked so well, it should not be abandoned. Your committee did not wish to be understood as resisting, without inquiry or examination, all changes in the fiscal affairs of the government, the report said. But, it asked, what are the grounds, what are the reasons and considerations which render this proposed change necessary and proper? Proponents of divorce argued that federal funds were insecure in deposited banks, though a recent report by the Secretary of the Treasury showed that this was not a serious problem. Moreover, Van Buren, in his December 1838 annual message, praised the conduct of banks. In January, the General Assembly expressed agreement with Lincoln's arguments by instructing Illinois' congressional delegation to vote against the sub-treasury plan. In addition to debating the bank issue on the national level, the legislators addressed state banking concerns, including a resolution condemning the practice of depositing in a Missouri bank the federal taxes collected from Illinois residents. Lincoln at first agreed with the resolution, but then moved to table it indefinitely. Instead of responding to the financial panic and recession by sensibly reducing expenditures for canals and railroads, the General Assembly, with Lincoln's approval, unaccountably appropriated more funds for such purposes. In December, acknowledging that his own course was identified with the system, Lincoln said that Illinois had gone too far to recede, even if we were disposed to do so. The following month, he reiterated this sentiment in a Finance Committee report. We are now so far advanced in the general system of internal improvements that, if we would, we cannot retreat from it without disgrace and great loss. He had pledged to support the system and announced in the General Assembly that his limbs should be torn asunder before he would violate that pledge. A year later, a citizen, probably Lincoln, defended internal improvements spending in a letter to the Sangamo Journal. Illinois legislators had done that which they thought would be for the future glory and honor of the state. They sought to help farmers create a ready market for the fruits of their labor by borrowing money to build roads whereupon the farmer could transport his products to some port of embarkation. An improved transportation network would provide a home market as well as a cheap and easy conveyance of commodities to foreign markets. The parts of the system in place had already dispelled the gloom from the face of many a farmer and mechanic. The author warned that to abandon the system would be ill-advised. Should the state manage to get through it honorably, she will get glory. Illinois' own industry and good management would pay the debt. The author wished his fellow citizens to keep constantly in mind that no murmuring or complaining of theirs will mend matters. They should not, like the foolish Israelites, by their murmurings, distract the counsels of their state, and put back the works of public improvement, which is fast converting their whole country into a fruitful field. Instead, let them, with contented minds and cheerful industry, go about making pork and beef enough in the next thirty years to pay for works fifteen times as costly as those now in progress, if they can find a reasonable market for it. To meet the costs of the internal improvement system, Lincoln proposed that Illinois buy 20 million acres of public land within the state from the federal government for 25 cents per acre, then sell it for a dollar and 25 cents per acre. If implemented, the plan would generate enough revenue to pay off the debt. Resolutions endorsing Lincoln's scheme passed the legislature, but Congress ignored them. In 1840, Lincoln urged John Todd Stewart to show them to the influential South Carolina Senator John C. Calhoun, who had proposed a similar plan. 
Lincoln also voted to impose a modest tax on land and to change the formula used to compute property taxes. To a dissenting Democrat, Lincoln protested that the old system, which relied almost exclusively upon taxes levied on the property of out-of-state landowners, failed to produce enough revenue. Moreover, it valued all land at either three or four dollars per acre, allowing owners of valuable property to pay less than their fair share of taxes. Lincoln claimed that the new system does not increase the tax upon the many poor, but upon the wealthy few by taxing the land that is worth fifty or one hundred dollars per acre, in proportion to its value, instead of, as heretofore, no more than that which was worth but five dollars per acre. If the wealthy did not like it, there was little reason to worry, for they are not sufficiently numerous to carry the elections. The Eleventh General Assembly addressed the touchy subject of county divisions. One legislator observed that of all the questions pending, the most difficult to settle are those as grow out of disputes in relation to county towns and lines of counties that affect such local interest. In 1839, David Davis explained to a Massachusetts relative that there was a great mania in our state for the creation of new counties. Speculators who own towns want counties made for prospective county seats. And then again, the office-holding spirit, which is diffused very generally in Illinois, induces the people generally within the limits of the proposed new county to desire its formation. Lincoln fought a rearguard action to prevent the balkanization of Sangamon County. In September 1838, the Sangamo Journal had run a letter, probably by Lincoln, accusing division proponents of selfishness, a desire to make money, or to obtain the little offices in the new counties. The author was particularly harsh in criticizing John Taylor. Old Sangamon must be cut to pieces to accommodate Colonel Taylor. He once endeavored to destroy her through the instrumentality of Iliopolis. He now aims to produce the same result by making use of Petersburg. The letter maintained that Aaron Vandeveer, of Lick Creek, wanted a division so that he could win election to the General Assembly, something he could not do in Sangamon County. In any of the proposed divisions of Sangamon, the mass of the people would not be accommodated so far as county business is concerned, as well as they are now. Despite Lincoln's opposition, it was clear that some kind of division was inevitable. He pragmatically sought to ensure that Sangamon would be carved up into three instead of four new counties, and that Springfield would not be disadvantaged. If the county were split into four equal sections, Springfield would be isolated in the corner of one. As a member of the Committee of Counties, Lincoln drafted a bill creating three new counties. When it was reported on January 16, 1839, the House referred it to a special committee on which Lincoln sat, that amended the bill, all of the amendments being in Lincoln's hand. On February 2nd, the House debated the measure, with Lincoln arguing against four equal counties. The bill, as amended, passed, establishing the small new counties of Logan, Dane, and Menard. Sangamon remained large with five representatives. Lincoln preserved for Sangamon six townships that would have been lost if the county had been divided into four counties of equal size. Thus, as the Sangamo Journal noted, Old Sangamon, though considerably shorn of territory, will still remain among the most extensive and populous counties in the state. In protecting the interests of the county, Lincoln employed the same skills he had used in Springfield's campaign to become the state capital. At least one of Lincoln's friends criticized him sharply for this stand. In January 1839, William Butler known as a quiet, dignified man, accused him of truckling to land speculators. In deference to their friendship, Lincoln judiciously replied, You were in an ill humor when you wrote that letter, and no doubt intended that I should be thrown into one also, which, however, I respectfully decline being done. 
Employing the imagery of suicide, as he did surprisingly often, Lincoln declared, I am willing to pledge myself in black and white to cut my own throat from ear to ear, if, when I meet you, you shall seriously say that you believe me capable of betraying my friends for any price. In closing, Lincoln called himself, Your friend in spite of your ill nature. Butler had also rebuked the less forbearing Edward D. Baker, who responded heatedly, calling Butler a fool. Acting as peacemaker, Lincoln explained to Butler that Baker had been writhing under a severe toothache. Hence, at that time was incapable of exercising that patience and reflection which the case required. He counseled that it is always magnanimous to recant whatever we may have said in passion. And when you and Baker shall have done this, I am sure there will no difficulty be left between you. Lincoln practiced what he preached, exercising over the years an almost superhuman magnanimity. The General Assembly also addressed the issue of slavery. On January 5, 1839, the Judiciary Committee moved two resolutions, the first condemning the governor of Maine for his refusal to extradite Georgia men who had helped runaway slaves, and the second declaring that citizens of the free states ought not to interfere with the property of slaveholding states, which property has been guaranteed unto them by the Constitution of the United States, and without which guarantee, the Union, perhaps, would never have been formed. Lincoln initially concurred, but on second thought said he wanted more time for deliberation. Finally, he concluded that it was better to postpone the subject indefinitely. The subject, however, would not go away. On February 1st, it came up again when John Calhoun, in reply to abolitionist petitions, introduced resolutions urging Congress to ignore pleas for the abolition of slavery in both Washington, D.C. and the Western Territories, and for the prohibitions of slave trading among the states. He added that attempts to grant Illinois blacks fundamental rights were not only unconstitutional, but improper, inexpedient, and unwise. The House defeated Calhoun's motion, 44 to 36, with Lincoln joining the majority. In March 1839, the General Assembly adjourned. Lincoln had, as usual, been conscientious, answering 157 of the 181 roll calls and serving on 11 select committees. The legislature reconvened the following December at the urging of Governor Thomas Carlin. Meeting for the first time in Springfield, the General Assembly had to deliberate in churches for the State House, whose cornerstone had been laid two years earlier, stood unfinished on the public square, surrounded by stagnant pools in which many of the city's free-roaming hogs wallowed. A wag suggested that wild rice be cultivated there. It will grow in water from six inches to a foot deep, reproduces well, and is a very nutritious article of food. A sufficient quantity could be raised in the State House yard to secure rations for all the state offices. Governor Carlin wanted the legislature to modify the internal improvement system, for the state could not pay the interest on the debt needed to support it. As the House of Representatives discussed the governor's proposal in its temporary quarters at the Second Presbyterian Church, Lincoln once again tried to salvage what the Democrats referred to as infernal improvements. He argued that at least some portion of our internal improvements should be carried on, at least one work calculated to yield something towards defraying its expense should be finished and put in operation. When he voted for an unsuccessful proposal to have joint stock companies take over the system, with the state owning some shares, the Springfield Register sneeringly declared that Lincoln has blown his pledges to the winds and has left the system to shift for itself. What an example of good faith! The jibe was unfair, for Lincoln voted repeatedly to sustain the system, including the Illinois and Michigan Canal. When it was proposed that work on the canal be suspended, he said, We should lose much by stopping the work on the canal, that a mutual injury would result to the state by suspending all operations there, 
the embankments upon the canal would be washed away and the excavations filling up. Although the legislature did not kill the internal improvement system de jour, it did so de facto. Governor Carlin also recommended an investigation of the state bank. The legislators complied by establishing a special committee with Lincoln as one of its members. In late December, he reported to John Todd Stewart, The legislature is in session and has suffered the bank to forfeit its charter without benefit of clergy. There seems to be but very little disposition to resuscitate it. A month later, Lincoln had better news for his law partner. The bank will be resuscitated with some trifling modifications. He was right. The following day, the investigating committee defended the bank in a report that Lincoln signed. The General Assembly permitted that institution to suspend specie payments until the close of the next legislative session. The removal of the state capitol came up yet again because the citizens of Springfield, suffering from the economic hard times, had difficulty raising the $50,000 to help pay for the new state house. Some legislators were ready to introduce a bill relieving the townspeople of that burden, but Lincoln objected. And though fully appreciating the kindly feelings that prompted the proposal, insisted that the money should and would be paid. The legislature adjourned on February 1, 1840, after reviving the state bank, continuing support for the Illinois and Michigan Canal, but otherwise cutting back on internal improvements, and incorporating the town of Springfield while leaving unchanged its new status as state capital. Characteristically, Lincoln had answered 145 of 169 roll calls. Well before adjournment, Lincoln and other Whigs girded for the presidential election. Thanks to the hard times caused by the Panic of 1837, they had a good chance to win. Illinois Whigs had at first opposed the convention system adopted by the Democrats, believing it to be a Yankee contrivance, intended to abridge the liberties of the people by depriving individuals on their own mere notion of the privilege of becoming candidates, and depriving each man of the right to vote for a candidate of his own selection and choice. Eventually, however, defeat at the polls forced them to reconsider. David Davis told a fellow Whig in 1839, The longer I live, the more I am convinced that unless the Whigs of this state organize through conventions, they will be beaten at the next general election. Candidates show themselves as plenty as blackberries. The following year, Lincoln and four party colleagues declared that a disbanded yeomanry cannot successfully meet an organized soldiery. In September 1839, the Whigs of Sangamon County urged their counterparts throughout Illinois to send representatives to a state convention the following month. That conclave chose delegates to the Whig National Convention, passed resolutions, adopted a plan for organizing the state, and drafted an address to the people. Lincoln was named one of the five Whig presidential electors and placed on the Whig State Central Committee, which the Democrats derisively called the Junto. The delegates endorsed the presidential candidacies of both Henry Clay and William Henry Harrison. Although Lincoln deeply admired Clay, he supported Harrison for expediency's sake. An 1838 editorial in the Sangamo Journal, probably by Lincoln, declared, in words which had personal resonance for him, that Harrison's nomination would proclaim to the world that poverty shall never arrest virtue and intelligence on their march to distinction. Furthermore, Harrison had earned his country's gratitude for arduous and valuable services to the community. A May 1839 letter in the Sangamo Journal, also probably by Lincoln, argued that Harrison was more electable than Clay. Acknowledging his admiration for Clay, the author nonetheless noted that the people, the bone and sinew of the country, the main pillar of the republic, I mean the farming and laboring classes, favorite Harrison. The author, who signed himself a voice from Southern Illinois, added that the people are for General Harrison, 
and be it whim or not, they must be humored, or the vanities, that is, the Democrats, will take advantage of the deep-toned feeling of the public mind in his favor, and a victory which is probably ours will be theirs. In December 1839, delegates at the first Whig National Convention agreed with Lincoln, passing over Clay and the other conspicuous leader of the party, Daniel Webster, to nominate the popular, colorless Harrison, and sent him forth unencumbered by a platform. When a Democratic newspaper sneered at Harrison's simple ways, "'Give him a barrel of hard cider and settle a pension of two thousand a year upon him, and our word for it, he will sit the remainder of his days content in a log cabin.' The Whigs made a virtue of them. Instead of principles, he would run on his military record, his humble log cabin origins, and his fondness for egalitarian hard cider rather than elitist champagne. Some Whig organizers eagerly seized the political low ground, believing that passion and prejudice, properly aroused and directed, would do about as well as principle in a party contest, and that to correct the abuses of the Van Buren administration is sufficient motive to vigorous and efficient effort, and in politics as well as in philosophy, it is unwise to give more reasons than are necessary. They ridiculed Van Buren as an aristocrat, who ate with gold cutlery, wore silk hose and ruffled shirts, scented himself with perfume, and primped before immense mirrors. In a circular signed by the Illinois Whig Central Committee, including Lincoln, the president was termed effeminate and luxury-loving. Whigs championed Harrison, by contrast, as a true man of the people, content with homespun clothes and log-cabin rusticity. The campaign insulted the intelligence of many thoughtful people. An Illinois Whig leader, Albert Taylor Bledsoe, declared that observers of the 1840 contest would have supposed that the whole world had run mad and rushed into the wild contest on the sublime issues, that log cabins are the best of all buildings, hard cider the most delicious of all drinks, and coonskins the finest of all furs. In no age or country, perhaps, since the dawn of civilization, has humbuggery been exhibited in more gigantic and grotesque forms than in the Harrison campaign of 1840. When Bledsoe expressed intense mortification that the Whig party, which had claimed a monopoly of all the intelligence and decency of the country, should descend to the use of such means, Lincoln replied, "'It is all right,' We must fight the devil with fire. We must beat the Democrats or the country will be ruined. In response to Bledsoe's protest that ends do not justify means, Lincoln looked very grave, but said nothing. Lincoln was not alone in his evident embarrassment. A British visitor reported that many Whigs seemed to be a little ashamed of the arts to which their own party had had recourse in order to enlist the laboring classes in their ranks. Noting that the Democrats had used hickory poles to win support for Andrew Jackson, who was known as Old Hickory, in earlier campaigns, some Whigs rationalized that one piece of vulgarity and bad taste was justified by another. Thus neither party had dignity or independence enough to rise superior to such absurdities. A case in point was the New York Whig, who reasoned that since his party had been broken down by the popularity and non-committal character of old Jackson, it was but fair to turn upon and prostrate our opponents with the weapons with which they beat us. Lincoln took charge of the Harrison campaign in traditionally democratic Illinois, where the idea prevailed that all things were fair in politics, love, and war. He predicted the state would turn Whig in 1840. In January, he reported to John Todd Stewart that the nomination of Harrison takes first rate. You know I am never sanguine, but I believe we will carry the state. The chance for doing so appears to me 25% better than it did for you to beat Douglas. In the fall and winter of 1839 to 1840, he helped organize two series of debates with Democrats the first of which took place in November. They were preceded by informal political discussions 
in Joshua Speed's store, where, one evening, Douglas accused the Whigs of committing every imaginable political crime and challenged his opponents to a public debate. The Whig spokesmen were Lincoln, Cyrus Walker, and Edward D. Baker. The Democrats were represented by Douglas, John Calhoun, Josiah Lamborn, and Edmund R. Wiley. The first debate took place on November 19th, with Cyrus Walker making the Whig case and Douglas the Democratic response. Lincoln had the final word. In the course of his remarks, Lincoln called the Democratic editors of the Springfield Register liars for alleging that he supported John Bennett instead of his old friend Bowling Green for a legislative seat. The Register chided Lincoln for the assumed clownishness in his manner which does not become him. According to that paper, he will sometimes make his language correspond with this clownish manner, and he can thus frequently raise a loud laugh among his Whig hearers. But this entire game of buffoonery convinces the mind of no man, and is utterly lost on the majority of his audience. The next night Douglas and Lincoln debated the Bank of the United States. Lincoln evidently did badly. The register ridiculed his efforts and said that even Lincoln's friends thought he had been whipped. One of those friends, Joseph Gillespie, had to agree that against Douglas, Lincoln did not come up to the requirements of the occasion. Gillespie, who said he never saw any man so much distressed, thought that Lincoln was conscious of his failure. Years later, Lincoln told a friend, I'm one of the thinnest skinned men to any marks of impatience in my audience. Later that week, the fiery, hot-tempered, impulsive Edward D. Baker spoke for the Whigs. One election day, the British-born Baker assaulted a prominent Democrat who had questioned his right to vote. Lincoln said that the bloody-faced Democrat was the worst whipped man that he had ever seen. In the Illinois General Assembly, Baker threatened to beat a judge who challenged his word. Baker uttered some harsh words about George R. Weber, co-editor of the Illinois State Register, prompting Weber's brother John to yell, Pull him down! Relaxing in his office on the second floor of the building where the debate took place, Lincoln heard the commotion below and promptly raced downstairs and beheld Baker confronted by a menacing crowd. Lincoln grabbed a stone pitcher and threatened to smash it on the head of anyone who attacked Baker. Violence often marred Illinois elections. Around the time of the debates in Springfield, for example, Usher Linder was speaking for the Whig cause in the State House and was continuously interrupted by hecklers in the balcony. At the conclusion of his remarks, Lincoln approached Linder, expressing concern for Linder's safety. Baker and I are apprehensive that you may be attacked by some of those ruffians who insulted you from the galleries, and we have come up to escort you to your hotel. We both think we can do a little fighting, so we want you to walk between us until we get you to your hotel. In the second round of debates, which attracted an audience of about 500, Lincoln redeemed himself for his earlier failure. According to Gillespie, he begged to be permitted to try it again, and was reluctantly indulged, and in the next effort he transcended our highest expectations. I never heard, and never expect to hear, such a triumphant vindication as he then gave of Whig measures or policy. On December 18th, Lincoln branded the Democrats' sub-treasury plan a scheme of fraud and corruption. Douglas responded in a manner that caused Lincoln to remark that he is not worth talking about. The day after Christmas, Lincoln gave such a powerful address that it became the Illinois Whig Party's textbook for 1840. He began by candidly admitting that it was peculiarly embarrassing to me to attempt a continuance of the discussion on this evening, which has been conducted in this hall on several preceding ones. It is so because on each of those evenings there was a much fuller attendance than now, without any reason for its being so except the greater interest the community feel in the speakers who address them then, than they do in him who is to do so now. 
I am indeed apprehensive, that the few who have attended have done so, more to spare me of mortification, than in the hope of being interested in anything I may be able to say. This circumstance casts a damp upon my spirits, which I am sure I shall be unable to overcome during the evening. After this painful acknowledgment, Lincoln delivered a sober analysis of President Van Buren's independent sub-treasury scheme for government funds, a deflationary plan that, he argued, would create distress, ruin, bankruptcy, and beggary by removing money from circulation. Hardest hit would be poor people in the states with large tracts of public land. Knowing, as well as I do, the difficulty that poor people now encounter in procuring homes, I hesitate not to say that when the price of the public lands shall be doubled or trebled, it will be little less than impossible for them to procure those homes at all. Lincoln cited history to support his alternative to the sub-treasury, a national bank, which for over forty years had managed to establish and maintain a sound and uniform state of currency. The Bank of the United States had performed this service cheaply, while the sub-treasury would cost more and do less to restore prosperity. In addition, government money was safer in a bank of the United States than it would be in the hands of government officials like those who had recently embezzled large sums. The bank was clearly constitutional, Lincoln argued. As he proceeded, Lincoln abandoned his didactic exposition of economic theory and history and began to scourge the Jackson and Van Buren administrations for their extravagant spending. He went on at length to rebut Douglas's attempt to explain the federal government's unusual expenses in 1838. Lincoln was occasionally abusive. He ridiculed arguments of the opponents of the Bank of the United States as absurd. He called Douglas stupid and deserving of the world's contempt. And he labeled one of Douglas's arguments supremely ridiculous. Lincoln indulged in some demagoguery, asking of the sub-treasury, Was such a system for benefiting the few at the expense of the many ever before devised? Warming to the task, Lincoln became almost hysterical as he savaged the Van Buren administration. Many free countries have lost their liberty, and ours may lose hers. But if she shall, be it my proudest plume. Not that I was the last to desert, but that I never deserted her. I know that the great volcano at Washington, aroused and directed by the evil spirit that reigns there, is belching forth the lava of political corruption in a current broad and deep, which is sweeping with frightful velocity over the whole length and breadth of the land, bidding fair to leave unscathed no green spot or living thing, while on its bosom are riding like demons on the waves of hell the imps of that evil spirit, and fiendishly taunting all those who dare resist its destroying course, with the hopelessness of their effort. And knowing this, I cannot deny that all may be swept away. Broken by it, I too may be. Bow to it, I never will. The probability that we may fail in the struggle ought not to deter us from the support of a cause we believe to be just. It shall not deter me. If ever I feel this should within me elevate and expand to those dimensions not wholly unworthy of its almighty architect, it is when I contemplate the cause of my country, deserted by all the world beside, and I standing up boldly and alone, and hurling defiance at her victorious oppressors. Here, without contemplating consequences, before high heaven, and in the face of the world, I swear eternal fidelity to the just cause, as I deem it, of the land of my life, my liberty, and my love. Although such rhetorical bombast marred this speech, Lincoln made some legitimate economic points. The independent treasury scheme would have been deflationary, though not as badly as Lincoln predicted. Moreover, he sensibly praised the useful regulatory function that the Bank of the United States had served, something like the role that the Federal Reserve System would play at a later time. Joshua Speed, recalling that Lincoln gave this address without manuscript or notes, marveled at his powers of concentration. 
He had a wonderful faculty in that way. He might be writing an important document, be interrupted in the midst of a sentence, turn his attention to other matters entirely foreign to the subject on which he was engaged, and take up his pen and begin where he left off without reading the previous part of the sentence. He could grasp, exhaust, and quit any subject with more facility than any man I have ever seen or heard of. Responding to Speed's observation that his mind was a wonder, Lincoln modestly remarked, You are mistaken. I am slow to learn, and slow to forget that which I have learned. My mind is like a piece of steel, very hard to scratch anything on it, and almost impossible after you get it there to rub it out. A Democrat who heard the speech remarked that Lincoln surprised me by his ability and by his apparent logical frankness. His statements were clear, and his arguments must have given great satisfaction to the party he represented. He asserted his proposition with firmness and supported them in the most effective manner. Even the Register praised Lincoln's effort as, in the main, temperate and argumentative, and mercifully free of coarse invective, unfounded ridicule and personal abuse. The Democratic editor said it was pleasant to find a man among them, the Whigs, who occasionally is able to deal in sober reason. The speech was widely published in the Whig press and issued as a campaign document in pamphlet form. Lincoln stumped for Harrison throughout Illinois. In March, Lincoln campaigned as he made his rounds on the legal circuit. With Edward D. Baker, he spoke in Jacksonville, where Douglas and the bibulous, combative Josiah Lamborn, a representative of the darker side of frontier politics, made their replies. Noted for bitter and unmeasured denunciations of Whigs, the tall, slender Lamborn had a peculiar, tawny complexion and a crippling deformity that had evidently made him vengeful and acerbic. Lamborn's undoubted brilliance was overshadowed by his lack of scruples and his drinking habits. He became an alcoholic, abandoned his family, and as Attorney General of Illinois, accepted bribes. Lincoln spent much time in the southern part of the state, known as Egypt, chief stronghold of the Democratic Party. Lincoln's speaking style, accent, and folksy approach to politics seemed more suitable to this area than to the northern part of the state. He canvassed Egypt more extensively after the August elections, in which the Democrats won the legislature and two of the state's three congressional seats. He was joined by his friend Edward D. Baker, former Governor Joseph Duncan, and Alexander P. Field, the fiercely partisan Illinois Secretary of State. A tall, perfectly formed man, with erect, soldierly bearing, and the polished manners of a born courtier, whose otherwise handsome features were marred by a nodular, potato-like nose. Field told a friend that the Whigs lost the legislature in consequence of the great majorities against us in the southern part of the state. That part of the state has not been properly attended to, or their majorities certainly would have been greatly reduced. Baker, Lincoln, Governor Duncan, and myself are going to spend all our time in the southern counties, discussing the principles of our party in every neighborhood, and challenge these men, Democratic leaders, to a fair discussion of this administration, organize our friends, and circulate documents amongst them. The Democratic press sarcastically remarked, Missionaries Field and Lincoln have again been sent forth by the Junto of Springfield to make a last effort in bringing the ignorant and heathenish Democrats of Illinois from out of their blinded and self-destructive errors and threaten them with the anathema of the Holy Federal Church if they do not open their eyes. Illness compounded the hardships of campaigning in such a primitive region. As Baker and Lincoln stumped Egypt, they found themselves shaking with the ague one day and addressing people the next. In the absence of railroads and stage lines, they had to ride on horseback with their clothes jammed into saddlebags. They covered vast distances through swamp and over prairie, all the while enduring miserable accommodations. But no matter how tired, jaded, and worn the speaker might be, 
he was obliged to respond to the call of the waiting and eager audiences. Lincoln's oratorical skills proved a valuable weapon in the Whig arsenal. For many Westerners seldom read newspapers, and thus obtained political information solely from stump speakers. John Hay observed that it was difficult for city dwellers to form an adequate conception of the intense affection and eager interest that a jolly, eloquent, and discreet partisan leader excites among his constituency of the backwoods. His triumphs occur in rural schoolhouses and groves, where his wit is rewarded by hearty laughter and his eloquence by yells of approbation. In regions with few sources of entertainment, a popular orator who can make men laugh and cry becomes entwined with their sluggish, emotional natures, and a speech is to them not an incident of an evening, but the event of a week. Baker's style differed from Lincoln's. An opponent recalled that Lincoln did not possess the poetry and pathos of Baker or Linder, but he had an earnestness which denoted the strength of his inward convictions and the warmth of his heart. Harmon G. Reynolds, a prominent Mason in Springfield, recollected hearing Lincoln during this campaign. The very first impression made upon us was that he could be implicitly trusted, and he had not spoken five minutes until we felt certain that he was a man of power. Reynolds was especially struck by the rich and musical intonation of his voice, his honest utterances, and naive, homebred way of thinking and speaking, so unlike other men. Connoisseurs of political speaking gave Lincoln good marks, despite some reservations about his appearance. Gustav Korner reported that at a Belleville rally in April, the other orators outshone Lincoln in melody of voice and graceful delivery, but that he was the strongest in argument. Lincoln's appearance was not very prepossessing, for his exceedingly tall and very angular form made his movements rather awkward. And his features, especially his high cheekbones, were unpleasant to behold, said Corner. His complexion had no roseate hue of health, but was then rather bilious, and when not speaking his face seemed to be overshadowed by melancholy thoughts. Corner observed Lincoln carefully, and detected a good deal of intellect in him, while his looks were genial and kind, but doubted that he had much reserve willpower. Earlier that month, Lincoln won a more positive notice in a Whig newspaper, the Alton Telegraph, which reported that his highly argumentative and logical speech in that city was enlivened by numerous anecdotes and was received with unbounded applause. The Telegraph also noted that at Carlinville on April 6th, Lincoln spoke with great power and eloquence. Negrophobia looms large in the campaign. The few extant examples of Lincoln's speeches showed that he indulged in the same race-baiting that he so freely employed four years earlier. For their part, the Democrats labeled Harrison an abolitionist of the first water, and a hypocrite who would make slaves of white men while making free men of black slaves. A Democratic campaign paper in Springfield denounced Lincoln and his fellow Whigs for seeking to deliver the federal government into the hands of a set of fanatics who boldly proclaimed that they would sacrifice their country, its liberties, its honor, and its glory, to make the Negro the equal of the white man, and alleged that wherever an abolitionist is found, he is loud and warm in support of Harrison. There are some three hundred abolitionists, it is said, in the county of Sangamon, every one of whom is for Harrison. In Springfield, Democrats attacked the Whigs for soliciting aid from that separate, distinct, and fanatical party called abolitionists. Responding in kind, Lincoln and other Whigs reiterated their earlier charges about Van Buren's support for black suffrage in 1821. At Carlinville, on April 6th, Lincoln reportedly showed that the Democratic presidential nominee was clothed with the sable furs of Guinea, that his breath smells rank with devotion to the cause of Africa's sons, and that his very trail might be followed by scattered bunches of nigger wool. 
In a debate with Douglas, he said that if his opponent tacked the wool upon Harrison's head, he would pull it off. Douglas retorted that he would begin just where the other gentleman left off, and that he would stick to the wool question. In another debate with Douglas, Lincoln praised the Bank of the United States, denounced the President's sub-treasury plan, told many highly amusing anecdotes which convulsed the House with laughter, and reviewed the political course of Mr. Van Buren, and especially his votes in the New York Convention in allowing free Negroes the right of suffrage. When Douglas accused the Whig presidential candidate of dodging the issue of abolitionism, Lincoln protested that the document cited by his opponent was not genuine. In a March 1840 debate with Douglas at Jacksonville, Lincoln ambushed the little giant on the abolition issue. While preparing for that event, Lincoln had his headstrong and revengeful friend, Dr. William F. Fithian, a skilled practitioner of political dirty tricks, write to Van Buren asking if William M. Holland's biography of the president accurately described Van Buren's support for black suffrage in 1821. Van Buren confirmed Holland's account. In a debate with Douglas, Lincoln asserted that Van Buren had voted for Negro suffrage under certain limitations. When Douglas denied it, Lincoln read aloud from Holland's life of the president. Douglas called it a forgery, whereupon Lincoln produced Van Buren's letter to Fithian. Douglas angrily seized the volume, damned it, and flung it out into the audience. At Pontiac, Illinois, Douglas had misquoted Holland's biography of Van Buren. When Lincoln reached Bloomington, he asked David Davis to obtain a copy of that volume. Davis did so, and the next day Lincoln confronted Douglas with it. In justifying his tactics, Lincoln told James Matheny that Douglas was always calling the Whigs Federalists, Tories, Aristocrats, and alleging that Whigs are opposed to liberty, justice, and progress. This is a loose assertion, I suppose, to catch votes. I don't like to catch votes by cheating men out of their judgment, but in reference to the Whigs being opposed to liberty, etc., let me say that that remains to be seen and demonstrated in the future. The brave don't boast. A barking dog don't bite. In April, Lincoln once again used Holland's life of Van Buren to prove that the president had advocated and supported abolition principles and opposed in the New York Convention the right of universal suffrage. Addressing a Whig rally in heavily Democratic Belleville, he charged that Van Buren had always opposed the interests of the West, was in feeling and principle an aristocrat, had no claims upon the people on the score of democracy, and was unworthy of their confidence and support. Lincoln analyzed Van Buren's rise to power in a manner which drew forth bursts of applause and peals of laughter from the assemblage. Lincoln's Whig friends also emphasized the race issue. The Sangamo Journal denounced Van Buren's love for free Negroes, manifested not only in his previous support for black suffrage, but also in his tolerance for courtroom testimony by blacks. In 1839, at the court-martial of a naval officer, two free blacks who had witnessed the alleged crime testified against the officer, who was convicted and cashiered. Calling this a monstrous and high-handed proceeding, the journal protested Van Buren's refusal to declare a mistrial. The journal declared that this would lead to a day when black testimony, even from slaves, would place whites at the mercy of blacks. Not stopping there, the editor predicted that Van Buren's approval of the court-martial verdict would lead to black suffrage, and one step more, too horrid to be contemplated, and that amalgamation. Lincoln's oratory in 1840, like that of other Harrison campaigners, tended to pander to popular taste. In an unusually perceptive commentary on the young Lincoln, John M. Scott, an attorney who eventually became Chief Justice of the Illinois State Supreme Court, described one of Lincoln's speeches during that campaign. The young legislator, already regarded as one of the ablest of the Whig speakers in that campaign, stood in a wagon to address his audience. There was something in him that attracted and held public attention, Scott recalled, 
Even then he was the subject of popular regard because of his candid and simple mode of discussing and illustrating political questions. In 1840, the dominant economic issues were not such questions as enlisted and engaged his best thoughts. They did not take hold of his great nature and had no tendency to develop it. Occasionally he discussed the questions of the time in a logical way, but much time was devoted to telling stories, to illustrate some phase of his argument. But more often the telling of these stories was resorted to for the purpose of rendering his opponents ridiculous. That was a style of speaking much appreciated at that early day. In such oratory, Lincoln had no equals in the state. A story he told was not one it would be seemly to publish, but rendered as it was in his inimitable way, it contained nothing that was offensive to a refined taste. Scott noted Lincoln's gift for telling off-color stories in a way that they gave no offense even to refined and cultured people. That day, Lincoln's story was met with loud bursts of laughter and applause. It placed the opposing party and its speakers in a most ludicrous position, and it gave him a most favorable hearing for the arguments he later made in support of the measures he was sustaining. In that period, Lincoln's mastery of humor was very effective and made him a popular speaker. Acknowledging that it was not a fair mode of treating an adversary, Scott explained that it is a mode of attack greatly relished by popular assemblies because most people like to see their opponents discomfited by being made the butt of a well-told story. As Scott observed, insult and ridicule were common in frontier politics, but Lincoln deployed them so mercilessly that they constituted a form of cruelty that reflected his primitive background. Not until midlife would Lincoln change his ways and earn a justified reputation for infinite forbearance and goodwill. If, as president, he could declare that he had not willingly planted a thorn in any man's bosom during his youth and early adulthood, he positively delighted in planting such thorns. In a celebrated event at Springfield on July 20th, for example, Lincoln excoriated Judge Jesse B. Thomas, who had been accused of writing anonymous letters for the press. In fact, Lincoln and his fellow Whigs were the authors of those letters, for which Thomas chided them in a speech. Lincoln's repose was merciless. He began by saying that he was a humble member of the Long Nine, so that he could not swell himself up to the great dimensions of his learned and eloquent adversary. The effort to do so would, he feared, be attended with the fate of the frog in the fable which tried to swell itself to the size of the ox. But he could do this. He could prick a few pinholes in his adversary and cut him down to his natural size. He then proceeded to describe with minute accuracy the political career of Judge Thomas and his various somersaults. He told how a new light had struck the learned judge, and with what wonderful agility he went right over. As he delivered his absolutely overwhelming and withering remarks, Lincoln was terrific in denunciation, mimicking Thomas's gestures and accent. The distraught Thomas began to blubber like a baby, and withdrew from the assembly. He cried, all the rest of the day. The Democratic Illinois State Register chided Lincoln for his rude assault upon the private character of Thomas, declaring that even fellow Whigs were disavowing what became celebrated in the annals of Illinois politics as the skinning of Thomas. The next day, a remorseful Lincoln apologized to Thomas. Lincoln also skinned Colonel Dick Taylor, a Democratic candidate for the state Senate, whose assaults on Whig elitism nettled him. The showy, bombastic Taylor was a talkative, noisy fellow, and a consummate fop, who never appeared in public without a ruffled shirt, a blue coat and brass buttons, and a gold-headed cane. When Taylor denounced Whigs as aristocrats, Lincoln replied that whilst Colonel Taylor had his stores over the county and was riding in a fine carriage, wore his kid gloves, and had a gold-headed cane, Lincoln was a poor boy hired on a flatboat at eight dollars a month, and had only one pair of breeches, and they were of buckskin. He explained to the audience, If you know the nature of buckskin when wet 
and dried in the sun, they would shrink, and mine kept shrinking until they left for several inches my legs bare between the top of my socks and the lower part of my breeches, and whilst I was growing taller they were becoming shorter, and so much tighter that they left a blue streak around my leg which you can see to this day. If you call this aristocracy, I plead guilty to the charge. Lincoln then unbuttoned Taylor's vest and outcascaded his ruffled shirt like a pile of entrails, causing the crowd to burst forth in a furious and uproarious laughter. Occasionally Lincoln's attacks backfired. At Belleville he sought to illustrate the economic distress brought about by the Panic of 1837 and Democratic policies. As an example, he noted that just that day he had seen a fine horse sold by a constable for the unusually low price of $27. At that, the constable, who was in the audience, cried out that the horse had only one eye. The nonplussed Lincoln seemed rather depressed and was less happy in his remarks than usual. A Democrat gleefully exclaimed, How very fortunate for the Whigs that Mr. Lincoln saw the sale of the one-eyed horse that day, he was thus enabled to prove that Mr. Van Buren caused it, together with all the other ills of life that us poor mortals are heir to. At Waterloo, down in Egypt, opposition speaker Adam Snyder scolded Lincoln for his low-road tactics and warned him that if his mission was to convert the lost and benighted, other weapons must be used. In Salem, Lincoln reportedly was completely done up, even his anecdotes failed to command attention. When an ally told him he was wasting his time, he replied, It is a fact, but my friends at home think I am not doing my duty unless I am out. So, I may as well stay. On the whole, though, Lincoln did well on the stump. In late May, the Quincy Whig reported that the Democrats have not been able to start a man that can hold a candle to him in political debate. All of their crack nags that have entered the lists against him, have come off the field crippled or broken down. In a debate with John A. McClernand at Shawneetown on September 5th, he impressed the crowd with the novelty of his attacks, ludicrous comparisons, and fund of anecdote. He also won credit for eschewing criticism of Van Buren's purportedly sybaritic style of living, a staple of Whig campaign strategy originated by Whig congressman Charles Ogle of Pennsylvania. According to a letter in the Democratic Illinois State Register at Shawneetown, Lincoln emphatically declared that the Ogle mode of demagoguing is a small and contemptible affair, and stated that he never alluded to the furniture of the president's house himself, and that he knew it was a mere trick to gull the people, and his only justification for his party was that Mr. John Quincy Adams was denounced on the same ground. Shortly thereafter, at Equality, Lincoln delivered a speech that sent the Whig faithful into ecstasies. He likened Democrat Josiah Lamborn Switch, from Whig to Democrat, to the adventures of a slave in Kentucky who had been sent by his master to deliver two puppies to a neighbor. En route, the slave stopped at a dram shop for refreshment, leaving outside the covered basket containing the dogs. While he was imbibing, two jokers replaced the pups with piglets. Upon arrival at his destination, the slave was astounded to see that the canines had become porcine. Returning to his master, the slave once again paused at the dram shop, where the pranksters removed the pigs and restored the pups to the basket. When explaining to his master how the dogs had been transformed into pigs, the slave was startled to observe that the pigs were once again pups. The nonplussed slave expostulated, I isn't drunk, but them dare puppies can be pigs or puppies just when they please. Just so, Lincoln said, Lamborn could be a Whig or a Democrat, just when he pleased. Lincoln could adapt his style to the situation. When he visited Mount Carmel in early September, he delivered a dignified and eloquent address before a mixed audience in the afternoon, and a more informal one to an all-male group that evening, when he seemed to let himself down to their level, pouring forth a current of witticisms and anecdotes which aroused the wildest bursts of applause. 
A Democratic paper reported that in Mount Vernon later that month, as Lincoln again debated McClernand, he spoke with much urbanity and suavity of manner, and was listened to with attention. He showed that he was well calculated for a public debater, for he seldom loses his temper, and always replies jocosely and in good humor, so much so that the evident marks of disapprobation which greet many of his assertions do not discompose him, and he is therefore hard to foil. On his swing through Egypt, Lincoln debated Isaac P. Walker, a top lofty, highly partisan, sarcastic, unpleasant Democrat. They clashed in Albion, where Walker had once lived. In his silk hat and black broadcloth suit, Walker looked far more distinguished than Lincoln, who wore blue jeans. But Lincoln's wit offset his poor appearance and allowed him to prevail. In order to deprive his opponent of any advantage that his former residence in Albion might confer, Lincoln began by quoting from Byron's poem, Laura. He, their unhoped but unforgotten lord, the long self-exiled chieftain is restored. There be bright faces in the busy hall, bowls on the board and banners on the wall. He comes at last in sudden loneliness, and when they know not, when they need not guess, they more might marvel when the greeting's o'er, not that he came, but why he came not before. An onlooker remarked that Lincoln's sallies on why he came not before had taken the wind out of his opponent's sails completely. In late October, a Jacksonian legislator, Dr. William G. Anderson, repeatedly interrupted Lincoln's speech at Lawrenceville, charging that the speaker was falsifying the acts and record of the Democratic Party. Lincoln must have replied heatedly, for Anderson declared that Lincoln's attack on him imported insult and ominously demanded an explanation. A duel seemed likely, but Lincoln disarmed that threat with a conciliatory reply. I enter no unkind feeling to you, and none of any sort upon the subject, except a sincere regret that I permitted myself to get into such an altercation. What Lincoln said in his many other speeches may be inferred from contributions in the Sangamo Journal and the Old Soldier, a campaign paper that he helped edit. Many of the opinion letters signed A Looker-On, An Old Jackson Man, and the like, were evidently Lincoln's handiwork. In November 1839, a looker-on excoriated Democrats for attacking the Illinois State Bank, calling them would-be dictators, whose charges were mere absurdities. The author, who claimed to have been in Vandalia in 1835 when the General Assembly chartered the bank, pointed out that leading Democrats had championed that institution. Similarly, in 1837, Democrats had procured the suspension of the requirement that the bank redeem its notes in specie. So, a looker-on concluded, as the bank is their own dog, they may whip it, and I trust the Whigs will only stand by and see it well done. Several articles by an old Jackson man roundly condemned the Van Buren administration for extravagance and corruption. Democrats had denounced John Quincy Adams for spending $12 million to $15 million annually, he pointed out, but Van Buren had expended over $40 million. Under Van Buren, Republican simplicity and economy had been lost. He also alleged that Van Buren had bribed newspaper editors with patronage and had abandoned the one-term principle which Democrats had championed in the 1820s. The Democratic Party in Illinois abused the patronage power, an old Jackson man charged. Look at the list of Van Buren conventions held throughout the state. In all of them you find the registers and receivers of land offices, the prominent members of all such conventions, dictating to the people who they shall vote for almost every office, while the small fry, composing the main body of these dictatorial assemblies, is principally composed of postmasters, office holders, and office seekers, the Van Buren administration tolerated corrupt officials like William L.D. Ewing, who, when he stepped down as receiver of public monies at Vandalia, was found a defaulter and judgment obtained against him for about $15,000. But 
but the Democrats nonetheless ran him for the state Senate, the U.S. Senate, and made him acting governor and speaker of the Illinois House of Representatives. The author also denounced the Van Buren administration's proposal for a 200,000-man militia, which, he alleged, amounted to a proposition to raise a standing army, a new engine of patronage and power. This old Jackson man issued a warning. Give to an ambitious and unprincipled president the sub-treasury, the control of the national funds, and to his army of office holders and office hunters, 200,000 trained militiamen, 25,000 men in each military division, 12,500 men in actual pay and active service in each division, the whole body looking to the president for appointment and promotion, the whole under his direction and control. Give him these, and you will, afterwards, scarce dare refuse him anything his rapacity may demand. In a similar vein, son of an old ranger attacked Van Buren's record in the War of 1812. While Harrison was camped in the field, or ranging our frontiers, fighting our battles, defending our women and children from the murderous tomahawk and scalping knife, and adding new luster to the American name with his splendid victories, at the same time, Van Buren was in the New York legislature, voting for Rufus King, the federal anti-war candidate for senator. When a Democratic campaign paper alleged that Harrison had not behaved heroically at the Battle of Raisin River, a Kentucky volunteer, probably Lincoln, replied, I have no doubt the writer of the above lines had rather be considered a knave than a fool, and therefore I shall pitch him on to the first horn of the dilemma and treat it as a base attempt to deceive the people. In a public debate at Petersburg, Lincoln attacked Archer Herndon, who had accused Lincoln of being an interloper. Lincoln replied that when he had been a candidate as often as Herndon, he would quit. Herndon was also assailed in the press. A letter by a citizen, probably Lincoln, chastened him for supporting Van Buren in 1840 after having opposed him four years earlier. Condemning this apostasy, citizen sneered, if any man does deserve office at the hands of Van Buren, you surely do. To sustain him, you have sacrificed all, character, reputation, conscience, and the good opinion of tried friends. This citizen did not eschew strong language. He called Herndon a traitor and scorned his truckling and fawning, a bowing and scraping to the powers that be, which, in the absence of any other testimony than your own professions of honesty, furnishes us with the best key to your motives. The combative Herndon heatedly rejected such charges made by members of what he called the British Negro Indian Sympathy and Anti-Republican Bloodhound Party. A writer, probably Lincoln, pretending to be Herndon, asked Van Buren, We know you honestly consider the Negroes, particularly the fat, sleek ones, superior to poor white folks. But why, in the name of Guinea itself, can you not suppress even your honest sentiments until after the election? In November, Harrison swamped Van Buren, carrying 19 of the 26 states. The president did manage to eke out a victory in Illinois, capturing 51% of the votes to Harrison's 49%. Hard times, Van Buren's bland personality, and the vogue for egalitarianism combined to doom the incumbent. His victory in Illinois, the only free state he carried other than New Hampshire, apparently owed much to immigrants who worked on the Illinois and Michigan Canal. David Davis, a Whig friend of Lincoln, who narrowly lost a bid for the state Senate, complained that if the Irish did not vote more than three times, we could easily carry the state. Davis added that the Irish vote along the line of the canal increased at the late election most wonderfully, and in nearly every other county of the state, the Whig vote has enlarged greatly. Like Davis, Lincoln was angered by such irregularities. On election day, when he heard that an Illinois railroad contractor had brought a construction gang to take over the polls, Lincoln told him menacingly, 
You will spoil and blow if you live much longer. That night Lincoln confided to Joshua Speed, I intended to knock him down and go away and leave him a kicking. On a similar occasion in Springfield, Lincoln stymied a group of Democrats who had threatened to seize the polls and prevent their opponents from voting. Armed with an axe handle, he scared off the obstructionists. When the legislature convened soon after the November elections, Lincoln proposed an investigation of electoral fraud. Despite the result in Illinois, Lincoln was jubilant over Harrison's victory. In Springfield, Harrison won 63% of the vote, slightly more than the 59% that Whig presidential candidates usually received there. At a raucous celebration, Lincoln made a great deal of sport with his speeches, witty sayings, and stories. He even played leapfrog. In 1840, Lincoln sought a fourth legislative term, though in March he told Stewart that, I think it is probable I shall not be permitted to be a candidate. Many Sangamon County Whigs outside the Capitol had resisted the convention system and objected to the Springfield Junto that supported it. The Junto had further alienated voters by opposing the division of the county. Thomas J. Nance, a Democrat in Rock Creek near New Salem, criticized the junto to a resident of the capital. Most of our citizens are becoming acquainted with the officious meddling of a few men, this disposition to misrepresent all our reasonable askings will have one good effect. This is to convince us that we must unite to repel their dictating edicts. At a meeting in South Fork, voters declared that they disapprove of the dictative course pursued by the Springfield Junto of lawyers and officeholders. They threatened to do all we can to put the Junto down. In 1839, the Junto had also antagonized some Whigs by selecting John Bennett of Petersburg rather than Bowling Green as a candidate for the General Assembly. Despite all this, the Sangamon County Whigs did nominate Lincoln at their convention that March. Though they rejected all other Springfield residents, save Edward D. Baker, whom they chose to run for state senate. Why Lincoln did not receive that honor is unclear. Lincoln reported that Ninian W. Edwards was very much hurt at not being nominated, and added that for his own part he was much, very much, wounded himself at his, Edwards's, being left out. The fact is, the country delegates made the nominations as they pleased, and they pleased to make them all from the country, except Baker and me, whom they supposed necessary to make stump speeches. Lincoln was better known for his oratory than his organizational skills. Anson G. Henry complained that when it came to such tasks as compiling lists of important Whigs who should receive government documents, you need not expect Stuart, that is, John Todd Stuart, Baker, or Lincoln to do this kind of work. I am the only working man of this sort in Springfield. I have all my life beat the bush for others to catch the bird. On election day in August, Lincoln retained his seat in the General Assembly, coming in fifth in a field of ten, with 1,844 votes. The leading candidate received only 15 more votes than Lincoln, while the sixth-place finisher lagged 578 votes behind him. In August, shortly after Election Day, the General Assembly began a session marred by special bitterness occasioned by an impending change in the partisan balance. The Democrats, aware that this session represented the last apple they will have because of the Whigs' triumph in the national election, were determined to extract every drop of juice while they have the chance. Whig Senator William H. Fithian likened the Democrats to the Indian who was badly wounded and knew that he must die and therefore was determined to do as much mischief before he did expire as he possibly could. One Illinois Whig editor deployed the rampant partisanship of most lawmakers. Elected at a time of high party excitement and with an eye single to his blind devotion and subservancy to that party, the representative too frequently enters upon the discharge of his duties, governed and controlled only by the most sordid views 
selfish motives, and basest passions, to which the asperity of party feeling can give birth. Governor Thomas Carlin summoned the legislature to a special session beginning on November 23rd, two weeks before the constitutionally stipulated date for the regular session, in order to grapple with the mounting state debt. It seemed unlikely that Illinois could meet the interest payments due on January 1st. Because the new capital was still not quite ready for occupancy, the legislators met in Springfield churches. Once again, William L.D. Ewing defeated Lincoln for Speaker of the House. After some vigorous but futile attempts to have Vandalia restored as the state capital, the General Assembly then prepared to convene its regular session on December 7th. The Democrats tried to seize the moment for some mischief. Since a recent law provided that the Bank of Illinois would have to resume specie payments at the end of the next session of the legislature, Democrats argued that the bank must meet that burdensome requirement as of December 5th, when the special session closed. The Whigs, hoping to have the regular session combined with the special session, and thus postpone the bank's day of reckoning, boycotted the legislature, thereby preventing the necessary two-thirds quorum for adjournment sine die. When the representatives gathered on December 5th, the Whigs stayed away, except for Lincoln, Joseph Gillespie, and Azahel Gridley, who were to observe the proceedings and demand roll-call votes. The frustrated Democrats, eager to hurt the state bank by adjourning, instructed the sergeant-at-arms to round up absent Whigs. When that tactic failed, the Democrats managed to bring in enough of their own previously absent members to create a quorum. Lincoln and his two Whig colleagues angrily bolted for the door, which was locked. Because the sergeant-at-arms had received no instruction to unlock the door, he refused to do so. Lincoln then opened a window and stepped through, followed by Gillespie and Gridley. When the sergeant-at-arms was instructed to pursue, he exclaimed, "'My God, gentlemen, do you know what you ask? Think of the length of Abe's legs, and then tell me how I am to catch him.'" This unconventional departure through the church's first-floor window drew laughter from the Democratic members, who derisively shouted, He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. The register sneered at the gymnastic performance of Mr. Lincoln and his flying brethren, and recommended that the State House be raised in order to have the House set in the third story, so as to prevent members from jumping out of the windows. That way, Mr. Lincoln will, in future, have to climb down the spout. One observer reported that after the House adjourned, such a clapping of hands and stamping you never heard. On the whole, I must say, I consider the conduct of both parties disgraceful in the extreme. Years later, Lincoln was ridiculed as a long-legged varmint who was great at jumping and who earned his membership in the junto by jumping out the windows of the State House to save the bank. Lincoln found this episode very embarrassing. According to Gillespie, he always regretted that he entered into the arrangement, as he deprecated everything that savored of the revolutionary. In later years, whenever the matter came up, he would change the subject. When the regular session began on December 7, 1840, the House of Representatives, finally meeting for the first time in the new capital, wrangled over the debt crisis. Lincoln managed, after much cajoling, to persuade his colleagues to raise the general land tax and to issue special bonds to cover the pending interest obligations. Lincoln's interest bonds scheme was criticized as a mere gull trap set for the purpose of catching money holders and sharpers. The tax hike, however, yielded insufficient revenue to solve the problem, and in July 1841, the state defaulted on its interest payments, causing the price of Illinois bonds to plunge. A Democratic state senator complained that the very men who voted for the railroad system, men who indebted the state millions, are afraid to vote one cent of taxes on their constituents to sustain the tottering credit of the state. In 1842, the state took in revenues of less than $100,000, while interest payments approached $800,000. 
A struggle over the Whig-dominated Supreme Court convulsed the legislature. The justices had angered Democrats by overruling Governor Carlin's decision to remove Alexander P. Field, a partisan Whig, from his post as Secretary of State. When the court also seemed likely to weaken the Democrats' electoral base by denying aliens the right to vote, most of the state's 10,000 foreign-born voters were Democrats, the General Assembly entertained a motion to pack the Supreme Bench by adding five justices, a proposal that became the lion measure of the session. The ensuing debate was, in the words of a state senator, vehement and exciting, partaking much of party abuse and personal crimination. In the midst of the heated exchanges, a member of the lower house reported that the very genius of disorganization is holding the reins whilst old Nick whips the horses. Everything is done by party votes. Beholding the spectacle from Washington, John Todd Stewart lamented, I have often been ashamed of my state, or rather of its loco legislators. They are a laughingstock. Lincoln's friend, Senator William H. Fithian, thought that he had previously seen the business of the people carelessly and tardily attended to by their representatives. But now he felt compelled to say, I have never until this session fully realized the length and breadth of the unparalleled embarrassments of the people of Illinois. Although the main battleground of this war was in the House, Lincoln scarcely took part. He had prepared remarks that he could not deliver because Speaker Ewing allowed the Democrats to cut off debate. On February 1st, when the bill cleared the House by a vote of 45 to 43, the Sangamo Journal published a letter by a member of that body, probably Lincoln, indignantly protesting that the judiciary of Illinois is to be assailed and the Constitution in its spirit, if not the letter, violated. And the members who would have raised a voice in its defense are to be gagged into silence. Hyperbolically comparing the proceedings to the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798, the author denounced Ewing and his alarming parliamentary rulings. He asserted that it is sufficiently revolting to the feelings of free men to be gagged into silence under any circumstances, but if this gag law can be enforced in relation to a particular measure before that measure is before the House, then anything like freedom of debate may be cut off, and the members literally gagged into silence. When Ewing rejected this protest as gratuitous and unfounded, the aggrieved legislator replied in a statesmanlike fashion, remarking that he had not been induced by any unkind feelings towards the Speaker, and that there was no reason we should wound each other's feelings, or that those civilities and kindnesses which mark the character and intercourse between gentlemen should be violated and endangered. He maintained that the official conduct or decisions of public officers is public property, and are fair and legitimate subjects of criticism, so that facts are correctly stated and inferences fairly drawn. In my own much more humble sphere, I freely concede the right of investigating my public conduct, and if dealt ingenuously with, will not be found to complain. Lincoln was not so conciliatory in late February, when he and 34 other Whig representatives denounced the court-packing statute as a party measure for party purposes, which manifested supreme contempt for the popular will, undermined the independence of the judiciary, the surest shield of public welfare and private right, and set a precedent for still more flagrant violations of right and justice. In April, a satirical communication in the Sangamo Journal, probably by Lincoln, suggested that the Judiciary Bill passed only because a member, Ebenezer Peck, was bought off with an appointment as clerk of the State Supreme Court. Another such communication, also probably by Lincoln, ridiculed Stephen A. Douglas for his inconsistency as an opponent of life offices, who nevertheless accepted such a post as a Supreme Court judge. In the 1840-1841 session, Lincoln once again fought on behalf of the Illinois and Michigan Canal, moving that the state increase the land tax 
and issue bonds to complete the project. A Democrat from Montgomery County countered with one of Lincoln's own favorite tactics, the funny story with the concealed barb. He compared Lincoln to an Arkansas topper who had passed out and, when all other means to revive him failed, regained consciousness at his wife's suggestion that a brandy toddy might be the best medicine. Upon hearing the words brandy toddy, the bibulous gentleman sat up, saying, That is the stuff! Lincoln seemed to think the more debt that the state assumed, the better. Lincoln responded in kind. His critics' actions during the legislative session, he quipped, called to mind an old Indiana bachelor who was very famous for seeing big bugaboos in everything. One day, while hunting with his brother, this gentleman fired repeatedly at a treetop. His sibling, who saw no target, asked what he was trying to shoot. When told that it was a squirrel, the brother, believing that there was some humbug about the matter, examined his person and found on one of his eyelashes a big louse crawling about. It is just so with the gentleman from Montgomery. He imagined he could see squirrels every day when they were nothing but lice. Lincoln's remarks convulsed the whole house, forcing a halt to all business. The speaker banged his gavel to no avail. Legislators of both parties laughed, screamed and yelled, thumped upon the floor with their canes, clapped their hands, threw up their hats, shouted and twisted themselves into all sorts of contortions until their sides ached and the tears rolled down their cheeks. One spasm succeeded another until the representatives seemed to be perfectly exhausted. Much as they admired Lincoln's wit, the legislators rejected his argument that to prosecute the work now was in fact the most economical plan that could be adopted. To stop it would involve the state in much more debt and ruin. Lincoln clashed with another Democrat, John A. McClernand, over the state bank. From southern Illinois, McClernand was a devoted foe of all banks. Vain and overbearing, he was an effective, if unscrupulous, speaker, always ready for a political fight. His knowledge of the classics, his grand eloquent manner, and his smooth delivery led people to call him the Grecian orator. According to Gustav Korner, McClernand was bold in his assertions, denunciatory of his opponents, perfectly fearless, an experienced public speaker, never trying to persuade, but to subdue. McClernand and Lincoln held an especially heated debate over the question of whether the state bank should be the fiscal agent for Illinois. Lincoln, with asperity, accused Democrats of underhanded dealing. He declared that there was a manifest disposition on the part of some of the Van Buren men to prop up the bank, and it is perfectly apparent that the party are prepared to detach a fraction of themselves to go with the Whigs in sustaining the bank, their usual policy, and then throw the odium of suspension upon the Whigs. Lincoln said that he was tired of this business. If there was to be this continual warfare against the institutions of the state, the sooner it was brought to an end, the better. If the great body of the Democratic Party would act upon conservative principles, he was willing to go with them. But this scheme of detaching a fragment from their party to help the Whigs pass a measure and then turn around and kick and cuff us for it, he had seen practiced long enough. Lincoln's attempt to protect the interests of the bank proved futile, for it was compelled to shut its doors the following year. With his departure from the General Assembly, Lincoln found himself out of office for the first time in seven years. He had chosen not to seek re-election, for he wished to obtain the Whig nomination for Congress. The apprentice phase of his political career was thus over. Since entering the legislature in 1834, he had gained stature. In December 1840, a member of the lobby, a kind of mock legislature that met in the Capitol after the General Assembly sessions adjourned for the day, called him emphatically a man of high standing, a self-made man, and one of the ablest, whether as a lawyer or legislator, in the state. As a speaker, he is characterized by a sincerity, frankness, and evident honesty, calculated to win the attention and gain the confidence of the hearer. 
Thomas J. Henderson, who recalled hearing Lincoln during this session of the General Assembly, was less favorably impressed, saying that he was awkward in manner when speaking, with a swaying motion of body and a swinging of his long arms that were somewhat ungraceful. Henderson heard members laughing and talking about appointing a committee to hold his coattails when he was speaking to keep him still. A few months later, the Fulton Telegraph said, We think the great talents, sacrifices, and high standing of Mr. Lincoln should bring our friends to the decision of taking him up as a candidate for governor. Lincoln had little interest in that post, for Whigs stood no chance of winning statewide office. In July 1841, a Western Illinois newspaper reported that, since his return from the circuit in mid-June, Lincoln declines being considered as a candidate for governor. Five months later, the Sangamo Journal announced that since Mr. Lincoln returned from the circuit, he has expressed his wishes not to be a candidate for governor. An item in that same paper the following year finally scotched the proposal. We do not believe that he desires the nomination. He has already made great sacrifices in sustaining his party principles, and before his political friends ask him to make additional sacrifices, the subject should be well considered. The office of governor, which would of necessity interfere with the practice of his profession, would poorly compensate him for the loss of four years of the best portion of his life. Some Whigs also objected that Springfield should not have both the party's only congressional seat and the governorship. In 1840, Lincoln's ambition had grown more intense. Fueled by his new status as a presidential elector, Whig campaign manager, chief stump speaker and organizer, as well as Whig floor leader in the State House of Representatives. William H. Herndon believed that Lincoln, as early as 1830, began to dream of a destiny. I think it grew and developed and bloomed with beauty, etc., in the year 1840 exactly. Mr. Lincoln in that year was appointed general elector for the state. Mr. Lincoln told me that his ideas of becoming something burst upon him in 1840. Lincoln now felt ready to advance from the state to the national legislature. In the General Assembly he had learned how to build coalitions, how to persuade his colleagues to do his bidding, and how to roll logs. According to Lyman Trumbull, a colleague in the Illinois House of Representatives, Lincoln was viewed by his political friends as among their shrewdest and ablest leaders, and by his political adversaries as a formidable opponent. Trumbull, who was critical of Lincoln, nonetheless acknowledged that among the highly talented men who served in the legislature in 1840 to 1841, he stood in the front rank. But for all Lincoln's growing sense of strength and competence, there was, as Samuel C. Parks noted about the Lincoln of 1841, nothing to indicate the future reformer, either in religion or morals or politics. His greatness as a moral statesman in years to come would have been hard to predict based on his legislative record, which showed him to be likable and clever, but little more. He understood the nuts and bolts of lawmaking and excelled at ridiculing Democrats. In his leadership role, however, he curiously had little to do with framing legislation. Of the 1,647 bills passed during Lincoln's four terms, he directly introduced only 10. Another 21 had been brought forward by committees on which he served. Lincoln offered only eight resolutions and 14 petitions, it is no wonder that fellow Whig leaders observed that during his years in the legislature, Lincoln never gave any special evidence of that masterly ability for which he was afterward distinguished. By the age of 32, Lincoln had proved himself to be an ambitious, gifted partisan, but exhibited few signs of true statesmanship.